We're live on YouTube. We are live on a website. All righty. Good morning, everyone, and happy uh, Women's History Month and happy budget season. Pursuant to Section 241 of the New York City Charter, the Queens Borough Board is holding this hearing in order to establish our borough's priorities with regards to the mayor's fiscal 2023 preliminary budget released on February 16, 2022. Uh, this morning, we are joined by the offices of Councilmember Julie One, Linda Lee, uh, Councilmember Palladino, Speaker Adams, Councilmember Williams, Councilmember Ari Ola so far. All right, I think I got everybody. All right, the preliminary budget proposes a $98.54 billion financial plan. This is a slight decrease compared to the fiscal year 2022 adopted budget, which was $98.72 billion. This budget is expected to collect $65.9 billion in tax revenue an increase of $3.4 billion from the current modified budget. Property taxes account for the largest share of tax revenue at $30.9 billion. When looking at several key agencies, we see that compared to the fiscal year 2022 adopted budget, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is funded, by, funded at $2.07 billion, a $194.22 million decrease from the FY22 adopted budget. The Department of Education is funded at $30.74 billion, an $826.19 million decrease from the FY22 adopted budget. The Department for the Aging is funded $27.53 million less than, than last year, including a $31.57 million cut to senior centers and mills. The Department of Youth is decreased by $153.37 million. However, there is an increase of $57.63 million to the SYE program, which is gonna provide about 100,000 job slots, of course, in which we commend. The police department is funded at $5.41 billion, which is $29.64 million less than the FY22 adopted budget. My office will analyze the rest of the fiscal year 2023 preliminary budget and other city agencies in the coming days. The last three fiscal years have presented challenges to the city. In addition, the national economy has still not fully recovered from the pandemic. And while I am optimistic that we are on our way, economic recovery has been uneven with the unpredictable waves of COVID-19 including the latest wave of the Omicron variant, which peaked in September, 2021. But we are New Yorkers and there is no challenge that we cannot overcome. Here in Queens, we will get through this together and work with our partners to secure a, re a responsible budget that works for all. As the budget is shaped by first the preliminary budget, then the executive budget, and finally the adopted budget, I look forward to working with the mayor and the city council on addressing budget shortfalls. With that, let's begin the Queens Borough Board budget hearing. We have a record-breaking 200 plus groups who RSVP to testify. So everybody stay on the clock. Each person has up to three minutes to testify as indicated by the countdown clock. However, shorter testimonies, less than three minutes are encouraged and appreciated highly, especially by the borough president staff considering how many speakers we have today. We will consider all written testimony just as much, so please present your top priorities only. Just a friendly reminder and some housekeeping before we begin, testifying at this hearing is not a formal budget application to my office. Let me say that again. Testifying at this hearing is not a formal budget application to my office. Please check the website at queensbp.org and go to the budget tab to view which applications are available. With that, let's officially begin the fiscal year 2023 Queens Borough budget hearing. And first to present is Community Board One. Good morning, Borough President. Thank you for this opportunity. New York City Council members and individuals, 
Thank you for being here and good morning to my fellow community board members. I am Florence Cloris, District Manager for Community Board One. Today, I would like to address the capital and expense district needs for fiscal year 23. Our board is developing rapidly. We have experienced numerous changes. Recently, we had the addition of the New York City Ferry. The area of Hallett's Point has seen an immense uptick in foot pedestrian traffic. There are incredible dark areas and the installation of lighting has been requested by residents and visitors alike. The installation of lighting would improve the street usage and safety, improving the quality of life. The area of Main Avenue between Vernon Boulevard, 8th Street, Green Park on Main Avenue, north side of Astoria Boulevard, 27th Street, north side and beyond Hallett's Point Playground require adequate lighting. We urge the study for the area to accommodate this request. I would also like to bring to your attention the failing infrastructure in our growing community. For over well 50 years, a section of community board on 32nd Street off Dittmars Boulevard till the dead end has major sewer issue lines. The residents of our community must drudge through excessive rainwater flooding their homes. The pervasive flooding that continuously happens has not been addressed and causes significant damage. The area does not have runoff lines and one line is used for rain runoff as well as sewage. The street itself floods during rains which cause hazardous conditions year-round whether it be ponding causing excessive mosquitoes or slip and fall conditions due to dangerous icing this must be addressed the area requires immediate full pipeline reconstruction this will consist of a combined sewer system once reconstruction occurs the community will require a full of dot to resent the residents suffered and remediate from water damage for far too long. Whether damages are monetary or health, this is a situation that must be addressed. Our district has a large number of housing developments. One of those being Astoria Houses, which lies on the waterfront, bordered by 27th Avenue, A Street, Hallett's Cove and the East River. Our former councilman, Costa Constantinidis, environmental protector, environmental Protection Committee Chair stated 50 to 55 percent of our committee will be affected by rising waters. Astoria Highs is, has adversely affected by Hurricane Sandy. Eight buildings were damaged. The boilers need to be replaced and elevated. Roof repairs, plumbing and electrical work were needed. There has always been an existing condition with high tides rising over the existing seawall. Salt water has severely damaged the seawall and railings, which has been in dire need of repair. We must be proactive. The seawall itself needs to be redesigned and reconstructed to prevent first future damage of Astoria houses. After a $75 million investment made by FEMA, we require post-Sandy seawall protection for Astoria houses. The Esplanade and the surroundings are highly developed, which are in a flood zone. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is evaluating the waterfront area for the safety of our community. We are working on this study and will require the repair funds will be needed. May I go on for the last paragraph, Mr. President? Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. The final matter I would like to address for today is 114th police precinct. To eliminate flooding repairs and restoration of the lock rooms from flooding, which occurs, water and discomfort harm our officers. Our police officers should not have to wade in prior to going to work. The flood has not only caused a hardship, it would be a potential health hazard. Mold could follow. Officers could potentially slip and fall, causing personal injury. We request this be addressed immediately. This is an unsafe work condition. The possibility of a new station house is absolutely welcome to improve all the issues surrounding the existing facility. As the district grows, the number of officers must follow. This option would provide the space for that to occur. Thank you for your time and attention to these matters. It is truly appreciated. Thank you to you all for hearing our requests. Thank you, Florence. All right, we're gonna to go to our next presenter, Community Board Two, Debbie Markell. Hi, thank you for allowing us to testify today. Good morning, Ma uh, Mr. Borough President, Donovan Richards, elected officials, chairs, and guests. Thank you for your continued support on many projects within. Um, Thank you to our council members for always being supportive and creative. CB2 has experienced record real estate development and exponential population growth over the past two decades. Rezoning, particularly in Long Island City along, the, along Queens Boulevard and originally aimed towards commercial growth, poorly anticipated the residential boom and the pressure has been placed on 
every aspect of our community needs. Residential real estate development has outpaced the provision of essential services, upkeep of the infrastructure, schools, roads, and transit and open space. COVID-19 has reminded us of the importance of parks, cultural facilities, and other community services. Core infrastructure throughout the district is aging and requires ongoing capital repairs. This was evidenced by a water main break on Vernon Boulevard. The category has had the largest number of budget requests. Deteriorating sewers infrastructure in Long Island City and Woodside is legendary for its insignificant capacity. Small businesses in Woodside and Sunnyside have suffered enormous hardship during the COVID-19 pandemic, resulting in closed storefronts and the deterioration of street corridors. We request the, the city prioritize our budget request for streetscape improvements in Woodside Business District at 61st Street along Roosevelt Avenue, including the repair and replacement of street lighting, brick paving, and sidewalks. COVID-19 has reminded us of the importance of parks. The parks and open, open space really are in need and desperate upgrades. Recently, the addition of the Kosciuszko Bridge pedestrian bike path has led to the request of the city to do a feasibility study in creating a pedestrian greenway and park benches along the Review Avenue between Laurel Hill, Kosciuszko Bridge and Greenpoint Avenue. This road would be suitable for a protected lane and could be a great way to enhance the greenway for all pedestrians as well. We're in need of trees um, along in, and within the entire CB2 area and Sunnyside. The construction of schools and provisions of youth services have lagged behind the population growth in CB2, particularly in the Court Square area within the School District 30, which has been cited as one of the most overcrowded school districts. CB2 requests that SCA identify a viable school site. We have much homelessness that needs to be addressed. Um, in, uh, Community Board 2 has experienced an increase in homelessness in our district, especially during COVID-19. The temporary shelter population in CB2 has increased significantly. The identification of sites and resettling of homeless families in the temporary shelters has been disorganized and disruptive to the residents of the community. I just have one more paragraph. That would be okay. Um, while CB2 is at the beginning to emerge a pandemic with looming cuts, community boards will not be able to support the technology upgrades, which proved to be essential during COVID-19 crisis and allowed CB2 to function seamlessly without the interruption of our services for our constituents. We thank the council member's office and look forward to new relationship with the current councilwoman to continue to support these mandated services. And we work closely with the borough president and your administration on many and continuing important projects. Thank you very much for the continued funding and the support of our community boards. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. All righty, we're gonna now go to CB3, Giovanna Reed. She's not here. Yes, oh, I'm I, here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I am here. Oh, I see. Uh, good yes, good morning, Borough President. Uh, members, distinguished members of uh, City Council, Borough Board, guests and colleagues, I bring greetings from Community Board 3, uh, which uh, are the neighborhoods of East Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, and North Corona. While there are more than 60 items that the Community Board has recommended for support, time will not allow for all of them to be mentioned this morning. Here are just a few of the priorities that we offer for your consideration. Uh, increased funding for uh, senior programs and adult care, year-round youth programs and uh, employment. Funding for the, both of these programs is crit critically important and is greatly uh, needed by our community. Uh, in regards to year-round youth programs, we need creative, meaningful programs that will allow our young people to gain experience and grow. And, and grow. Employment training and recreational programs are key. Um, uh, it is important that our businesses re, uh, get reestablished uh, as the pandemic and the downturn of the economy has had a devastating effect on uh, to the pro, uh, sorry devastating effect to our businesses, and so we ask that these uh, minority small businesses uh, receive the support and services that they so sorely uh, need. Um, 
we also have requested that the that uh, to expand and increase services for the homeless. There is a noticeable increase of homelessness in the district and the city of New York. The city has uh, has to do a better job in caring for the citizens who have permanent uh, housing. Um, we have also asked that uh, uh, one of our top priorities is upgrading our combined sewer system. Uh, as you may recall, Hurricane Ida did a, had a major impact on various areas within our district and serious flooding damages incurred uh, and understand and we uh, and, and underscored the need to upgrade our overtaxed combined sewer systems. We ask that they be replaced and upgraded as it will go a long way towards reducing the incidence of flooding. I'm sorry for the interference. Um, public safety is of major concern for us and we ask that uh, our precincts uh, get uh, increased funding so that they can hire the necessary personnel in addition to the If I can just say lastly, uh, we hope that you will support our request to increase baseline budget community uh, based on budgets for community boards. It will help to the increased funding will help to purchase live streaming services, higher personnel, funding to offsite, um, I'm sorry, funding to uh, offset the raising costs of purchasing and maintaining office equipment. An increase to our basic budget would make significant difference in the operation of our community board office and the services that it provides. I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today about the needs and concerns of Community Board 3. And again, I'm, I apologize for the, the background noise. Oh, thank we you. didn't hear it. No problem. Okay. All right. Thank you for your testimony. All right. We're going to go to CB4, Christian. Good morning. Good morning. So I, I clocked myself at exactly three minutes and one second. So here goes. I think I got you guys. Y'all don't I'm not trying to talk too fast. Uh, so um, good morning, Borough President, Council Members and Chairs joining our panel this morning, as well as the staff. You guys did an amazing job on this. Uh, my name is Christian Casano, and I'm the District Manager for Queens Community Board 4, overseeing the communities of Corona, Corona Heights, Newtown and Elmhurst. I thank you for the opportunity. Um, as has become customary for us to see before and as the reference in previous years, I'd like to refrain from directly discussing the capital expense budget register. Uh, we feel that that document clearly defines the community needs and represents a part of the bigger picture. Uh, today's testimony won't affect or change those needs. They uh, obviously still exist. Excuse me. Uh, instead, today I'd like to more deeply, uh, excuse me, I'd like to more directly request items that didn't make into our budget register and directly reference ways in which the community board itself can assist the constituents to better meet their needs. Uh, for several years now, we've been at the forefront in conducting hyper local community events, ranging from early, uh, excuse me, Earth Day community garden events and therapeutic art camps to large scale youth fairs, dog licensing events, and holiday tree lighting ceremonies. Funding, however, has always been contingent upon support from small businesses, the Borough President's Office, and the City Council. Uh, the Board of Office has often uh, taken money out of its already strained OTPS budget to provide local community groups and city agencies, even with a multitude of items from uh, paint supplies for graffiti cleanups to art supplies for arts and crafts workshops. Um, Throughout the year, boards are often approached by not for profit with requests for sponsorships in the form of basic food items or tabling, which always requires some kind of branding and or memorabilia on behalf of the board. Uh, board's budgets are already strained, and since the pandemic, their duties and daily operations have changed to be more conducive to very different, uh, newly identified needs. As such, CB4 is requesting a similar stipend, such as that given to us in previous years by both council districts, allowing the board to better brand itself and to further serve its community with more public events, street fairs, and giveaways as the pandemic restrictions loosen. Funding from both respective council districts would ensure that uh, events focused on historic preservation and youth empowerment can be front and center, items that have and will continue to be top priorities for our district. Additionally, uh, my final is a key component to many of our events, and another topic taken very seriously by both my board and I is that of our community gardens. Um, we are home to several gardens, uh, one on the way, but one in specific, Sparrow's Nest Community Garden, an 11,000 square foot parcel of land acquired and built out with direct help from us at the board since its inception about maybe five or six years ago. We have and continue to use the garden as a community space, a tour venue, and therapeutic art camp site. This garden built and funded almost entirely by its groundkeeper, um, 
Pastor Guan is home to be beehives producing Corona honey, hen and quail coops producing eggs, and a multitude of exotic herbs and vegetables that are distributed within the guidelines of green thumb requirements. For several consecutive years, however, a lack of support given by the Parks Department and our elected officials in helping to mitigate or at the very least acknowledge the many infrastructural issues that the land faces. Flooding mitigation, excuse me, flooding mitigation, proper signage by the power and water sources in the form of solar panels, water pumps, and logistical upgrades, specifically the pathways are sorely needed not only to maintain, but upgrade the garden to better serve the surrounding communities that we need I uh, thank you all for this opportunity to present and thank for the staff, excuse me, thank the staff and you all for hearing us out. Great, thank you, Christian. All right, next we're gonna go to Gary, District Manager, Community Board 5. Good morning, Borough President Richards, and thank you and the city council members and the chairpersons of the community boards and all those good community board members who've made this city um, better than almost any city in the country. Um, we're under a lot of pressure. We're coming out of this uh, COVID pandemic, two years of this, isolation for a lot of people. Um, so we really need to stick together. Um, now, I, I can't go without saying it, uh, war in the Ukraine and what that's going to mean to the peace of the world and the climate change issues where there have been more hurricanes, more tornadoes, uh, a much warmer climate in recent years. Um, those are some of the big issues that we're facing. As far as in our community board, um, our basic needs We've always been very uh, police, fire, sanitation oriented. We um, have fewer police officers than we need. We would like an additional 20 officers assigned to the 104th precinct, uh, simply because so often they're holding calls and they're in alert. And I think that's true for a lot of precincts who had many more police officers. And there was a time when we had 200 and now we're down to 150. Uh, police officers. And of course, they need to be trained well so that they don't over overreact to difficult situations. But the great majority of police officers have done very well uh, at protecting the public. Um, enough DEP field workers to uh, deal with uh, the flooding problems that we're having and uh, the flooding problems that we're going to have if this kind of weather continues. Um, buildings inspectors are very important. We have a lot of illegal dumping in our, in our area because we have a uh, railroad siding and other areas that uh, you don't have somebody watching across the street. So we need to keep our communities clean. Uh, youth programs are very important to us. I think they have played a big role in reducing crime over the years in the city. Uh, senior programs, especially for the frail elderly, uh, traffic problems with vehicular speeding. So those having enough inspectors for DOT, uh, traffic signal, uh, always stop investigations, that sort of thing. And with so many people in danger of being evicted, uh, the budget and the effectiveness of legal services is very important as provided by HPD and others. On a capital budget issue, the reconstruction of Mafara Park on the Ridgewood Glendale border is very important. Uh, it's deteriorated, uh, especially the, uh, the soft surface ball field and uh, baseball season's hopefully coming and we'd like to see reconstruction of that important park in our neighborhood. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you. We now will go to community board six, Frank Belusio. Unmute yourself, Frank. Here we go again. <laughs> yeah, my big mouth and all. I, I, I keep muting myself. There, there goes, and she started the time. Okay, everybody, good morning again. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, you all know that for the new people that, and, and I'm speaking for all my colleagues, community boards are the most local grassroots form of city government. And I think we all demonstrate that every single day. We're, we really are the critical bridge for communication between government and the regular guy and gal out in the street. Community Board 6, Forest Hills, Regal Park, we are a well-defined community, not that yours isn't, but historically we have offered a set of desirable amenities, not that you don't, which accounts for its very strong market demand and property values. We would like to continue that. Every year, every board, Community Board 6, we come before you to fight 
for a fair share of services. We're looking for not only short-term reactions, but long-term services. As you know, these services are vital to maintain the quality of life for the residents of all districts. I don't know how many of ever you have ever read the responses that we get. I'm gonna read you a couple. We must maintain and restore essential services. We're frustrated with the responses from the registered budget requests. Number one, further study by the agency is needed. Number two, reach out to the agency. Number three, we support, but with capital letters. Number four, for information, contact, blah, blah, blah. Five, the agency will try. And last but not least, no funds available. We're all frustrated and sick and tired of those responses. We need proactive responses and long-term solutions. It's time folks to zoom in, not to zoom out. Community Board 6 requests support all of our budget items. They're attached, I'm not gonna read them all. And just because they have different numbers doesn't mean they're not a priority, they're all a priority. However, this year is especially crucial due to the increase in development and climate change. Development means more people in our area. And throughout Queens, the infrastructure, and you know this Mr. Borough President, is choking. We're doing a good job alternative transportation, but we need more. We have to continue to fight for our civil city services. As a victim of Sandy, we had a devastating infrastructure failure with the impact of Hurricane Ida. A number of my colleagues already mentioned this. Death, destruction of our local infrastructure. What's been done to CB6? What's been done to fix the infrastructure? Sandbags? Again, I ask. Where are the plans? Where are the solutions? Yeah, we need larger sewers, improved drainage, and the list goes on and on and on. I hope all the council members are listening too. We appreciate the support that we have received from our council member, mayor and borough president. Community boards are small but mighty. And as a city agency, we really are. Okay, I love the bell. Thank you very much. It's really working this year. You all get the message. Let me Thanks. shout out the Borough Hall staff who made this all work. Uh, Carolina, yeah. <laughs> Amanda, our budget director. Uh, thank you and so many others. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that bell? Join. Yeah, the bell is really working this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to uh, also acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Linda Lee. I think I just saw uh, Council Member Ung's office and Council Member Gennaro's office. And now we will move on to CB7, Marily, Marilyn McAndrews. Good morning, everyone. Um, Borough President Richards, Deputy President Ebony Young, members of the City Council, Community Boards, honored guests, and of course, my fellow colleagues. And I can't uh, say anything more than you've already had expressed already. The only issues, a lot of issues that we do have in Board 7 pertain to DOT and DEP. Our number one capital submission, uh, reconstruction of 20th Avenue from the Whitestone Expressway service road to College Point Boulevard and 127th Street from 14th to 23rd Avenues. This heavily utilized main artery within the district connects the communities of Whitestone and College Point. The road has extensive flooding problems and its extensive roadbed is sinking. Major road constructions and sewer work is necessary in order to bring these streets up to grade. The reconstruction of Willits Point phase two, priority number four, has been neglected by the city for too long and needs a total reconstruction to include sidewalks, roadbeds, sewers, and street lighting. Yet, over the years, the legitimate businesses have paid their real estate, sewer, and water taxes without getting capital reconstruction they so desperately need. They have extensive flooding problems and a non-existent roadbed is filled with craters, making it impossible for drivers to navigate the area. The project should be funded by, again, the DEP and DOT. The construction of Alma Street from Whitestone Expressway Service Road to 25th Avenue, a priority number six is a main access road into College Point. This road is 
collapsing, causing drivers to lose control. Therefore, the roadbed must be surcharged, the sewers placed on piles in order to provide streets from not collapsing again. The reconstruction of 28th Avenue from Linden Place to College Point Boulevard, this street is an access road into College Point as well as the corporate park. The roadbed also collapsing and possibly causing drivers and bus operators to lose control. The roadbed must be surcharged in order to prevent the streets from collapsing again. The sewer line is on piles, but the streets around it are collapsing. All right, Borough President Richards, Community Board 7 hopes you will do everything in your power to move these pressing issues forward. This is Marilyn McAndrews, District Manager, Community Board 7. I thank you all. Thank you, and absolutely uh, we will. Oh, what discipline she has. She finished before the second time. Look at that. Look at that leadership. Leadership. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, sir. Thank you for You're your welcome, testimony. Sir. We look forward to working with you on these issues. Um, Councilmember Lee has joined us. Uh, anytime, uh, if you wish to give remarks or questions, uh, you're more than welcome to. I want to say good morning. You're more than welcome. I know. I just wanted to say good morning and thank you so much as a former member of CB11 for many years. Um, I, I so agree with uh, the sentiments that Frank brought up about how community boards really are. I think it was Frank that said this. Um, that said that community boards are really the local, most local form of government, and it's such a great way to get our communities involved and uh, excited about being involved and learning about the process. And so I'm looking forward to just listening um, to all of your testimonies and seeing what your needs are and how we as council members can be supportive. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, for all the work that you guys do. <laughs> and for staff members uh, on, when your member hops on, they're more than welcome to ask questions. I know this is the first year, so welcome for many of you. Uh, if there are questions or remarks your member wants to give, uh, they certainly uh, can do that. All righty. Uh, we will now move on to Marie Adam Overday, Community Board 8. Good morning, Board President Richards, elected officials, Borough Board members, colleagues, esteemed guests. Each year, our members elicit information from, community, from the community and prioritize our budget request. While the answers for the expense budget request were palatable, it seems that most of the answers we got from the capital request were just taken out of a hat. Year after year, agency, agencies respond, studies, more studies is needed, However, we never see any result from any of these studies. So it appears that the agencies are no longer aware of their responsibilities for submitting an intelligent response to community board's request. Our number one priority was to upgrade electrical wiring at the Barwood Family Shelter to facilitate window units for air conditioning. Part of the homeless services response was that they work with providers to maintain shelters in a safe, clean, and comfortable environment. The question is, how comfortable is that environment when there is no air conditioning for families with children with the temperatures of over 90 degrees. In that same building, the staff is provided with air conditioning. Why are the homeless in the subways? Sleeping in air conditioned subway cars seem more comfortable than sleeping at our Briarwood family shelter in the heat of summer. Heat kills. A few years ago, Eyewitness News reported the death of a beautiful five month old baby due to overheating in a New York City shelter. Her name was Anaya. How many Anayas must die before shelters are provided with air conditioning? The last couple of years have proven how important our parks and playgrounds are. One would think that the Department of Parks and Recreation will be fully funded. That is not the case. For almost every request, there's an insufficient funds. They refer us to our council members and our elected officials. Hence, I'm here today to advocate for our parks. If we truly want our residents, young and old, to lead healthy lifestyles, with daily exercise, it begins with funding our parks, our trees. Bloomberg's administration planted millions of trees. However, we have no funding to maintain them. Last year, it took over a year for sidewalks to be repaired after a storm. That's not acceptable. Now our infrastructure, our district is being upzoned. The infrastructure is not adequate to support what we already have. However, DOT and DEP either have no funds for street reconstruction, sewer upgrades, curb repair, or they conduct studies with no results. And the roads are um, being resurfaced incorrectly, causing ponding conditions with, which exacerbate the problems. Community boards are being asked to do upgrades without the means to do so. We do not have our own meeting spaces, so we cannot do hybrid. 
So we're asking for earmark funds for community boards to conduct hybrid meetings, along with the technical support to do so. As James Frick said, don't tell me what your priorities are, show me where you spend your money, and I'll tell you what they are. Thank you, everyone. Please support us. Thank you, Marie. And we, uh, staff, we should follow up on that uh, Briarwood shelter situation. Great. Uh, Thank you, Board President. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to now go to uh, James uh, CB9. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Borough President. Um, my name is James McClellan. I represent Community Board 9. We represent Woodhaven, Ozone Park, Richmond Hill, and Kew Gardens. Uh, I want to congratulate all the council members newly elected, uh, especially Joanne Ariola and Lynn Schulman. Um, we, can't, we can't get these projects done unless we have the support of our council members, and we always appreciate your support. Um, with that said, I'm just going to bring up a few items. As you know, Kew Gardens will be home to the borough-based jail. My board has serious um, issues with the jail as far as information being provided to the board. The original price tag is going to be $10.5 million. We feel that that's underestimated, and we'd like to take another look at it and get a real assessment of what it's going to cost the city. Um, we also supplied the council members with an alternative plan that we'd like to them to look at and give us their opinion on. Another big topic that we have here is the Richmond Hill Library, which has been languishing for years. Um, we don't know why there's no movement on it. Um, the council members and the BP have, have uh, allocated close to $15 million for the project. We feel it's fully funded, and we'd like to see it move forward. Um, as with my colleagues, we are plagued with illegal dumping. Um, it's getting to a, a big quality of life issue, especially on 100th Street between 103rd and 101st Avenue, which is DCAS property and the LIRR train station on Babbage and Hillside. I want to thank the BP's office for arranging a walk through the area recently. We spoke to NTA officials. Um, it's all about dollars and cents. They told us it's going to probably take about a million dollars to put up security fencing. So we requested our state partners to look into that. Derelict vehicles is a huge problem, big problem. NYPD can't keep up with it. We don't have enough tow companies who have contracts with the city. We'd like to take a look at opening up and have tow companies come in and take care of it. Um, our retail corridors, the businesses need help after emerging from COVID. I'm concerned about the awnings law expiring. These individuals receive colossal fines and once it gets lifted, I'm afraid they'll have to pay these absorbing fines. And then lastly, as my colleagues also said about agency funding, um, we hope that they get adequate funding to address these quality of life issues, traffic, deal. I would love to see DOT get a curb contract which they haven't had for years. Um, so I don't know if the borough president could champion that also. Um, and, you know, sanitation, litter baskets, illegal dumping, uh, all the quality of life, graffiti, um, it's important. We, we, our offices is inundated with calls and there are quality of life issues. And we just hope that the agencies continue to respond, which they have been, but they need the money to continue. Thank you very much. I look forward to speaking with my council members and uh, congratulations to Speaker Adams on her historic election who was also one of my council members. Thank you, Mr. Borough President. Thank you to your staff for putting this together. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, James. Woo! I need a nap now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, we would now go to District Manager Karen Peterson. Good morning, Borough President Richards, members of the City Council and Community Board Chairs. My name is Karen Peterson. I'm District Manager of Community Board 10, which represents Howard Beach, South Ozone Park, parts of Ozone Park and parts of Richmond Hill. We request your support for all of CB10's capital budget priorities. Construction of new schools remains as our first capital budget priority. Every child needs and deserves a seat in a school that is not overutilized. That need is even more critical now as the pandemic has shown us that we need more space in our schools to accommodate our children safely. Providing for that needed extra space will also serve us well post pandemic to permanently have space available to lower class sizes. We also request your continued support for all our expense budget priorities. Assigning additional personnel to the 106 police precinct is our top expense budget priority as it has been for years. We have experienced increases in major felony crime during 11 of the last 20 calendar years, more years of increases in any other precinct in Southern Queens. In six of the last 10 years, also more years of increases in any other precinct in Southern Queens. And now during the latest three year period within the last five years, our crime has increased. Our crime has been growing historically. 
Our call for more officers is not just driven by the current situation in our city. Our population, both residential and ambient, continues to grow, and we need additional officers to keep pace. The rate of major felony crime in relationship to our population is also increasing, as shown in the attached, in the attached chart. Last year, we experienced the second largest increase in Southern Queens for major felony crime as it relates to our population, yet our personnel decreased this year. These increases are of great concern to our residents. We are seeing a disconcerting pattern of increases in major felony crimes against persons as opposed to property crime. We are also seeing that the present of major felony crime occurring in our precinct in relationship to crime according in Patrol Borough Queen South overall has been increasing as well in recent years. Simply, our share of Southern Queens crime is increasing each year. Addressing quality of life issues is also of major concern. Our residents believe the NCO program would help reduce common quality of life complaints if regularly assigned officers were in their neighborhoods daily. However, we continue to see increases in the number of quality of life complaints. The increases in both crime and quality of life complaints indicate that although our precinct personnel work hard to reduce them, we do not have sufficient officers to ad adequately address either. The educational needs of our children and the need to provide for public safety are paramount issues in Community Board 10. However, they are not the only priorities we urge you to fund. We also urge that you assist in moving all our other priority projects forward as they will address roadway, public safety, resiliency, sewer, and park improvements needed in our district. My comments continue in the written material you have before you. Thank you for your support. Thank you so much for your testimony. All righty. Uh, we will move on now to Community Board 11, Joe Marzaliano. You got it. Thank you, um, Borough President Richards, Deputy Borough President Young. Um, Queens Council uh, uh, elected officials um, for this opportunity to speak to you about the Community Board 11 capital and expense budget request. Community Board 11 represents the communities of Auburndale, Bayside, Douglaston, Hollis Hills, Little Neck, and, and Oakland Gardens. Our board members advocate for capital projects that will improve infrastructure and expense items to enhance the quality of life for our residents. We would appreciate your support and advocacy of our requests. Traffic safety is now our first and foremost problem. DOT has a backlog of requests for one-way street conversions, new traffic signals, all-way stops, and speed bumps. To maintain and improve traffic safety, additional engineers are needed to conduct traffic studies in order to reduce the backlog. DOT also needs more traffic maintenance personnel to reduce long work order lists. It takes about a year for speed bump installation and six months for signal and sign installations. With four major highways intersecting CB11, arterial highways are an eyesore. Additional personnel and increased frequency of cleaning is required. Our first capital priority continues to be a request to DOT to fund a widened greenway on Northern Boulevard between 223rd Street and Douglaston Parkway. After the city installed a protected bike lane on this stretch, it did not accommodate the safety and transportation needs of the community only a shared and widened pathway above the curb line will suffice. As per statistics provided by the NYPD, there have been over 200 accidents on this stretch since installation, 10 of which included bicyclists on the barrier along that stretch. DOT is amenable to the creation of Greenway to the current Jersey barrier configuration. The community board has, in, has also been advocating for over 20 years for the reconstruction of 223rd Street between 37th and 41st Avenues in Bayside. It is impossible to drive on this stretch of road without damaging your car on raised manholes and sunken roadways. An on-site inspection was conducted in the fall of 2021 by myself, along with the Borough President Special Director of Climate Change and Flood Mitigation after the recent superstorm. Now is the time for action. In the expense budget, we continue to advocate for increased funding for street tree pruning, dead tree and stump removal. The proper maintenance of street trees is a safety issue. Falling trees and limbs have created death and property damage costing the city millions of dollars in claims. This backlog has been worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic and requires more funding now. To enforce our building and zoning laws and to expedite the application and inspection process, the Queens Department of Buildings must be funded for an adequate number of fully trained plans examiners, inspectors, and community affairs staff. CB11 has a large senior population. and We also advocate for additional NORCs as well as um, uh, senior centers in our district. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Joseph. 
And we now will go to, I think we're joined by Reverend Princess, Princess Dorbs from CB12. I didn't see Yvonne on. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, good, mo good morning, um, Mr. Borough President, Donovan Riches, and to all that are on this morning. Uh, Community Board 12, our boundaries are the Van Wick Expressway West, Hillside Avenue South, Francis Lewis Boulevard, Springfield Boulevard East, and the communities of South Jamaica, South Ozone Park, Hollis, St. Albans, Adelaide Park, Rich Rochdale Village, North Springfield Gardens. In Community Board 12, we are uh, asking for support and requesting resources for a hospital. We have a number of primary care facilities, but they do not address serious health issues. Education is one of our top priorities. We have a, a great number of co-locations that exist, trailers, and there is still a lack of after school programs. Dumping is a major problem in our community district. Uh, we are requesting cameras to be installed in some of the areas and to assure that the offenders are being identified. We also need help from sanitation as well. We are requesting additional resources from New York City buildings. The buildings department needs to also be open on the weekends. Everyone seems to do a lot of moving around and illegal activity during that time. We're having a great deal of problems with single room occupancy. The foreclosures are what they are and we are asking for resources to be allocated to neighborhood housing services of Jamaica, provide them with more outreach uh, for the homeowners with the foreclosures. Flooding, we are still having groundwater issues that need to be addressed and with parks and recreation, we are in need of um, help with the homeowners being uh, charged with the trees and the, and the concrete, but these are all city items. Tree replacement is needed in Basley Park in regards to fallen trees and all the other parks. Those trees and those stumps needs to be removed and replaced with new trees. Enforcement for the 18 wheeler trucks all over the entire district. We have a traffic department. I don't know what they do, but we do have one. That needs to be investigated. Um, we have support for our cultural uh, groups that are here and we continue to increase in population as all the other community boards have already stated and I do concur and it, it needs to be repeated. We have all these agencies, but everybody's not working. Somebody needs to look, we have to look into this. Borough President, we need you to put your foot down. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reverend Thorbs, Chair Thorbs. All righty, we will move on to now Community Board 13, Mark McMillan. Good morning, Bill President, Council Members, Board Chairs, and to my colleagues. Um, board 13 serves Bel Air, Bell Rose, Cambria Heights, Floral Park, Glen Oaks, Laurelton, Meadowmere, New Hyde Park, North Shore Towers, Parkside Terrace, Queens Village, Rosedale, Springfield Gardens, Warnerville, and Wayanda. Uh, geographically, we're the largest board in Queens and the second largest in the city. Uh, this year is a special year for the city because it, it got a lot of additional money from the federal government. This is the largest city budget ever at almost $100 million. Um, so there are some things I think that can be done uh, this year that might not have been able to be done in other years. I'm just going to kind of highlight what we have here. I'm not going to read it off. Uh, one of the, the big issues that we have is, as what Reverend Forbes just talked about, is illegal truck parking, especially in two areas, one along Springfield Boulevard between 121st and 130th Avenue, and another on Hillside Avenue between Winchester Boulevard and 240th Street. The 105 summonses these vehicles and these trailers, but we still need to have, we need, we need more done, and we need to have bo booting done. You know, we need to get more boots. I know the NYPD does with their own budget what they want, but we need to have more boots allocated to, to the city and to these precincts so these guys don't just use the tickets as a, as a, a cost of doing business. Our number one priority this year was the expanding the exit on the southbound Cross Island Expressway at Hillside Avenue. Uh, UBS Arena just opened up, which has increased the volume on the Cross Island Parkway tremendously. Uh, we need to have that left turn lane expanded. There's plenty of room there. Uh, DOT can do it. It's a relatively, it shouldn't be that much of an expensive project. And it would eliminate some of the backup onto the highway from the exit that inevitably occurs. I mean, the, the the commute starts, the rush hour starts at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. It's, it's ridiculous the way it and, and it, it starts back at the uh, Northern Boulevard and it goes all the way up to the Southern State. So it's a really strong commute while wow, the time is going. The other thing we need, we need more funding to DOT to install speed humps 
and to conduct traffic mitigation studies. Um, the, the interesting thing about our district is the highways are slow and the side streets are fast. We get unending requests for speed humps. We need more funding for, we share a, a parks district with Board 11 and they need a mini dump truck and a pickup truck. We have two large parks that are heavily used and we need to get that in, in place so they can service the parks and also the, the many different uh, meetings that we have. Uh, we need more funding for tree pruning. We have a lot of trees in our community and we have one contract a year. We need to have more, more tree pruning. Um, it, it knocks down wires that are in, really important for you know, electricity, for our streaming and for our internet. And finally, we need more money for DOT to deal with the trees that uplift sidewalks. I mean, these are things that happen. It exposes homeowners to potential liability. And um, again, this is funding that should be available this year that we, we can put into the budget that can really address some of the issues that are out there. Thank you very much. And we hope to, we hope to get some of this funding in place. Thank you. And we've been joined by Council Member Brooks Powers Office. Also, um, just on the, the trucking issue, because this is a borough-wide issue, obviously, um, you know, I'm gonna propose us working with our state partners so right now, one of the issues that precludes private, because uh, you know we want we want these trucks towed, and NYPD only has so much capacity to tow them. Although we did actually, uh, before I left the council, I got the police commissioner to to uh, purchase at least one or two new trucks. But there's a state law that precludes private tow operators from towing trucks, and I feel like yes, we need the NYPD. But just as if you park on some side street, you know, perhaps a, a private tow operator could tow you, we should have that same capacity for the entire city. So that's something um, we have to figure out with our state partners because that would enable us to, to increase capacity on the heavy duty tow trucks. And quite frankly, it would be lucrative <laughs> for, I'm sure, I'm sure the private operators would love because they would make a killing off of <laughs> towing them. The other thing is um, we did work with the, uh, and this is for the council members, we were working with the prior administration, um, uh, de Blasio on um, a Queens wide, well, he was looking at the tow pound light citywide, and we really need to open up capacity for some of these lots to be able to, to tow um, these heavy duty trucks in Queens. And we have a real problem because we have a capacity issue here. Um, so the de Blasio administration was reevaluating their tow pound citywide tow pound uh, lot plan period. And we need to go back to this administration and ask either where it's at or if they're going to continue to look at it. Um, because there could be some unique opportunities to open up more capacity. Because even if the 105, for instance, Mike, wants to tow these trucks, they're towing them right outside the airport in the tow pound lot there. And they don't, they can only probably put two heavy duty trucks in there. So we, I know we have the same issue for communities abutting JFK and also LaGuardia Airport as well. Um, and it's not going to get any easier because everybody's ordering stuff online. Right, so as we see that, <laughs> we get more truck traffic. The more you order on Amazon and all these other places, we're gonna have more of that. So uh, I want us as uh, as collectively as, as boards to figure this one out uh, as well, or the dumping issue, um, you know, all of these issues are issues we hear from every board. So we look forward to working with our council partners um, and the mayor on the budget to make sure we do see those increases and including on DOT as well, which are correct, so. Thank you for your testimony. We're gonna now go to CB14, Jonathan Gaskell. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Borough President Richards and our council members, and Selvina and Joanne and are, uh, have been uh, good advocates and we wanna welcome Joanne Ariola as our new council member who have supported our budget requests in the past. I'm once again requesting that the Borough President and the city council support all of our capital expense priorities as we submitted to OMB this past fall. Just want to quickly highlight a couple of our requests. One, the funding of design and construction of the widening of Rockaway Beach Boulevard, Edgemere Avenue for the whole length from Beach 32nd Street to Beach 62nd Street. This was one of the board's conditions for approving Auburn by the Sea and the Auburn East projects. In the next three years, over 11,000 units of affordable housing will be built, yet HPD in the city has not kept its commitment to completely widen one of our only two 
uh, east-west roadways in our community. We need two lanes of traffic in each direction with turning lanes. It's a matter of safety. Two, the Arbor and Somerville neighborhood, HW 60, 631. This is a sanitary and storm sewer project that has been our top priority for almost 30 years. The last phases of this project are closest to Jamaica Bay and the neighborhood suffers from severe flood, flooding every time we have a new moon, there's a storm, an unusual amount of rain. Funding to finish this project must be put in the budget immediately. Three, we, we request a summer detail for traffic agents. We get police, but we don't get a sufficient amount of traffic agents, certainly on the weekends, but during the week. Um, we need agents in both precincts, the 100 and the 101st. Residents who get up in the morning, get in their car, and some lovely tourist will park in front of their driveway apron, and now they can't get out of their driveway to go to work. People park anywhere, bus stops, no parking zones. We need, uh, we need better there. The board requests that district-wide uh, traffic study to be done with a, an estimate of 30,000 new residents coming over the next three years and a conservative uh, estimate of 9,000 new cars. The, uh, the contention that DOT and the city has said that our roads can handle it with a few tweaks is specious at best. That's just not serious. Uh, finally, uh, while City Hall believes you can put five pounds of salami in a one pound bag, common sense dictates differently with our population increasing by almost one third, school seats, playgrounds, lack of jobs, open space, parking, flow of traffic have not been adequately addressed. The city must fund these budget uh, requests now. The city must do proactive. The city should not do what it normally does is reactive to a problem. We need money in the budget. We thank you all for your support. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, on the 32nd, uh, uh, we just had a meeting with the folks with the city and actually r and &E, So you should know that there was a $2 million allocation put in the budget for r and &E for them to study the extension, although we know we don't really need the study of the study, but we are working with Councilmember Brooks Powers and also Senator Schumer as well um, to prioritize this um, this specific road. So we did have a meeting last week, actually. Right. I mean, it's, it's, we thank you for that. It's evacuation. There's two roads in and out. This yep. one narrows. It's, it's, it's we're, we're, working on, we're working on the $40 million ads. All there right. All right. <laughs> right. All right. All righty. Um, all right. We're going to now go to community. Oh, no. Community boards were done. Oh, well, I want to thank all of you because you really, um, really, we're really doing good on time this morning. So I want to thank you all. And we obviously look forward to continued work with each and every one of you on your priorities. And uh, if you choose to stay on, obviously, um, we would appreciate it. But if you're not, if you can't, we understand it. But thank you. Uh, we look forward to working on all your priorities. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you. All right. All right. We're now going to go to the president of Queens College, Frank Wu. Good morning, friends. Borough president, uh, borough uh, vice uh, president, members of your staff, city council and your staff, uh, and all the community board chairs. My name is Frank H. Wu, and I'm proud to serve as the president of Queens College. Thank you for this opportunity. Our request is for $3.5 million of capital support for renovation of Rat House Hall, home of our drama, theater, and dance department, an acclaimed department that will be part of the new Queens College School of the Arts, QC Arts. With a celebration coming up on May 5th, QC Arts will open with 1,200 students. With our eight and a half decades serving this borough, this uh, new school, the Queens College School of the Arts uh, will be critical uh, to revitalizing the borough and for us as a civic institution and arts center for everyone. Rathaus Hall is crucial to the success of the school. Named for a German Austrian composer, Karl Rathaus, who joined our faculty after fleeing the Nazis. It's a place where students receive instruction in everything, in stagecraft such as lighting, costume design, sound, projection design, and theater technology going on to careers in directing, acting, dance, and movement. This is specialized instruction and it requires specialized facilities. We have 6,000 square feet of old classrooms, 
What we want to do is to prepare the classrooms that our students need with a curriculum rooted in anti-racism, social awareness, critical engagement, and creative freedom on a campus where students speak 110 languages, trace their heritage to 133 nations. This is ideally suited to promote diversity in the arts. You'll have the opportunity when we celebrate on May 5th to tour our exquisite Lefrac concert hall with its restored the Godwin Turnback Museum, the only art museum in the community system, and our studios. And at that time, you'll have the chance to visit Bat House Hall, where you'll see exactly why we're requesting $3.5 million in capital support. We asked the borough president to provide 50%, and the Queen's delegation and individual city council members cover the remaining 50 for a total of $3.5 million. 1.75 from the borough president, 1.75 from the Queen's delegation. In October, we'll mark our 85th anniversary at the heart of the world's borough, serving talented students of every conceivable background, and arts has always been at the heart of what Queens College does. With the opening of the Queens College School of the Arts, we will be poised to better serve our students, and Rat House Hall is where they learn and put all of their talents to use. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Wu. All righty, we're now going to move on to hear from President Bernicia Eanes, York College President. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Borough President, York City Council members and members of Queens Borough Board, I am Bernicia Johnson Eanes, President of York College in the heart of Jamaica, Queens. Thank you, Borough President, and the members of City Council for the support you have given York College in the past and for providing the virtual hearing where we're gonna publicly articulate our needs for the upcoming year. Here at York College, we're helping students actualize their dreams and visions in a way that is transformative to their families and their communities. We are ranked number 11 in social mobility and tied to 19, tied to number 19 for top public schools in the US in World Report 2022. Located in the most ethnically diverse borough of the city of New York, the students reflect the diversity in which we come. 36.3 identifying as Black and African American, 26.3 Hispanic and Latino, 23.3 Asian, 45% are born outside the mainland US, and 61% of our, our first generation to graduate from college. We remain steadfast in our commitment to foster the culture of student success with the support of the faculty and the staff. Your college cannot do that without the deeply rooted partnership with local community and with our local electeds, and we're proud of this history. On December 3rd, 2021, many of you joined us at York College for the historic ribbon cutting and celebration for the complete completion of seven capital projects, which included our faculty dining room, large lecture halls, elevators, escalators, biology, chemistry labs. My request this year's focus is on the following for York College, the tennis courts and field house, restrooms renovation and guard booths. The project will remove the cracking and depression and puddling in our health and physical education outdoor tennis court area. The surface has become a trip hazard and impacts playing for the student athletes for it to be inappropriate for them to be there. In addition, the existing restrooms at the HPEC field house building adjacent to the courts, these improvements will boost the tennis program at York College and put us in a position to help the community. Our funding request is 1,750,000. The other request is a keyless card entry system. In line with the campus mission to provide a safe and enriching environment, your college is transitioning into a faster, more appropriate way for people to come on campus. The purchase of this system includes the remote management and all those things that go with it. The request is 1,500,000. Total Reso A request is 3,250,000. On behalf of the students, faculty, and staff of your college, I want to thank you each for considering this during this these challenging times. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you for moving those projects. Your thank college you. is moving. It's great to be at the uh, ribbon cuttings. I keep the good work. All righty, we're now going to go to, and I love ribbon cuttings for everybody testifying. Ribbon cuttings, groundbreakings. We want to move projects. We just don't want to give money. <laughs> All right, we're gonna now head to the deputy borough president is laughing because she 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 knows that's that's what we're all about here, building institutions. We're gonna now move to Charles Petz, Queensboro Community College. Good morning. 
My name is Stephen DiDio. Um, I'm the Vice President for Queensborough Community College, and I come to you today on behalf of our college president, Dr. Christine Mangino. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, members of the council and the community board. I sincerely appreciate the capital funding and tireless support that you have provided over the years, including uh, your recent support of phase one of our ADA accessibility project. As you probably know, our campus was built more than 60 years ago for approximately 5,000 degree seeking students, and today serves more than twice that number, plus an additional 10,000 students in our continuing education and workforce development programs. More than half of these students are the first in their families to go to college. All of them reflect the diversity of our great borough, and they are in need of your support. In fact, more than 50% report a household income of less than $30,000 a year. We proudly serve as a gateway to the middle class and nearly 90% of our graduates continue their studies at a four-year college. We also welcome 100,000 visitors annually who attend our three acclaimed cultural centers. For these reasons and more, Queensboro was recently named as an Aspen Institute Prize finalist which is the nation's signature recognition, or as President Obama has called it, the Oscars for great community colleges. We want Queensborough's remarkable achievements reflected in all aspects of our college, including our facilities, which of our 14 buildings and a million square feet, our newest is more than 50 years old. Today, I come to you to ask for your support for ResoA capital funding projects with the New York City Council. All projects are eligible for matching funds from the state. Our RFK uh, gymnasium and locker rooms built in 1967 are in need of serious repair. The reconfiguration would allow them to be ADA and will enhance privacy to meet Title IX requirements. It will cost $3.1 million to ensure that the upgrades are completed on behalf of our students and the broader Queens community who also utilize this space. Additionally, we are asking for $2 million to continue to fulfill our commitment to ADA accessibility through phase two of our campus restroom upgrade projects. And finally, our campus is in desperate need of a backflow prevention system where Queensboro connects to the New York City water system as required by the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. The system prevents contaminated water and chemicals from flowing back into public water drinking, uh, public drinking water. Therefore, I'm requesting your support for 800,000 to help us build this new system in support of the health and safety of our Queens community. Colleagues, we are grateful for your consistent support of community in Queensboro on behalf <laughs> Thank you. And uh, when you hear the first ring, that's just uh, letting you know you hit the two minute mark. All right. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And thank you for the great work. Uh, all right. We're going to go to Ms. Spagic, LaGu LaGuardia Community College. Liodmila. I didn't want to mess up the. Liodmila. Uh, uh, I'm uh, doing the presentation. Oh, you're going to uh, do it. Pre okay, got it. Okay. Shire. Okay. Good morning, Queensborough President Donovan Richards, council members, community board leaders, and distinguished guests. On behalf of Kenneth Adams, president of LaGuardia Community College, I'm Shahir Elfan, vice president of administration at LaGuardia. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify on behalf of the college regarding our capital request for $5 million in city funding for the workforce development training facility. At LaGuardia Community College, we serve nearly 30,000 students annually. Our students come to learn and build skills in short-term programs that lead to certification and jobs in high-demand areas, including plumbing, HVAC installation, and other operating energy management systems. Other Others attempt LaGuardia Community College to earn college degrees in fields such as industrial design, mechanical and electrical engineering, and energy technology. A recent study by Stanford University noted that LaGuardia ranked fifth among all US two-year colleges in providing economic mobility to our students. Let me share the story of one of our students, Nicholas Ortiz. Nicholas Ortiz is a 34-year-old uh, student born and raised in Astoria before enrolling at LaGuardia Electrical One program, 
training program. Nicholas worked in a retail store, paying him $19 per hour. He came to LaGuardia with a scholarship that covered 80% of his tuition, and uh, only he had to put $385 for the electrical course. He finished in May 2021 and landed a job with same pay at Sol Solanta Solar, but also helped them with experience. And now he works at Runwise based in Bronx as an assistant electrician in a boiler room making $25 per hour. In a few months, he will become a member of the union, Steam Fitter 638. Getting better pay, stable union job has been Nicholas's goal, one of which LaGuardia has helped him to achieve. There are countless of stories like Nicholas. We are constrained in our offering because while students demand is high, uh, our available training space is limited in order to serve more students and to provide our students access to advanced equipment and technology, we need to update, build, uh, update and build a new workforce development space. To address this disparity between the demand of workforce development programs and available space, we're requesting $5 million in capital funding uh, from New York City Council, uh, Queens delegation, three million. Should I com complete it? Yes, yes, you can finish. And the borough president's two million dollars to convert obsolete classrooms and offices, approximately ten thousand square feet, into training spaces to allow hands-on education and skills building in this field. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Shahir. All righty, we now will go to Neil Moore. Uh, New York City Health and Hospitals, Queens. Good morning, uh, Queens Borough President Donovan Richards. Uh, I'm Neil Moore, the Chief Executive Officer of New York City Health and Hospital, Queens, an essential safety net whose mission is to provide the residents of the most diverse and fastest growing borough in our city with access to safe, affordable and high quality medical care. I'm pleased to have an opportunity to testify at today's hearing. And I thank you, Borough President and the entire Queens delegation for allowing me to speak about the critical role Queens Hospital plays in ensuring access to healthcare for the residents of Queens. I'm here today to speak briefly about how two major infrastructure projects that are connected to our efforts to essentially reimagine Queens Hospital in light of the catastrophic pandemic and its aftermath, including addressing the long haulers and the impact it has had on mental health. Bridging the gap in meeting the needs of our community is imperative. Healthcare access is generally defined as the opportunity to use appropriate services in proportion to the healthcare needs of the community. However, Access to care is often limited by long-standing racial and socioeconomic disparities, and the pandemic has served to further expose a worsening access crisis. On top of that, our borough continues to suffer from the aftershock of a condition I'll refer to as a closure crisis, the shuttering of several hospitals that began in 2008 and the loss of hundreds of hospital beds and the loss of too many lives. As a result, the borough of Queens now has the least beds per capita than any borough in the city. During that time, visits to our hospital room increased by over 100, with visits skyrocketing to 100,000 a year, instead of the 50,000 visits that the emergency room was originally designated to accommodate. Thankfully, borough president's office and members of the Queens delegation provided our hospital with the funds needed to renovate and expand the hospital's emergency room. This decision saved countless lives, especially when you realize that the renovations were completed only a few short months before the start of the pandemic. The members of our delegations responded to the needs of our community then and we, then, and we are confident you will be there for the hospital and our patient once again. To better meet the needs of our community, we are requesting funds to create an additional 20,000 square feet of much needed ambulatory care space. The first project entails adding two floors to our hospital pavilion, and the second project will create even more medical space 
by repurposing an old unused swimming pool. I just want to thank you, Borough President, for giving us the opportunity to uh, present to you today. Thank you. Uh, just go through, what was your total ask again? The, to the total ask was for two, uh, for two floors and a swimming pool is in around $60 million. $60 million. okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna now go to Helen Bartiega, uh, Elmhurst, Queens. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone's having a great morning. Thank you so much for our President Donovan and our beloved city council members that are online. My name is Helen Arteaga. I'm the proud and humble CEO at Elmer's Hospital, which is part of Health and Hospital Health System, which is the largest public health system in the nation. Um, a little bit about Elmer's, we're 4,500 strong. We do 1.1 million visits for our president. That means we see one in every other adult in the borough of Queens. Um, fun fact, we speak more languages than Google. Google only speaks 109, Elmer's Hospital speaks 125. That represents 93 different cultures and religions. And just to make things even more fun, this year in October, we'll be celebrating 190 years of serving the city of New York. So hence, our ask is a little big, but it's important. I really wanna thank you for the support you gave us last year. We were able to increase our ICU beds and um, our ORs that we are currently in construction and we're gonna see you guys come over and take some pictures. Um, it's not a ribbon cutting because you know, ORs are a little unique, um, but we're definitely looking forward for demolition pictures. Um, our FY23 ask is a little big because last year we focused on what do we need to make sure that we are ready to face the next pandemic or the next wave of COVID, which the funding really did help us because as you guys know, Omicron beat us hard and Elmer's Hospital once again was the epicenter of the epicenter, along with my brother, CEO from Queens. Um, so that infrastructure money that you gave us last year was super helpful to fill in the gaps for Omicron. This year, our ask is focused on health disparities. We really wanna focus on women's health. We wanna work on our HIV TB patients and we wanna work on a green project. So our first ask is $50 million for our women's pavilion. Currently, we're 51% of the population, and we do not have a public system that has a full service for women's health care, starting from the beginning of pre-adolescence, when a young lady gets her menstrual cycle, all the way to post-menopause. We do not have that here in the borough of Queens. We also, in our beloved current women's building that we have, doesn't connect to the hospital. So God forbid there is a, an emergency or a woman goes into labor, the women's pavilion is not able to send the patient straight into Elmer's. So this funding will create not only three additional floors, but create a bridge to the main hospital where if a woman or an, a woman in healthcare in a crisis, will not, we won't have to call EMS to drive half a block to the emergency room, but this will create a pathway straight into the hospital and give her access to healthcare sooner than possible. Our HIV TB clinic ask is $6 million to renovate that clinic. It's super important we serve 3,700 patients there. We service more than the HIV TB clinic on Junction Boulevard. And our indicators are over, our vital load suppression rate is over 94%. We are the highest, not only in Queens, but in New York City. And our last ask is to fix our outside doors. Currently the entry doors of both sides of Elmer's on the H building and on the Broadway side are old, they're not efficient. And being green myself, one of the major things that I'm trying to do for this hospital is to make sure we reduce our carbon footprint. And this ask is about $5 million. But more important, I think the hospital deserves a new look, a new refresh. I want our patients to feel the 1.1 million that walked through our doors, plus our 4,500 employees, that when they walk through our buildings, they feel the support and the expertise that are on within these walls. I know our ask is big, but like if COVID has taught us anything, Without good health care, our community cannot strive to be a better community. So I hope you support our ask. To all our hospitals, their ask yes. is not too big. You know, yes. we should aim to, and it's a conversation I had with the governor uh, just last week in Queens, um, you know, really needing to see that investment 
uh, in healthcare in a big way. Um, so we look forward to, to working with you and God willing, knock on wood, we'll have some good news soon. So, uh, so thank you and thank you all for no, the work. Thank you. Time. All right. We're going to go to now Mount Sinai, Queen. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Mount Sinai, Queens, Carmen, Dr. Uh, Cameron Hernandez. Good morning, Borough President. Good morning, Delegation. I'm Cameron Hernandez, the Executive Director of Mount Sinai, Queens for the past year. Um, I want to thank you for taking the opportunity to listen to our ask for today. Um, Borough President, I'm welcome to have you out for another ribbon cutting like we had with the Infusion Center, um, hopefully with this new project. Um, Mount Sinai Queens continues to expand into Queens um, and do uh, with the new uh, stroke center, with the new ambulatory center, uh, with new operating rooms in our new, in the 2016 building. On the top of that 2016 building, there is currently a shell and the idea is to build out a 22 bedded ICU, which would be uh, a net of around 16 beds, new ICU beds for the borough of Queens. We would, um, we are asking the total cost of the, of the project is, is $25 million. Of that, we're asking the borough president for 5 million and the city council for another 5 million to build out those 20 and the Mount Sinai health system will um, do the rest of the uh, lift in terms of the cost of the ICU. With these 22 beds, we will be able to support our new catheterization lab, which is opening up in a month uh, for any of those patients who come in right now. About 150 patients come in with gripping chest pain and end up having a heart attack here. We actually have to transport them out to Mount Sinai Hospital. They will now be able to stay in our own borough and be taken care of here at Mount Sinai Queens. And if they need ICU level care, they'll be able to stay in the new ICU. We also are bringing in a new neurosurgeon um, and the new neurosurgeon will be able to do their, all their complex surgeries here at Mount Sinai Queens with the support of the ICU. We continue to, the way that these small community hospitals uh, survive is to basically have complex care here within your hospital and that it needs to be supported by I the ICU. So the goal is really to keep patients here in, in the borough. Uh, we really realized this during the uh, last few surges where patients were foregoing their treatments because they had to go into, Mount, uh, into Manhattan. So again, we want to make Mount Sinai Queens a destination and not a pit stop for Manhattan. And the way that we do that is to support our hospital as well as our community with these ICU beds. So once again, I want to thank you for your time. And the, uh, again, the ask is for $5 million from the borough president's office, as well as another $5 million for the city council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we're going to now go to Renee hassock Motes, uh, St. John's out of the Rockaways. Good morning, Borough President Richard, City Council members, and the entire Borough Board Committee. On behalf of St. John's Episcopal Hospital, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come before you to make this request. As you know, St. John's is the only hospital providing emergency and ambulatory care to the densely populated, culturally and economically diverse communities of the Rockaway Peninsula. The catchment area consists of 125,622 individuals. Today, we are respectfully requesting $740,401 for the purchase of 16 critical care beds, 14 which are standard, two which are bariatric, and one C-arm for its operating room. The new critical care beds will replace existing Straker Go two beds that are over 12 years old, which lack crucial functions and are not up to current standards for pressure injuries. The new critical care beds will support faster recovery and help medical staff provide the most effective care possible. The beds include rotation and microclimate surface to prevent pressure ulcers and maintain skin integrity, percussion vibration to mobilize respiratory secretions and prevent lung collapse, adjustment into chair position to provide early movement to mobilize respiratory secretions and prevent deconditioning. The new C-arm will replace a GEOEC 9800 C-arm that is 19 years old and is not on par with current standards. For example, the current C-arm does not provide high resolution X-ray images in real time. The new C-arm will, thus allowing physician and surgeons to monitor progress and immediately make corrections. 
The C-arm is a mobile imaging unit used primarily for fluoroscopic imaging during surgical and orthopedic procedures. It has a computer workstation used to view, manipulate, and store the images. It is the current standard of care and has been proven to greatly improve patient outcomes. Both systems are standalone pieces of equipment and are able to move freely throughout the units as needed. Thus, they will be minimally attached to real property. St. John's Episcopal Hospital's ICU, CCU, and operating rooms serves the city's general public by treating people with life-threatening injuries and illnesses and performing surgery. Thank you again for the opportunity to come before you with this request, and we look forward to a positive result. And you said 740, that's going to get you your replacing beds or additional beds? So the $740, um, $401 is going to get the 16 critical care beds okay. and also the C-arm. It's a combined okay. cost. Okay. Any update on the um, maternity ward? Where are we at there? So we have to maintain the ability to continue to do surgeries um, and deliveries while doing renovations. So when the teaching center is completed, which we had some issues with the construction um, contractor, that has held up the movement of labor and delivery. So once that's rectified, we can begin the renovations for labor and delivery. Perfect. All righty. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, uh, we're now going to hear from, I think, uh, this individual uh, is doing both hospitals, uh, Jamaica Hospital and Flushing Hospital, Sabia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for giving us this opportunity today. Uh, but before I make my request, I do want to share some good news with you. Third year in a row, Jamaica Hospital was nominated amongst the top 250 hospitals in the country, which really puts us in the top 5% of the hospitals in the country for quality. And we are extremely proud of the care that our team is providing to our patient population here in Queens. Jamaica Hospital aspires to offer the latest technology to the residents of its service area, a significant number of whom are members of racial and ethnic minority groups, and many are underserved. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw the critical role that Jamaica Hospital played for this community. We would be grateful for your support to fund the acquisition of some critical equipment. We are requesting $3.7 million for replacement of our current 1.5 Tesla MRI and, added in, and to add a second three Tesla MRI. Currently, our radiology department performs 4,000 MRI scans annually. With the two scanners, our volume can go up to 600,000. Trauma, stroke, and other emergency cases account for most of our current MRIs. We would like to provide MRIs also for breast MRI and uh, advanced oncological diagnostic MR imaging of the prostate. The new M3 Tesla MRI will also help us with more advanced neurological scanning. We are, we are planning to become a comprehensive stroke center, and for that, this 3T MRI would be significantly uh, important. Uh, in addition, in the post-COVID world that we live, the, the time it takes to clean the unit between patients is really adding to the time and cutting on the number of exams we are doing per day, which increases wait time for patients. To have the two MRIs will be significantly important and helpful for us. In addition to that, we are requesting $252,228 for four new anesthesia machines and $250,906,000 for four uh, patient monitoring systems. This year, we are planning to add four more operating rooms to our hospital. Our emergency room is one of the busiest emergency rooms in the country. We are the busiest level one trauma center. So we are in dire need of uh, increasing our OR capacity. In addition, over the last several years, we have also uh, um, hired new uh, subspecialty surgeons, neurosurgeons, vascular surgeons, ENT surgeons. We know how difficult it is for our patients to get advanced surgical care outside of Queens. So we want them to stay within our hospital. So we are increasing our hospital surgical uh, OR capacity by four and these anesthesia machines and uh, the monitoring systems will help us in those four new um, uh, operating rooms. Thank you. I want to thank you for your time and consideration of these requests. Thank you so much. And I'm a, I'm a Jamaica hospital baby. So we know that. We are proud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. All righty. Next, we're going so go to go to St. Mary's hospital. Oh, oh uh, yes. Oh, you, so, got, you have to do uh, flushing now. Flushing. Yes. 
And thank you again for your time. So as you know, Flushing Hospital serves a densely populated, ethnically and racially diverse community with many indigenous and underserved residents who would benefit greatly from access to the latest and most accurate technology. So for Flushing, we're requesting a replacement of our fluoroscopy system, which is uh, 532,000. Uh, the one uh, digital room that we have uh, for fluoroscopy in the department is 10 years old. The new technology will uh, help us improve the uh, resolution of the unit as well as cut down the radiation dose that our patients will, will um, get. Uh, in addition, we are requesting $309,310 for a new Cepheid testing analyzer. This is uh, used, utilizes PCR technology to provide test results in about 45 minutes. It is very versatile unit. Not only can we do COVID testing, we can do testing for all other uh, flu, RSV, C. difficile, strep A, strep B. So all these tests are time sensitive and essential for our institution. We are also requesting re uh, replacement of our uh, GE um, C arms, which are used in the OR. That's a, uh, that number is $401,615 and the current units are 10 years old. The resolution on those units is not as good and the radiation dose that our patients are receiving is also higher. So this new, these new units will really be essential for um, making the patient uh, experience better. The radiation dose is less and the resolution is more. I would also like to give an update on some of the last previous projects. Last year, we had funded our mammography unit. So we are very happy to now say that we are providing the latest cutting edge 3D mammography for our patients, both on the Jamaica campus and on the Flushing campus. You also had funded our ultrasounds, which are again state of the art. So we really are very pleased that we can provide high quality imaging in our departments. I would also like to make note that uh, uh, the last I checked, Radio Flushing and Jamaica were the only two hospitals in schooling that had diagnostic imaging centers of excellence designation from the American College of Radiology. And thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony. All righty, we're going to now uh, go to St. Mary's Hospital for Children, Sean Laley. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Borough President Richards. And thank you to the members of the City Council. Appreciate taking the time to hear our testimony today. Additionally, I, I want to thank Borough President, his staff, and the staff of so many of our elected officials for their tireless support as we navigated the pandemic. It meant a great deal to us and our staff, and we're truly appreciative. So thank you. Founded in 1870, St. Mary's Hospital for Children has been serving New York's sickest and most vulnerable children for over 150 years. Our skilled nursing facility in Bayside, Queens, remains the only post-acute children's hospital in all of New York City. Each year, hundreds of medically fragile children from throughout the five boroughs come here to receive the long-term care they so desperately need. Approximately 90% of our pediatric population comes from economically disadvantaged families. Over the past several years, through the critical support we've received from the borough president and city council, St. Mary's has been able to continuously advance the quality of care and services we provide, ensuring that every one of our patients gets uncompromised access to the best care possible, regardless of a family's ability to pay. One of the most critical roles here at St. Mary's is that of the pediatric skilled nurse. Presently, our staff includes approximately 200 skilled pediatric nurses, all of whom are dedicated to ensuring the health and well-being of our medically fragile children, and all of whom are absolutely heroes after the service they provided over the past two years of the pandemic. Because of the severity of our patients' conditions, it is absolutely essential that our nurses are as prepared as possible to respond to sudden dramatic complications in a child's health, such as cardiopulmonary arrest or a need for emergency insertion care. To this end, we are respectfully requesting funds to support the purchase of two advanced simulation devices, which will be using the critical training of our facility's nursing team to respond to emergency circumstances such as this. Secondly, another critical role here at the hospital is that of our rehabilitation therapists. Here at St. Mary's, our inpatient and outpatient population includes New York City children with major mobility challenges, such as spinal cord injury, developmental disabilities, and many other special health care needs that require intensive daily physical rehabilitation for a child to achieve maximum comfort and mobility. In recent years, with the help of highly advanced data support from folks like you, our rehab therapists have had many wonderful patient success stories, such as kids with spinal cord paralysis regaining lost mobility to a degree no one would have thought possible before. By supporting the purchase of a zero-G gait and balance system, we would enable our organization to dramatically increase the types of rehabilitation activities our team is able to conduct with the children in our care, helping these kids regain lost mobility, learn to manage their conditions, and achieve a greater quality of life. So in sum, thank you so much for everything you guys have done for us over the past couple of years. 
And I want to encourage everybody to come out and visit us here as the hopefully reach the last stage of the pandemic. We'd love to welcome you in person and show you the wonderful kids that you guys are helping support. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I think I did tour your facility. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just so grateful for the work that you all do uh, each and every day. God bless you. Thank you. Support. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we've been joined by Speaker Adams. So just want to acknowledge her. Uh, we now we'll go to, she's the one who wants to give remarks. Of course she can, whenever left, but she's busy. Uh, we now will go to Barbara Pergoski from uh, Musica Regine Production, Regine Productions. Forgive me if I chop that up. Musica Regine Productions, Barbara Pergoski. Good morning, everyone. It's Barbara Podgorski. You did a great job. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry I have getting over a bad cold. I hope I'm in the right place because I represent a, a cultural organization here in Queens. Uh, our office is here in Maspeth and our, our home base is in Forest Hill slash Kew Gardens. Um, and we are now in our 22nd season. We're actually asking for a very modest amount of money. And I thought this was the best way to get our message across having everyone in one room. Um, we offer something very unique to the community. Uh, and our mission is basically to build community by sharing the cultural arts with um, underserved areas of Queens. We have been uh, mostly for the last 21, 22 seasons, um, having a base of Flushing and Forest Hills. Now we're mostly in Forest Hills, which is a little bit more affluent neighborhood here um, not particularly underserved because the people do have access to be able to go out to the city and go to concerts. What, what we have been doing is bringing internationally acclaimed artists um, right to our home base in Queens so that people don't have to go very far. Uh, we do our best to feature musicians and composers from Queens, from New York City. I just did a whole concert series uh, last weekend uh, focusing on female composers and composing from a female perspective. Why I'm speaking to you today is for the past five years, we've created a unique program that's free and just for our smallest members of the community, for the children. And these are interactive concerts for the kids that are shorter in length so that they could come and be themselves uh, and not have to sit through a full length uh, program. We're all trained uh, through Lincoln Center Education at Juilliard um, in a certain philosophy that works also with the Board of Education with carefully curated scaffolded uh, lesson plans for the kids that will relate to what they do in school. What I do, uh, we do them at venues where the families can come. We don't necessarily go into the schools, but we have recently been with extra funding going into some universal pre-K to see our smallest members. And sometimes it's it's their only um, opportunity to, to see live music and to get really excited. So what I have to say to you today, we're actually only asking for $10,000, which will be able to provide about 10 programs to more underserved areas of Queens, not just Forest Hills, which we already do. Um, uh, it, would, it would be very, very valuable. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought when the bell went off. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I don't feel very well today. Um, but yeah, no, we would like to branch out very much so, and I thought that this would be a great opportunity. Great, thank you. And I also would encourage you, um, so uh, my cultural affairs director is Phil Bowman, um, and I would urge you to also, uh, if we can make sure Deputy uh, BP and Michael that we uh, connect her with Phil. Wonderful. Thank you. So I, right. I think I've emailed with Phil. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. All righty. Uh, next, we're going to go to Sylvia Sewell Ramsawak, Serious Fun After School Incorporated. You did very well with that. Thank you. Um, that <laughs> double barreled name this morning. Good morning. Um, I, I, I too, uh, hope I'm in the right place. It was such a, a wonderful uh, group of people doing such great work um, as in hospitals. Um, I'm with Serious Fun After School Inc. 
We're a nonprofit organization. Our vision is to provide New York City children the opportunity to explore their inner artists, to create a kinder, more empathetic world. We were founded in 2008. We provide child care programs in six green schools um, where the children get arts enrichment as part of a, a fully licensed uh, child care wraparound program. Um, during the pandemic, we actually unfortunately had to we had to convert everything to a virtual program. We are funded with Compass for our summer um, musical program, which is where children write the music, they write the script, they um, perform the dances, they build the sets and put on a musical over six weeks at one of our local school in Queens. And we've been very grateful to the Department of Youth and Community Development for that. We currently get $14,000 for a grant for the Green Initiative, um, where we are teaching our children about upcycling and recycling and composting, organic gardening and cooking. Our schools are mainly um, Title I. We are in Astoria, Long Island City. We're also in Sunnyside and Woodside. Uh, this year, once we were able to come back into um, in-person uh, providing services, we reached out to Dr. Compasso's office in District 30, uh, School District 30, and um, targeted two new schools that needed free childcare. We've been very lucky to get the childcare stabilization grants. Um, we understand that these funds are not to be used for um, for staffing purposes. So uh, we also have a, what is a modest ask of, of 10,000 to support our supplies across the six sites. But um, you know, the sky's the limit if, if there was, uh, we're also applying for the um, child care desert grants to try to create child care slots for children under five. Um, but if we could have the 10,000, that would go a long way in just supporting our major costs, obviously, are people. And we increased everyone's uh, salary and uh, hourly wage for all of our positions up 28% to just recognize the uh, hard work that our people do and try to provide a living wage and um, benefits. So any, if we could get support in some of those other non-staff costs, it would do so much to help us just continue to offer more services. Thank you. And, where, thank you, where did you and where did you say your organization is based at? We're based in Queens. Well, in, LIC, um, in LIC, you said, right? Yes, our we uh, our office is in LIC, but we're on site in public schools. So oh, we're so in Astoria, Long Island City, Woody, Woodside, and Sunnyside. PS uh, 150, PS 84, PS 76, PS 166, um, PS 17. Have I hit them all? All right, great, and it's good to see. I I founded the Greener NYC initiative. If that's the initiative you were talking about in the council, so that was. Oh, awesome. thank you. It's been this is our <laughs> great. This to is see our the working. <laughs> yeah, it's our fifth year. Um, wow. And part, well, we've applied for hopefully our fifth year for next year, but it's been wonderful for us and the right. kids, especially virtually. We were able to provide stuff for kids with that. So thank you so much. Oh, great, 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 great to see it still going. All righty. All right, thank you for your work and testimony. All right, we're now gonna go back to hospitals. I think we're joined by Carrie Harewood, uh, NYC h, h Gotham Healthcare Queens. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you this morning. My name is Carrie Harewood and I'm Regional Administrator for Gotham Health in Queens and Staten Island. Um, this morning, we wanted to just touch base with you briefly because we had put in a request for an ear handling unit in the amount of $2 million. Um, for those of you who may not be very well versed with uh, New York City Health and Hospitals, of course, it's the largest public health care system in the country. Um, Gotham Health is this ambulatory arm, and we have about eight locations here in Queens. Um, where we try to deliver high quality healthcare services with compassion, dignity, and respect to all New Yorkers without exception, or regardless of their ability to pay for these services. Uh, we facilitate getting folks enrolled in various insurance plans or NYC care for those who may have, uh, may not qualify for um, insurance plans. Uh, our staffing is reflective of the community and many of our staff reside locally and understand the community that we serve. We speak many various languages um, and the Springfield Garden site, for which this particular um, ask is for, 
It's been open for 23 years and it's located in the Springfield Gardens Stop and Shop Mall, right there on the intersection of Springfield Boulevard and Merrick Boulevard. Um, it's actually our busiest site in Queens and it continues to grow. Uh, we actually have doubled our visit volume within the past five years. Um, you know, and we provide services right now for pediatrics, women's health, adult primary care, family planning, as well as pharmacy services. And so what we are asking for is the $2 million to replace our air handling unit. Uh, the unit that we have right now is over 20 years old, malfunctions constantly and interferes with clinic operations. Over the past uh, year, we've had to relocate, close the practice and relocate it three different times uh, because of issues with this air handling unit. Um, so we've really been struggling with that. And when it's not malfunctioning, it's uh, you know not providing heat or not providing um, cooling, it's causing floods because we it, it freezes over and then ends up flooding the uh, the practice, which then presents a dangerous situation, not only for patients, but also for staff. Um, so we really need a new unit so that we will be able to continue our clinical operation uninterrupted and that patients can continue to access care at this location. And so that's really what we're asking for this morning. Wow. You know, I pass by all the time. I didn't realize. Um, I actually just the other day saw the, the h and eight sign in there. Yes, um, that's amazing. I think, yeah, I think there was a groundbreaking when I was a staffer in the city council for it, but I'm glad that y'all are reaching out. I would love to come in also. Uh, oh, we would call. love to have you. We would love to have you. All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you for your ask. All right. We're now going to go to Sami Shumais from the Flushing Town Hall. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Great. Uh, Hello, uh, Donovan, for president. Nice to see you and some of your staff. Um, and thanks to you and to everyone at the uh, Borough Board for the opportunity to testify. Um, as many of you know, I'm Sammy Bouchemais, Deputy Director of Flushing Town Hall. And for the past 43 years, Flushing Town Hall has served the people of Queens and New York City with extraordinarily diverse arts programs, celebrating the rich cultural heritage of the immigrants of Queens and uh, all over New York City. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we served around 72,000, including 31,000 through our education programs, um, school students and seniors and, and so on. Um, in fiscal 21, the year we were mostly virtual, we served about 51,000 mostly online programs uh, because we resumed our online programs in June of last year. Uh, calendar year 2022 this year marks the 160th anniversary of Flushing Town of the Flushing Town Hall building. Uh, the cornerstone was laid on June 7th, 1862, and we'll be celebrating that with our annual gala on June 9th. We hope to see you all there. So a little bit about us. After consulting with the Department of Cultural Affairs, we are not putting in a capital request this cycle. So we have three projects, elevator mechanicals overhaul, HVAC project and restroom renovations project, all of which are fully funded. I've put some of the detail in the written testimony, but elevator mechanicals and HVAC are both moving this year. Um, uh, HVAC just moved to design phase. It just kicked off design a, a week or two ago. Elevators is supposed to do construction later this year. Uh, and if there are any funding shortfalls, that's going to be taken from the restrooms project. So again, after talking with DCLA, we're not going to put in a request. If they think that there are more shortfalls, we'll then make the request next year. Um, as for expense requests, we're putting individual expense requests to all the city council offices, and we'll reach out to you on uh, meetings to discuss. Uh, but our general message to the whole Queen's delegation is that uh, in the fiscal 23 um, adopt, uh, preliminary budget, we're, we, Flushing Town Hall, would take a cut of $400,000 in our operating support um, because most of our funding is not baseline. So we're asking the council uh, to really advocate strongly for the restoration of the 20, 20 million put in the uh, budget last year at adoption and to fight for more funding overall for the cultural sector. That's really our, our main request to everybody. So thanks very much for your time. Thank you, and we look forward to working with the council on it. Thank you for your work. 
All righty. We're now going to go to Leonard Jacobs, uh, J-Cal. All right, BP, he's actually not here right now. Okay. Uh, okay. I think we see, I see Maureen, I think. Queens Museum is on. But Sally, I saw. I saw oh, it's I, me. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, thank you, Borough President Richards, for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Sally Talent, President and Executive Director of the Queens Museum. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to you, Borough President, and your amazing staff for your unprecedented support of the Queen's Museum over this past year. You visited us so many times uh, on occasions during the pandemic and helped to lift our spirits, including recognising the Cultural Food Pantry volunteers on their Volunteer Appreciation Day. We've actually committed to continuing the Cultural Food Pantry and deepening that offer to the community over the coming two years, since it's so needed. Um, of course, uh, we want to recognize your generosity in a donation of 4 million in capital funds to support the borough's first ever intergenerational multilingual family learning center rooted in arts and culture, i.e. the Queen's Children's Museum that we are um, ever optimistic about. Um, we are in our 50th anniversary this year and we have a really exciting program. We're opening our spring exhibitions on Sunday, March 13th, and we invite all of you to our first public opening in two years. Please join us. Um, and together with Delta Airlines, we've recently announced um, six new permanent public artworks that will welcome travelers to Delta's amazing new terminal at LaGuardia Airport. Um, these are extraordinary works by six New York City based artists and we're really proud to have been the commissioning partner for that project. We're launching uh, a new uh, accessible website and refreshed brand that you will see rolling out in the coming months. And we're extending and expanding our cultural food pantry offer um, so that we can offer not just food and resources, but also um, really deep collaboration and art experiences for all of our um, neighbors who, who come every week and spend time with us in the museum. Um, we will, um, we're beginning our capital project design phase and we'll continue to work with local partners, including elementary and high schools across the borough, Queen's Community House, Common Point Queen's, Queen's College and Queen's Community College. And finally, this spring, we're launching our um, Young Leaders Art and Social Justice Institute. The goals of this program will be to nurture thoughtful, independent young artists and leaders in, in arts, culture and social change. And we have two requests before the borough president for the fiscal year 2023. The first is a 15,000 discretionary request to expand our education programming borough wide and get it back up and running fully. This includes the Young Leaders Art and Social Justice Institute, which will provide a series of art and cultural sessions um, for Queen's teens. And the second is a 1 million in capital funds for the inevitable cost escalations uh, associated with this project. This is part of a 3 million request in FY23 one million to LA and one million to the city council. Thank you for this opportunity um, and it's lovely to see you. Thank you, Sally and Deborah, for uh, all the work that uh, you've done and for truly being a community partner and opening your doors up. Um, you did extraordinary work uh, during this pandemic and want to thank you for your sacrifice and look forward to the continued work on uh, building out that museum. So, so thank you for your work. Thank you for your testimony. All righty, we're now go to, and we're gonna hop around a little bit uh, just for the community board members and council members offices represented. We're doing so good on time that we can hop around a little bit. So I wanna thank everybody for staying on task. And once again, thank the staff for this great blue sky timer, which has worked extraordinarily. Um, we're gonna go to now uh, Ma Ma Magger Association, Magger Association. Magar, M-A-G-A-R. Uh, good right. afternoon, Honorable Borough President and everyone. It is our first time uh, applying for funding from the uh, government level, city level. Magar Association USA Inc. It shall be known as a Magar USA in abbreviation is a non-profitable, non-political, charitable, humanitarian and secular organization established in New York City on March 28, 2004 and officially registered in the state of New York on August 30, 2004. 
Mogar USA is dedicated to the preservation of culture and existence of Mogar people who have been residing in the United States of America. Mogar USA has organized lots of events to unite Mogar people who have been living in the United States of America and to preserve their cultures. It has also been participating in many events organized by other communities. Even though Mogar USA was established to take care of Mogar community only, now Mogar USA has grown up registered as 51C3 organization in 2019 and capable to serve in the broader area of ne entire Nepali community. As Nepali community is growing up in the state of New York and all Nepalese are immigrants, Mogar USA wants to work for Im immigrant power initiative and start working with in informational and motivational programs such as adult literacy initiative and immigrant opportunities initiative. To accomplish these goals, we are going to conduct programs whole year round in three different topics, which are as follows. First generation program. In this initiative, there will be space for first generation Nepali speaking American people to share, read and write in Nepali in their native languages as well. Immigrant uh, second, immigrants story in this initiative, people can share their story about experience being an immigrant in new world. Um, it might be helpful for their children's success as well. Uh, third one, adult literacy class. In this initiative, people get life skill classes, voting rights classes, civic engagement classes for their importance for society and city. Top of all that, our uh, ultimate hard work is must and Mogar USA provides space accessories, volunteers, and a lot to meet the goal. So uh, to meet this goal, we have a um, allocate, um, we, are, we are requesting for budget, which will be $97,400 for this uh, program. And if we get the opportunity, we'll prove that Mogar USA is a trustworthy organization. Thank you for your cooperation. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you so much for your testimony, Vishnu. Thank you. All righty, we now will go to Green City Forest. Green City Forest. Anel from Green City Forest. I see them. Mute. Yes, sorry, I just <laughs> dropped my headphones. I'm one second. Hello, good morning. Hello. Good morning, Queensborough President Donovan Richard, Speaker Adams, Council Member Lee, William Shulman, Juan Krishna Kaban Ung. Power, Brooks, Moya, and all of the Queen's council members and community board chairs. I'm Anel Cabrera Mars, proud Queen's Elmhurst native, speaking for you, of you from home. Um, I'm also a proud chief program officer for Green City Force, and I'm pleased to testify with you this morning um, before the borough board to discuss Green City Force and our request for renewal funding from the city council to support our work focused on uplifting New York City Housing Authority residents and communities. Since 2015, Green, uh, the Green Job Corp City Council Speaker Initiative and a Greener NYC Investments have been vital to our organization and community success. GCF, Green City Forest, has been honored to, be, to have past support by Borough President Richards and former council member Kostanidis via a Greener NYC, as well as from council member Shulman and many others current council members. Our priority is to provide young adults living in New York City Housing Authority uh, the tools and the workforce opportunities to lead a green city rooted in social, economic, and environmental justice. As a part of our program, core members enter six to 10 months AmeriCorps National Service terms. While in service full time, they lead large scale raised bed farms that we call eco hubs, which you can see some behind me, in NYCHA communities across the city. Green City Forces programs is rooted in the belief that NYCHA residents are uniquely positioned through leadership, training, and service to drive change in public housing communities while building skills, earning certifications, and gaining experience to help launch their careers and achieve economic prosperity. 
DCF operates a unique program that is critical relevance for NYCHA young adults and the residents they serve. Since the height of COVID-19, GCF's farm stands have become necessary resources for the communities it serves. In 2021, our EcoHub sites distributed more than 17,000 pounds of organic produce for NYCHA community members, and we started our compost collection program, collecting over 3,300 pounds of food scraps. Our goal for 2022 with continued support from the city council is to continue providing direct access to organic produce to the thousands of residents in NYCHA at a critical time as we continue to navigate the disruptions caused by COVID-19 and continue our historical success of an 82% graduation and an 83% placement in jobs or school following program participation. We are seeking to establish our first eco-home farm site at the fall of 2023 we are currently funding, we have funding from the Mayor's Fund of New York City to begin these efforts, and we would greatly value the Queen's delegation support in further investments, well as helping us establish a strong ongoing physical presence in our Queen's community as we identify our permanent Queen's location for food production, workforce training, and community transformation. In 2020, in fiscal year 23, GCF is requesting $5,600,000 from New York City's Council Speaker Initiatives to be used to pay for professional expenses, salary, and fringe for the service coordinators who are NYCHA residents and alumni staff for our program who serve our EcoHub sites and role models for our members. This year, we're asking for additional investments via the Speaker Initiative and Greener NYC, Green Job Program, Job Training and Placement Initiative, Access to Healthy Food and Nutritional Education, NYC Cleanup, and Bridge Program for Workforce Development. A, clean, a Green City Forest mission is to serve uh, and programs intersect with these initiatives that I've listed. Thank you for your time. And I hope that the more than 100 core members we're looking to train and gain access to their uniforms and supportive services um, are able to bring our amazing programs to Queens in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you and so happy to see Green City Force here uh, and all the good work you're doing and uh, training young people, especially from public housing uh, in a future green economy. And I'm always proud to have worked with you along with uh, Councilmember Richie Torres at the time uh, to make sure that uh, your program could stay afoot. And, and we look forward to continuing to support the efforts. And I do urge your new council members who are unaware of your organization to definitely get to know your organization, especially as we begin to transition to a green economy. So thank you. Getting, getting young people of color ready for these opportunities will always be grateful for the work you all do. So thank you. All righty. Um, we're going to now move to Jay Rogers, Queens Theater. Jay Rogers, Queens Theater, Queens Theater. Here you go. Good afternoon. Good Slava afternoon. Ukraini. My name is Jay Rogers, and I am the general manager of Queens Theater in Flushing Meadows, Corona Park. Before I begin, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to every community leader here today for your steadfast support of arts and cultural organizations throughout the city over the last two years, ensuring the survival of hundreds of organizations like Queens Theater. Last year, Borough President Richards made a historic and significant allocation to, of funds and resources to the cultural community, allowing multiple organizations the ability to advance their ambitious projects. Queens Theater is the recipient of one of these called capital allocations, completing funding for the base project of the renovation of the Claire Shulman Theater, consisting of a complete replacement of our theatrical lighting, sound, and rigging systems, as well as the reconstruction of our audience chamber. I've been working on this for over a decade, and I, I cannot thank you enough for the ability to advance this transformation. This project is funded. We are actively advancing it. We have conducted our internal discussions and brainstormed ideas how to leverage this project into something truly transformational, but there is one vital element of the space that has not been adequately addressed yet, the stage deck itself. During the ongoing development of the renovation project, I've learned that our wood frame stage, complete with a non-functional turntable, has been in place since the original conversion to a live performance space in the mid-70s. Internally, the theater has undertaken refurbishment and repair projects, but by all measures, 
The stage has exceeded its life cycle and it's due for replacement. There are approaching concerns surrounding the long-term structural safety and stability of the deck. To that end, Queen's Theater has submitted a capital project request to the borough president's office in the amount of approximately 1.6 million to extend the scope of work on the Shulman Theater renovation to include a complete redesign and reconstruction of the stage deck constructed on a steel frame with basket weave sprung flooring. It will be designed in tandem with the renovated audience chamber to ensure the greatest possible experience for patrons and performers alike. The current stage deck was designed with the sole purpose of theatrical productions in mind, but Queen's Theatre has evolved and expanded into more interdisciplinary programming, including dance and music performances, community events, and even use as a location for film, television, and photo shoots. A redesigned, re-engineered stage deck provides greater flexibility to accommodate a wide variety of these uses and represents a potential to significantly enhance our rental revenue as it opens doors to types of usage we currently cannot accommodate. We have a unique opportunity right now before the design process is formally kicked off to augment the scope of the project, take advantage of construction mobilization and avert a third extended closure and fully transform this space into one of the most accessible and flexible live performing arts venues in Queens. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. And I love the marketing of Queens Theater and your uh, background. Thank you. We've learned a thing or two over the, over the last few years. <laughs> and, and, and every time you mentioned Claire Shulman, you just you warm my heart because I love Claire. Um, I miss her. We uh, so. <laughs> we owe our very existence to her, and we are uh, doing a special memorial tribute to her at our gala this year on May second. And we hope. Oh, we'll okay, be please make us. sure we uh, get the invitation for that. Absolutely. Um. All righty. Um, yeah, I think you, you answered the question. So basically just uh, the, the, the increase in funding would just enable you to get it all wrapped up instead of having to go back and do a separate contract. Exactly. Yes. Right, it, it. It's, it's trying to get it all in one fell swoop. All right. Perfect. All righty. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. All righty. Okay. Next, we'll hear from Carl Goodman, Museum of the Moving Image. I hope I got that right, Amanda. Yep, you're good. All righty. I saw him hopping around. Carl? Here I am. Okay, I just dropped this into the chat. And apologies for uh, the um, form of what I'm about to present because I am extremely great, grateful to President uh, Richards, uh, members of council, especially those who have recently taken office. I'm contact, we're in contact with all of you regarding our programmatic and existing capital allocations. I'm here to quickly speak about something different, which has to do with reform of the capital process after the allocations are made. None of this has to do with what you're doing, which results in generous and critical allocations that allow us to continue the service that maintains our commitment to the health and growth of the city. The concern for capital reform is what happens after allocation, informed by the museum's experience, and not only, you know, not necessarily thorough and logistical, logistical review. This is not the fault of any specific agencies, departments, or bodies. They are systemic issues. While other organizations may share these concerns, I am not. Spe I am speaking only on behalf of Momi. The issues, time and cost. It takes sometimes up to five years uh, to actually complete a capital project. We have one in limbo for about ten. This is an unacceptable amount of time to devote to urgent capital issues uh, in the buildings that we face. Qualifications, right now capital projects are structured in such a way that makes it hard for these orgs who do not have a 50% match in hand to advance the funds. Many of these organizations can self-manage their projects if they didn't have this upfront requirement. Those who can self-fund their project need not have a city agency to run them as they juggle a tremendous amount of projects which they cannot possibly develop uh, nor do they are able to have the passion for a commitment to a project that the organization itself has. We are somewhat sidelined. The backlog, and currently the uh, system includes uh, uh, cost escalations that require us to go back to you year after year sometimes for the same projects. Meanwhile, we have leaky roofs, malfunctioning cooling systems, and a waste of taxpayer dollars. Um, stakeholder buy-in. Everyone knows that capital is broken. We need many allies to fix it. 
Um, I've included links to Directive 10 of the Comptroller, which was recently made more stringer, I mean stringent. We recognize the checks and balances are critical when spending public monies to prevent bad actors from abusing the system and to have accountability. Um, speed and effectiveness of self-managed projects. MOMI is not in a position or authority to our knowledge that allows us to make policy recommendations, but our experience has been that projects of a specific size or below can be effectively self-managed. Important controls are, of course, critical. We have no capital budget requests for this year, only programmatic. Our request is instead that the city, through the leadership of the offices of the borough president, city council, and its committees, and the office of the controller, mayoral administration, and its appropriate agencies consider taking a fresh look at this project. While we have issues that are citywide, I am of the mind to think the Queen's government in this unprecedented moment of collaboration and collectivity can lead this process of review and reform. The bell of opportunity has just rung. I hope we can work together to improve the system. Thank you very much. That was pretty good, Carl. <laughs> uh, I, I owe it to you guys, you know? Sorry, I'm going out on a limb. <laughs> bell of opportunity. Hey, uh, so uh, update on that. I did have a conversation with DDC and we are pulling together a meeting on this. So um, I was at Flushing Library uh, on Friday and got to speak to the assistant commissioner. And so uh, we talked about this very issue and things are in motion. So look forward to uh, working collectively on this because we want to move projects and I know you do. And, and you know, we want all of the projects to move in Queens. That's our, we, that's there why we're are, here, right? Exactly, that is why you're here. And before the end of all of our term, your terms, we want these projects to be done. Thank you to all. all. Right. all righty, thank you, good seeing you. All righty, next we're going to go to Francis Ascano from New York Hall of Science. Thank you, Borough President Richards, the Queen's delegation and the budget team for this budget hearing on the importance of funding essential community-based organizations and institutions that provide vital services to our Borough of Queens and the city. I'm Francis Ascano, Director of Government Affairs for the Hall of Science. And as you know, may know, NYSCI is the largest cultural institution in Queens, serving as a destination for residents from across the borough and throughout the greater metro area. NYSCI serves hundreds and thousands of New Yorkers, of New Yorkers, school children, teachers, and families in STEM learning. The institution is a critical resource within the many diverse communities that make up the borough of Queens and to families and educators throughout New York City. It is our hope the city will allocate $5 million towards the refurbishment of, our, of NYSCI's theater, including a request of half a million dollars from the Queens Borough President in the soon to be adopted FY23 budget. As we look to restore NYSCI and rebuild our institution after being shuttered by the twin crisis of COVID-19 and severely damaged by Hurricane Ida, we are excited to explore new initiatives to offer even more services to our community. This is why we're seeking capital funding for our theater, which is used to support our mission by presenting educational films, science-based programming, and talks. We routinely host events for community groups, school showcases, and welcome many other New York City organizations, such as yourself, for the use of the theater. For NYSCI, this theater refurbishment is part of our broader commitment to serving our local community of, of Corona. It will improve technical components of infrastructure, enhance accessibility, and modernize the space to increase functionality and flexibility for increased use of community events. Your support of this project in the upcoming city budget will significantly help in an enhanced viewer experience and enable us to showcase STEM concepts in relatable and the state-of-the-art facility will serve as an important resource for nearly 200,000 New York City school children who visit our facility each year, enabling them to make connections between what is learned in the classroom and experiences in the world. Overall, New Yorkers rely on the various cultural institutions, nonprofit organizations, programs, and resources to strengthen engagement and learning opportunity. NYSCI's mission and program extend beyond every visitor and is seen through the work we do to make STEM exciting, appealing, and inviting to everyone. Without the continuous support of funders, especially city government, this work wouldn't be able to happen. It is imperative that funding for cultural institution groups cultural groups and community-based organizations remains whole and continues to receive support going forward. 
Despite setback and challenges, science is a tool that must be accessible and relevant in everyone's life and is useful in problem solving and creating new for NYSA, the work we do both within and beyond our walls complements each other to provide educational and essential services to our communities, students, families, and all. With more than six decades of operation, your support has been crucial to upgrade our facility and enhancing visitor experiences. We thank you and your staff for hosting this hearing to discuss our capital needs and hope you can fund our 5 million requests with 500,000 from your office and the rest from the administration and delegation. Thank you. And I always say my first, uh, my first field trip was to the Hall of Science. So it always has a place in my heart. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs> thank you for the work you have done. All right, next we're going to go to Erin, Queens Botanical Garden. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Erin. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the Queens Botanical Garden. Uh, we're so grateful to the Queensboro President Richards and this committee for providing this opportunity to discuss the impact of the garden's programs on our community and our financial needs. QBG is located on 39 acres of city-owned land in Flushing, Queens, where the place where people, plants, and cultures meet. Gardens and outdoor spaces are even more important now than ever. QBG has continued to serve as a steadfast resource for our community, offering a safe, beautiful, and interesting place to explore. In FY21, the garden served over 160,000 visitors, including 9,500 school children. This year, we expect to welcome uh, sustainably more. Uh, substantially more. On Lunar New Year, this event, um, event this winter, we attracted a record number of visitors, over 2,300 to the garden. Our compost and farm teams worked tirelessly over the last year to process over 5,000 pounds of food waste in Queens and donate over 5,000 pounds of produce to local food pantries last year. And this fall, we are slated to break ground on a new educational building to replace and expand on the current educational facility. There will be room for more public programs, environmental workshops, adult education, and teacher training. All this would not be possible without our dedicated staff and dozens of local community organizations that partner with us to bring over 250 interns and over 2,000 volunteers to the garden each year, including over 50 summer youth. In 2021, QBG adopted our latest strategic plan that will go through 2024, titled People, Plants, and Partnerships for a healthy new era. It has three overarching goals, to create a more enhanced experience on site, to increase engagement of our communities with more communities with an emphasis on underrepresented communities in Queens and to build a stronger organization. We respectfully seek discretionary funding for FY23 to strengthen our efforts to achieve these goals through continuing to provide the public with essential garden space for socially distanced, culturally enriching, an engaging experience and to bolster our many community educational programs and services, including through the QBG farm, volunteerism, and public programs. Queens Botanical Garden never stopped bringing people, plants, and cultures together this year, and your support helps us to remain an urban oasis for visitors to find peace, relaxation, and inspiration among the wonders of nature. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you for the work that y'all have done. All righty, we're now going to go to Nick Burton, Queens Public Library. Nick, oh, there you go. Good morning. I am Nick Buron, Chief Librarian and Senior Vice President at Queens Public Library. On behalf of the library and our President and CEO, Dennis Walcott, it is a pleasure to be here and provide testimony to the Queensboro Board. Thank you, Queensboro President Richards, council members and members of the board for the opportunity to speak to you about our budget priorities for the next fiscal year. QPL greatly appreciates your partnership and the years of support you and the members of the community have shown this dynamic institution. And on behalf of every person who works and ser is served by the Queens Public Library, thank you. March 16th will mark two years since the unprecedented closure of all of our physical locations to the public. QPL has robustly reemerged safely, reintroducing in-person activities and playing an integral role in New York's recovery. We will continue our virtual programming, which has been an outstanding resource. We have conducted over 29,000 programs from March 2020 through the end of January 2022, 
In that same period, we circulated over almost 4 million e-materials and added over 123,000 items to our digital collection. And our live and archive programs, such as Hip Hop DJ Sessions with Ralph McDaniels and 24-Hour Black Health and Healing Virtual Summit, were viewed nearly 1.1 million times. Whether it was serving as test and trace, vaccination sites, learning labs, polling locations, or conducting 2020 census outreach, Queens Public Library has been there serving for the people of the borough. Three of our locations served as vaccination sites for children five to 11. 18 of our locations uh, began distributing COVID-19 test kits to the public. And to date, we have distributed over 23,000 coronavirus test kits to the public, and we hope to expand that effort. Mayor Adams' fiscal year 23 preliminary budget instituted a 3% a cut to our operating budget this fiscal year, but rescinded a proposed fiscal year 23 budget uh, funding cut of 3%. Fortunately, we have found ways to absorb the reduction for this year without affecting hiring or service levels. However, if things change in the mayor's executive budget and cuts are re-proposed for fiscal year 23, staffing levels, public service hours, and collections would likely be impacted. With 66 locations, QPL has a large capital program and a variety of needs. Our 10-year capital plan submitted to the city, we have identified a need of 270 million over the next 10 years. Of this, we will need almost $99 million in fiscal year 23 to address projected budget funding deficits, as well as to begin the process of initiating priority one capital projects in need of immediate attention. An additional amount of 13.3 million is needed to launch these same priority one projects. Libraries have been at the forefront of bridging the digital divide and we've secured over 22,000 hotspots to lend to our customers. We will need the borough president's office, our community boards and community leaders to continue to advocate for libraries to help us meet the challenges we face. We respectfully ask for your continued financial support, particularly for our capital program and for your advocacy in fiscal year 23. Borough President Richards, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Nick. And of course, we love our libraries. So look forward to our continued work together. Thank you. All right, we're now gonna to go to Denise Dixon, the Showing Hearts Foundation. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here from Showing Hearts Foundation and we're seeking funding for our Youthpreneur program. Youthpreneur is a unique approach uh, that we use through um, seven week intensive. And then we do a one day summit where we support and promote the professional development and civic engagement for the youth in our community. Why we do this is because it truly matters. Our programming and our facilitators help to activate the courage and confidence and ingenuity that our youth and young adults need to build businesses, address their community needs, and to develop and, pers and pursue their, their personal goals. Um, what we've seen in our last couple of years is a significant growth in participant RSPVs, uh, RSVPs, we've seen 120 per cohort, and we're looking to partner, well, we're actually partnering with the Young Men's Initiative this year, so we're looking to actually double that. Um, and 92% of our participants have actually gone on to pursue their own businesses, whether it be virtual, uh, starting online businesses or pursuing uh, career paths. Um, why we need your support is because we can't do this without your help. Um, we are able to provide them with not just a set of skills, but we also want to provide them with the, ex with the experiences. With additional funding, we're able to engage partners to come on board to provide um, um, internship opportunities. We've actually spoken to several businesses that we would like to assist us in placing these, these young people. And we would also like to provide them with the, with the seed money so that they could pursue some of their uh, dreams. Um, we, are, we are aware that we are faced by a lot of disparities within our community, but we don't wanna focus on that. We focus on the 
skills and the talents that our young people have and enhance that. And by, and by doing so, we empower them to move forward. Uh, showing hearts um, is also looking to bring these programs to younger to a younger population. We've been invited into some after into some after school programs, which is an excellent start for us to reach the children at a younger age and build them up so that they know that their vision matters, what they're seeing in their community. They have the ability to create solutions and possibly be the world changers that their communities need. Thank you. Thank you for your work and uh, please give my regards to uh, the, your founder. Uh, thank you so much. Sure will, thank you. All right, all right. Next we will go to Hope Astoria Church. Hope Astoria yes, Church, yes. I see you. Okay, Donnell. That's me. You may begin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for this time. Um, it's an honor to be speaking to you. Um, I'm from Hope Story Church um, and the, the ministry is Hope Justice. And we are uh, a group of people that just really care about our community and, and trying to support. And we are starting um, an initiative called the Seek Justice Action, Seek Just Action Initiative, where we are looking to be a part of the solution with our neighbor, with our, with our neighbors, we are located on 35th Street, uh, some blocks away from Ravenswood community. And we've been building and, and partnering with, with, um, with the community center and with the tenant association. And um, we feel that the funding will be very helpful for us as we try to provide more services and more programs uh, within the Ravenswood community and the proximity of our church. So for example, um, uh, that we find that there is a need for, for training for seniors in regards to, you know, uh, computer software programs, Zooming, the things that we're on right now. Uh, some seniors are, are kind of left out of that, especially as we shifted over into the pandemic. And we have willing people that uh, can train and the funding will be helpful for providing equipment. Uh, our program will provide career development, leadership for youth, adults, and seniors. And so this funding would just be very helpful for us and empowering the community around us and, and just being a part of the solution and uh, with, our, with our partners. Um, and so um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right. We're now going to go to the Jewish Board of Family and Children Services, Bridget McBrien. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me and allowing me to testify today. My name is Bridget McBrien from the Jewish Board of Family and Children Services. The Jewish Board can be summarized as a mental health and social services advocacy organization. We provide services to more than um, 40,000 New Yorkers each year, specifically in Queens, about 2,800 people each year in mental health counseling, um, support for those who have experienced abuse or neglect and those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As we all know, prior to the COVID health crisis, demand for mental health services had been outstripping capacity in underserved communities throughout New York City. Now under COVID, mental health is at a crisis point. We provide a lifeline for about 10,000 New Yorkers seeking counseling services each year. Right now, 15% of our clients are on a wait list and our wait times for clinical services often exceeds one month. Um, the, this is a result of clinical staff shortages, and especially in geographic areas in Queens with low transportation. The Jewish Board um, also operates a mental health counseling appointment line. Um, it's kind of become a crisis line. In 2022, uh, excuse me, in 2020, we received 10,500 calls to this hotline. This year, we've received over 31,000 calls from people seeking mental health services. We also have experienced right now over 600 crisis calls a month, whereas previously we were averaging about 100. 
And today we have 430 clients who are considered at risk for suicide. Um, due to the pandemic's flexibilities, we've been able to perform many more telehealth visits. Right now we are operating about 25,000 telehealth visits per month to our clients. Um, and we've been really happy to see that telehealth has been such a lifeline to people. Um, we want to ask for support today for mental health counseling services, support for the indirectory through the city council and the city budget, support for the COLA, and any discretionary funds that would ensure access to care by reducing client and um, staff wait times at, for clinical services. We also, as you may remember, Borough President, operate two domestic violence shelters in the Rockaways, and we... Um, you know, not only provide shelter, but provide mental health counseling to people experiencing domestic violence. So with that, um, just want to thank you again, and um, again, ask for support for the human services sector overall and mental health counseling specifically. So thank you don't, you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the work you do out there. Uh, and then you don't have a range of what you're asking for from us in the council to support the initiatives. We have a speaker's list request for $100,000. Okay. We have a Dove initiative request for 79. And we have individual member item grants to council members and we will be submitting a discretionary grant for your office. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. Next, we're going to go to Emily Conrad, Common Threads. Hello, hello. I hope you all can hear me. Um, thank you for this time today. I am with Common Threads. We are an organization that focuses on healthy cooking and nutrition education. And we, as many others are, are very thankful for the partnership we've had with the Office of the Queensborough President for the last few years. Um, it has really helped us to uh, sustain and expand some of our program efforts around Queens. We have been in existence as an organization for almost 20 years. We've been in New York City since 2014. Um, we are across all five boroughs. We partner mostly with schools, but also with community-based organizations and medical institutions. Um, when we partner with schools, we like to take a, um, a whole school approach to bringing nutrition education and healthy cooking into the community by working with school teachers to implement nutrition education during the school day. Um, we have an eight lesson uh, in school nutrition education program. The children make hands on uh, healthy snacks as part of each lesson while they're learning nutritional concepts. We give teachers uh, whatever they need to bring that into the classroom. And then in the after school hours, we do hands on cooking classes with the children in the school kitchens. We also do um, family cooking classes, grocery store tours for parents, other parent workshops on just um, budgeting when it comes to cooking and eating and grocery shopping and other to um, similar topics. Our cooking classes for children also incorporate a cultural component. They travel the world through food, learning about the culture and cuisine from around the world. And all of our programs are SNAP aligned and WIC aligned. So that means that uh, you know we're not trying to teach fancy, really expensive, hard to attain cooking to anybody. We're trying to work with families where they are um, and to uh, reflect the culture of their cuisine and whatever resources they might have within their neighborhood for food, whatever they might have as a food budget. So we're really trying to, to demystify the idea that healthy cooking has to be expensive or hard to do or out of reach for anybody. Um, we currently have 12 school partners in Queens um, and we are, uh, we've been growing each year in Queens. So we're really excited this year to be working with these 12 school partners. And we are hoping to be able to sustain and to continue to grow our work into the coming year. Um, I know I have about 30 seconds. So I'm trying to think if I, I miss anything. Um, I'll throw in there that we've had, you know, a number of external and internal evaluations that are statistically significant year after year that show that our programs are increasing nutrition knowledge and helping to change eating behaviors to um, a more healthier way of eating. And we increase cooking at home and sitting down for family meals, um, which are all goals and objectives of our programming. Again, thank you very much. Thank you. Can you just reiterate your ask again? Um, your budgetary ask, if you have a budget. We'll be asking for $15,000 with our okay. application. Thank okay, you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
All righty. We're now going to go to Jenny Laurie from the Housing Court Answers. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Jenny Laurie. I'm the Executive Director of Housing Court Answers. I want to thank you, Queensboro President Richards, and the Queens Council delegation for supporting our services. Uh, funding basically has allowed us to help people facing eviction uh, in, in New York City Housing Court and specifically in the Queens Housing Court. In pre-COVID times, Housing Court Answers operated an information table five days a week in the Queens County Housing Court, staffed with three people who provided assistance with forms, connections to lawyers, and help accessing eviction prevention programs. In the fall of 2021, our table on the second floor hallway of the housing court reopened, and uh, we're there now two days a week on Wednesdays and Thursdays with one person. We hope to bulk that out a little bit in the coming months. During the entire COVID pandemic, Housing Court Answers has been operating a hotline five days a week, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. In the first half of the fiscal year 22, uh, we helped over 16,000 callers to our citywide hotline and just under 5,000 callers from Queens, um, both from over the hotline and from our information table. We've helped hundreds of tenants from Queens facing eviction connect with lawyers and get help with back rent and understand how to access housing court while it was partially closed. We've also assisted small landlords connect to resources and understand court procedures. Housing Court Answers has been providing workshops via Zoom for new advocates and constituent aides on housing and housing court issues. Prior to COVID, we presented numerous trainings at Borough Hall in cooperation with the Queensboro President's Office. Housing Court Answers has applied for $5,000 in funding from the Borough President for printed materials and supplies our information table in the Queens Housing Court for FY23. And in addition, we're requesting council delegation support for a renewal of our city council initiative funding of $700,000 to help with our work citywide. Thanks again for your support and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. And now that the, uh, I just had a question, now that the, um, uh, the, um, Moratorium. The moratorium was lifted, so I was trying to find the word. Um, what have you seen in Queens? So, yeah, so things are ramping up really fast, both in person. The courts announced they're going to go back to full in person by the end of March. So we're getting a lot more people physically coming into court. There are a lot more cases on the calendar moving forward. And our hotline, which is a citywide hotline, is really has gone up from, say, 200 calls to, say, sometimes 600 calls a day. So there's just a, you know, they're restoring old cases that were frozen during the moratorium. And then I'll, there are a lot of new cases now that the moratorium is lifted. Landlords can file new cases. So, yes, uh, explosion. And it's beyond basically the capacity of the court to handle and beyond the capacity of the legal service providers. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All sure. Right. Thank you. All righty, we're going to now go to legal outreach. Yes. Good afternoon, Queensboro President Donovan Richards, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Tamika Edwards, Managing Director of Program Operations at Legal Outreach, a 39 year old Queens based college prep and professional development nonprofit. Legal Outreach requests a grant of $10,000 from City Council local initiatives and $25,000 from the Queensboro President Discretionary Fund to support its Summer Law Institute, College Bound Program and Alumni Support Program in 2022 to 23. Our mission is to change the educational trajectory and career outcomes for low income minority and first gen high school students from underrepresented communities in New York City. We do this through several programs, starting with the Summer Law Institute that we run in conjunction with six different law schools. And at each institute, we take approximately 25 students from New York City middle schools and provide a five week law immersion experience where students learn about criminal justice and criminal trials, interact daily with lawyers from various fields within the law and are exposed to professional environments through weekly field trips. The program culminates in a criminal mock trial in front of an actual New York State Supreme Court or federal judge. 
We currently recruit from 14 middle schools in various Queens neighborhoods, primarily Astoria and Jamaica. And those students attend programming at CUNY and St. John's Law. After the Summer Law Institute, students get an opportunity to join our four-year college-bound program, where we run 12 other programs that run after school on Saturdays and every summer of students' high school career. And the purpose of, of our program is really to build their academic, social, leadership, and professional skills to prepare them for college and beyond. Some of the programs that we have include a Saturday Writing Academy, SAT prep program, professional exposure program, internship program, transition to college program, and more. Between eighth and 12th grades, we serve approximately 370 students and 40% of them live in Queens. Over the course of the years, 100% of our students have graduated from high school, 98% have matriculated to college with 80% matriculating to most highly and very competitive colleges according to Barron's. 95% of our, our students have graduated from college and have gone on to pursue various careers, including working in the office of the New York City Council Speaker. So essentially we wanna continue the work. Um, we request that you make this investment in our youth that we free both now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. All right, we're gonna now go to the Queens Historical Society, Kingsland Homestead, Jason Antos. Hi, Bob President Richards. Hey. How are you? Thank you for speaking with me today. So to introduce myself, I'm Jason Antos with Queens Historical Society here in downtown Flushing. And we are a, the official historical society for the borough of Queens. We have been in operation since 1968. And our main objective, of course, is to educate the borough and citywide of the beautiful history of Queens. Uh, we were originally founded uh, over 100 years ago in 1903. We had President Theodore Roosevelt as our first honorary member, and we still continue that mission today. Uh, we provide many programs, uh, all types of cultural programs here at the Kingsland Homestead, which is a colonial era farmhouse located in the Weeping Beach Park, right off of Parsons Boulevard near Northern, opposite the Bound House. Uh, some programming that we do, for example, we have a, a history program for interns to uh, help archive and study local history. We also have uh, programs that cover many different cultural aspects because, as you know, Queens County is the most diverse county in the United States. So we plan on exhibits and book talks and walking tours and all types of wonderful things to explore the multicultural aspect of Queens. Uh, I myself have been involved here with the society for almost 20 years. And there is a lot to offer here in terms of educating people on local history and New York City history at large. Uh, we are asking for funding. Uh, we're asking for capital improvement funding in the neighborhood of 100,000 and also operational expenses at around 60,000. The, uh, the 100,000 uh, to start off with is for our uh, ongoing basement project. We have a sub-basement here at the homestead, which we're using, which we, we were using as the extra archival space. Unfortunately, due to Hurricane Ida back in September, the basement uh, was severely damaged and some of our archival material uh, was damaged. So we are in the process of trying to restore and to preserve that. And that is one of the reasons why we're asking for this funding. Uh, to finalize, we are uh, reopening as of last month, and we are starting with our cultural programming beginning on March 20th. And we're moving forward with uh, educating the, the neighborhood at large and the community at large about the history of Queens. And I thank you for meeting with me today. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you very much. All right. Next, we're going to go to oh, self-help, Katie Folly. Hello. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, uh, to testify today. My name is Katie Foley. I'm the Managing Director of External Affairs and Communications at Self-Help Community Services. Thank you for holding today's hearing to learn about the needs of our Queens community. 
We are a nonprofit serving 25,000 older and vulnerable adults through home health care, affordable housing, and skilled social services, while remaining the largest provider of services to Holocaust survivors in North America. We serve approximately 14,000 older and vulnerable adults in Queens. We offer robust services, including case management, friendly visiting, uh, seven affordable housing residences, home care, home care aid training, services for Holocaust survivors, NORC, senior centers, where the New York Connects Queens provider, um, and much, much more. Throughout the COVID pandemic, we have continued to serve our clients through a range of our range of home and community-based programs. Our aides have provided much needed at-home care and our social workers from the community-based programs have been checking on our clients to ensure safe and reliable access to food, shelter, medical care, benefits and entitlements, and much, much more. We've also expanded and enhanced our virtual senior center to reduce social isolation. Today, I'll highlight a few areas of need within the self-help community. Our first request is 50,000 for a self-help transportation program, providing free round-trip transportation to medical appointments for seniors in Queens. The pandemic has significantly increased the need for safe private transportation options for older adults. And through the generosity of various council members, we've been able to provide 1,400 rides for older adults in Queens since November. And the program will continue for the remainder of the fiscal year in districts 30 and 19 due to additional funding. Based on feedback we received from individuals who have benefited from the program, as well as the demand, we know that this program significantly improves the quality of life as it eliminates concerns about transportation costs, traveling alone, navigating public trans transit to get to their doctor's appointments. So we hope that that funding is able to continue next year. The second main request is for our virtual senior center. 20,000 to support 40 homebound or socially isolated older adults to continue participating in the VSC. These are interactive, live, real-time classes and peer-to-peer -peer chats on a wide range of topics. People use their own computer to log in, and this has been a trailblazer in combating social isolation, which is such a big issue right now with older adults. We're also asking for support on two citywide initiatives for the Self-Help Alzheimer's Resource Program, SHARP, for 200,000 from the Social Adult Day Initiative, and our innovative senior center in Flushing, Benjamin Rosenthal, Prince Street, 154,000 from the Senior Centers Programs and Enhancements Initiative. This senior center serves about, has a membership of 4,000 older adults, and the funding supports overall senior center operations um, for all of those older adults. So across all of our programs, our team is working every day to ensure our clients live with independence and dignity through this challenging time. And we res respectfully request your support to continue these funding these programs. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for all the work you've uh, done during this pandemic, uh, working with our seniors specifically. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we're going to hear from Andrea Bowen, and she'll be rep representing the Ackerman Institute, Trans Latina Network Se Sex Workers Project, and then the Urban Justice Center. Welcome. Unmute. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Borough President Richards, Creams, City Council members, community board members. I saw you, uh, VP and council staff, for accepting uh, this request for funds. Uh, my name is Andrea Bowen. I'm a consultant uh, representing Ackerman Institute for the Family. Um, and I'm specifically here today to talk about the Latinx Youth and Family Immigration Project, or LIFEP. Um, for 60 years, the Ackerman Institute has been serving families with innovative couple and family therapy services, state-of-the-art training programs for mental health and other professionals, and cutting-edge research initiatives that develop new mental health treatment models. We serve thousands of families through our programs, and that's only increased since COVID, and we've been able to do um, work through, uh, you know, media like this. Um, specifically today, we want to tell you about the Latinx Youth and Family Im Immigration Project in our New York City Council Grants Request for FY 2023. Um, we, uh, there's a $125,000 request. I'm happy to give the uh, app ID if you need. Um, so the Latinx Youth and the Family Immigration Project, or the Melo in Espanol, is uh, committed to promoting mental health and well-being among New York City's Latinx immigrant community. We provide th free family therapy in Spanish, free family support groups in Spanish, help with partner organizations, free training and case consultation with clinicians and staff. Uh, training materials and workshops provided to over 50 bilingual clinicians and profession, professionals annually and free referrals from mental health services, helping over 100 Latinx immigrant families uh, annually. Specific to Queens, 18% of the families receiving free family therapy are based in Queens. 
Uh, and also we have partnerships with Life is Precious based in Queens, as well as Cabrini, Cabrini Immigrant Services, uh, which serves family in Queens, which means that we reach hundreds of additional families in Queens per year. Um, so um, again, for the Life It program, um, we're seeking $125,000. Funding will enable us to provide the bulk of our services for free families in Queens. Um, and council funding is really critical to being able to provide Ackerman's life-changing services to children and families in need, especially to our Latinx immigrant population. We thank you all for your consideration and your support, and also um, for being able to sit here and listen to all these requests all day. Happy to answer any questions you have. Well, thank you, and thank you for the work that you do, and uh, we look forward to the work ahead with you. Great, thank you so thank much. You. Um, you. I'll move on to the other, other, other items. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, next, I will go to Trans Latinx Network. So um, I am also, I've been a consultant to Trans Latinx or Trans Latina Network, um, DBA, Trans Latinx Network for several years. Um, I'm primarily requesting support for our discretionary expense application with the Trans Equity Programs Initiative. So that's $375,000. Um, and further that the Queensboro Board support the Trans Equity Programs Initiative. We're looking for folks uh, to support that and make sure that we maintain our, our funding at least that we had last year. We've also requested Trans, Trans Latina Network specifically has requested 5,000 from Council Member Krishnan. Um, the vast majority of Trans Latina Network's clients are from Queens, from FY21 to FY22. Um, first two quarters, we had 126 clients in Queens receiving intensive services, and that's 36% of our client base. We also serve thousands of what we call our passive recipients of services. So we give out PPE, safe sex kits, and food and pantry distribution at several sites, street outreach primarily. Um, that's 40 street outreach events um, around 10 times a year, uh, and in, um, in English and Spanish. Um, so that's many thousands um, served through past outreach. Um, there are many social services offered by the city and nonprofits, very few are tailored specific to the transgender, non gender non-conforming, non-binary community. And even with the creation of new, new programs for these communities, there's a dearth of programming for trans and gender non-conforming and non-binary adults and immigrants specifically. Um, and so Trans Latinx Network or Trans Latina Network has jumped in to fill that gap. And so um, our services that we will be providing and have provided through trans equity programs include our workforce programs, forward and TGNC leadership space, um, workshops, on, workshops on several topics, including but not limited to how to work with law enforcement, um, increasing awareness of law and policies of relevance to community, like how do you file a complaint under, under the state's Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act? Um, immigration basics and anti-discrimination know your rights workshops. Um, we responded to COVID by, you know, sending out um, PPP information, um, letting people know about vaccine eligibility and pop sign up assistance, um, helping folks get enhanced IDs and other forms of identification, including immigration documents. Um, we helped family members get serve safe certifications to make them more employable given the success that so many trans and gender non-conforming community members have had in the service sector. We create care boxes uh, for folks enrolled in our program, including hygiene materials, clothing, and other materials. We have citizenship classes. Um, and so, and again, a ton of this work is in Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, and Corona. Um, and so most of this is funded through $375,000 in the Trans Equity Programs Initiative. And so we ask that you support that initiative and specifically our ask within it. Um, and to anyone in Council Member Krishna's office, we'd love your support with our member ask. So um, that is Trans Latina Network. Any questions on that? Good to go. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and finally, it's actually only three. Um, the third is it's Sex Workers Project of the Urban Justice Center. Um, you know, Urban Justice Center has many different um, projects and Sex Workers Project is one of them. So. Um, I am actually Associate Director of Government Affairs for Sex Workers Project at the Urban Justice Center. I wear many hats, which I'll call SWP. I'm requesting support primarily for our discretionary expense application with the Speakers Initiative. That's $100,000 application ID 126115, um, for which we'd appreciate the, the borough delegation being a sponsor. Um, we know the importance of having sponsors uh, of, 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 um, of speakers initiatives. 
Um, we'd also ask for your continued support as a delegation for supporting the persons involved in the sex trades initiative for which we received fifty thousand dollars and we also received thirty thousand under the immigrant opportunities in initiative so we ask for your continued support with that initiative um so the vast majority of sex worker projects clients are from queens um data from fy 21 and 22 show that 136 of our 371 city residing clients reside in queens um, we provide client-centered legal services to individuals who engage in sex work, regardless of whether they do so by choice, coercion, or circumstance. We were one of the first programs in the nation to assist survivors of human, human trafficking, and we're pioneered in an approach grounded in human rights, harm reduction, and real-life experiences of our clients. Uh, our, our lawyers are multilingual, non-judgmental, and bring you know many, many years of experience. So we're seeking primarily funding for um, our immigration related work that includes um, funding to help sex workers apply for and obtain immigration status we screen them for relief and filing to obtain asylum so that includes special immigrant juvenile status t visas u visas vowel based relief and vacature expungement sealing um, primarily vacature in this in the state of new york um, that can allow people to get record relief that will then allow them to continue on in the immigration process um, we're also continuing work um, uh, to do workers' rights litigation in legal sectors of the sex trades. Um, there's wage theft of people who work in, say, strip clubs. And so we've been, we've been talking to folks to ultimately build up a class action suit. Um, and so funding will go towards compensation of attorneys working on all of these cases who will assist in intakes and take on a variety of direct legal services including full legal representation, referrals to legal experts on other types of cases, referrals to social services, policy advocacy with relevant city agencies, outreach to impacted low-wage workers, and more. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. And thank you so much for listening to me for nine straight minutes. <laughs> no, it's fine. You wear a lot of hats, but uh, definitely doing some important work. And I guess the only question I had is, are you seeing a much uh, steeper increase due to the economy at this moment in Queens? <laughs> Yeah, um, I would say Trans Latinx Network, um, for, for which I have just have the, well, actually among all of them, because of the ability to, one, COVID, obviously, I mean, because primarily like the clientele is coming from Jackson Heights, Elmhurst, and Corona, um, there has been um, the need to really increase street work services. So with like Trans Latina Network, we started doing the PPP outreach mm -hmm. um, and doing all the vaccination outreach. Um, in addition to that, um, I mean, with Ackerman, because we started doing video therapy, um, we, you know, saw an enormous increase. I think it was, uh, it was below, well below 900 new clients. And then we ended up getting something like 900 new clients because we had um because we had the, the video therapies um and that's citywide but again queens is you know around 18 percent of that um uh and with respect to um sex workers project the urban justice center um the law has been changing a lot with policing of sex workers um but because of the depth of our of our legal bench We've been doing um, sit down conversations with folks to sort of learn what their experiences are. And so um, it's been a, there's been a, a wild change in the services and the way like vice relates to sex workers. And because of the city council funding, um, we've been able to do really on the ground. I've been part of these conversations, just listening in um, really intense conversations with folks to learn what they're experiencing and what the changes in their cases look like. So we're able to you know, modify our legal services to match that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Chris. you. All right. Thank you. Let's have been joined by Councilmember Bob Holden. Um, any more questions or should I sign off? It looks like the borough president froze. I'm so sorry. Um, so we may be having a couple of technical difficulties. So uh, Robert Holden, would you like to say a couple of words, Council Member? Uh, thank you. I'm, I just came from a hearing. Um, uh, anxious to hear all the needs of the borough. Um, sorry that the borough president froze. I it was a little stop action there. 
Uh, we're here. <laughs> we got to upgrade the uh, the internet, the uh, the bandwidth uh, for a hall. But uh, thank you, everyone. I'm just here to listen, obviously, and uh, I'll ask some questions uh, uh, when I'm on the call a little longer. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so kindly. We'll go ahead and have Read Alliance up. I believe it is Danielle Guindo. Yes, hi, it's Gindo. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, Gindo. Yes. Hi, hi Daniel. How are you? <laughs> hi. Thank you so much for the opportunity for to present. I apologize for the delay getting on. We had a little bit of technical difficulties here. Um, so Read Alliance, um, we're requesting $50,000 to support our critical early literacy intervention programs, which are serving children and teens in South Jamaica, Queens. Um, in FY23, we plan to enroll between 75 and 120 elementary children, elementary school children, and to employ between 45 and 60 teen leaders. And these are high school students, um, and likely even more. These are high school students who live in the same community and or attend school where the elementary school students um, attend. And, and we will also be employing elementary school teachers, um, at least six to eight of them to work in our effective programs in this community. And we're poised to provide programming in either in-person or virtual or a hybrid format, whatever, whatever our partner schools um, choose and, and, and prefer and what they think is going to be most effective with their community. So Read Alliance is founded on a commitment to educational equity and youth leadership. And we work to accelerate the tr educational trajectory of early elementary students through the power of teens who provide one-to-one -one literacy tutoring in under-resourced communities throughout the five boroughs. And so South Jamaica is one of the many communities in which we have a foothold. Um, we utilize more than 20 years of experience. We were founded in 2000, so we're celebrating our 22nd year. 20 years of experience to deliver programming in the early literacy intervention and youth development and workforce readiness spaces. Our dual impact model serves two important populations, the young children who are striving to read and young people who are high school students and need meaningful, meaningful paid employment. Our model addresses the achievement gap, both for low-income early elementary students while engaging teens in serving their communities as rate, paid reading tutors. And since 2000, we've employed more than 13,000 high school students, providing over 15,000 kindergarten and second grade students with one-to-one -one reading tutoring in important phonics-based instruction in low-income neighborhoods. Um, we also provide pre and post assessment data that, that tells us more about how each child is progressing individually and collectively. Um, so historically in South Jamaica, we have worked with three elementary schools, PS40, PS48, and PS160. And um, over the past seven years, as part of a literacy collective intervention, we have been one of the few organizations that are providing in-school programming that has demonstrated an increase in proficiency from five to 55% over the last seven years at PS40 alone. So we're really proud of that. Um, and we are moving forward. I know that I'm out of time, but we're moving forward with, with um, a, a roster of programming for this year as well. So I guess I, I should open it up for questions or if I can say just a couple more things about what our plans are for this year. A couple more things, more things in, yeah, no problem. Awesome. So in 2020 and 2021 school year, we employed um, 54 teenagers who all earned minimum wage, and we served 71 children in kindergarten and second grade. And of the children who were enrolled, they demonstrated that their progress, even though it was an all virtual year um, in our programs, they demonstrated the same progress that we typically would see in an in-person model. So we're really proud of that. And we never stopped. In fact, um, during the summer of 2020, the schools in our partner schools in South Jamaica were really three of very few schools in the city that participated in our pilot virtual literacy program. So that when we kept going in the face of an unimaginable challenge, 
those were the students that we served first. And as a matter of fact, in December of 2021, when we just started to go back to in-person, PS48 was the first school where we went back to in-person and we are actually in person there still. Um, so we're really proud of that. And then um, just looking ahead, you know, we're, we're, we've already got 75 kindergarten and second grade students enrolled um, with an additional 25 in the same community. And we've got just about 45 teenagers employed in this program. Thank you, Danielle, for all of your work. Early intervention is definitely key. Thank you so kindly. We appreciate you presenting today. Um, we'll now have Swim Strong Foundation Incorporated on standby will be Salas House, uh, Sean Slevin. Yes. Hello, Hi, everyone. <laughs> great, you. thank you. It's great to be here. And thank you all for your support over the years to Swim Strong Foundation. For those of you that don't uh, know us, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit with a mission to reduce unintended drowning and uh, water-based accidents. You might think that that's a little bit of a niche cause, but on a global basis, a person is actually drowning every 70, 70 seconds. Um, with every death, there are five more people that are suffering life-altering changes due to water-based uh, accidents meaning brain and spinal cord injuries. Come here to the United States and we average 11 uh, drowning deaths per day with a commensurate 55 people suffering the brain and spinal cord injuries. And um, you know, it's, a, it's a real problem. Um, certainly communities of color are severely impacted as a result of this. And while those statistics may be quite stunning in and of itself, uh, think of this as it is, a global epidemic, 95% um, of these tragedies actually never ever had to happen, they were preventable. So this is what we're trying to get in front of. Um, before the pandemic, we were able to serve and teach over 10,000 people how to swim. We gave over a million dollars in free swim lessons to families that needed that help. When the pandemic hit, we didn't stop either, uh, we had developed just prior to the pandemic, a program called Know Before You Go, K-N-O-W, Before You Go. And I took that into schools, about 17 schools. It was a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we taught that to about 9,000 students. And then during the pandemic, we revamped that to make it a much more rigorous and full-blown program. And so uh, we had a number of schools uh, about six or seven other schools that joined us in the piloting of that program. So to date, we now have 24 schools using the program, uh, 13,500 students. We also initiated legislation uh, in the Senate, it's Bill 2207, in the Assembly, it's Bill 728, which at the heart of it will mandate the uh, training, the education of water safety in all of our New York State schools, K through 12. So we've been busy, <laughs> we've been busy. Um, our ask of um, the uh, borough president and all of the electeds actually is to focus on our no behavior training. We would like to be able to offer this at no cost really to every school in the city. So we have to do that in small chunks because there are, um, gosh, 318,000 or so students in the city. So if we, if we take that down um, for the, by year 63,600 students, if each of the districts is able to train 4,550, we're able to kind of move this training through the city school system, which would be absolutely great. So of the borough president, we're asking $50,000 this year to help supplement what we're asking of the council members. We also will be asking for, uh, support from the speaker, uh, some of the initiatives, and of course, the delegation. Any questions? Oh, thank you for the work you do. I think I saw Councilmember Holden's hand raised. Yes. Councilmember Holden? What was that? Like, oh, I thought we saw your hand raised. That's round, uh, round one. That, that round sounds... one. <laughs> <laughs> I like the bell. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks so much for the work you do. And um, worthwhile, I just want to echo what she said. Uh, obviously, it's a worthwhile project. Learning how to swim, water safety, so important. Once you know how to swim, you always know how to swim. But um, it is, we have to try to get everyone enrolled. It's 
many of the council members on this call can say that a week doesn't go by. We don't get an email from Sean saying well, that we really have to expand the program and we should. And I just want to echo um, the great work that she does and her organization. And the borough president knows about uh, Swim Strong and, and the work they've been doing for a very long time. So again, thank you, Sean. Thank you for your advocacy and everything that you do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. All righty. Uh, next, we're going to go to uh, Daniel Gallagher, Solis House Incorporated. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Danielle Gallagher, and I'm the Director of Operations at Solis House. Um, thank you for availing the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, for those that don't know, Solace House is a free suicide prevention organization. What we do is offer free therapy to anybody in suicidal distress, anyone who engages in self-harm or have been bereaved by suicide. Of course, um, under that falls depression, anxiety, loneliness, and isolation. We have two offices, one in Long Island City. We are lucky enough to um, be in the New York Irish Center building um, and have a great partnership with them. And we're also located in Yonkers in the Woodlawn area. Um, we also offer family support to anybody who is struggling to help someone who might be suicidal. Um, we help them with language, what to say, resources, et cetera. And we have a group bereavement um, meeting every other week on Thursdays. We see about 70 to 75 clients per week, and we don't have a max amount of sessions that someone can attend. We always felt like that was just putting a Band-Aid over the situation. Mm -hmm. So what we have decided is that clients stay with us until they're ready to be referred out or close. Um, in 2021, we did provide almost 2,500 therapy sessions and all of them were free. We don't accept insurance. We don't require doctor's note. Um, that is our mission to make healthcare, mental healthcare easily accessible. Um, so in 2019, we actually decided to expand our offices and that went from two therapy rooms to five in the New York Irish Center. However, with the pandemic hitting, we have been remote since then. Um, but we are gearing up to go back to that office. Um, so we are requesting $5,000 to the contribution of our office um, and that expansion. Um, and that is us. Any um, uh, what was the amount again? 5,000. 5,000 for an expansion. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. And I'm assuming your workload has increased tremendously. Yes, the pandemic. It's, it's been a very interesting year and transition and what people are presenting with and um, the accessibility. And we unfortunately have had a waiting list and almost, I think almost every other service like us in the city has. So it's definitely needed. Um, and so any support that we can get, we appreciate. Thank you. All right, next we'll go to Rabbi Heck, project lead. And so sorry on the passing of your mom, just wanna give my condolences. Prayers are with you and your family. Uh, hit unmute, Rabbi Heck. He's still muted. Okay, yeah, I'm here. No, it, it, it was my uh, father's sister. Okay. Oh, your father's sister. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Fine. I just want to, first of all, thank you uh, for your friendship and your leadership, both to you and the uh, Deputy Borough President, uh, um, Ebony Young, and all the members of the City Council who have been helping us. Uh, d during the uh, pandemic, your staff was down at our food pantry, bringing masks and gloves and, 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 and PPE. I just want to thank you for, for everything that you've done to really help us. So uh, we've been partners with uh, Queen City government for the past uh, 28 years. We're helping thousands of people. We are a grassroots agency helping people from all walks of life. We have hundreds of uh, immigrant families that we service, youth who are at risk, 
a Holocaust survivors now that were helping it. I just want to thank you because this year we got some new funding from DIFTA uh, uh, from you and we were able to bring uh, additional uh, Meals on Wheels to people's homes who are really suffering, who are home, who really have nothing to eat and it's made such a difference. So um, I just uh, want to thank you. We're seeing a big increase. Families who are suffering, people who are still uh, out of work. A lot of, uh, of the Holocaust survivors are, um, are having nightmares and and flashbacks of the youth because uh, of all the stress of young of of loved ones who have passed away uh, because of the uh, pandemic. And we like to really increase uh, what we're doing. We also would like to increase the services to youth. So we'd like to have more of the uh, recreational uh, and socialization activities as well. So we're on the front lines of poverty and we'd like you to continue uh, to, uh, to be helping us. So we're, we're, we're requesting uh, $20,000 in uh, expense funding, $18,000 in DIFTA allocated funding for frail elderly. And we're also seeking, uh, which is a long project, uh, capital funding at our property in, in, in two gardens uh, for uh, $575,000. So that's still a long process, but we'd like to work with you. And I just want to thank everyone who's been there for us um, uh, every single day. Thank you. And thank you for the work you do, Rabbi Heck. Thank you for leading with your heart. Thank you for the work you do. All right, we're going to go to Joan Lawfer, Queensboro Council for Social Welfare. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joan Serrano Laufer. I've been the director of Queensboro Council for about 30 years. Uh, we're now located, thank you, Mr. Borough President, and the Borough Hall, sharing the room with the Center for the Women of New York, and it gives us a good place to work. The agency is going to celebrate its 100th anniversary in June. Um, we started when Queens was only beginning social service programs and we helped form them and we helped invite people and agencies to the borough, such as the um, Shield Institute for the Developmentally Disabled or the um, other organizations that moved into the borough throughout the years. Um, ACQC was one of them and we're really proud of those things. Uh, at one time we had a large staff. Now with like many other agencies, we lost funding and we had to cut our staff drastically. We do a variety of things. Our information referral program used to be critical because people wouldn't know where to turn for help. And our staff and our volunteers and our students in training, social work interns in training, knew how to refer somebody to an agency for proper service. Now we find that people call us and say, we tried such and such an agency and they didn't do what they said on the website they did. So it's still helpful to connect them. We do trainings at senior centers and such issues as elder abuse prevention. Uh, after each program, somebody comes to us and says, I have a neighbor who has this problem. Never themselves, but always helpful to give them the information that they need to get them started. Uh, we have a $30,000, 29 and change grant through HPD from the Queens delegation. And I always say, if we save one family from being through HPD community services, if we save one family from being homeless, we've saved the city more money than we need. And I went on and on to talk about our 10 services in the subjected material and knowing that we're running a little bit, we started early and now we seem to be running a little late. I just wanna say how badly we need these services. We're asking for money through DIFTA to, from the city council to allow us to continue the services to the various senior centers throughout the borough. We're asking for connect, uh, continuation of our Dove funds, which allow us to work with domestic violence um, and elder abuse folk. Um, and we're asking for the uh, HPD funding. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, we hope to return to the office very shortly. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work you do and all the work you'll do in the future. All righty. Uh, we're now going to head to uh, the witness to, witness to mass incarceration. 
Hey, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you to the borough president for attending our outdoor event at Baisley Park in Queens last summer, where we showcased formerly incarcerated led services and businesses. Witness to mass incarceration is led by and serves incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. We're a member of the Queens Borough President's Nonprofit Network. And since our founding, we've done a series of initiatives and special projects. Right, right now, we are raising money with the permission of the Department of Corrections to provide hats, gloves, and socks to 5,600 people at Rikers. Uh, the weather has been frigid just because it's 70 degrees here. You ought to know it's, it's still cold there and they're out in the water. So we uh, plan on delivering these hats, gloves, and socks March 21st. Uh, Witness was formed based on my experience with the criminal legal system, both behind bars and post-release. Uh, most formerly incarcerated people have endured toxic prejudice and structural injustice that makes it hard for us to access any resources or create a sustainable living. Um, many of us have been denied wage earning jobs for decades and those who are employed risk being fired due to past convictions. Opening a small business or service, as far as we are concerned, is the path that many of us take to circumvent employment discrimination. However, businesses require capital, which doesn't come easy, and the paucity of business agency is especially significant within the African American community. Uh, the inequities in wealth and access to capital is reflected in the following statistic. Prior to the COVID pandemic, there were 5.7 million American small businesses and only 114,400 were black owned. As the backbone of wealth, small service and businesses are community oriented, create employment opportunities, promote the prosperity and safety of their neighborhoods. They have unparalleled potential to build individual wealth, generational wealth, and financial security, which we've been denied. I believe in this unique potential for formerly incarcerated people to create small businesses and services in a space that we haven't been given much space. We are asking for funding to advance our multi-year project called the MAP Project. It is an economic ecosystem of formerly incarcerated led services and businesses. Um, I see I only have 23 seconds. There's no existing listing of formerly incarcerated led services and businesses. And I, is, do I only have 11 seconds left? Yeah. We, okay. We want, <laughs> <laughs> we want to, uh, we want to basically. Well, how much, what are you, how much are you asking? For? We're asking for 25,000 to build out Queens. There are coffee shops and uh, catering businesses. There's a, a lot of people in Queens that we wanna network them and provide them with financial resources. Okay, thank you. Thank you and thank you for the work you're doing. I really did enjoy uh, being out there. Uh, you know, people often like to label and talk down on others because they may not have gone through um, incarceration. And I, I thank you for humanizing these individuals who are looking to better their lives. Uh, they're often talked about and dismissed and talked down upon as if they're nothing. Um, but if everybody's giving a sound opportunity, guess what? We could actually reduce recidivism and reduce crime. Uh, you and can't the, criminalize your way out of crime. You have to give people opportunity. <laughs> and I want to invite you to the second annual. I look forward to being there. <laughs> I was really proud to see the work that they were doing. It, re it really was. So thank you very much. You. All righty. Um, okay, we're now going to go to the Flux Factory. Nat oh, no, I'm sorry. Urban Word NYC and then to the Flux Factory. Uh, Paladino I don't know where they are. Paladino office, mute yourself. But I don't think. Hello, everyone. Hi, thank you so much for having me join in. My name is Chanel Gabriel. I'm with, um, I'm the executive director at Urban Word NYC. Um, greetings to everyone, all these amazing organizations that are present here that some of which we've actually worked with um, and worked in your district. So Urban Word itself um, is a youth organization that believes that poetry and hip hop um, is a pathway to healing, youth development, civic engagement. And um, specifically, um, we're coming to you to talk to, um, a little bit to the program that um, 
that works very much in partnership with a lot of organizations around civic engagement in particular. So we have we run the National Youth Poet Laureate program. However, the biggest launch was actually here in New York City. We started it in New York City, and I apologize, my headphones are not working for some reason. <laughs> if it's a little, it's uh, fine. It's fine. Please. It's fine. Perfect. Okay. Good. Um, but pretty much what we're doing with the, um, with the the funding that we're we're asking for is to be able to continue this program. Um, quite a few grants have um, dried up, and um, it's an art based program that works with young people. Um, from the different boroughs of New York City, but definitely um, we have a large amount of young people from Queens, from Regal Park to um, to Jamaica, to honestly, um, very much a lot of uh, community support out of Queens. Um, and we've worked with um, the Jamaica Arts Center um, on this program as well to focus on allowing young people to be able to use poetry as a method for change and transformation in their community. Um, this program allows them to interact with other artists. Um, we do a lot of partnerships with New York City Votes um, in helping young people recognize the value of voting and civic engagement in that capacity, learning that they become advocates for um, political engagement. Um, and we've had young people that have been in this program that have gone on to be speechwriters uh, for different people. One particular uh, was a speechwriter for Elizabeth Warren's campaign who came out of this program. So um, that we see that young people know that something in their community needs to be changed. They see that, but we, um, we want to give them the platforms as well as the tools to learn about the history of, of um, arts and artivism and activism. And uh, this funding would allow us to be able to support the young people having stipends to be able to attend the program, Metro cards to be able to be there, as well as opportunities for guest speakers to come in and speak with them. And honestly, in speaking with all these amazing people, we'd love for you to actually in kind be able to talk to them about the different things going on in, in the community. But um, the support, the financial support would greatly allow us to continue this program and not just to, to select the Youth Poet Laureate, who we've had at least five of them from Queens, um, one of which who spoke at the Blasio's inauguration, um, performed at that, um, but definitely wanting to continue that legacy of youth activism and uh, youth leadership. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, you know, I am a public service, so all my work is pretty much in kind, although you do pay my salary. So I would be more than willing to come and speak to young people and you know, I'm always willing to do that. That's that's never an issue here. So uh, you could reach out to Michael Mallon, who's on, and he'll connect you. And I would be more than happy to do that. Thank you uh, so much. And uh, we look forward to following up uh, and the work ahead with you. So thank you so much. All righty. Next, we're going to go to uh, Nat Rolf uh, Flux Factory. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your time. Um, and, you know, as with every year, it's really humbling to hear uh, the work of all these other nonprofits in Queens. Um, so I'm the executive director of Flux Factory. Uh, we were founded in 1994. We've been in Queens since 2001, and we run an artist in residency and gallery space. So uh, for emerging artists, we provide affordable studios. Um, of course, the affordability crisis doesn't just affect housing, it also affects people's workspaces and a place where people can create work at um, a stage where they really need that affordability so that they can take the next steps up in their career um, is really crucial. Um, we also provide free uh, public events and exhibitions, um, you know, everything from concerts to group exhibitions, solo exhibitions, all of those are free and we always pay artists to present their work. Um, and we really are a, a very prolific group because at the core of what we do, there's just um, a very energetic community of people. Um, I really do look at us as a community space first that uses culture to bring people together. Um, so this is a really incredible year uh, for Flux Factory. Um, we've been, as, as I think you know already, uh, we've been in a long-term capital transformation where we just purchased our building through funding from the city of New York. So in July, um, the space became ours and we will exist forever in this space. So um, the escalation of rent had really been, you know, might have driven us out of business entirely otherwise. Um, so we're currently under renovations um, and we're very grateful for, to your office for uh, providing some liaising to the Queens Department of Buildings Commissioner as part of that process. 
Um, that's been really uh, great to help make sure that our filings go successfully. Uh, we're also going to be opening a satellite space in Hunters Point South. Um, both of these are happening, you know, in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, and so that space will be um, that that'll be providing a uh, gallery space and some co working space as well for artists. It's on parcel G um, and you may have seen that the buildings are really coming online, um, the Gotham buildings and there's some new TF cornerstone stuff that's coming up um, and it strangely there's. I don't think there's a bus line even contemplated going to that area. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that we're making a request of $71,000 for a 15 seat passenger van in this fiscal year. Um, it'll allow us to move people and also, uh, you know, things you can imagine as an art space, we're schlepping things very often. Um, and we've relied implicitly on people kind of letting us loan their personal cars for organizational purposes which is very kind of our uh, community of volunteers, but is kind of gradually becoming unsustainable. So that is uh, what we've made a request for this year. And um, we're grateful for your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that's 55K in capital, right? Uh, I believe it was 71. 70, I'm sorry, 71. Okay. Yeah. All righty. And that's for a van? Uh, yes, a 15 seat uh, passenger van. Okay. Got it. Okay. All right. Next, we'll go to, uh, thank you. Thank you for the work. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll go to Riccardi, uh, QEDC. Good afternoon, Board President Richards. Good afternoon, Council members and Board members, and also the other great organizations that are um, on this on this call. Okay, so. Um, my name is Ricardi Calix, and I'm the uh, deputy director at the Queens Economic Development Corp. And you know, Queens DC, we are a nonprofit organization. We've been around since 1977, and we are uh, our mission is to help create and retain jobs through small business development that includes neighborhood revitalization, individual counseling, training and funding, and provision of commercial kitchen space at the incubator at the East Space in Long Island City. We also provide community marketing clean up through the most efficient graffiti removal program. And our Queens Tourism Council promotes the cultural and recreational benefits of the borough. Um, in 2021, we started working with, uh, with Queens Together, uh, which is a, a coalition um, of, um, of, of, you know, in, that empower restaurants to the Plated Forward program, which helps feed frontline workers and assist people facing food and economic insecurity during the times of crisis. And all of our programs and emphasis is to make, uh, is made to work closely with low income, women, minorities, and, immigrant, and immigrants in order to bridge the inequality gap. All the programs we are requesting funding for are open to everyone and we never charge any fees, but we really serve as a, as a support system for the entrepreneurship community, for the business community, and also, to help uh, you know, stimulate economic investment in the borough. Uh, so for the fiscal specific programs, the total is $85,000 broken down as follows. So the small business assistance program that we provide, we're asking for 20,000. This provides entrepreneurship training, which includes planning, workshops, seminars, and individual counseling in the areas of planning, operations, marketing, and finance. For our graffiti, graffiti free Queens program, we're asking for 30,000. Um, uh, keeping Queens graffiti free through the quick cleanup of any graffiti in local communities. This includes all types of graffiti and defacement cleaned through our rapid response deployment program. The QEDC will take direction from the funding representative and in most cases have sites cleaned within two to three days. Our, we're asking for $10,000 for our tourism and marketing initiative, which promotes the borough's many cultural, recreational, and culinary attractions through events, advertising, and marketing through the Queens Tourism Council and our It's in Queens website. And lastly, um, working with Queens Together, which is a network of, of, of Queens-based restaurants, um, especially those in underserved neighborhoods, um, founded at the onset of the pandemic. It is a resource for best business practices, providing assistance when there was revenue due to crisis. So 
uh, we are uh, asking for $25,000 for this consortium of community-based organizations to help provide food security in underserved neighborhoods where residents lost their income or were too ill to shop and, um, and they're providing prepared meals. We look forward to any support that we can receive from your office, um, but President, and as always, we always want to be a resource to um, the, uh, the entire borough when it comes to business support and, and neighborhood revitalization. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your critical support uh, for our small businesses uh, and all the efforts around feeding and promoting Queens through the pandemic. So I wanna to continue to uplift your organization and thank you for all the work you've done uh, throughout the uh, pandemic and beyond. All righty, uh, DBP, you're gonna take over for a minute. Got it. All righty. All right, thank you. So we're gonna move on next to uh, Caring Kind, the heart of Alzheimer's caregiving, waging she on deck, a better Jamaica. Uh, waging she. Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Waging Shi. I am a uh, Caring Kind uh, diversity outreach director and Chinese outreach manager. And thank you uh, for uh, providing me this opportunity uh, to join this uh, testimony session. Um, I'm so happy to see everyone uh, again here. Um, and then everybody, uh, I think I joined this meeting for a couple of years. And Kevin Kai has been in New York for almost the 40 years. We provide like special service and a unique service to the people uh, to the individual and the family affected by Alzheimer. Um, so I am not, I, you know, my English is, is not my first language, but I learned from the English, like one word is very, really, very really, uh, good interpret, uh, like the Alzheimer. They said, Alzheimer is no discrimination. Yes, it is. Everyone can be affected by this disease. Um, we, uh, we are here to provide the service, um, include support group, education, consultation, uh, and then uh, Wonderly Safety Program. And everyone, you know that Queens, like the Chinese population and uh, Latino population is grow very fast. Um, in the past few years, uh, especially under pandemic, uh, everyone stay home, especially like the elderly, um, they are very isolated. Uh, from, from the Alzheimer, from the Alzheimer and dementia family, they all very, very, uh, very, very uh, suffer with, uh, with like the outside, with Alzheimer disease and then also under pandemic. Uh, I thank you so much for, uh, Queen's Bolo uh, president, they giving us funding this year. We want to continue to require the, the, the funding to cover our continued service. And then we ask for uh, 20,000 uh, in for our like the events or like the classes. And then uh, like a wonderly safety program um, to cover not only Chinese population, to cover Chinese population and Latino population. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and they also, also, I just want to emphasize something. Like I said, uh, I always say the words to my community. I said, I look young, but I am getting older. I might affect it by Alzheimer. So we have to increase our awareness about this disease since now on. It is not only for the elderly, also for the younger generation. So we will focus on education, different uh, generations. So this is I want to share everyone here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your service, Weijing. We appreciate you presenting today. Um, we are going to go ahead and skip a better Jamaica as they are not on right now and move to Old Astoria Neighborhood uh, Association, Richard Kazumi. One deck is NYCH20. Thank you kindly. Yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Borough President. Uh, it's Richard Kuzami. Uh, okay, and uh, it's good to see you. Um, the Old Astoria Neighborhood Association uh, is a 501c3 nonprofit formed in 2014 uh, with our nonprofit status 
approved in 2015. We are based uh, on and near the formerly redlined Western Queens waterfront as follows. Easternmost border is 21st Street and Steinway Street. Westernmost border is the East River. Northernmost border is the East River and southernmost border, Queensboro Plaza North. Our mission statement is to promote communications between residents and city agencies, private business, developers, charities, and elected officials. To promote local business environment for economic growth and promote neighborhood reinvestment. Enhance the cultural health of our area, both in artistic achievement and promotion and in relations between various ethnic groups. And lastly, to work to identify quality of life issues and advocate for solutions. OANA uh, aims to accomplish its missions by arranging and facilitating presentations, workshops, town hall meetings in the Astoria community. In the last election season, we hosted two debates of candidates in District uh, 22. We invite government agencies, electeds, private institutions, and local residents and business to address issues of local interest. ONA will provide the services uh, for the benefit of residents, businesses, and owners of properties that are located within uh, the borders of the stated above. Some issues we've addressed include advocating uh, with other stakeholders for the New York Ferry Landing and its direct extension to the Upper East Side, the start of street cleaning in the neighborhood. Uh, we never had any street cleaning for 40 years. Creation of a school safety zone, particularly around PS 171, and a lot of other uh, important We currently are deeply involved in the bus lane proposals for 21st Street. We're also working to present an arts festival on the waterfront and to create an arts district in order to highlight our institutions such as Socrates Sculpture Park and the Taguchi Museum and artists that I call Old Astoria home. We've been recipients of New York City Council discretionary funding since 2015 and greatly appreciative of the support we've been receiving. However, we're a small non-volunteer driven organization. When we need professional assistance, we often turn to subcontractors to handle our web presence, social media, design graphics and physical flyer distribution. We have no employees. Regretfully, we cannot get these funds reimbursed through the city council discretionary funding, but this would be allowed through the borough president's funding. <clears throat> These subcontractors include young neighbors who help with local outreach. We strongly believe in trying to keep funds in the neighborhood. We cover a large part of that sub subcontractor cost. We will be instrumental in our growth. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Uh, did you state your monetary request, Richard? That's at the end there, $10,000. 10000 Okay, thank you kindly. Appreciate that. I know you do a lot of work in Old Story, and we appreciate that. Thank you so kindly. Uh, but we'll go ahead and have Matt Molina, NYCH2O on deck. Uh, it's uh, Seattle uh, Global Citizen Incorporated. Thank you. Matt Molina. Oh, uh, hello. This is David Chichuka for NYCH2O. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Borough President Richard's office and members of the Queens delegation for hearing our testimony today. Uh, my name is David Chichuka, Assistant Director of uh, for NYCH2O, and our mission is to inspire and educate New Yorkers of all ages to learn about, enjoy, and protect our city's local water ecology uh, through providing public programs and school programs at historic reservoirs and parklands. We encourage diverse citizens to advocate for responsible public policy. Our activities promote science-based knowledge of New York's local ecosystems and what is needed for urban water resilience in a time of escalating climate change impacts. I'm here today to talk about our citywide ecological sustainability proposal with Jamaica Bay Rockaway, uh, Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy, the Bronx River Alliance, Natural Areas Conservancy, and the Van Cortlandt Park Alliance. As part of the Greener NYC initiative, we propose a citywide ecological sustainability program to protect the city's valuable ecosystems, mitigate increasing uh, climate change impacts, and improve open spaces and waterways. Uh, our coalition has formulated a citywide plan that will engage the public in environmental education, stewardship, and provide green jobs and training designed to improve the ecosystems in public spaces, parklands, and wetlands. According to our partners at the Nat Natural Areas Conservancy, there are over 20,000 acres of forests and wetlands in New York City. Uh, divided across these 20,000 acres, our proposal comes out to under $90 an acre. 
NYCH2O has a successful track record of organizing cleanups on beaches across the city and at the Ridgewood Reservoir in Highland Park. Bringing together hundreds of volunteers a year, we are able to do the same work the city normally spends four to five times more on through contract work. The benefits are more than just cost savings. Our work provides New Yorkers the opportunity to get involved in their local communities, experience our city's natural environment, and learn something new. Um, with this funding, NYCH2O, with this funding, we will remove invasive species and plant native species in Highland Park, Baisley Pond Park, Lemon Creek, Conference House Park, Mount Loretta Unique Area, and St. Francis Woodlands. Uh, we will hire six full-time stewards from the communities surrounding these natural areas and provide green job training. We will continue our STEM field trips, which bring over 28, which have brought over 28,000 public school students from 284 schools, primarily Title I and III schools, to New York City parklands. Uh, we will organize monthly volunteer stewardship events and engage the public in programming that brings them into our local parks. Uh, we believe that getting people out into nature is the best way to foster a connection with the environment and encourage community engagement. Um, we thank you for your time and consideration, and we have submitted a longer proposal as written testimony. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your time, Dave. Appreciate your service. Uh, we have Speaker Adams who has joined us. Do you want to say a few words, Speaker Adams? Okay, if not, we're going to go ahead and move to Stephanie Molcock, please, Agarda. Is, is that a hand, Mr. Uh, Councilmember? Oh, yeah, Councilmember Holden, yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks, David, for that one. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was, he's saying, yeah, I that was you. good. Uh, it's, hard yeah. to see, it's hard to see everyone on the Zoom because uh, obviously the screen is smaller. But uh, David, I just want to thank you for your testimony and H2O for their great, great work, uh, particularly in the Ridgewood Reservoir. Um, that's, uh, by the way, they, they do public, um, uh, obviously, um, trips and uh, school trips and programs and they supervise a lot of cleanups uh, at the reservoir um, over the years and I participated a few times it's very grueling it's, it's <laughs> but it's a lot you get fresh air and you get a glimpse of what Queens used to look like before um, we all got uh, you know involved in um, paving it over so it, it's really nice that um, h2o is doing the work uh, at the reservoir and um, a lot more work has to be done, but just the supervising of the volunteers and all that, all that they do to preserve what, you know, the past of Queens and, and nature is so important. So if you get a chance, go out to Highland Park, take a look at the, you could see most of Queens, by the way, right up, right up to the Rockaways. It's a great, great view um, in my district. I just, um, and I want to thank David for his, uh, his testimony and, and, and certainly let's try to fund H2O even more than we've had in the past and try to, uh, to, to really take advantage of the great work that they do. So thanks, David. Thanks for, uh, uh, by the way, thanks for seeing my hand up again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Council member. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we can share it widely. Yeah, thank, you, right? thank you all so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Council Member Holden. We will now have uh, Stephanie Wolcock. Good afternoon, and thank you, Queensboro Deputy President uh, President Ebony Young, and uh, Queensboro uh, President Donovan Richard, Queens Council Members, and Community Board Chairs. My name is Stephanie Wolcock, and I am Executive Director of GAHA, a community-based organization advocating on behalf of Brazilian immigrants in New York City. GAHA was previously named Cidadão Global. We appreciate the opportunity to present testimony for you today in support of GAHA's discretionary funding request. GAHA's mission is to increase the economic and political power of Brazilian immigrant women living in New York City by providing them the tools needed to increase their political visibility and economic independence in order to make a positive and tangible social impact for all immigrants. GAHA is the only organization providing language specific and culturally appropriate services to the Brazilian immigrant community living in New York City, estimated at about 200,000 individuals and growing every day. 85% of those who access our services reside in Queens, the epicenter of Brazilian immigration to New York City, specifically in the areas of Astoria, Long Island City, Sunnyside, and Woodside. 90% of our members are women and 75% of those are low wage workers. Some of the biggest problems impacting the community are fraud against immigrants, wage theft, 
partner abuse, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis. Lack of correct information available in Portuguese and scarce resources keep the community in a cycle of oppression, harming everything from their ability to keep their immigration status to their ability to be paid what they earned. Our organization invested in a number of projects and seek to provide community members with the leadership development, knowledge of rights, community organizing, and public education in order to strengthen civic participation and collaboration with the community. These projects include Know Your Rights workshop series on domestic violence, immigration rights, health care access, and employment rights, weekly legal clinics in the area of immigration law, direct legal services, opportunities for civic engagement, and domestic violence counseling and referrals. In connection with our empowerment leadership program, we offer bilingual forums and advocacy opportunities that aim to involve immigrants in the political process and civic debates. Any funding will be used to support GAHA's work in increasing civic engagement of immigrants, increasing knowledge of legal rights, and increasing the economic and leadership development of immigrants. Funds will be used to conduct legal clinics, conduct outreach and distribute Know Your Rights information online and at churches, salons, libraries, schools, and other places where immigrants gather, conduct bilingual English and Brazilian Portuguese Know Your Rights presentations, design, publish, and disseminate Know Your Rights information in Portuguese. We encourage the board to invest in immigration, immigrant organizations as a way to empower the community and lift the immigrant populations out of the shadows. Thank you so much for letting me speak today. Wow, that was timely. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Amazing work. Thank you for the work that you do. It's amazing. Um, we are going to have Oratorial Society of Queens, and on deck is the Brown House Historical Society. So am I next? Yes. Hi, I'm Jim Trent. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, my, I'm Jim Trent. I'm a member of the board of the uh, Oratorial Society of Queens. The Oratorial Society of Queens uh, was founded in 1927 and is the oldest performing arts organization in the borough. We were founded as the Oratorial Society of Flushing, but we've grown, we professionalized, and our performances elevate the cultural offerings uh, to Queens to rival the quality of what can be found in Manhattan or I would say anywhere else, not just Manhattan. We now draw both members and audience participants from all over Queens and even from outside of Queens. Our headquarters are in Forest Hills. Uh, we rehearse in Flushing and we perform twice yearly uh, in Bayside at the Queensborough Community College. We serve everybody on hence seeking funds from all municipal sources in Queens, uh, Borough President, Queens delegation and the individual council members since their constituents attend enjoy and are enriched by the work of OSQ. We give our exposure to uh, performing young performing artists and enrichment to audience and singing members of all ages. Our organization hit a road bump with the cessation of live rehearsals this year due to the COVID considerations. People who are lovers of music tend also to be lovers of people. The cessation of live rehearsals and with our switch to virtual rehearsals was problematic for some of our members. But we are back to live rehearsals and we are hard at work rebuilding our membership. We are also back to live concerts. Our next concert at Queensborough Community College is on May 15th. So mark your calendars and don't miss it. But we are more than just music. We employ 90 union member uh, musicians, 14 professional vocalists. Um, we also engage photographers, recording engineers, stage crews. We provide income to the Queensboro Performing Arts Center, and we provide support for local restaurants, florists, and printing services. We also provide rental income to Beth, uh, Temple Beth Solom, uh, which is down uh, near the edge of downtown Flushing. OSQ does a superb job at raising funds from private sources. But as is the case with almost all not-for-profits, additional support from the government sector is essential. We are requesting a total of $60,000. Um, and there's a breakdown that was you know, sent to you a couple of days earlier. It's $10,000 from the borough president and the rest divided amongst the, uh, the delegation and individual council members. Did it in one minute. Wow, okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate your time. Uh, yes, we did receive your information, so we look forward to working with you. In the okay. Um, and now we have uh, the Brown House Historical Society on deck, Better Jamaica. 
All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Elise Helmers, Executive Director of the Boundhouse Historical Society. Thank you for this opportunity to present today. For fiscal year 2023, Boundhouse Historical Society is requesting $50,000 in funding for the following three initiatives, the development of educational programming recognizing our designation, as a national underground railroad site through the National Park Service's Network to Freedom, the digitization of the Boundhouse archives, including the application of Past Perfect and Story Map software. And lastly, we're requesting funding for an artifact preservation project. These projects will allow the residents of Queens, as well as national and international audiences, to access over 360 years of Boundhouse history and nearly 1,000 years of Queens history. To give you a very brief overview of the Boundhouse Historical Society, we were founded in 1945 with the support of Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia and Judge Charles Colden. The Bound Home itself was constructed circa 1661 and is the oldest home in the borough of Queens and one of the oldest in New York State. Notable achievements of its residents include John Bound's 1662 defense of religious freedom and liberty of conscience, as well as the Bound Parsons family members' participation in abolition efforts and anti-slavery activism throughout the 18th century into the 19th century. As mentioned, in fall 2021, Boundhouse was designated as an underground railroad site in the National Park Service's Network to Freedom. We're the only designation from the Borough of Queens and one of only a few located in Greater New York. This designation recognizes Boundhouse as a facility for the research of underground railroad history. As part of the network, will be made more accessible to both national and international audiences, of researchers, scholars, tourists, and history enthusiasts, and perhaps most importantly, school groups and classrooms across the five boroughs. Um, now I'll give you a bit more detail about our individual funding requests um, that we talk about further in our testimony that we submitted. And, um, for the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom programming, we seek to develop our school programs across grade levels in order to highlight the home and property's history as an underground railroad site um, and the family's involvement in the abolition movement. Um, and education projects will include the creation of new lesson plans for in-person and virtual school field trips in accordance with New York City social studies curriculums. Um, and we also want to make those programs more accessible to uh, students um, with unique sensory and learning needs, as well as translating those programs into a variety of languages. Um, for archives and digitization project, um, we have over 300 years of Queens and New York history um, in primary source materials that date back to the colonial period and include bound family correspondence, business records, and paper ephemera. Uh, the, I'll skip ahead a little bit because I know I'm running out of time. Um, it's really important for digitization to take place because it uh, spares wear uh, while ensuring that their contents will survive in the worst case scenarios of disaster or theft that we have to prepare for. Um, and lastly, just I'll skip ahead, um, the artifact preservation project is the last thing we're requesting funding for, and that's to properly house over 10,000 artifacts that um, the Bound House has from over uh, from three different archaeological excavations that took place on the property and are now being stored offsite at Queens College. All right, thank you. you and your monetary <laughs> Sorry for going request. over. That's okay. Your monetary request uh, was fifty thousand, and in our testimony, we've broken it down so you can see what each project needs. Yep. Okay. Thank you so thank kindly. You. Appreciate your time. A better Jamaica, please. And on deck, we have Sunnyside Community Services. Better Jamaica. If you're on, off mute, please. I don't see you here. Uh, hey, uh, Greg Mays is here. Greg is here. Yes. I'm here and I'm here. Okay. Okay. Can you we see you. Yes, we can. Great, great. My name is Greg Mays. My organization is A Better Jamaica. We started in January 31st, 2007. We are 15 years old uh, now. So we're celebrating just sort of the after your 15th year anniversary. Uh, as many of you know, we started out very simply showing movies in two parks, St. Albans Park in the summer of 2007. We had some discretionary films on the rear comedy. We showed Happy Feet and Pride. It was exactly as I envisioned. We put the screen up and the people didn't need come. At this point, we're up to 16 programs, uh, everything from 34 live jazz presentations at the Air Train Jamaica Station, which is going to restart, thankfully, uh, come April the 7th, I think that first Thursday is. 
Um, and we are still in the schools with our reading program where we deploy senior citizens to tutor one-on-one -on -one first graders who are struggling with the acquisition of their reading skills. You can only imagine how important a project like that is today. So you can really find more about us at abetterjamaica.org. All of our programs are there. I just wanted to just sort of shout out a couple of the new uh, developments that we're working on. Uh, the first is a program called Civic Duty, and it is in, partic in particular a hands-on civics education. Um, so we will launch that program within the next month and we'll work with 10 to 15 11th graders who reside in the South Jamaica houses. I have a meeting with the board of director of the South Jamaica Resident Association tomorrow night, and then the larger meeting with the body is on the 10th or so. Uh, so really, really excited about that. We're gonna do everything from start the kids from going to their resident association meeting, we'll go to a neighborhood association meeting, they'll go to the community board, they'll go to the borough board, they'll go to the city council, we'll go to the state, and finally we'll go to the federal. So a really, really impactful program for 10 to 15 young people there. Um, also, uh, the Jamaica Media Center is a project that we've been working on for quite some time. We're in the third of three phases in the planning for that. The first phase was to just sort of objectively determine whether there would be users for that um, program. And that consulting work was done by Web Management Services. The second phase was building out a business plan. We would identify just different revenue streams. And the final phase, which is kicking off next week, is the financial feasibility in terms of the fundraising feasibility. So we have a consultant called Advance NYC, and they're going to go throughout the foundation community as well as talk to the electives and make sure that we have the money to one, both build the program out, uh, the facilities out, and keep it going on a regular basis. So that's the, the Jamaica Media Center. Please stay tuned for that. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to talk about just sort of a, another new program, the Jamaica Community Choir. I know and love the Queens Oratorio Society. I sing to this day because I, as a middle schooler, I started to sing at IS-59 under Miss Anne-Marie Hudley. So it's something that we're going to launch in October, given the right funds. So all, again, all of the details or some of the details in our testimony and our website is at a better Jamaica.org. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it, Greg. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for your work. Appreciate that. Donna Gensler, right. uh, Sunnyside Community Services, and on deck is Forest Hills Visiting Neighbors. You're on mute. You're on mute, Jonah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Ebony. It's great to have allies at the Borough President's Office. And my name is Jonah Gensler. I'm the Associate Executive Director of Community Services at Sunnyside Community Services. Um, thank you to all council members and certainly to the Borough President, Richard. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of 16,000 Queens residents who come to us every day for support. These last two years have brought huge disparities in our city and our borough all this into focus. And we as an organization, we played a critical role in helping New Yorkers who have fallen behind and get helping them to get back on track. During this pandemic, we were a lifeline for families and community members. We opened a temporary pantry, including resources that came from the borough president's office. We distributed over $700,000 in cash assistance to families that were struggling to pay rent, utilities, et cetera, excluded workers' funds, we distributed 300,000 masks throughout Queens. And so as part of the nonprofit fabric of New York City, we are also part of the city's recovery. The need for our core services and supporting of, of youth, seniors, immigrants has only increased. And so today we asked the borough president and the Queens delegation to allocate funding so that we can help meet these needs. We're requesting $10,000 from the borough president and 50 from the Queens delegation to support our full continuum of senior services Every year, 7,000 seniors are participating in our active adult, older adult center, getting benefits, getting case management, home delivered meals. They're having friendly visitors, caregiving, just to name a few programs. We have a very urgent request for $100,000 in capital support from Borough President Richard's office and $172,000 from Council Member Julie Wan. And this is because of the damage that Hurricane Ida wreaked, wrecked on our community center at Woodside Houses. We had water up to people's waists. The center was destroyed. And so we're looking to get the furniture and the equipment to make that center come back to life for the residents of Woodside Houses.
This storm caused tremendous damage. NYCHA is doing its part to take care of the renovations that are needed, but we need that furniture, we need that equipment in order for us to survive and serve the community. We're also requesting uh, money for other initiatives, the senior center programs and enhancements. New York City support our seniors, healthing aging, senior centers for immigrant populations, among others. Um, we thank uh, Councilman Holden, uh, Council Member Wan, Council Member Moya, and Council Member Krishman, who will all be considering our requests. Thank you for your commitment and thank you for your support in advance. Thank you so much, Joan. I know the great work you do over at Sunnyside Community Services, so we thank you. Um, we're gonna go perfect. Wow. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to the Forest Hills visiting neighbors with Cynthia Morrow, and then on deck will be opportunities for a better tomorrow. Uh, Deputy Borough President. Yes. Something? Yes, Council Member uh, Holden. Yeah, I, I just want to congratulate uh, Sunnyside Community Services, Jonah. Uh, you guys did an amazing job, especially way way before the pandemic, but especially during the pandemic. You were a lifeline for a part of my community. And I thank you for that. And um, whatever is, is you need, you should get because uh, Sunnyside, you know, community services is so important. So in the capital area, whatever I can do to help out, I, 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 I'd certainly do it. And I'll, I'll talk to uh, council member Juan because, um, and, and I guess she knows, she obviously knows what you mean to the community uh, beyond Sunnyside, beyond the community of Sunnyside and, and, uh, but again, no, I think without Sunnyside Community Services during the pandemic, I don't know where we'd be. So I just want to congratulate you and all the great work that your your uh, people do there. Um, I witnessed it firsthand, and we can't do enough in Queens for for you um, to to improve your your space at Sunnyside. So thanks so much for your testimony. Thank you, Thank you so much, Councilmember Holden. And I really do appreciate your loss, your personal loss of, of your mom. And I think that we were honored to have been part of her life as well. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you. Yeah, okay, so we're gonna move on to Cynthia Morrow. Hard to follow that, <laughs> but we help our corner of the world nonetheless. Um, I'm Cynthia from Visiting Neighbors. We are going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We came into Queens in 1984 to take that wonderful concept of Neighbors Helping Neighbors into the Forest Hills Regal Park area. We work with a predominantly the oldest old, 85 plus. A lot of people forget that this is a society we are aging and we are living longer. T uh, 10 years ago, the average age of senior was coming into our program was 79. Now it's 89, 90. Um, looking for help. We had a little lady the other day, she's 99, came in for help and called us up and we said, what, wait, what you took so long for? And she's like, I didn't need you before, but I need you now. And with the pandemic, I was completely isolated like a prisoner. And that's something I do wanna address. During this pandemic, it, it really exacerbated the issues already faced by older adults struggling to stay independent in their own homes. We have a simple concept, just volunteers that we find, just people from the community who either live, work, or play here and want to uh, befriend an older adult. And never has the, something as simple as a card in the mail, snail mail, we really depended on that. We did tremendous amounts of mailings of information, cheer up cards, um, get well, uh, condolences, and also any form of uh, engagement mentally. We, the seniors especially loved all of our little uh, wittisms and uh, riddles, uh, and then sent us more and it just kept going. The uh, seniors that we uh, worked with, um, we, we basically remained open and active throughout the pandemic. Now we're predominantly in the Forest Hills Regal Park area, however, we got calls throughout the whole city because this is the way it was. And we extended our telephone reassurance. If somebody was lonely, just needing a contact. We're asking for your continued support, one, to advocate for older adults. We know the council gets it. And we're so thankful for our borough president of Queens to understand and recognize the needs of his older constituents. We do a lot with very little and we continue on. We're here to keep people connected, engaged, and as part of our community and not forgotten that they matter. And that's our message. You matter. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if you named a monetary request, Cynthia. 
I did it, but we, you know, last year we got 3000 because he managed to find some extra money under the, under the hat. And then we get $2,500 through the, um, our um, Karen Kaslowitz, who has actually helped fund and start our program. She was part of our original connection. She's an amazing gal. And we're hoping that her, um, you know, the one who's carrying her torch now, um, you know, Lynn Shulman will take that and support us at the $2,500 level. Like I said, we do a tremendous amount. We're a little group with a big impact. We think of ourselves as sort of like the little engine that could, and we do. Thank right. you. Thank you. Great work. Appreciate that. Dr. Williams, you're on and up next on deck, Micah Dicker of Siana. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Darlene Williams, and I'm the president and CEO for Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow. Thank you to Bear President um, Donovan Richards Jr., the Queen City Council members, and chairs for the community boards for inviting us to speak today. I'm here to advocate for increased funding to serve more people in Queens and to help the city recover equitably. Founded in 1983, we are one of the city's largest providers for workforce development and education services for opportunity youth between the ages of 17 and 24 who are neither enrolled in school or participating in the labor market. We also work with adults who are disconnected from education and or employment. Our mission at OBT is simply to break the cycle of poverty and equity in education, job training, and employment. And we do that by serving as a bridge to economic opportunity for youth, individuals, and families in the underserved communities that we provide. We provide programming from high school equivalency courses to industry certified job training programs for high school graduates. And our focus is really to meet individuals where they are to meet their goal. As we all know, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the US labor markets are rapidly changing um, programs that were dissolving for these people in this participating group. So we wanna make sure that we have jobs and we're happy to serve them well. So we ask for support of the younger generation of Queens and we wanna do this now so they can flourish and contribute to our city's recovering economy. So our request is broken down between the Queens delegation and the Queen City Council members. So we're asking to invest in the following ways. $325,000 for a quality assurance and resource team. So researching trends, especially now, understanding the market and the needs of the community is really critical to the components that we serve to provide effective service delivery. We want to improve how we evaluate, how we use our program data, and how we meet the needs of the participants and our partners. $73,000 for a community liaison. We want to increase our partnerships. So there's more barriers violence, food insecurity that we see with our participants as they come into our programs. So we want to build a robust community partnership so we can enhance our referral services that we do to people in our network. $40,000 for our medical administrative assistance program. We saw more than ever that our medical professionals were very important for the pandemic. So we have a very strong medical administrative assistance program in Southeast Queens. And we want to continue to in increase that program so we can have a pipeline to mental health providers and medical providers. And then of course, our college access program. Mountain now more than ever before advanced degrees and certifications really open the door to economic stability. So we wanna make sure that we can continue to provide service to stop over 1,000 participants annually before they can get that pipeline to um, education. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for all the work that you do. We appreciate you. you. Uh, Sienna, Michael Dicker, and then on deck, we have Manuela Gamora and New York Senate. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Micah Dicker, and I'd like to thank uh, Queensborough President Richards and all his staff and all the Queens Council members and all their staff um, for hearing us out and for um, be, be for supporting us during our uh, during our during Sienna's time serving the Queens community. Uh, last year, Sienna celebrated our 15th anniversary, albeit virtually. Um, in those 15 years, we have made a tremendous impact in the community. Uh, serving new Americans. Our full name is the Center for the Integration and Advancement of New Americans. And we were founded in 2006 with a particular focus on uh, immigrants from uh, the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. And the reason why was because after 9-11, as I'm sure many of you know, many people from those communities experienced a lot of discrimination, harassment, bigotry, um, and one of the resulting one of the results of that was a fear of seeking out services that they needed, basic services that they needed to help um, you know achieve econo economic and educational and social mobility. So Siana was founded as a response to that to help provide services such as English classes 
civics classes, uh, access and assistance applying for public benefits like SNAP, housing, rental assistance, uh, providing uh, immigration legal services, and for younger community members providing um, after school help, after school homework help and enrichment, all these uh, basic really community focused services that we felt and still feel are crucial to um, help immigrant communities achieve economic advancement and social advancement. And um, as time has gone on, we've, uh, and as our presence in the community has increased and awareness of us has increased, we now serve clients from all over the world, particularly a growing population from Latin America. So we currently wanna focus on uh, recovery and resilience from the COVID-19 pandemic. Immigrant communities, for many of the reasons I've explained, the isolation, the bigotry, have um, been disproportionately impacted by, have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So we're requesting $75,000 to increase our organizational capacity and expand our direct service programs, including our classes, our legal services, our after school programs, our case management services, to uh, provide to to provide these services to the communities, as well as to hire additional multilingual, culturally competent staff to ensure that immigrant voices are heard, their needs addressed, and their rights and security reinforced. Uh, we, uh, we've always viewed racial and cultural and ethnic equity as a key component of, who, of what we do. Um, and we are in many ways a trusted messenger to help bring immigrant communities, um, help bring them out of any fear that they may have of, of government, of government agencies, and of seeking help in the community. Uh, we want to be the voice for them and we want to provide as much help as we can for them. And in the past year alone, particularly for the pandemic, we've seen a growth of over 200%, um, specifically 232% in clients from before the pandemic. Um, and we hope that number continues to grow and we would like your support in helping us achieve that. Thank you. Thank you, Micah, and thank you for being a voice. Uh, before we move on to Manuela, really quickly announcement, uh, can you please um, sign in with the name that you use to RSV on your group for? Because if you come into the room or someone comes into the room and we don't know who's coming in, they will not be let in. So please sign in with, with the name that you RSVP for. And um, it is also uh, important that you, everybody understands this is one speaker per, per organization. So we do appreciate you uh, understanding that. And so we'll go ahead and move on to Manuela. Thank you. And thank you so much. Um, hello, um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Manuela Zamora. I'm uh, the executive director of New York Sandworks, a not-for-profit organization that builds hydroponic farm classrooms uh, from kindergarten to 12th grade in New York City public schools. Our goal is to teach STEM and particularly science of the science of sustainability through the lens of urban farming. Uh, our cutting edge uh, urban labs are designed precisely for urban environments. And um, we are committed to grow a generation of environmentally engaged learners prepared to meet the challenges of the future. The challenges of today and the future, I should say. Uh, we build hydroponic labs in existing classrooms. So it's a very cost effective solution to students um, uh, for learning for students to learn and also can grow, to grow nutritious foods right there in the classroom year round with 21st century technology. Most of these labs have been built with capital funding from city budget. Uh, and today we're um, addressing the need to provide programming support to these labs. So this, uh, our program is not really an, an luxurious additional class. It's really an integrated part of the school curricula. It's directly um, connected with the daily school programming and it really augments and strengthens the science learning that happens in the school. So the New Sonos program gives access to high quality science education in a way that is relevant to the moment. We start in elementary schools with a year round hands-on science and nutritious curriculum nutrition curriculum, <laughs> it's nutritious too. And uh, we continue through 12th grade with uh, the region's required lab curriculum. We're working to build a geographic pipeline of schools so that students may continue to have access to this type of program all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade. So the 12, 12 years of a school grade um, time. <laughs> 
In addition to working with elementary schools uh, and middle schools, with funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, we're creating a high school certification program so that students graduating from our program will have an industry recognized credential. And we're helping to find pathways to either uh, jobs in this quickly expanding field, but also into CUNY or SUNY education. This is a uh, green workforce development, and we're excited to bring it to Queens. So uh, we're currently working with 31 K to 12 grade schools in Queens, and we have um, scheduled 10 additional schools that will be funding um, and building a lab the summer of 2022. So today we're respectfully requesting to uh, Queens uh, representation here. Uh, the support of $180,000 for 20 labs that need uh, $9,000 of programming per year. The $9,000 will cover all our support, all materials for students, um, teacher training, and um, you know all program support for the year. So I encourage, two seconds, I'll finish. <laughs> I encourage you to uh, support these schools who have all the investment already in the labs installations and the continuation of the program is, is really fundamental for the um, uh, impact of science learning in their communities. Thank you so much. Thank you for supporting the sciences, Manuela. We appreciate you. Um, we have Alexa uh, from Variety Boys and Girls Club and on deck is Bob Mahonan. I'm um, sorry, Monahan from the Greater Ridgewood Youth Council. Alexia. Actually, it's Leah Carter. Alexia, okay. RSVP repeat for us. Thank Good you. Afternoon. Thank you, Borough President Donovan, Borough President, Deputy Borough President uh, Young, City Council members, and honored guests. My name is Leah Carter. I'm the Chief Executive, I'm the Chief Advancement Officer for the Variety Boys and Girls Club located in Astoria, Queens. My colleague, Alexia, um, Macro Giannis uh, was going to join me, but unfortunately she is not participating. She's watching instead. She's giving me good luck. Um, as many of you know, the Variety Boys and Girls Club opened back in 1955. We are located on a half square block at 21st Street and 30th Road in Astoria between the Queensboro and Tribro bridges. We offer after school and summer camp programs at six locations throughout Western Queens. We serve, we currently serve over 4,000 youth per year in after school, summer camp, sports teams, and weekend programs. Sorry, I didn't have my video on. Um, we have size constraints with our current clubhouse and the facilities that we have, we are looking to expand. Um, we have both discretionary requests as well as capital requests out to both the borough president's office as well as a number of council members throughout Western Queens as well. Our capital request is for $5 million, which would go towards our actual capital program to build a completely new state-of-the-art building that will house and um, um, serve over 16,000 children going forward. We have a $300,000 discretionary request at this time for things uh, that include our after-school programs, our current um, college initiatives, our immigrant initiatives, as well as um, many other programs, including um, the swim club and, and uh, team that we have here as well. Our swim, our pool is actually closed. <laughs> so just as a point of, of uh, reasoning why we need such funding is our boiler is broken. And because of the age of our building and the size of our boiler and how old things are, we cannot have the swim team or any of the um, programs that revolve around the pool in effect right now because it is it costs too much to repair. So that is detrimental to Western Queens and all the kids that we serve. We are looking to get that fixed, of course, with the new construction and we are also um, looking to put shovels in the ground as far as the new construction in uh, fall of 2023 with about a two year building plan that goes along with that. Thank you so much for all your time and appreciate any effort that you guys can give to us. Thank you, Leah. We appreciate what, they, what you do at the Boys and Girls Club. I'm coming from the Y. I certainly understand. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move to uh, Bob Monahan, and then on deck, we will have Scott Thornhill. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much. 
for anyone who's been around knows that I like to uh, make this very brief. So I want to thank everyone for their support in the past. The Youth Council is 40 years old. We serve 3,000 youth and family a day. We'll have 1,000 SYs this summer. Um, we have 20 some odd locations, summer camps, et cetera. And um, we think we do a good job and we're hoping that you'll support us. That's it, thank you. Thank you for all the work you do, do Bob. We appreciate you. Uh, Scott, Scott Thornhill, you are up and on deck. We have Moshe Brand Sodorfer. I just wanted to make sure I said that right. So Scott, you're on. Deputy Borough President, could I just jump in? Just yes, sorry, Bob, yes, uh, Council Member. Thanks, thanks, sorry. Um, Bob Monahan and the Greater Rougewood Youth Council is amazing um, in that order. <laughs> and um, Bob, I'm not gonna give you a proclamation anymore or, or a plaque because there's no room on your wall. I have to give you a statue or something that sits on the floor um, after your amazing career. By the way, Bob can't retire because he's too valuable to the community. Um, so he's not allowed to retire. He's not allowed to leave. They do such great work um, during school, after school, weekends, summers. I mean, it's amazing, amazing work. I don't know where the city would be without the Greater Ridgewood Youth Council and Bob Monahan. Um, he's dedicated his life to the youth of our community and we owe him so much. I said one day I'm gonna get you a statue, but you'll probably outlive me. So somebody else will have to do it. But you are an amazing, amazing man. And that um, I can't say enough about, but so I just wanna, I just wanna encourage anyone who could fund the Greater Widgewood Youth Council and um, all the many years that Bob dedicated uh, his life to the youth of our, our neighborhoods in, in the city, and especially Queens, um, we can't do enough for them. So uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, just seeing your office, I know what to, I have to do next. So uh, in the way of awards. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, council member. We appreciate those words. I'm gonna go ahead and skip to Aaron Cyperstein and then back to you, Scott, if that's okay. So Aaron Cy Cyperstein from Met Council. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks very much for taking the time today. I know it's a very busy day. Met Council, you know, is the mothership of the Jewish community councils around the city. We have 16 of them, we're in all the boroughs. <clears throat> in my testimony, you'll see about all the services that we do, Holocaust services, Christ intervention services, family violence services, which sadly is growing in Queens, senior repair, where we go into people's homes <clears throat> of people that are not are neglected and we fix their apartments for them. A lot of superintendents and landlords don't want to take care of these elderly people because they figure they can get, get them out and, and, and add to the rent, which is disgusting. And we go in there and fix their apartments for free. We find out what they need, scree, dree, pantry stuff, snap, everything we do for them. It's one stop, Med Council does it all. So the uh, borough president in the past has helped us. We can hope that they continue. And there's just one ad additional thing this year, which we didn't put in ever is a capital request. Finally, we bought our warehouse. <clears throat> Actually, it was a landlord that was trying to rip us off a lot. We finally bought it off her. Now we have our own warehouse and we need renovations done. It will enable us to serve the many people that need us. Um, just one quick thing, right after we bought it, we were able to do a 300 elderly that was on waiting list. But since we bought it, we were able to have a little bit more space. We took the 300 off the waiting list and now they're getting sent food. So we're doing the renovation project. It's in my testimony over there. Any capital help that the borough president can additionally give Med Council, it would be greatly appreciated. And again, thank you for all the people at the borough president's office. I actually worked there a couple of years ago. I know how hard it is always the director of senior health services. So thank you very, very much. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate your work. Scott, on deck, we have Moshe. Scott Thornhill. If you're speaking, Scott, you're on mute. It looks like Scott is trying to. I am to here. I'm okay, here. here. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, it'll, it may explain more in just a moment as to why as, as to why that happened here. Hold on one second. All right, here we go. My name is Scott Thornhill, and I'm the Director of Public Policy for Alpha Point. 
And I'd like to thank uh, Borough President uh, Richards and all others in attendance. Um, Alpha Point is a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, located in Richmond Hill. Our mission is to empower individuals who are blind or visually impaired through opportunities for employment and personal development. Our over 100 year track record of serving people with vision loss positions us uniquely to handle what the CDC says will be uh, a large increase, dramatic increase in the number of individuals experiencing vision issues over the next two decades. Chronic diseases such as diabetes and environmental factors have led to the prediction as, as much of, as a 50% rise in the number of individuals uh, experiencing vision-related disabilities. While we would like to serve our way out of the need for our existence, the reality tells us our mission will only become more important in the near future. Already today, over 70%, that's 70% of people who are blind are not working. Research also shows us that people with disabilities who lose a job, 85% of the time, they do not find another one. The obstacles are too limiting. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has only magnified what has happened for far too long. People with disabilities are often the first to be let go when times get tough after previously being the last to be hired. As one of the largest employers overall in Queens and the largest employer of people who are blind, not only uh, in the city, but in the state of New York, uh, Alpha Point will not let that stand. Uh, we will not stand for the status quo. All is not bleak though. Uh, Alpha Point is prepared to be a leader uh, and we're proud to do so. And what is possible for those with vision loss, I myself am blind and presenting to you today using assistive technology called JAWS, Job Access with Speech. <laughs> A screen reader tells me everything that's on my computer, just as you would read it with your eyes. This technology, along with other technology, allows people who are blind to access information and perform the same work responsibilities as our sighted peers. Alpha Point has built out a technology center uh, on our, at our 123rd Street campus to provide skills to people who are visually impaired to perform jobs and other parts of life that are crucial, crucial to them engaging more fully and fully strengthening our communities. We have submitted a capital funding application to help our employees, and we're confident you will see the value in that request. Today, however, I'm asking for support from the Borough President's Office and others to help us obtain baseline testing and curriculum needed for those we serve in our technology training center and the assistive technology devices they will need to use to do the testing in various aspects um, involved. Determining which technology is best for the individual, uh, individual allows our team to maximize remaining vision and tailor recommendations. <laughs> Uh, um, and help with se secondary dis disabilities. Uh, so today I would just like to thank you for your time. Uh, we're looking for you to come alongside us in this effort. Over 300,000 individuals in Queens are facing difficulties with vision. Thank you for your time. Amazing work, Scott, thank you. Thank you. Um, Moshe, you are up and on deck, Jeffrey Younger, Shalom Task Force. Hi, good afternoon. Great to see so many friends over here. Um, First of all, thank you so much to the Queens Bar President, to the entire staff for all of your support, your past support. We really appreciate it. Uh, the JCCRP out in Farakway, Queens, Queens of our President Richard's hometown, um, has been serving the community for 50 years. We just did our 50 year anniversary. We are a social service provider, one stop shop. As my colleague and dear friend Aaron Sipperstein said, we are affiliated with Met Council. Um, we do a multitude of social services, including food pantry, benefits enrollment, crisis intervention, uh, Holocaust survivor services, et cetera. What our request for the Queen from partnering with the Queens Borough President Office is to um, assist us with our Medicare enrollment department. We are the only organization in the Rockaways that does Medicare enrollment. I think everyone here knows how complicated that is with all the different drug plans part A, part B, part Z, the whole alphabet of drug plans. And obviously when it comes to our seniors, um, healthcare is essential to their, to their well-being and extremely important and confusing for them. So our case management team helps them every step of the way um, in signing up for Medicare enrollment. We just wanna thank you guys for your support. Thank you for your help. Thank you for always being a pleasure to deal with. And we look forward to your continued support. Please send my regards to the uh, borough president. Thank you. 
Thank you for your work. Uh, we have Jeffrey Younger and we have Yankee Chitting on deck. Hi, it's Ashley Shoshana Friedman from Shalom Task Force. I'm the executive director. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, and I wanna thank you for the previous support you've given to Shalom Task Force. As I'm sure you've heard from all the different nonprofits here, your support is critical in fun the functioning of our nonprofits. And it really makes a difference. And in our case, it makes a difference for the victim survivors of domestic violence. Just to introduce some of you to Shalom Task Force, we are, we are opened in 1992 as one of the first agencies nationally to respond to domestic violence in the Jewish community. No one was talking about domestic violence at the time. And to give it a little policy context, this is before VAWA was even passed in Congress. The issue was silence. And believe it or not, it was a group of brave women here in Queens um, that saw a need and responded. And the first service they offered was a confidential anonymous hotline where victims are heard, believed, and helped. And this hotline remains the soul of our agency and is a trusted community resource. And we've answered over 27,000 individuals in need since our, we've started. The mission is very simple, but hard. It's to combat um, and prevent domestic violence and foster healthy and safe relationships. Our focus is in the Jewish community because it's a community that will not access traditional resources and needs culturally sensitive programming. We do this through three primary services, this anonymous confidential hotline. And during COVID, and we could talk about that in my remaining, um, we've pivoted and also expanded to have a chat line. And we've seen an increase of over 30% of need through that. Our Sarah's Voice Legal Services Program, which helps victims navigate the whole array of legal services from consultation to going through divorce. In addition, they also attend to rabbinical courts, which is a complication for some of our survivors that we work with. And we're very proud to announce that we are now gonna be on site at the Queens Family Justice Center. So we're better able to serve the Queens community on site there. And also our prevention and education awareness programs. Cause so like so many nonprofits here, we'd like to be out of business. We love not to have um, domestic violence. And so we go into work with youth, clergy, community-based organizations through a number of our programs. Um, the last month was D Dating Violence Awareness Month, and we hit over 450 students in the Queens area and close over 4,000 students in New York City engaging around dating violence awareness um, programs. And um, if you look back this week, I mean, a lot of us are retrospective, right, introspective right now. It's been two years um, since COVID started, and domestic violence has really been touted as the pandemic within the pandemic. We've seen an increase, the most harrowing and the reality of the many victors, victims were sheltering in place with their abuser and had to make the frightening choice between staying safe from an abuser and risking their health from the exposure of COVID. In response, I'd say we were really well positioned because of our, our experience in the community. We pivoted all of our, our services to help clients online. I spoke about expanding to a chat line. We also were able to, to serve our legal clients through online services and really touch the community through our education and prevention online. With that, I will end. I need to thank you for your continued support. We look forward to working together and I appreciate everything. Alam, thank you so kindly. Uh, we'll have Yankee Chiring and on deck, Susan uh, Mathiason. Good afternoon, Deputy Borough President Ebony Young and thank you to also members of your team who are here with us today. Honorable members of the borough board, borough presidents, city council members, and the chairs of the community boards, thank you for giving us an opportunity to testify before you today. I'm Yanki Shering, executive director of a company Capital, formerly Business Center for New Americans. We are a New York City based nonprofit CDFI and federally certified small business administration micro lender. We serve all boroughs with, from two locations, one in downtown Manhattan and the other, other in. Jackson Heights, Queens. Uh, accessing capital for small businesses has always been a challenge for people of color and immigrants. Most of the community that a company capital serves is further disadvantaged with limited language competency. For over 20 years, a company capital has served people of color and immigrants by providing free financial education, training, specialized savings program, IDAs, individual development accounts, um, and small business owners with access to affordable loans that range from 500 to 250,000. In 2020 and 2021, as businesses were shutting down, stores and restaurants closing down, we at a company capital rolled up our sleeves and focused on relief efforts to support our small business clients. We had the pleasure of working with the borough president Donovan's office uh, partnered with the office in assisting small businesses in Queens qualify for the Queens Small Business Grant Program. We were able to help assist 112 small businesses in 
Queens qualify for up to 20,000 in grant funding each for a total of 1.8 million. Our efforts in the last year, fiscal year 2021, generated over 13.3 million of additional support for grants, loans, emergency loans, and cash relief. Small business owners of New York City are reopening their businesses to a harsh new reality. Commercial rents have continued to rise. Online, online shopping has shrunk, uh, has shrunk the pool of customers. Tourism is an all-time low. Work from home, reduced commuter, commuters, and foot traffic have really lessened business. With funding from the borough president's office, a company capital will provide tailored workshops, one-on-one -on -one counseling services and coaching services in languages. Whereas our staff speak a total of 14 different dialects and languages, and most important of all, affordable access to credit. Um, so thank you for you know, hearing our testimony and our request is for 25,000. Thank you, uh, Yankee. Yankee, appreciate your time. Uh, we have next up the Douglaston and Little Neck Historical Society, Susan Mathiason, and on deck, Kevin McEwen, Hofago Dance um, Ensemble. Susan, I think you are on mute. There I am. Now you can hear me, and I've lost time. Anyway, um, the uh, we were founded to um, secure landmark designation in our two important historic districts within the communities, um, but since then have um, expanded into an organization that um, offers a variety of educational programs. And um, you know, these are our core programs are, and these were funded last year and we're looking for funding again for them this year. Um, it's our annual meeting lecture that just um, does, we discuss environmental, we discuss historical, we discuss, um, you know, researching your home um, are sort of the topics that we get discussed. And we get about 70 to 100 people attending each year. We do walking tours of the neighborhood so people can get a better understanding of the neighborhood's history. And in recent years, we started doing children's programming. And last year, with your support, we were able to do a Zoom lecture with the kids at PS98 on um, the indigenous, indigenous plants in the area. And each of the kids was given a seed kit so they can plant their own indigenous plants. And we're looking to expand that program into other schools. Um, most importantly is our quarterly newsletter, which um, has articles about local history, the architecture. Um, we talk about landmarks law and changes, um, and that's mailed to a list of about 2,000 in the neighborhood. This year, we're also looking for funding to build on our archive. Um, we have an extensive archive of materials related to the neighborhoods, which we started giving to the archive at the Queens Public Library in 2017, and slowly have been donating. And we've also been trying to make it more accessible, so we've been helping the library with digitization. And um, so we've been able to do some parts of that. Most recently, the photographs were completed. What we're doing now is we're partnering with the two associations, two neighborhood associations in the community, Douglas Manor and Westmoreland. They have extensive archives of businesses that um, um, their business minute, their minutes of their meetings, which really document a hundred years worth of history um, of the two neighborhoods, you know, and and you know, from development of the neighborhoods to various issues. Um, so it really is a, a, a great resource that is, you know, it's a comprehensive history of Northeast Queens that starts from the farm days and goes till now. And this is an incredible resource for you know residents, teachers, we plan on put, making it online so it can be used as a resource for the classroom. Um, so that is a sort of a bigger bulk of what our um, funding would be for this year. And we hope and thank you for your past support and we hope that you will continue to support us so that we can keep our, up our good work. Thank you. We appreciate your work, Susan. Thank you so kindly. Before we have Kevin, we've had a council member, Ariola, who's just joined us. Would you like to say a few words? <coughs> Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to thank everybody who came on. Thank you, Deputy Borough President and our esteemed Borough President for putting this together. I know that this meeting is lengthy, but it is so important because we need to know what the needs are, not just in our own districts, but across the boroughs and, uh, and the city. I want to uh, 
just thank our community boards, the ones that I'm, I represent, both nine, all of nine, uh, 10 and 14 for their leadership. The deputy, I'm sorry, I was just on a deputy commissioner's uh, Zoom meeting. So, but uh, our district managers and our chairs, as well as other chairs and, and district managers, such as Frank Galicio, Deb Markell, and so many others that, that I work so closely with. I appreciate all the testimony, uh, I'm, I really do. And uh, although I wasn't on earlier, our staff was, and we are taking copious notes as to what is needed. Thank you to all my colleagues and that, that are on listening. We really wanna do right by you. And, um, and everything that's important to you is important to us and have, have a great rest of, the, um, of your meeting. Thank you, council member. We appreciate you joining. Uh, we'll have Kevin and on deck, we have Eileen Riley. Good afternoon, Madam Deputy Borough President, the Queen's Delegation and Council Members. My name is Kevin McEwen and I'm the Founder and Artistic Director of Cofago Dance Ensemble. Cofago Dance exists at the nexus of African dance tradition and the Black experience here in America. We present artistic work that embodies healing principles through its storytelling. The company's choreography and dance workshops are used to engender, express, actualize, and facilitate ritualistic healing processes through dancing and drumming. Cofago Dance Ensemble is requesting the support of our programming from the Queensborough President's Office. As we move into our third year of dealing with the global pandemic, 2022 provides us with great opportunities to represent our home borough of Queens on a local and global level. In May, we will partner with the Culture Lab in Long Island City for our first full-length show of our new season. In June, we will perform for the Black Spectrum Theater in Jamaica, Queens. In July, we will travel to the U.S. Virgin Islands to conduct a two-week residency program with the Virgin Island Arts Council. And in August, we will represent the entire United States at the Roots of Dance Festival in Kaltuiz, Poland, which will be a capstone project that began virtually two years ago at the height of the pandemic. Your support will go towards rehearsal space rental, repairing musical instruments, as well as renting facilities that we can use for our performances. Each year, we hold an annual Kwanzaa celebration that celebrates the traditions of the holiday through the performing arts. Kwanzaa celebration is a partnership between ourselves, the Queensboro Community College Dance Program, the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning, and the nonprofit arts organization Rhythm and Dance, who have all been instrumental in our ability to reach out to the Southeast Queens community. This event pro provides a unique opportunity for us to engage the community, bringing people together to celebrate as one. In the past, we've held fundraisers to come up with our funding for our programming. This time around, after several years of successful programming, as well as the show getting more attention and more requests, we realized that the additional support is needed for us to be successful. Instead of the show just being one night, it might need to be several different days in several different locations. As artists, we want to share our passion with our community, but it shouldn't be to the detriment of our own personal savings accounts. We are requesting $20,000 in funding to help support our programming and outreach initiatives. Our programming provides important opportunities for the community, and we hope to continue serving the borough of Queens with our dance education and programming initiatives. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you, Kevin. We appreciate your time. And my minor, one of my minors in college happens to be West African dance. So great, great work. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Do we know. Yes. Yeah, an invitation to our next event. Oh, good. Excellent. Okay, we have, I'm sorry, before we have Eileen jump on, we have a Council Member Williams who has joined us. Would you like to say a few words, Council Member Williams? Hello, and I just want to thank uh, the Deputy VP and, and our Borough President for hosting this very important uh, session. I'm just listening in um, and definitely wanting to support all of the wonderful groups that are doing amazing work and just look forward to hearing uh, your testimonies and, and yeah, thank you for joining or, and for having me. Thank you, Council Member Williams. We appreciate you joining us this uh, afternoon. And we will now have Eileen Riley. And on deck, we have India Home Incorporated. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Queens Borough Presidents, Richards, and members of the Queens delegation. I had sent in a little lengthy uh, testimony, but I'm going to shorten it up for an answer to your email request. Since 1898, our building, now known as Masper Town Hall Community Center, has served the community of Masper as an elementary school until the school moved to a new location, now known as IS-73. The building was utilized as a local girls club, 
and by the Public Work Administration during the Depression era. From 1936 to 1971, it was used by the New York City Police Department as the 112th precinct. So as you can see, our building has been here for many, many years. And with the help of your predecessors, and since we have so many new um, council members this year, I thought to tell them a little bit about the building and who we are. So um, with the dollars that we've received, we were able to refurnish or reestablish the whole building. It, it's from roofy leaks to uh, a basement that you've had to put boots on before you could go downstairs. So without their help, we would not be where we are today. Two of the reasons why I'm asking for dollars. The first one is for our discretionary funds for our after school program. <laughs> Presently, we service 2,000 after school children daily in 13 programs held in 11 Department of Ed schools. These programs allow the parents, guardians to go back to work to go, or to go back to school themselves. For the families that English is not their first language, the parents know their children's homework assignments will be completed and checked. We play a major role in their lives. We also service the toddlers and the seniors of the community. The second thing that we're asking for, which is a real biggie, but um, is in our building. And it's uh, we already have a project going on and it's called PWQMA HVAC, which is under the New York City Department of Design and Construction. Um, they're telling me that we need an additional $1 million to have the AC come to uh, project come to fruition. Uh, we're hoping between the city council and the Queensborough president's office that we'll be able to um, receive these dollars so that we can continue with it. Again, I thank you for your time and hopefully for your money. <laughs> okay, have a good day. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Uh, we'll jump now to um, Sharanya Pilar, and on deck will be Sindha um, Heritage Foundation, the Heritage Foundation. So Sharanya. Hi, I am um, speaking from India Home, as you mentioned, um, and hello to the Queensborough Board, the Queensborough President Donovan Richards, and fellow community members. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify today on behalf of India Home. Um, I know there's, again, a lot of new members. I just love to speak a little bit more about us. India Home is the largest dedicated senior center program um, specifically for New York South Asian seniors. During these testing years, our organization has been the safeguard for South Asian seniors in Queens as they navigate multiple parallel pandemics, multiple waves of COVID, and especially increased social isolation. When our seniors are going through tough times, we are often the first ones to call and check in. Just last week, our staff called up one of our new members who didn't show up to bingo that day. And as it turned out, she had faced a death in the family. And the next morning, our staff received a text pouring with gratitude, just saying, you know, I was feeling really bad. Thank you for caring. Just in 2021, we conducted over 17,000 of such wellness check-ins for, um, for our seniors, which are crucial moments to not only provide supportive contact, but also to connect members to any needed case management services, of which we provided over 4,600 in 2021. I testify to you today to emphasize the needs and demands for our services, and um, especially to highlight the new housing project we are embarking on and our funding asks. For fiscal year 2023, we submitted an HPD application for acquisition and new construction at 170 11-13-1589th Avenue in Jamaica, 11432, to establish a supportive senior workforce housing building with community space. The proposed new construction residence and community center is projected to be on a 75 by 100 lot and the building will have around 50 units, a mix of studios and one bedrooms um, with a community space for enriched senior programming. To support this new FY23 project, we have requested the repurpose of, of two previously um, allocated awards, which we were unable to move forward with due to site issues. And so we've asked for the previously allocated awards to go towards this new project 
for a total of 3,848,000. The awards we've requested to be repurposed are awards from fiscal year 2020 um, and from fiscal year 2022. And um, this project is, is really gonna play, play an integral part in bringing much needed housing access to underserved populations in Queens. In addition, India Home requests 58,000 of expense funds to support our programs across the borough. Our programs have touched the lives of over 5,000 older adults through a variety of services, such as congregate meals, case management, education, civic engagement, arts programs, ESL classes, advocacy and research, and, and much, much more. And uh, this week, we've recommenced our activities at our four locations across Queens, and um, after pausing due to Omicron, and we have especially proven this year our abilities to pivot and continue providing a variety of critical services and increasing access to resources for underserved immigrants. And you know, we count on your support as always as we uplift our communities together and navigate the increased needs of our members. And thank you for your time and advocacy. And we look forward to making a better Queens together. Thank you. Sharanya, thank you so much for the work that you do um, here in the borough. We're going to have poultry next. And on deck is Lily Chang, Girls Inc. Good afternoon, everyone. Salam alaikum. Um, greetings to our QBP, Donovan Richard and all the council members that we are begging to, for you to help us in our program, and Speaker Adams. Um, my name is Putri Rankamaniski Ananor, and uh, it's a very immigrant name, and the name of our group is Kinding Sindaw Malayo Heritage. We have been existing since 1992, and uh, we have been servicing the community all over the city, and particularly Queens. And uh, I'm a Filipino indigenous woman, who has been working as an immigrant nurse, but my, my volunteer life is to uplift the situation of the immigrants, particularly the invisible, <laughs> bringing with us the culture and tradition of Southern Philippines that will unite our ancient heritage together with uh, Malayo heritage and our Sanskrit heritage from 4th to 10th century and our Latino heritage. And these are all convergent in Queens. So through our dances, music and martial art, we would like to highlight that story in bringing social justice, racial justice and immigrant empowerment. And uh, recently a member of our group was uh, a victim of anti-Asian hate crime. And uh, we are so devastated that we're trying to analyze how we're gonna work on uh, social and racial justice using art and uh, theater arts to um, align convergence instead of differences among the community. And unfortunately, the person who was the assailant is person of color. So instead of um, running or focusing on getting the assailant, we program a theater of the oppressed as integral to our group work. And we are hoping to use this as a training, training uh, empowerment to all the people across borough, but particularly in Queens. And uh, it's the highest immigrant population. And we believe and use of this theater of the oppressed to uh, align our understanding and we are asking actually right now we are, are we ask for 64,000 as a capital funding for transportation, parking and stipends for the driver to carry our musical instruments, wardrobe and all the props that we need to educate uh, people of color, community, Queens community, schools and all across the borough. And this is a trailblazing work. We had been funded through CTC in our Renayong project which focused on uh, broadcasts, especially during the time of COVID. And right now we are asking help from all uh, council members and our borough president to help us work on this trailblazing work that we're trying to do for racial justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Poultry, for your time and the work that you do for the borough. We appreciate you. Uh, we have Lily Chang up next, Girl to Inc. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much to the Queensborough Board for the opportunity to present. My name is Lily Chang. I am the Vice President of Development at Girls Inc. of New York City. Girls Inc. of New York City serves over 10,000 girls throughout the city a year. 
um, through comprehensive whole girl programming designed to uh, educate and empower the whole girl. And uh, we do so through programs in STEM, financial literacy, um, mental health, college readiness and preparedness and leadership. So just all encompassing. Um, the reason I'm presenting today is because we uh, really would like to strategically expand our reach in Queens through two very targeted initiatives. Um, one is our Mind Body Matters program and the other is our financial literacy app. So both are quite new in development. Um, the, the Mind Body Matters program is, um, has been instrumental in supporting girls' mental health through the pandemic. It's the first of its kind digi digitized mental health um, support, education support platform um, designed for teen girls, specifically teen girls of color. Um, we use um, multicultural avatars and social justice vignettes to illustrate um, concepts and educate girls on how they can um, work on themselves to support their mental health, um, which is much needed programming in New York City public schools. Um, the other new exciting initiative that we have is uh, we are developing the first of its kind financial literacy app designed for teen girls, um, seed funded by Google to build this app, but we're seeking for funding to distribute it throughout um, schools in Queens. Um, this app will help girls to overcome their fear of finances and start building um, their wealth and financial planning from a very early age. Um, it's designed to uh, really um, target um, the teen girl demographic and lift them, them, themselves and their families out of poverty. Um, and so with these two initiatives, we feel are extremely key um, to, to um, recovery of, of girls um, in in our schools um, and in particular in Queens, um, we are hoping um, to expand our reach there. Uh, we're in 10 schools now and uh, we would like to um, continue to expand these two programming efforts and hopefully be able to have a broad reach with our financial literacy app. So um, that being said, um, I really appreciate um, your time and uh, we hope um, to work to partner in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing work for girls. We appreciate you. Um, we'll have Emerald Isle sign up on Dennehy and then on deck LGBT Network. Carrie Ann. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Siobhan Dennehy. I'm the executive director of the Emerald Isle Immigration Center. And certainly my thanks to the borough president and to the deputy borough president for your leadership and convening of this very important budget hearing. Also want to thank all of our council members, especially our recently and newly elected members, our own Julie Wan in Woodside and Queen's own speaker, Adrian Adams. So just by way of history, Emerald Isle was founded in Woodside in 1988. And that was then to serve the needs of recently arrived Irish immigrants. So while our landscape has greatly changed since then, our mission in helping our community remains the same. We've also added our office location in the Bronx. And today we serve immigrants from over 120 nations. Um, each year, our, imp our impact we have is on the lives of nearly 40,000 clients. We've assisted 3,500 New York City residents to complete the process of becoming a US citizen. And in addition, have completed over 2,500 petitions and applications for lawful permanent residents on behalf of local immigrant families. Our program, programming, all of which is free, is robust and designed to meet the changing needs of the immigrant community. It includes direct immigration counseling and services, application assistance, mental health, geriatric mental health screenings, health insurance enrollment, free tax prep, food distribution, cultural activities. Um, most recently, and since the pandemic, we've assisted with COVID-19 public health information transmission. We've enrolled immigrants in the Excluded Worker Fund. We have done extensive outreach on the 2020 census. But our signature program um, is our free legal aid. Those who are seeking to obtain that permanent resident status or US citizenship. And what sets us apart from our peers is the fact that we offer assistance to clients from the beginning of their application to the end of the process. And we serve as the attorney of record the entire way. I cannot stress enough 
um, the importance of the funding that we have received through many initiatives from the city council and our elected representatives. The most important of those to us is the immigrant opportunity initiative. And that has provided steady, although not increased funding to us for the last nine years. Similarly, the programs that help us support all of the staff and services that we provide is through DIFTA with the information referral program. In addition, we're providing help on access health and also geriatric mental health. So we really thank all of you for the past support of the council. We encourage you to continue to support us. And in closing, invite you all to come visit us anytime you're in Woodside. And in the spirit of Irish Heritage Month, want to wish you all a very happy loyal euphoric. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Thank you so kindly for the presentation. Um, and I do apologize, uh, David Kilnick will be representing LGBT Network. Thank you, David. On, on deck will be uh, Ji Yung Chu from uh, Hunter College High School PTA. Hello. Um, I'm sorry, you're on deck, uh, uh, Jin Yung. I'm sorry. Uh, David Kilmanick will be going now, and then you're on deck. I promise you're next. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Borough President. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's really great to see everyone, and thank you for convening this important day. Uh, my name is David Kelnick. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am the founder and president and CEO of the LGBT Network. I founded the organization in 1993 while I was a graduate, at, uh, graduate student at Stony Brook University studying for my master's in social work. As a result of my master's project, I created a curricula to go into schools to talk about what it's like to grow up LGBTQ. While implementing the project in over uh, seven schools, the voices of our youth spoke loud and clear when they asked for something so simple, the desire just to have a safe space where they could simply be themselves and meet other people who felt the same way they did. It was something that resonated with me when I was a teenager growing up in Far Rockaway and attending Far Rockaway High School. Since founding the organization nearly 30 years ago, the LGBT network has become a wide reaching nonprofit organization that serves Queens LGBT community members of all ages, their families and support systems. Our organization in a nutshell through many critical and life-saving programs and services, help LGBT people to be themselves, stay healthy and change the world while creating safer spaces where we live, learn, work, play and pray. While a lot of our work is out in the communities throughout the entire borough, we operate the Queens LGBT Community Center, what we call the Q Center, the only full service LGBT community center in the borough, which during the middle of the pandemic moved into its new space at Kaufman Studios in Astoria. We offer many different services around education, advocacy, supportive uh, and community building programs for our families and allies. During the pandemic, we moved our services virtually. We are now back in person, uh, but we had many requests from folks to still continue those services online and we are doing that. So we are offering the greatest access, whether you're in Southeastern Queens or all the way in Western Queens, no matter where you are in the borough, you can access the programs and services that we offer. Some of the many programs and services we offer include anti-bullying education, leadership development, LGBT affirming sexual health programming, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, services for LGBTQ immigrants, um, community organizing, and many more. Um, you know, throughout Queens, we um, work with over 90 schools. Um, we held an annual youth conference, which is next week at City Field on March 16th. Over 500 of our youth from the entire borough will be there, and we invite everyone to come. Um, and I'm just going through this quick because I see the time. Um, and But I, I do want to say, in addition, you know, we're excited to announce that earlier this year, um, we are now leading a community-wide effort to bring back Queens Pride, which is now known as New Queens Pride. You know, pride is so important for so many reasons. It gives that visibility that is needed out there. Um, and this year, it's going to be the 30th anniversary, and it's going to be where we're going to be louder and prouder than ever. And I'm a, this is the first um, that we're announcing this, but one of our grand marshals is our great speaker, Adrian Adams. So we're excited about that. Um, our uh, I, come to pride on June 5th. Um, you know, for, ah, can I just have two more seconds? Well, 10 more. Yes, yes. For, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So for fiscal year 2023, the LGBT network submitted several discretionary funding requests from the city council. 
you know, we have been very humbled and honored to be supported by the uh, City Council Queens delegation since 2016 and the borough president. Um, and we're requesting 45,000 to support our programs and services throughout the entire borough. And also additional um, requests that we have through the city council for LGBT inclusive curriculum, domestic violence and intimate partner violence services, transgender equity, LGBT immigration services, health insurance enrollment referral, um, and HIV testing reaching our LGBT communities of color throughout the entire borough and the outer borough services Con consortium, which is led by a Queens organization, us that brings together um, L leading LGBT partner organizations in all the outer boroughs through Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and Bronx, where we have an efficient and coordinated model of service delivery of health and human services for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you for the extra time. Please come and see our youth next week um, at City Field, where over 500 of them will be together and certainly put June 5th on your calendar for the 30th anniversary of Queens Pride. Thank you. David, you're doing a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you so much for your work. And Speaker Adams, you are on. Would you like to say a few words before I get back to GU? Thank you so much, Deputy Borough President. Thank you so much to everybody uh, in the delegation. Thank you to all of our leaders in Queens. It is wonderful to see you. Um, it's, uh, it's just great to hear the work that you've been doing. I've been hanging on, listening for quite a while, and I've got to go. I've got people in my office right now waiting for me. So, um, but I did want to make sure I came in right in time. I mean, David gave me a great cue. Uh, so uh, right on time, but I do want to thank all of our organizations for doing the great work that you do for Queens so well. You do it like none other. Um, Deputy Borough President, I want to congratulate you. It's wonderful seeing you, you in that seat. Very proud of you uh, as you go on to represent our borough in excellence with our terrific borough president, Donovan Richards, who I still shamelessly call my baby brother, and I don't care who likes it or <laughs> I, not. I popped in because I hear your <laughs> voice. I'm in here doing stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're all multitasking today. So I just wanted to thank my colleagues who are here uh, in this meeting. Thank you to all of the borough presidents, uh, amazing staff. And of course, all of you that get the job done for Queens, um, you know, virtually and COVID on a shoestring these days. So our thanks to you. We will work diligently with the, with the uh, borough president's office to make sure that your needs are met to the best of our ability. So take good care. Thank you, Speaker Adams, for joining us. And, and, you know, we have a slogan in the borough president's office, Queens get the money, uh, Queens is the future. I know you can't just necessarily say that, but it could be in your heart. <laughs> it's, it's always in my heart, Donna. So we want it to be in your heart so much, my your heart. love for Queens. <laughs> All right, big sister. Thank Speaker you. Adams, sorry, we'll keep it. <laughs> good to see you. Good All right, DBP, you, keep up the good work. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we're going to continue on. Ji Yoong is uh, representing Hunter College High School PTA. And then on deck, we have William Weisberg for Fort Stale Incorporated. So my name is Ji Young Chu. Uh, I am a, a VP External Affairs of Hunter College High School PTA. And um, Hunter College High School Parents Teacher Association serves as an advocate for the education and general welfare of students attending Hunter College High School, fosters communication and cooperations among the parents and the faculty and administration students and alumni of Hunter College High School, fosters a optimum parents' involvement in activities to support uh, Hunter College, College High School and also promotes the, and celebrate harmony among the many cultures of uh, our community and, and solicit and coordinate the administration of parents' resources in support of Hunter College High School. Is it, uh, our organization is a voluntary organization led by a board comprised of elected parents members and through many committees provides a voice of parents on school related issues and sponsors informational social fundraising events to help support the school. And a PTA's major and critical source uh, of funding for the school, of course. And uh, we uh, serve uh, students from all five boroughs, but uh, around 40% of the students are from Queensboro. 
And so, um, and this time, uh, I would like to support uh, library uh, laptop upgrade. So I'm requesting a fund for 5,000 for the library laptop upgrade, because the uh, laptop uh, are like, uh, it's um, lagging. Uh, laptops, uh, current la laptops are lagging and have comp comparability <laughs> due to a slow speed. So new computer would be much appreciated by the students and students use the library and uh, benefit from the, using the technology and they do the homework and research project and the group works. So I hope uh, uh, the Queensboro can support the students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ji Young. We appreciate you and what, the work that you do here in the borough. And before we move on to William, my council member has joined us, council member Julie Wan. Julie Wan, would you like to say a couple of words? Hi, Deputy Borough President. Thank you so Hello. much. For it was on in the morning and then I've hopped back on so that I could listen to as many organizations as possible. And my budget director has been on all day, Nancy Corona. Thank you so much to all the organizations for being here and sharing in a very timely manner, like a, like a game show. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do, council member. We appreciate you joining today. Um, we now have William Weisberg from Forestdale Incorporated. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here um, and continue your minute waltz in this quick sharing. As you said, I'm Bill Weisberg. I'm executive director at Forestdale. And I feel like so many of us have been working together over the last several years to elevate the lives of families who are marginalized or struggling and their children from the community board leaders and the council and the Queensborough president back to his time on the council has really been a champion of the families that we serve and all care about. So thank you. I'm here today to mostly talk about our Strong Fathers program. The council and the borough president have championed that program and helped us with funding of over $100,000 when the city changed its funding formula. And so fathers and queens were getting less and the council stepped in with the borough president to fill that gap. Why is the fathers program important? Because fathers are important. And we've been able to serve 100 more fathers each year because of your support. So again, thank you. And in addition to the counseling and job assistance and child development workshops and intimate partner violence workshops, one of the most inspiring parts of working with our fathers is to hear them support each other, to tell each other, don't be the boss of your children's mother or your children, be a partner. Or I hear fathers say, my father loved me and also hit me. I'm learning how to love my children without disciplining in that way, or telling other fathers, you know, child support is an important part of your role as a parent. So they support each other in doing the right thing and becoming the fathers they really want to be. And during the pandemic, the need has mushroomed. So we're now serving well over 300 fathers a year, again, with your help. And the pandemic has also highlighted inequities and other needs. So we've helped with educational supplies. We've helped with learning pods. And our neighbors, your neighbors, have donated over $600,000 in cash that we've given directly to families that lost work during the pandemic. So Queens is hanging together. We're happy as far as fail to be a vehicle for the community to move forward together. And I will just also mention that the council has been very instrumental in supporting life coaching for young people who aged out of foster care as part of the Speaker's Young Women's Initiative. So anyway, in many respects, Strong Fathers continues because of you, the Queensborough President, the City Council, because you've stepped in to help us in uncertain times. We thank you for your past support and ask you for your continued support for our dads. Thank you. Thank you for your work, Bill. Very important work with dads, very nice. Um, we have Jeremy Seigman from Make the Road, and then on deck we have Bob Singleton, uh, Greater Astoria Historical Society. Hi everyone, uh, actually this is Kenny Manai, I'm gonna be testifying on behalf of Make the Road. 
So I just wanted to begin by, by thanking uh, Borough President Duncan Richards, Deputy Borough President, members of the community boards, members of the city council, and uh, Speaker Adams as well uh, for the opportunity to testify. As many of you know, Make the Road New York is the largest community-based membership organization in New York City uh, with 25,000 members, um, low, which are low-income New Yorkers. We have over 20 years of experience serving New York's communities of colors, um, including immigrant and working families, um, all of whom continue to be disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and economic fallout. With the support of BP Richards and the City Council this past year, we've been able to continue our COVID response work, such as providing emergency food through our Queen's Pantry, uh, serving as a trusted source for vaccine testing and COVID safety information, helping hundreds of previously excluded workers secure millions in COVID relief, and delivering our wraparound services, both remotely and in person. Um, your support has also helped us and allowed us to continue construction of our new Queens Community Center, uh, located right across, which will be located right across from Corona Plaza. Uh, this year, we are asking uh, BP Richards for $1.8 million in funds uh, to go towards the construction of the Queens Community Center uh, and to bring it across the finish line. We hope that we can complete construction by the late fall of 2022. Um, the community center will be a three-story, 24,000 square foot community center um, and, and transformative uh, for our, our community members as it will provide access to housing and public benefits assistance, employment and immigration legal services, ESOL, citizenship computer classes, uh, know your rights trainings, youth leadership programs and support for our TGNCIQ uh, communities. Um, the the multi-use flexible spaces of the new center will allow us actually to expand our capacity and, and serve more Queens community members. Uh, we see this project as a long-term investment in the social and economic growth of our communities and in Queens. Um, and just one last pitch and a thank you to the council members on the call. On the call, uh, we receive a, a number of city council initiatives, and we want to see those continue to be supportive, like the Access Health. MCCAP initiatives, the adult literacy initiative, um, the low wage worker support initiative, um, and the speakers initiative and key to the city, which help uh, support our services and make the road in a variety of program areas. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll gladly take those as well. Kenny, thank you, especially the work that you've done like during the pandemic. You guys really have to thank you so kindly. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> yes. Um, so next we have uh, Greater Astoria Historical Society, and on deck will be Telugu uh, Literacy, Literary and Cultural Association. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Queensboro President Richards, uh, Deputy Borough President Young, and Councilwoman Wong and the Queens delegation for giving us an opportunity to testify. My name is Robert Singleton, Executive Director of the Greater Histori Historical Society. Um, we have had a vast record of service and accomplishment uh, for the Borough of Queens and uh, beyond, uh, an extensive track record in partnering with the education community, by offering a broad spectrum of programming from elementary through graduate students. Uh, in the course of three decades, we have published articles focused on the Borough's historic heritage, and a three monthly newspapers that's distributed throughout Queens uh, with an annual, uh, with a monthly readership of several hundred thousand. Uh, we are working with the Long Island City Partnership as well as other local groups to develop themes to promote the community and the wellspring of its historic legacy. The Society is a world-class resource of New York City history from community advocacy groups, such as the Municipal Arts Society, Historic Districts Council, to a wide range of corporate clients, uh, including film credit to roll over their work recent uh, remake of Great Gatsby, which uh, garnered uh, director Baz Luhrmann an Academy Award in set design. A request of the borough president's office uh, is a $15,000. The name of the program is Freedom of Thought, Understanding Socialism and Progressivism as Political Ideologies and Their Place in History. The amount requested would be designated as an educational program to clarify ideas about socialism and progressivism, what it means, its deep-seated historical background in Long Island City, and an examination of its relevance today. This support would fund PowerPoint lectures, pay lecturers, hold roundtable discussions, and conduct outreach to schools, community groups, and political clubs. There is a need for a program such as this. 
People often hear socialism, confuse it with communism. Long Island City is a past associated with both socialism and progressivism, and it's found in our planned communities and model housing throughout the community. Some examples are GX Matthews, Matthew Flats, who had one quarter of all building permits in 1917, Sunnyside Gardens, author Jonathan Latham called it the gardens and official socialist utopia village of the outer boroughs, and the Steinways. They built a community based upon socialist principles that the family had before they even came to America. The progressives, uh, as defined by the Library of, Library of Congress, uh, worked to make America's society a better place to live. They tried to make big businesses more responsible. An outstanding example would be uh, the uh, Sunny, uh, Degnan Terminal and Sunnyside Yards, where a coalition of socialists, capitalists, and progressives worked together to design the world's largest workspace embedded within a transportation network. Ideologues on the left have bad press. The ideas are often dismissed as untruths or errors through education, better understanding, programs such as this can empower people to make better decisions and engage more fully in their communities. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Rob, for the work that you do here. Um, we have the Telugu um, Literary and Cultural Association. And then on deck, we have Latinas on the verge of excellence, love. Okay. Thank you, uh, the Deputy Borough uh, President. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Borough President and his team for giving this opportunity. Uh, my name is Jaya Prakash Injapuri. and I'm the president of Telugu Literary and Cultural Association, which founded in 1971 and is a not-for-profit organization with a mission to preserve the Telugu language and cultural heritage. TLC currently has over 3,100 members. Telugu speaking Indians come from South Indian states of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. TLC offers many programs to the community, such as four major programs, including Sankranti, Ugadi, Dasera, and Diwali festivals, annual events, celebrating the arts, culture, musical nights, attracting participation from hundreds of members. TLC also offers linguistic symposiums, various cultural programs, health and wellness programs, family picnic, educational seminars, sports and games, and volunteer and outreach programs throughout the community. Uh, all of this we do with the collective efforts of the executive committee and the community volunteers. Last year, in the last two years, because of the COVID situation, our team, along with the speaker Adams, we distributed face masks, food, and the face, face shields. Uh, this year, our goal, in addition to what we already do, uh, we want to expand programming for the youth in the form of workshops in robotics and Python programming to gain skills and advance their knowledge of current and evolving technology through experiential learning and CPR training for life, life skills. To increase access to arts, culture for audience whose primary language is not English. Our core programs in the arts and culture requires us to rent to venues, pay for artists and their audiovisual equipment, food expenses, fees uh, for the decoration, banners, preparing for the flyers. Uh, in addition, we are looking to hire four to six staff for program coordination, implementation, including youth coordinators and youth interns. Uh, all these years, we are able to get the funds for the community, but because of the COVID situation, it's getting very tough and getting frustration to get the funds. So this year, TLC is requesting $20,000 of expense funds from the Queens Borough President Office and further fund these programs. We hope Borough President Donovan Richards will support our efforts this year and include us in the opportunity to showcase culture, music, food, fashion and dance to the mainstream community to enhance the cultural vibrancy of Queens. Thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate your consideration and cooperation. Thank you all. Thank you, President. Appreciate your time. Thank you for showing up and for the work that you do in the borough. Um, we're gonna move to Michelle uh, Garzon and then we have on deck uh, Bone House Historical Society. Thank you so much, Deputy Borough President. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Garzon. 
My pronouns are she, her, ella. Thank you so much for allowing me to present today. I am the operations manager for Latinas on the Verge of Excellence. The acronym spells out love. Love is a curriculum-based mentoring program where we provide support to young female high school and middle school students in the areas of mental health, reproductive health, college access, and career readiness. And the way we do that is we have our program coordinators who help facilitate our curriculum in our partner schools across New York City. We also recruit college female students who serve as our mentors who support our program coordinators during the sessions um, for the group mentoring with our students. Love has supported various schools in Queens for five years and we have long partnerships with, um, with a couple of schools such as the International High School for Health Sciences, the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria and Queens, Veritas Academy and IS-126. Our current goal is to continue expanding the love program in Queens, specifically in neighborhoods with high Latino populations such as Corona, Jackson Heights, and Elmhurst. We are requesting $25,000 to reach this goal. The additional funding from provided by the Queens Borough President's Office and the council members will allow us to continue increasing our capacity, expanding the program, and serving more young women in Queens. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for the work you do. Uh, we will, um, I apologize, uh, Bone has already gone, and so I want to skip to the women for Afghan for women, women for Afghan women, women for Afghan women, and then move to um, our City Parks Foundation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy Borough President Young. My name is Laura Marks and I'm the program manager at Women for Afghan Women's New York Community Center. Women for Afghan Women is the only social service organization serving the Afghan community in Queens, which is home to 90% of the Afghan community living in New York City. I would like to thank the Queens Borough Board and the New York City Council for your committed support to our community center these past eight years. On behalf of Women for Afghan Women, we're respectfully requesting $25,000 to support our programs and services for Queens residents. Most of our clients are low income, Muslim immigrants, and many are refugees. 60% of our program participants are Afghan. The rest are from South Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and East Asia. Up to 70% of our clients are survivors of domestic violence and illiterate in their own language. They struggle with unemployment, food insecurity, and digital illiteracy. Women for Afghan Women provides daily ESL classes to adult women, U.S. citizenship classes, youth and senior programming, and support services such as case management and intimate partner violence counseling. We see clients in person and virtually, by appointment and on a case-by-case -case basis. Last year, Women for Afghan Women provided about 4,000 client intakes, emergency cash assistance to 187 people, and distributed PPE to 600 people. We also assisted 90 individuals with their cash assistance applications. These days, we operate a 24 seven hotline as a result of the uptick in gender-based violence. Following the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan in August, Women for Afghan Women has been serving the influx of refugees and evacuees from Afghanistan who have or will be resettled in New York City. Our comprehensive and life-changing work is evidenced in our work with our client Kazim and his family. Names are changed for their protection. Kazim and his family were supposed to be resettled in Nebraska after the fall of Afghanistan, but Kazim had ties in New York City who had promised assistance, so the family wanted to move here. But a decision had to be made in less than five hours. Other agencies were not nimble enough to respond to this urgent need, so Women for Afghan Women stepped in. We secured temporary housing for Kazim, his wife, and their five children for a month at an Airbnb in Queens, and we provided $500 in emergency cash assistance upon their arrival. Our case management team accompanied them to buy groceries and essential items and helped familiarize them with nearby stores and services. When their six-month-old baby became ill upon arrival in New York City, our staff accompanied the mother and infant to Elmhurst Hospital for treatment. Our services contribute to, the making, um, to making New York City a more equitable and just place for all New Yorkers. We could not accomplish this without your support. 
Thank you for your commitment to improving the lives of people that make our great city great. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate your time and your commitment. Um, we are uh, going to jump to City Parks Foundation and then following, we have the South Asian Council for Social Services, City Parks. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you to everyone who made this possible. The list is long, but the time is short. So I just wanna say that I'm excited to be a part of this volume and space um, on behalf of City Parks Foundation and hopefully not just focus on the challenges that we all are aware of, but how your public support and partnership helps us to address these challenges. Um, as you may know, City Parks Foundation is a not-for-profit that leads free sports, arts, environmental education programs in our parks and open spaces. And we co-manage this work with Partnerships for Parks, which is a joint program with New York City Parks, all of which helps to encourage New Yorkers to use and care for their neighborhood parks and green spaces. As we're well aware, the past two years of the pandemic have made it so clear that parks are essential to the physical and mental health of our city, um, and that New York has come to rely on vol volunteers as green responders to help with litter removal, planting, and care of our city's parks. Um, we were able to mobilize a network of nearly 600 groups and 21,000 individual volunteers from all 51 council districts. Um, that partnerships has cultivated and supported for many years. And thankfully, the council's own parks equity initiative helps make this network possible by funding our workshops, our coaching, helping with micro grants, supplies, and, and for staff support. However, we all recognize that volunteers are not a long-term solution and that the pandemic has exacerbated many long-term inequities. Um, so we must collectively rethink planning for and maintenance of our city's parks, plazas, garden, natural areas, and NYCHA spaces um, as a comprehensive network of open spaces that better meet our health, safety, economic, and environmental needs. In the short term, we must all work together to recognize parks as the essential infrastructure they are and provide truly adequate funding. Um, beyond maintenance, we understand the opportunities for collective wellness and social connectivity inherent in our parks. And we wanna thank you for our, the public fiscal support that's helped to sustain the variety of cultural sports and environmental education programming that helped to enliven our parks. Um, we are training the next generation of environmental, environmental stewards through our learning gardens programs, particularly in Detective Keith Williams parks, and we'll help connect youth to our waterways this summer at Hallett's Cove. Um, we'll offer recreational programs for seniors and youth to get outdoors and, and active through sports instruction. And we also plan to bring Summer Stage back to Queens with free performances at Flushing Meadows Corona Park and Socrates Sculpture Park. And to bring it back to the ask, we'd like to thank you um, for your um, support in the past and, and um, thank you for considering our request for this year of $20,000. Um, that's my time, but again, thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for keeping us active and healthy. We appreciate it. Uh, up next, South Asian Council for Social Services on deck, the Campaign Against Hunger. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Honorable Borough President, Deputy Borough President, Speaker Adams, City Council members, and community votes. I'm Sudha Acharya, Executive Director of South Asian Council for Social Services, or SACS. Thank you for this opportunity to present our plans to you. We thank you for your consistent support of our programs, especially towards our capital campaign, food security program, and senior support services. Your support enabled us to purchase a building last year, which has enhanced our capacity to serve our clients. Our major focus areas are healthcare access and awareness, senior support, and food security. We also provide legal clinics and basic and advanced English and computer classes. Our culturally competent staff speaks 19 languages. In the fight against COVID-19 pandemic and recovery, SACS has been front and center. Our core programs have adapted to ensure community members continue to receive services in a safe environment. Throughout the pandemic, our food pantry has continued to serve culturally palatable food to families all over Queens through our curbside pickup and home delivery of groceries to homebound, immunocompromised, uh, and families infected with COVID-19. 
Each week, we serve over 1,200 families at the curbside pantry, and 100 households receive groceries at home. This is over 5,000 individuals per week. We continue to provide case management and con connection to healthcare and other public benefits, both virtually and in person. Our staff also makes weekly wellness check-ins with our seniors to ensure their physical and emotional health. Supportive and bereavement counseling for individuals and families that are going through crises or have lost a loved one continue. In 2021, we served over 50,000 clients, 1,120 individuals with health, in, uh, with health insurance, 1,650 individuals with post-enrollment assistance, 6,000 seniors assisted with connection to benefits and supportive counseling services, and we distributed 550,000 grocery bags and 1.5 million masks. We helped 7,000 individuals receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Over the years, we have built a trusting relationship with immigrant communities. For them, we are the one place where they are assured of receiving a range of services in a safe and confidential place under one roof. We request, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> We request 75,000 from the Queensborough president towards our community services. Thank you. It's not COVID. Uh, <laughs> no worries. That's the first thing we all say. Yeah. Thank you for your services and support. We'll now go to the campaign against hunger and then our very own borough president Richards will be back with us and on deck for borough president Richards will be the hip to hip theater company. So uh, campaign against hunger, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I am Dr. Melanie Samuels, the executive director and founder of the Campaign Against Hunger. I just want to greet um, our board president and our deputy board president, all the council members, community board, Queen's delegation. Um, the Campaign Against Hunger have been present in Queen's since Sandy hit. Um, we were there the day before. With the, the idea of bringing our mission is to empower vulnerable New Yorkers to live healthier, more productive and self-sufficient lives by increasing their access to safe, nutritious food and related services. And we have done this as we advance our mission by providing equitable access to food with dignity, social services, youth workforce programs, nutrition education, urban farming to stir the community activism and engagement to alleviate poverty. What we have been doing for the last, um, since COVID, as everyone knows, that that has impact our community of color mainly. The Campaign Against Hunger have moved in um, quickly in obtaining a 9,000 square feet space where there we were able to work with 30 partners in Queens to distribute food from our warehouse straight to the homes. And we have moved out of using traditional food pantry distribution idea, using um, smaller organizations, churches, senior centers, nitro buildings, and others to help us distribute food as we knew that this was possible, the most effective way in getting healthy food to those that need it the most. We have in Queens presently um, two acres of land, half an acre that we're farming, right now that produces over 10,000 pounds of food every year that is distributed at our mobile at our mobile markets and our mobile pantries. We also are about to start distributing at a, a acre and a half of farming space and we're excited about that. Also our at the time our council member Richards was able to help us in acquiring a culinary arts center, a cafe, which will be opened officially. Grand opening will be next month. And um, there we are getting ready to start our culinary arts center. Since COVID until now, we have worked with 80 vulnerable youths in the community. We have worked with families doing taxes in Auburn View, benefits, um, different benefits and also working hard to distribute PPEs wherever necessary. So far, we have distributed in it over 2 million, over 2 million pounds of food. We have distributed um, in the Rockaways 5 million meals, which is an astounding number. Some of the partners that we have worked with, St. John's Hospital, Shelter and Arms Children, um, Family Services, 
Caribbean Equality Project, 100 suits, Academic of Medical, um, Beach 41 Tenant Association, ACS, and others that we have been working with, different senior centers, the LGBTQ communities, faith-based um, organizations. We have been working diligently, and the reason for this is that we know that building out a hub is, is essential to Brooklyn and Queens, and we're asking the borough president to assist us in building out a, a hub that will assist not only growing food, building food system, but working with those with incubator businesses. We'll be working with commercial kitchen, um, adding to um, alleviating our um, carbon footprint by doing a full recyclable system. We have had the support of the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn um, community, the Brooklyn Borough President. We've had the support of the mayor and others, and we're asking our board president, Queens Borough president, to assist us as we believe that this hub will be crucial in changing how we approach and alleviate hunger in our community. And I'll end there if there's a question. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, all the work you did during the pandemic and being on the ground uh, in the Rockaway with boots on the ground, making sure that those who um, really needed to be fed could be fed at the height of the pandemic. So I just want to thank you and your organization personally uh, for all that you've done and will certainly be considering the application as we move forward. So thank you and keep up the good work. Thank, thank I'll you see so you at that opening. I'm so excited about that. Uh, yes, I'm so we're looking, excited about that. Okay, so we're looking forward to seeing you at the cafe. That's right. Thank I'll you. Make sure that date works for me. <laughs> Thank you. It does. It does. It does. Or it does all right. See? It's the yes. beauty of being the borough president. You don't know what your days look like. They just, okay. Thank they you. Just send you places. <laughs> all right. Thank you so Thank much. You. All righty. Next, we're going to hear from another organization who's done a lot of important work on the ground uh, Metropolitan New York. Uh, Coordinating Council on Jewish Poverty, Aaron, Aaron Sipperstein. Yeah. Sorry, BP, it actually went um, when the DBP was here. Oh, my bad. Next, oh. we have a hip to hip, and then following that is Shazak. Okay, got it. Hello to the uh, Queen's Board. Uh, and I want to start uh, by introducing myself. My name is Jason Marr, and I'm the artistic director of Hip to Hip Theater Company. I want to thank uh, the Queensboro president um, and the office for past support. This is our 15th year uh, of operation here in Queens, and um, we are excited to map out our summer season. We produce a, an annual summer program of free Shakespeare in the parks. Uh, and uh, pre, uh, before each of our performances, we offer a children's workshop uh, for children uh, to sort of prep them about the play that they're going to see, give them a chance to uh, play some theater games and exercises uh, and, uh, and allow their parents to then sit and watch the play. Um, but we tour two full productions, professional actors, sets, lights, costumes, uh, to a, a dozen parks um, and we cover all geographical areas of the borough uh, and we've been able to uh, grow our season and our footprint each year thanks to uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs, thanks to our council uh, members uh, and thanks to the borough president's office. I must admit that I feel a little sheepish coming uh, and, and asking for money for, uh, for an arts organization when I've heard so many wonderful stories today of the organizations that are dealing with the pandemic, uh, with food and health. Uh, and, um, but I, I wanna echo what uh, the City Parks Foundation spokesperson said, and that is that parks and, and, I, and by extension, the arts are very vital to the health, mental health, physical health of our uh, of our citizens. Um, so, uh, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, that sort of that 
the, the discrepancy in the need. Um, but what we do is valuable. We reach about 9,000 people every summer with our program. Uh, about 1,000 of those are children that come and participate in the children's workshop. Um, and we also are committed to diversity and equity uh, in all facets of our creative team and our staff and our board. Um, and uh, so thank you so much for your past support. I hope you'll see it to uh, continue your support of this um, free cultural programming that we provide to Queens. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and thank you for being here. All right, next we're gonna hear from Hazak. Hey, 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 how you doing? Oh yeah. Oh, hey. How, how doing you Bob? doing? I'm doing great, two thumbs up. Uh, we missed you at the legislative dinner. I know you were away. It looked like a lot of fun and a lot of good food. You muted yourself though. <laughs> how about now, better? Okay, good. Yeah, good. So anyways, the bar president have seen firsthand and I uh, want to thank you for all that you do and your entire team and everyone that's on. The work of Chazak is very simple. We have uh, many children that after school, unfortunately, when they have too much time in their hands, they're involved with the wrong things. Uh, they're unfortunately involved with crime and drugs, not all of them, but the, some of them. And we try to get those kids, give them a home away from home and uh, put them into a safe environment with homework help and, uh, and, uh, and, and give them trips and incentives and, and weekends and, 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 uh, and, tr and prizes and, you know, just keep them busy. Uh, when a person is busy, he, he doesn't do, uh, you know, anything wrong. Uh, aside for those amazing programs that we have, after school programs, Sunday school programs, teens division programs, we have an amazing pantry where we uh, fed over 20,000 uh, people within a year. Uh, the bar president has seen the lines go around the block and many of our council members have seen it as well. Uh, all denominations, all backgrounds, everyone comes to conjunction with uh, Met Council was supposed to or was mentioned before. And uh, we're doing social services. We're doing a lot of great things and we want to do more. We're never satisfied. We want to strengthen more people. We want to help more people. And in order to do that, the famous thing is that, uh, you know, uh, there's something called money out there. So uh, we're requesting uh, from our uh, bar president for the Queen's delegation for our council members to please step up. Tahab Chazak has accomplished so much within the last uh, few years alone, but it has enormous amount of vision to do a lot more. So I wanted to thank you for your time and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you and thank you for the work uh, that you've done out there. Uh, it's really been important. Thank you. And your request was what? Just uh, one more time. Uh, my request is. Uh, is uh, I'm saying it's a lot. <laughs> um, Izzy Pesquet, are you on my government grants person? Looks like he's not, but uh, again, the request that's all right, you could you'll send it in. Yeah, uh, can I request 20 million dollars? No, I'm joking, <laughs> sure can doesn't mean you're gonna get it, <laughs> but if you don't ask, you shall not receive, right? So it's okay. better to ask. So I'm not saying right. you're doing important work. I mean, we can say, ask, is it realistic? Do you get 20 million? Probably not, but you know. <laughs> okay, so we're asking. We're you asking could play the lotto, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you never know. Uh, yeah, thank but you. Uh, no, seriously, thank you for all that you've done. And your organization has been phenomenal and been very helpful to the Queens community. So thank you so much. And we look forward to the work ahead. Appreciate it, Barbara President. Thank you for everything you do. All right, take care. All right, next we're going to go to uh, Valerie Green, Dance Entropy Incorporated. Buddy, uh, so that's me, Valerie Green. Um, I'd like to thank Borough President Dr. Richards for having me and the esteemed city council members. So Dance Entropy is a not-for-profit founded in 1998 with, we have 10 talented dancers and we perform all throughout New York City with a focus in Queens, our home borough. And we also tour throughout the US and internationally. And in 2005, we founded Green Space, which is in Long Island City, we're in District 26. And the venue is the home of the resident company, Valerie Green Dance Entropy. We also offer affordable rehearsal space, classes, workshops, multi-art events, uh, outreach programs, and performances. So just to say a little bit about rehearsal space, uh, space is needed to create work that goes on the stage anywhere. 
So we are sort of an incubator for dance where people come to make the work that you could see in Queens or anywhere in New York City. It's important for artists to have access to affordable quality space. We also have performance programs that are inclusive of choreographers of different genres, aesthetics, experience levels. We have a works in progress series that involves community feedback. We also have Take Root, which is a split bill that's curated program. So we try to honor artists at different phases of their career. We are also doing a lot of outreach in the community for populations, um, including senior citizens, at-risk youth, those who have experienced all sort of trauma, as well as people of different abilities. And um, <clears throat> we do classes on site, we do off site, we offer free tickets, discounted tickets. We try to get to use movement and dance as ways to connect people and to, and to heal. And um, I want to say also that um, during the pandemic, we moved everything online and we're happy that starting the fall of this year, we moved pretty much everything back to live performances very successfully and enthusiastically with no problems. Um, and we are strong to continue forward with our mission, providing all that we do to various people. And I hope to have your support this year. We've lost the funding from the Borough President Council, the Borough President's Office for a couple of years, and I'm not sure why. So after many years of having the support, so I hope that that can be uh, acquired again. Um, I thank everybody for their time and I hope that uh, you can visit Green Space or see Dance Entropy perform in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, next we're gonna go to uh, Lewis Lattimore House, I believe. I think I'm right, Amanda, right? Yeah, no, 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 no. Jassa, Jassa, then Lewis Lattimore. Sorry, I'm gonna go oh, to sorry. Jassa. Okay. Sorry, I thought I saw it. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Then Lewis Lattimore. Right after. Good afternoon. My name is Dion Woodburn, and I'm uh, the legal services supervisor uh, with Jassa Legal Services for Elder Justice. I want to thank, of course, you, uh, Borough President Donovan Richards, and the Queen's delegation for this opportunity to provide testimony regarding our request for funding. As you know, since 1981, JASA Legal Services Programs has provided free civil legal services to Queens County residents aged 60 and older, with, and those residents have to have the greatest social and economic need. We provide representation in such vital areas as preventing evictions, foreclosures, homelessness, and stopping elder abuse. With over 430,000 Queens residents who are 60 and older, we are the only provider of legal services in Queens that focuses solely on the legal problems of older adults. LSEJ is seeking $65,000 in funding to provide free legal, legal services with a focus on older adults who are homebound and disabled and isolated. The, the COVID-19 pandemic brought many challenges for everyone, particularly for those older New Yorkers. The pandemic served to highlight the challenges of social isolation, loneliness, and it emphasized the technological divide that older adults experience and continue to disproportionately face. With the eviction and foreclosure moratoriums lifted, LSEJ is extremely concerned about older tenants and homeowners facing eviction and homelessness who cannot have access to the courts and other services. These older persons are in need of reasonable accommodations, including access to technology. Without proper funding and services, we are afraid these older adults will once again fall between the cracks. Requested funds will enable JASA to work with the Office of Court Initiatives and Court Administration to provide coordinated outreach, home visits, legal and social services, and arrange reasonable accommodations for these seniors. Funding will also enable LSEJ to continue full range in-depth legal assistance at the courthouses. We've included statistics in our report, but you're well aware that over 31% of the population 65 and older are living below the poverty line. These individuals are our most vulnerable. 
coordinated outreach and legal assistance to these in Queens. That's what the funding is for. We need funding. We have two other asks. One is $25,000 for our LEAP program, which is social work and legal program um, to address the needs of elder abuse victims in Queens. We need money for lock changes and, and other security devices. We're also requesting 25,000 to support Jaffa Chat, a virtual visiting and reassurance program. Thank you so much for your consideration of our clients' needs and our funding requests. We deeply appreciate your ongoing support. And sorry for speaking so quickly. <laughs> You're yeah, muted, Borough President. Sorry, I'm on mute, uh, but you were right on time. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, you did you did great. Um, and I want to thank Jasper for all the work that you do. My son is in the office, as you can see. <laughs> um, so I want to thank you for all that you've done. Seriously, Jasa has been great. Uh, and we look forward to the continued work together with you. Um, we're now going to head to, I think, uh, oh, now, now I got it right. Lewis Lattimore House. <laughs> I'm Borough President Richards, uh, Deputy Borough President Young, and members of the uh, delegation. I'm extremely grateful to have the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Hugh Price. I'm testifying on behalf of the Lewis Latimer House Museum Board and our Executive Director, Ran Yen. Um, I'm Vice President of the Museum Board. Uh, Lewis Latimer was my great grand uncle. And in the 1990s, I was President and CEO of the National Urban League. In 1880, Thomas Edison invented the first light bulb. The problem was that it burned out very quickly and wasn't very practical. Two years later, Lewis Latimer, a black man, invented a game changing carbon filament, which enabled bulbs to be more durable and longer lasting, more energy efficient and economical for everyday use. Starting with the late Claire Shulman, um, and the elected leaders of Queens have provided in indispensable financial, political and moral support for the museum since day one. We are deeply grateful to our Borough President Donovan Richards and the current and former city council members for their continuing support. This year's request is for $5,000 from the borough president's discretionary expense funding. The legacy of this black inventor who helped to build America resonates strongly today with young people and with entrepreneurs and folks who work in the science and technology sector. Latimer House is the only city owned black historic house museum on New York City parks land. With your support, we provide Tinker Lab programs in his own former laboratory where youngsters actually invent stuff and proudly display their creations to their parents. We offer cultural programs which are inspired by his life, his love of the arts, and his commitment to advancing Black people. Starting in September of next year, the museum will celebrate the 175th anniversary of Louis Latimer's birth. We have very ambitious plans. We want to install a new permanent exhibition with modern displays, we need to refurbish the interior, which hasn't been spruced up in a quarter of a century, and we have many other ambitious plans. We invite the borough president and members of the city council to collaborate in these efforts and to join us for the grand reopening. Together, we take enormous pride. We can all take enormous pride in the fact that our museum was the cover story in the current issue of Preservation, the prestigious magazine of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Borrowing a line from the actress Jennifer Beals and the L Word, a series on Showtime, our goal is for everyone to think of Louis Latimer every time they turn on a light switch. Our executive director, Ran Yen, is available for further discussion and questions, and please feel free to reach out to her. And I look forward to working with you and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. We now will go to the chocolate factory. Hello, um, good afternoon. My name is Sheila Lewandowski, co-founder and director of the Chocolate Factory Theater in Long Island City, Queens. First, uh, thank you to Borough President Richards, Deputy Borough President Young, and to the Queens delegation for this opportunity to testify on the mayor's preliminary budget. I also want to extend a sincere gratitude for the pledge of support of the capital project. We have submitted a request for $2 million for, from the Borough President and 500000 from our council member, Julie Wan. Um, I'm going to use some of my time to talk about bigger capital issues, uh, and so I, I bear, beg your patience. The Chocolate Factory is an employer, a community anchor, a place of local pride, a partner with local businesses, a meeting place for community groups, a collaborator on projects as varied as park 
care, street fairs, arts education, and more. But that is not unusual for art spaces. We own a building that will be fully accessible, permanent arts and community space for Queens when we are able to renovate it. I am here today to ask for your support in making capital funding more equitable and accessible. Public capital dollars should be prioritized to organizations that cannot access private dollars, and those organizations should remain part of the process with a voice from the beginning to the end. If some of the points we're making you know, to help address them, I'm gonna give some examples of things the chocolate factory is facing, but then think about that when you're thinking about immigrant led and BIPOC and uh, organizations with even less access to resources. I would think the city should remove the 50% matching requirement to access capital renovation dollars for self-managed projects or work with the organization to be an active part of the design and project management of the renovations. Currently, if you don't raise the funds, the city can take over design and build, usually through DDC. It's more expensive, takes longer. And in this scenario, the organization has no veto power over the design of, of the space they envision from the, for their programming. This is the space they will have to manage and they have no voice. Remove the $500,000 minimum requirement for construction and renovation on facilities that are not city owned. Many organizations providing critical services have projects they can build that will build their capacity, but they can't afford 200 or 400,000, you know, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time It's so many points. Um, so we're ready to build and many of the problems we're facing other organizations are facing, but I don't have access to people who can give me three or $4 million. If I did, I wouldn't need city money. And we are not unlike other small organizations. Somebody needs to rebuild a bathroom. They can't afford that, but they can't, they also don't have a project that's worth $500,000. So they don't get capital money. I'm gonna submit the written testimony, which has a whole list of ways to make this more equitable and more accessible borough-wide and citywide. This will be a model for the city. Think about arts organization, community centers in every neighborhood of the city, but they need access to this capital money. So thank you. Thank you and uh, definitely hear you on that. And we're gonna be meeting with DDC as well. And this is something that's been brought up by a coalition of all of you. And we look forward to working with you on that. And I definitely hear you and definitely understand you. Not everybody's uh, has the biggest budget in the world as some other cultural institutions and especially in the outer boroughs where we're trying to grow. So uh, we look forward to the work ahead with you and uh, great to see you. Thank you, you too. All right, all right. We're gonna now go to the Noguchi Museum. I think I'm right. Yep. Okay. All right. Hey, there you go. <laughs> Hi, Borough President Richards, Borough President Young, and members of the Queen's delegation. Um, thank you so much for affording us the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I'm Brett Littman. I'm the director of the Sama Noguchi Foundation and Garden Museum in Long Island City. Uh, as you may know, the Noguchi Museum was founded in Queens in 1985 by the artist, uh, one of the leading sculptors and designers of the 20th century. Widely viewed as one of his greatest achievements, uh, it was the first museum founded by an artist during his lifetime, um, which is kind of an incredible thing. Um, it presents exhibitions and programs that deepen the public's understanding of the artist's life and work, and also extends the values that he had as an artist into the community. We typically welcome over about 50,000 visitors a year, and I can happily say that uh, as the pandemic is kind of coming uh, uh, down in terms of numbers, uh, attendance is up at the museum significantly. Past capital support in the 2000s from the Queensborough President's Office and the Queen's Delegation of the City Council had a profound effect on the museum. Uh, we were able to stabilize our main building, make it ADA compliant and open it to the public year round. Now the museum is embarking on a, another capital project that will focus on preserving the extraordinary resources Osama Noguchi left to the world through his museum. We're gonna to look to make a unified campus that will comprise the existing Noguchi Museum, a renovation of Noguchi's studio from 1961, which is located across the street, and a new storage lab and study center could be built on an adjacent property behind the studio. Noguchi's studio is an integral part of the artist's story and the museum. He was one of the first internationally acclaimed artists to settle in Long Island City. And for nearly three decade, decades, the center of his artistic practice in the United States was located in that studio and our museum building. Um, some of the most important 20th century designers, artists, architects were in his studio in Queens. So it has uh, a, a tremendous amount of history. The building features numerous elements that show how he lived at work. And the studio also uh, is where his apartment was. Um, and we plan to uh, renovate that building. It's in desperate need of stabilization, address the roof, the facade, the windows. Uh, they've all degraded over time. The living quarters will also be restored. 
Um, in addition, uh, to support our curatorial activities, the museum will construct a new storage lab and study center on the property it owns adjacent to the studio. A 15,000 square foot three-story studio will house the, ma the majority of the museum's collection, which compromises more than 3,000 artworks and models and over 60,000 photos, documents, and personal effects. These works have been scattered after uh, Hurricane Sandy when our basement flooded uh, and no longer able to be stored in the museum proper. To support this, these important projects, we're requesting $6 million in cultural capital funding in uh, fiscal year 23, uh, comprising of $1.5 million from the City Council, $3 million from the Queensboro President, and $1.5 million from the administration. Along with these allocations, um, our total project will budget with uh, these allocations will be $9.95 million out of a roughly $21 million project. On behalf of the Noguchi Museum, I thank you for your consideration, and I, have you, I hope you have a great day. Thanks again. Thank you, and it was great to be out there and uh, to tour uh, the museum and uh, grateful for your service in Queens. And Queens, y'all got to know it's in your backyard. I and mean, I never knew this, this phenomenal institution, like so many of our cultural institutions, uh, um, existed here in Queens. So get out there and see what's in your backyard. It's historic. Um, all righty, thank Thanks, you for President. your testimony. All right, we now are going to go to Socrates Sculpture Park. Good, um, hello, good afternoon. Is my timer started yet? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Borough President Donovan Richards and the Queen's delegation. My name is Tamsin Dillon. I'm the newly appointed Executive Director of Socrates Sculpture Park, located on the border of Long Island City and Astoria, Queens. I'm here to respectfully request a discretionary capital funding allocation of $300,000 towards furnishings, fixtures and equipment to complete Socrates Sculpture Park's new permanent building. Socrates Sculpture Park is a community engaged waterfront park dedicated to supporting artists in the production and presentation of public art. We're open every day, our admission is free and over 200,000 people visit and attend our programs in the park each year. For over 35 years, we've been stewarding this land since artists and community members transformed the once abandoned landfill into a park and exhibition space. Today, we're one of New York City's most prominent exhibition venues for public contemporary art, a cultural anchor in Queens and a vital green space for the neighborhood it inhabits. For the past eight years, we've been working with NYC Parks to create a permanent administrative and programmatic building in the park. Last year, thanks to major support from New York City Council, Queensborough President, and a private donor, we secured the necessary funding to move forward with contracting the construction of this building. We expect to break ground later this year. We now respectfully request additional funds to outfit the building with the necessary furnishings, fixtures, and equipment to complete the project. This includes furnishings that identified the building's designer, Lotech, to complete the space, technology to so that staff can operate as effectively as, as possible in serving our community and equipment that would support and enhance our programming and engagement with the public. The building will be one of the most innovative buildings on public land in New York City and is constructed entirely from shipping containers. The design embodies a 21st century imperative of reuse, adaptability and sustainability and was selected in 2016 as one of 10 public capital projects to receive the Public Design Commission Design Award. This support will complete the building and allow our staff to smoothly transition into the new space so there's no gap in programming or service to the public. This building secures the park's future so generations to come can enjoy the park and take advantage of our programmes. We're grateful for the support you've already committed to this project. And I want to thank you for your consideration of this request. Great, thank you so much. Look forward to working together. All righty, we're gonna go to uh, the Korean American Family Service Center. Hello, um, hello everybody. <clears throat> Um, I thank Queen's Borough President Donovan Richards, Deputy Borough President Young, Queen's delegations, and our Queen City Council members for the opportunity to testify today and for your ongoing support for the Korean American Family Service Center. Since its inception in 1989, the Korean American Family Service Center, KAFSC, has committed to preventing and ending domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse, and all our services are provided in a 
culturally competent and linguistically appropriate setting. As a direct service organization serving the vulnerable immigrants community, we are an essential human service provider. Throughout the pandemic, KFSC never closed its doors and our frontline essential workers stepped into the role of providing a myriad of services that have not normally been our target area, such as COVID-19 related services, as well as responding to the anti-Asian hate crimes and mental health well-being of our AAPI community members. Since the pandemic, KFSC frontline staff responded to a 300% increase in calls to the only 24-hour bilingual Korean and English hotline operating on the East Coast. In 2021, KFSC received 5,069 hotline calls, of which 88% were related to domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse, and or trafficking. 90% of these calls were Asian Americans, 95% were women, 100% were immigrants, and 98% had limited limited proficiency in English. Each year, over 3,000 individuals benefit from one or more services, and the majority of them are from Queens. The essential direct services we provide to an already marginalized and vulnerable community are critical for the survival of Korean American New Yorkers and will be even more so in the recovery efforts. In order to meet the increasing number of cases and calls and the needs of the community, I urgently ask for the support of the following initiatives, the continued investment in the AAPI community support initiative for 150,000, expansion of the Dove citywide initiative, the domestic violence intervention and prevention initiative, prevention of an intervention in sexual assault, domestic violence and prevent domestic violence prevention and intervention for young Asian American immigrants, young women's leadership development initiative, adult literacy and digital literacy initiatives. Uh, we're also requesting $10,000 for the emergency shelter, $20,000 for our Hodori after school program. We'll be submitting more detailed comprehensive written testimony. Thank you so much for your consideration and partnership. Thank you for all the work you've done uh, throughout this pandemic and uh, all of the cultural competency um, that you've um, exerted into all of the work that you've done. So I just want to personally say thank you for all the work that uh, KFSC has done as well. All righty, um, I'm now going to go to, let me just, I'm just checking my list, sorry. All right, the New York Iris Center, then to Queens World Film Festival. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you to Queensborough President Donovan Richards, and thank you to your entire team and staff. Um, my name is George Heslin. Um, I took over as executive director of the New York Irish Center. We're located here at 1040 Jackson Avenue. And I actually took over in the middle of the pandemic from my colleague, uh, Mr. Paul Finnegan. And the organization has received uh, much funding over the year, discretionary funding from various councillors and City Hall, and we're very grateful for that. Um, this year, we're seeking 175,000 to sustain the organization um, in, in all of our efforts. The organization is 16 years old. Uh, we're a not-for-profit social service cultural organization with multiple programs for children, adults, and seniors and families. Uh, we have four full-time staff, director of social care, uh, director of programming, um, finance director, and myself. We have three part-time staff, and we have, we have a host of 25 volunteers who support all of our programs. Uh, we have eight, 18 board members at the organization, and I'm delighted to say that we, we actually own our premises, so we're very lucky in that situation. And the building was built for by the community and fundraised throughout the community to, keep, to build the building. And we completely laid off our mortgage in 2016. Um, the center remained open throughout the pandemic. Our, pro our programs pivoted to engage with the senior community. Our programs included at-home deliveries, weekly phone calls, uh, a, a library, a magazine library, care packages drop off. And we also created a new haircut program um, with local hair salons for the senior community during the pandemic. Uh, the center serves approximately 20,000 community residents um, from neighborhoods such as Long Island City, Sunnyside, Wood, Woodside, Maspet, Astoria, Western Queens, and parts of Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, we offer comprehensive services and programs for older, older adults, including our weekly lunch program on Wednesdays. We do wellness checks. We have movie Monday program, computer and technology classes, tax filing, and social activities and outings. Um, the, center, the center also provides space deeply subsidized rental space for 43 not-for-profit organizations 
where they use for administrative use, meetings, events, classes, and other purposes. An example of the organizations we support are Alcoholics Anonymous, local dance schools, the Irish Counties Association fitness classes. Uh, we have Solace House, which is a suicide prevention organization, AARP, the Lions Club. Uh, we have an immigration lawyer here on our second floor who mostly serves, serves the continent of Africa. Uh, the same path for all and numerous others, local unions, NYPD, et cetera. Um, our audiences are drawn, as I said, from many districts and, and a cross section of the broader community and the Irish community. Um, we have a very diverse community here in Long Island City, and we also program music nights, play readings, panel discussions, an abundance of children's programs, and much more. Um, during the pandemic, we launched actually, since we opened our doors, about 16 new programs. And I'm delighted to say that everything is actually selling out very well and they're turning up. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. All right, next we'll go to the Queen's World Film Festival. Uh, we don't hear you. I think you're unmuted, but we don't hear you. All right, you'll come back. Okay, perfect. So just flag it, so, uh, 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 Amanda, flag it when you're back in. Uh, green touch now. Green touch. Unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is uh, My name is Victor Elahi. I'm the executive director of Green Touch. I work basic basically in Queens, New York. This organization. I established since 2005, March 29, based on Astoria, Queens, New York. I've been living here 33 years. I come from Yellow Taxi Driver in New York City, which is, I have remembering big demonstration 1995 in Manhattan, 33 people killed. I see every corner of the Queens, every, uh, uh, community people, there is huge community people are living in Queens, and I see that under free village children living here, they are uh, they they staying behind because of education system. We working to support them under privileged children, and here is I work basically South Asian community, and I see the project different places housing and bad people and their system. So I uh, try to look after and start to work in deep. Uh, we helping here in air pollution free neighborhood in Jackson Heights. Uh, by the way, I'm involved with the uh, Jackson Heights Bangladesh Business Association uh, in different times since back, long back. I have a uh, uh, center, Ginta Center in Jackson Heights. And uh, we try to work. Uh, one second, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I, I, one second, I'm sorry, excuse me, sorry. So uh, uh, basically, I see in New York, uh, especially in Queens, we have to work from uh, different uh, communities, people who live in here. We have to build up the relationship, and there is a violation goes on in train and the, you know, the neighborhood we know, we have to also educate them and we have to go there to build up our relationship. So then the people is behind or they stay their way, they can come close to us and we can work together to build up the better neighborhood, better Queens, educated neighbor, uh, Queens, and then in uh, New York and uh, obviously in America. I am thinking from behind, from the bottom, and we working. I have a team of uh, Green Tars, very dedicated people. We working. We want to build up a relationship, big relationship, and we work in deep. And you know, we we want to be a bright queens. Thank you. Righty, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we now are going to go to the Queens World Film Festival. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. And that happens Thank to the best you. of us, no problem. 
Okay, thank you, Borough President Richards, the City Council and our community boards and your incredible teams. My name is Katha Cato and I am the Executive Director of the Queens World Film Initiative, commonly known as Queens World. Thank you for the overwhelming opportunity to be here and I hope that my recent technical difficulties makes me memorable. From the beginning of time, we have gathered in the darkened caves around the flickering lights of our communal fires to share our stories. We've upgraded the caves and the flickering lights are now zeros and ones, but the impulse to gather and to discover our shared histories and to imagine a better future remains. It is primal, it must be nourished. As we recently shared with our alumni, now is not the time to put your cameras down. We need our storytellers now more than ever and we must support them as they reflect our world back to us. Queen's World launched in 2011 to provide screening and professional opportunities for local filmmakers so that they no longer had to go outside of the borough to screen their work or broaden their industry network. And to date, we have screened 1,638 films from 83 nations, 263 of them by Queen's filmmakers. In 2018, Pace Travel Magazine named us as one of the top eight destination festivals in North America because after attending a screening from almost anywhere in the world, you can go out and enjoy a meal from that same culture right here in Queens. On March 19th, 2020, in response to the pandemic, Queens World was the first festival in the world to jump online with 191 films earning over 30,000 views. The world came to Queens and that was only possible because we imagined it was possible. In 2021, Queen's World produced an 11-day hybrid event with 198 films online and 143 of those films live in five venues in Queen's. Movie Maker Magazine named us as one of the top 50 festivals in the world, and that's an honor that we share with this firm. With ongoing support of the Queensboro President, the City Council, Queen's World helps our community imagine solutions through year-round programming an annual multi-day, multi-venue international film festival, encore screenings with local CBOs so that the entire borough may experience films from around the world and around the corner. The Young Filmmakers Program that brings filmmaker mentors into the classrooms, industry panels, internships, and work readiness opportunities to help local filmmakers compete in the global marketplace. The pop-up film school with immersive filmmaking activities at community events and the listening tour which records our thoughts about hope and resilience. In 2021, over 5,000 people attended our live events, hundreds coming to Queens for the first time, and we will never, never forget what happened in those lobbies. When we came back together to renew our communal sense of what is possible, I wanna commend all of the organizations that are here. Everybody please drink water. And I ask you to imagine what is possible by supporting our discretionary funding application for $25,000 so that we may continue this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you've done. And uh, it's been exciting to watch the film festival will continue to grow uh, and very thankful for the work that you do. And thank you for your words. And really it is about all of the nonprofits. That's what really makes our borough a, a special place and, and, our, and our diversity, right? And um, today, you know, coming back as we sort of get out of this cloud of Omicron, uh, you, hit a, you hit a note because it's really all of us in this together has really got us through uh, this tough time. So thank you for your words. We're now gonna move on to the Center for Court Innovation. And I see we've been joined by council member Vicki Palladino. <laughs> Hi, Vicki. All righty, going to the Center for Court Innovation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erica McSwain. I am the director of Queensboro Initiatives for the Center for Court Innovation. Um, so since the inception, the Center for Court Innovation has supported the vision embraced by Queen's de delegation of a fair, effective, and humane justice system and building public safety through sustainable community-driven solutions. Our firsthand experience operating direct service programs and conducting original research uniquely positions us to offer insight that the Queen's delegation can look to as it considers the development of its initiatives that respond to the needs of all New Yorkers. This year, we ask the Queen's delegation to continue and expand the support for the center's innovation, innovative core funding. The center uses this fund to flexibly respond to the immediate needs of New Yorkers by piloting no, novel and effective community-based pilots to test for scalable solutions. 
the, through this work, the center is making a deep investment in engaging individuals as far upstream as possible to limit and ideally prevent justice system involvement. Um, an increase in investments would support the center's que uh, Queens Community Justice Center, which uses the funding for Youth Impact's peer leadership program, which engages youth diverted from the justice system. Um, mental health and justice system cannot be siloed. They are extricably intertwined. Properly, I'm sorry, properly addressing the mental health needs of all New Yorkers necessary now more than ever before with the stressor of COVID-19 weighing heavily on already under-resourced communities will allow us to lessen harm interactions with justice system and law enforcement. And on the flip side, ensure that contact with the justice system is humane with an emphasis on providing culturally competent treatment and programming. Ideally, we address the mental health needs of individuals before they ever intersect with the justice system. We urge the Queens delegation to continue to expand support for the Queens Community Justice Center's Uplift Program to address high levels of exposure to community violence and trauma among young men of color in Queens. The Center's Uplift Program provides trauma and healing services to justice-involved male, youth, and young adults by offering client-driven individual and therapeutic sessions and supportive group workshops through case management and victim service assistance and advocacy and mentoring. Participants are supported to recognize process and heal their own trauma, resulting in better uh, life outcomes. By partnering with the center, the Queen's delegation can go beyond transforming the justice system to cultivating vibrant and prosperous communities that center public safety security for all members. We thank the Queen's delegation for its continued partnership and are available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great work that you continue to do and I concur with all of the organizations doing great work around justice. Um, uh, we need you more than ever now, so thank you. I'm uh, now going to go to Queen's Defenders, Lori Zeno. Yes, thank you, Queen's Borough President Donovan Richards and the Queen's delegation. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lori Zeno. I am the Executive Director of Queen's Defenders. We are a legal services organization that represents over 20,000 Queen's residents annually in Queen's Criminal Court. We also operate youth programs in Far Rockaway and Jamaica that reach over 200 young people each year through mentoring and youth development programs. Our Youth Justice Court, our Rockaway Community Justice Center, who, uh, which has been in Rockaway now for going on three years, although we have been in Far Rockaway now for 10 years. Um, and uh, also our community justice centers and our other initiatives that we have. Uh, Mayor Adams' fiscal year 2023 preliminary budget presents a mixed bag of welcome initiatives and serious concerns for our boroughs, communities, and our youth in particular. The addition of increased summer youth employment slots will be a boom to the youth across the city this summer, but the mayor's renewed focus on strategies that will lead to over-policing have the potential to increase obstacles for youth residing in black and brown communities that have been disproportionately impacted by policing and policies rooted in a systematic racism. I implore the mayor to instead focus on strategies that can uplift our city's youth from a strengths-based perspective and provide options that they can access year round. Summer Youth Employment is a crucial program and it helps our youth gain valuable work experience, make connections and earn some money when they're not in school. I would like to see additional investment, however, in our youth outside of this impactful but time limited program. Young people need safe spaces to go after school. They need engaging programs that give them new perspectives and help them envision a successful future. They need to learn about possible career pathways, how to set goals and how to achieve them. They need to socialize, experience the benefits of a relationship with a caring adult mentor and learn how to navigate life's challenges under the guidance of a robust support system. We need to feel connected and the, our youth need to feel connected to the community. 
Um, there are many community-based organizations that do just that, but access to high quality services and options for youth is not equal across the city or across the borough. Take Rockaway, for example. Rockaway is a vibrant community filled with the dynamic and aspirational youth. Uh, they do not have the safe opportunities though as their more affluent peers for after school and weekend employment. What kind of improvements would we see if we targeted communities such as by Rockaway with holistic investment in the youth that reside there. At Queens Defenders, we like to say we're in the business of transforming lives. Our youth programs are year round. They have paid internships where young people gain valuable work experience. They learn a community service mindset and they think about their dream careers and how they might pursue them. Our programs have been wildly successful since their establishment in 2013. Their founding made possible with the support of then council member and now Queensboro president, Donovan Richards. We have helped court involved youth set new pathways for their lives and avoid, avoid further contact with the justice system. We've enabled youth with aspirations for legal careers, learn about the law, court proceedings, the roles that are played while, while simultaneously offering a restorative justice-based solution to issues in their schools and communities through our youth, youth justice program. Our young people have become well known in the communities in which they work, not for a reputation as a troublemaker or due to frequent interaction with the police, but because they are a trusted resource for their peers and even adults who are looking for help with legal, immigration, housing, and other issues. Our youth have fostered strong relationships with local police and work with them to create community events that promote healthy relationships, knowing your rights, and how to interact with police should you be stopped or questioned. They assist in our food pantry and design special Wrap events up, around the holidays. Yes, I'm, I have one thing left to say. Mayor Adams' proposed solution of additional policing in this community and our young people skips over a crucial step that make a, tr a transformative difference in the lives of youth, particularly those residing in Far Rockaway and Jamaica. We need to make a year round investment in them. We need, to we need to believe in their success. Policies are not the answer. They will look, policing, I'm sorry, the special police units are not the answer. They will be looking for crime and arrests. They're not focused on local youth success and their transition to adulthood. We as a city can, and must do better. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the additional time. And uh, a typical lawyer, right? I can. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good thank you. And thank you for the work. I hope the youth court is continuing to do well out there. Um, it's doing great. Catching up soon. Great. And All thank right, you for believing in us from the very beginning, and certainly supporting our our community justice center. And um, we welcome our new. Um, I guess, Community Justice Center of Queens from the Center of Court Innovation. Great, everybody working together. Yeah. All right, we're now gonna go to the Youth Justice Network. Am I, am I? Uh... And now we're gonna mute you. All right, <laughs> now Youth Justice Network. Greetings. On behalf of Youth Justice Network, I thank the Queens Borough President for the opportunity to address you. My name is Messiah Ramkisun, and I'm the Senior Director of Programming and Community Partnerships at Youth Justice Network, formerly known as Friends Violin Academy. As COVID-19 continues into its third year, justice-impacted youth remain at high risk of financial hardship, isolation, mental illness, trauma, and infection caused by the pandemic. We're also seeing an increase in gun violence and community violence, which is affecting the well-being of all of our communities. Our initiatives years addresses both the immediate and long-term damages of COVID-19 by bringing our staff and the resources at our community hubs. Credible messengers, dignity kits, job workshops, individual mentoring, and court advocacy into the neighborhoods where young people return home. Shifting gears, a mobile advocacy and career service is an innovative, inclusive, immediate response to address the short and long-term needs of young people. Funds from New York City Council would be applied to brace the basic brick and mortar needs for weekly presence in the neighborhood to facilitate the staff's ability to support young people. Specifically, funds would go towards update 
and maintenance of necessary equipment and technology for the van and mechanical maintenance to ensure safe and smooth operation. This support will go a long way to enhance our ability to help young people connect with a supportive mentor, prepare for and research available jobs, and access professional clothing for interviews and hygiene slash dignity kits. The bus, which is wrapped in our organization's logo and colors, parks in a different block each day, four days per week, four to five hours per day, connected with youth to address their specific needs. You froze. All right, we'll give him his minute when he comes back. Um, we'll go to uh, Rockaway Development. Hello. Oh, are you back? Are you still here? Yeah. Sorry, I think it was something, a tech issue. But I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we hear you. Go ahead. We'll give you okay. extra 20 so seconds. Can, so in conclusion, I'll say the bus, which is wrapped in our organization's logo and colors, is parked four to five hours per day on a different block each day, four to five days per week. Uh, we're there to address specific needs for young people around jobs, educational advancement, support with ID, housing, et cetera. We pull up and park in neighborhoods where overwhelming numbers of young people are traditionally stopped, arrested, and detained, and who make up a disproportionate number of youth returning home from jail slash prison. Our youth mentors who work on the bus as outreach workers are credible messengers and have the skill, lived experience, and community respect to successfully engage young people and connect them resources based on individual needs, from mental health support to educational pathways. In conclusion, uh, I will say that in December 2021, Shifting Gears launched for the first time. The bus is so far driven and parked in neighborhoods across New York City, from Far Rockaway, Jamaica, Morrisania, East Harlem, Flatbush, and East New York. On March 2nd, for example, the bus was parked for the day in Jamaica, Queens. Uh, we look forward to furthering this conversation and hopefully invite you one day as a guest on the bus so you can come on board and see the work and feel the heartbeat of who we are and what we do within community. Thank you for your time. You get on the bus like Spike Lee. I will definitely be there. You invite us. So thank you for the work. Uh, You're invited. Thank <laughs> you. I look forward. All right. Oh, I'm, I'm messing up this whole list. We're going to go to Tamang Tamang Society. Are they here? Tamang Society? Yes, the last name Lama. Lama? You just RSVP today? They're here. I see them. See them, yeah. Uh, okay, we'll come back to them. We'll go to Solar One. Hey, and congratulations to my former colleague, Steve Levin, on taking the helms of Solar One. And, That's right. Uh, and I look forward to working with y'all. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to um, thank you for the opportunity to be here, uh, Borough President Richards, and also to the Queen's delegation and the Queensboro Budget Board. I am speaking on behalf of the organization. I'm Sarah Radelet, Development Director. And I'm um, taking this beautiful three minute time slot on behalf of, of Solar One because um, our CEO, brand new CEO, could not join today. Um, but basically just some background for everybody. We're, we are a New York City-based nonprofit environmental education organization serving all of New York City. The great news is that we are just about to move into Queens as our administrative office and expand our workforce training center that has been in Queens for a number of years. Um, so we're very excited about that news. We're coming over to uh, 44th Road near, kind of near the Court Square subway station. And as such, we are first, uh, this is our sort of first moment where we feel uh, some, um, some uh, strength in coming before you and making this presentation. Solar One, in our educational environmental mission, we provide four different types of programs, three, um, three of which are, are citywide and would be sort of housed and centered in the Queen's offices. It's K through 12 environmental education, where we work in partnership with the Department of Education, providing just all encompass an all-encompassing curriculum about climate, environment, energy, water, food, all of the things that students and teachers should be up to speed about with respect to um, current status and then what we can all do individually to begin pushing things in the right direction. We've been presenting those programs for since around um, 2000, 
nine, and it's a very strong, interesting, dynamic program that also includes career readiness training for youth who are uh, teenagers. We have a, our workforce training program that I've referenced before, which um, is um, hands-on training in the construction trades for individuals who have had barriers to employment. We train about 400 individuals per year in partnership with um, very strong social service partners around the um, city and lead to certifications for those individuals so that they can be um, pursuing job placements. And we're building out that program this year with added capacity for us to help with those job placements and to begin to track and follow up. So we'd love your support for those programs. The um, third program is what we call our Here Comes Solar program, and it is technical assistance within community, within communities to help um, low income to moderate income housing complexes get solar panel installations on the rooftops. So individuals can tap into the renewable energy movement and have access to it, whether they own their own building or not. Many, many of us in New York City do not own our buildings. And so we have felt maybe squeezed out from that opportunity, but Solar One has, um, has figured out a number of technical assistance programs that help to make that a reality for, for those of us living in, in the five boroughs of New York. We look forward to telling you more about it and look forward to working with you into the future. And thanks so much for, for um, the time to present. Um, and we'd love, you know, we're, we're seeking funding support to support all of these programs along with some of the expense of, of getting that new workforce training lab set up there in, um, in, uh, in Queens on 44th Road. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you and welcome. I'm excited about this. Uh, Thanks. We are very, solar. very excited too. Yes. Glad to have you in the borough. All righty. Uh, we're now going to go to RDRC, Kevin Alexander, followed by Kevin. We'll hear from King Manor Museum, then God blessing, God's Blessings Plan. There's a familiar face. You got to unmute though. All righty. All right. Good afternoon, Queensborough President Richards and Queens delegation. Again, my name is Kevin Alexander, and I am the President and CEO of Rockway Development and Revitalization Corporation. While the impact of COVID-19 has been felt by all, we have seen evidence of a growing disparity between how low moderate income neighborhoods and middle to upper middle income neighborhoods have fared thus far including many MWBEs that already reported being financially leveraged and at risk of closing prior to the pandemic. With that being stated for fiscal year 2023, we have concentrated our request on business support, attraction, district marketing, placemaking to support locally minority owned businesses provide, by providing professional training and support to Queens-based local and MWB businesses. Two, strengthening our Rockaways neighborhood retail districts to keep existing dollars in the community and attract new consumers and spending into the Rockaways. Three, promoting locally owned and family operated restaurants as the centerpiece of a peninsula-wide placemaking strategy. We are requesting $75,000 to provide a third session of professional business training to 20 Queens MWBEs through our collaboration with a national recognized partner, Interise. The 13th session Amplify Queens Now Streetwise MBA program provides business development strategies, finance and financial management, marketing and sales, human resources, accessing capital, contracting with government major corporations and professional networking opportunities. RDOC will use these funds to staff and to assign staff to manage the program and purchase the license agreement covering the curriculum and facilitator slash instructor. Our second request for $75,000 is to develop business, track, business, business attraction, business support, and district marketing materials that can be accessed by local residents, travelers, and day trippers interested in exploring shopping and doing business in the Rockways. This wide endeavor will require staff to really routinely travel five commercial quarters stretching 12 miles and a toll bridge to conduct surveys and assessments, collect photos and video clips, and professionally produce collateral for our partners to promote. Our third request is through the $20,000 through the Neighborhood Development Grant Initiative to develop a peninsula-wide placemaking campaign focused on dining in the Rockways. RDOC will need additional staff to conduct on-site surveys, collect information on restaurants, and create a professionally produced restaurant guide on a quarterly basis. In closing, 
Our goal is to strengthen existing businesses already leveraged and at risk of closing with a suite of professionally trained, developed tools that can lead to new opportunities and to begin changing the mindset that the Rockways must remain eternally divided as opposed to viewing the Rockways as one unified regional economy. Thank you for your consideration and time. Thank you. Thank you for the work you've done uh, with us over the years. Thank you. Look forward to continued work together. All right, we're going to King Manor Museum. Kelsey. Hi, good evening. Hi. Thank you so much for the time. Um, so you might know our mission is to interpret founding father Rufus King's political legacy and anti-slavery history to teach critical thinking for a healthier democracy. So with that anti-slavery history and our community focus, we care deeply about social inequities. And while Jamaica is at the outer edge of the outer boroughs, this doesn't mean that we should have a lesser quality of life than our friends in other parts of this great city. I live in Jamaica and I walk to work every day and I have so much love for this neighborhood. It's my personal goal as director of King Manor to provide a world-class museum experience and contribute positively to the quality of life here in Southeast Queens. Our main focus since the beginning of the pandemic has been to increase community ownership of the museum. One of the best things we can do to welcome in the community is to do just that, invite community use of our space. We host small business and artisan fairs, film festivals, invite local schools and faith organizations to steward our community garden and display community curated exhibitions of local artists. We humbly request funding to support this exhibition series, which increases the quality of life in downtown Jamaica, promoting access to arts and culture and driving visitors to the museum and by extension, the commercial corridor. I want each of our visitors to feel empowered to seek out the historic roots of our current issues and use this knowledge to make decisions that make the world a better place, whether that's being more conscious of how and what they consume or finding effective ways to ameliorate social inequities through a historical understanding of how those problems came to be. We do this through school tours, visitor tours, free family craft days, community festivals, and more. I'm also, also asking for continued support of these educational programs and festivals. It's really important for us to offer very low cost or usually free programming to our underserved community. And we're so grateful for the support of the borough presidents and city council members discretionary funding, especially the cultural immigrant initiative. We recently hired a Spanish speaking educator to help us welcome our Spanish speaking friends and are looking to hire a Bengali speaking educator by the end of fiscal year 23, so that language in addition to finances is not a barrier. My third and final request is support for our community garden and seed library. Since we are located in King family's historic 1805 home in the middle of Rufus King Park, visitors regularly comment on what an oasis our museum is in the urban bustle of downtown Jamaica. Support for our garden would not only be an investment in our museum, but would help us make the front section of our park look much more inviting and improve the streetscape for our neighborhood as well. I know this is a really wide range of initiatives, but I'm proud to ask for funding for all of these as it shows the depth and breadth of our relationship with our community. We strive to have as little overhead as possible. Uh, myself and another staff member uh, personally regilt the lettering of the preamble that um, you can see in behind me that adorns our front fence last summer. Uh, one phrase from the preamble constantly inspires the work that we do to form a more perfect union. And we hope it inspires everyone who walks past the museum as we are sure it inspires all of our wonderful local politicians to keep making Queens ever better. Thank you so much for the opportunity for the work that we do and for your continued support. Thank you, Kelsey. All right, we're gonna now move on to God's blessings plan. Hello. Thank you, President and the uh, Queen's delegation. I appreciate um, the time to be able to speak. Um, my name is QR Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of God's Blessings Plan, as well as the founder. Our mission is to show the love and compassion of Christ to our local communities through strategic outreaches and programs designed to meet needs and leave people with a sense of love and dignity without discrimination. Our overall budget need is $60,000 but we have requested 10,000 in discretionary funding. Um, the vision for us is to be a beacon of light, hope and equality for the underserved and underrepresented throughout the world. We came into existence in January of 2018 with 50 blessings bags filled with seasonal necessities and a $15 gift card to McDonald's to give away to the homeless. In 2021, alone, we served over 18,000 people in need ranging in terms of in items um, from diapers, wipes, coats, holiday toys, food, socks, 
back to school supplies, toiletries, feminine hygiene products, and much more. Um, our core work has focused on the distribution of basic necessities to make ends meet. And the program we're asking for assistance with um, combines meeting those immediate needs of children and families through the distribution of basic necessities while also providing an opportunity for caregivers to get job training and immediate hire slash training positions. We hold these events at various locations, including NYCHA facilities, and we partner with other nonprofits to provide the diapers and wipes to children and feminine hygiene products to women and mothers. By addressing this need, as well as the need for toiletries, we aim to help ease some of the stress of families that are struggling to make ends meet. During our giveaways, in an effort to address the needs of the family in totality, we're also in partnership with a minority and veteran-owned Queens-based driving school and a Bronx-based staffing agency to provide free CDL training courses for unemployed and low-income residents. Um, our goal is to increase the number of training and direct hire opportunities for trade and union jobs in low income areas throughout Queens. I found that it's impossible for someone to tell you where they'll be in five years if they don't know where they'll be in the next five days. It's imperative that we help first beat their short term basic needs so that they can focus on their longer term um, advancements in their careers. Even with assistance of SNAP and uh, WIC, there are no programs that help those in need with items such as diapers, wipes, toiletries, feminine hygiene products, coats, or socks. In providing those necessities along with the job training opportunities, I believe it, it provides an ideal win-win situation and allows employers and unions to reach an untight, untapped, diverse employee source and grow their organizations as well as providing new insight to available jobs that do not necessarily require a college education to make a decent living wage for low-income New Yorkers. Um, it's, it also gives those same residents the opportunity to not only use those skills at other companies, but also the opportunity to build those skills and couple them with business classes to establish their own businesses and take control of their financial future. I thank you for your consideration and I hope that you um, give us the opportunity. Watch Ms. Johnson for your testimony and thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank Next, you. we'll go to QSAC. Oops. <laughs> Hello. Um, I am here. I don't know why my photo is not, I'm not showing. <laughs> Uh, uh, are you sharing your screen? Okay. There we go. That's why there's a piece of tape there. <laughs> good, good afternoon, uh, Borough President Richards, uh, council members, staff, um, community board members. Um, thank you for, for the opportunity to um, present briefly uh, our ask. And first, let me just start off by saying thank you for uh, your continued support over the years uh, at CUSAC. Uh, and for the, you know, being able to be there to provide services to uh, children uh, and adults with uh, autism. Uh, our three asks are quite um, self-explanatory and I'll go into them briefly. Uh, the first is our usual ask of, uh, you know, what we've asked every year for 5,000 for uh, supplies, uh, program materials, trainings um, at some of our program sites, um, which you have done in the past. Um, our next ask is for 10,000, um, and that is for our job training program. Uh, as we enter a, um, it's a job training program for individuals, for young adults and adults uh, who are diagnosed with um, an ASD uh, or some other intellectual developmental disability. And it's to allow us to provide uh, additional supports uh, for those individuals that we're serving so that they can get the skills, gain those skills uh, necessary to get uh, gainful employment um, and, you know, be part of the, the great economy that's soon to come as we move into a post-pandemic economy here in New York City. Um, the other one is, is something that we've been doing, uh, you know, our doors never closed during the pandemic. And uh, we've been serving, you know, individuals remotely uh, in a hybrid fashion um, as well. Uh, but we've uh, over the last two years have been um, providing uh, the um, high school equivalency program uh, exam uh, for individuals on the spectrum uh, who have a diagnosed uh, intellectual developmental disability uh, and so forth. And so we're asking for 10,000 to, um, 
to increase our capacity so that we can increase our capacity and provide also additional supports. Right now, there are aspects uh, like tutoring that goes unfunded uh, and materials that we might need and supplies uh, for those individuals. Uh, you know, uh, IEPs right now, as you all know, is is not a recognized diploma. And so a lot of our, our referrals uh, will have IEP diplomas uh, and we're helping them to get their uh, regular, you know, high school equivalency diploma so that they can pursue um, gainful employment in whatever career they wanna be uh, to pursue. So hopefully we can uh, gain your, have your support on that. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all hopefully soon in person. So thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for the work you do. Thanks. Oh, you're right on time. There thank we go. you. Take All care. Right. All, All right. right. See you. All right, we're going to go to Conrad Poppenhusen now. Good evening. Now, it, it went from good afternoon to good evening, and thank you, I'm it sure, by now. Good morning for me. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good A long, long day, so I appreciate you're still there listening to us. Uh, I thank you for this opportunity to have the budget uh, request of the Conrad Poppins and Association heard. Like everyone else in the city, the Institute struggled through the many challenges of 2020 and 21, but we survived by rising to the occasion and tapping into our creativity and that of our wonderful volunteers. I am the executive director of this wonderful historic building and I have been for 38 years. And it has become, during the pandemic, it became more important to me than ever because we did not close. And I saw how important it was to the community that we continue to serve them, even though it was in innovative ways, either in the garden, virtually, or by, taking a trolley around the community with a musical band on the balcony and going up and down the streets of Whitestone and College Point and Bayside too. And the members of the community were extremely grateful for that. It brought them smiles, it brought them hope, it brought them encouragement. In FY23, in addition to our multicultural con concerns, concerts, excuse me, community murals that the youth participate in, family painting, affordable piano lessons, school and public tours of this historic facility and of the community. We will also be starting an ESL program and a citizenship program and family movies in the garden. We are the only such facility in College Point and Whitestone and therefore we are more important to the community than ever. We managed to accomplish a great deal with extremely limited funds. We make every tax dollar count and we do it all with one full-time and one part-time staff. Our expense budget request from our councilwoman, Vicki Palladino is 35,000 from our borough president, 3,500. And our capital request, we have two requests, but the most important one is to completely fund the sidewalks, the bluestone sidewalks and historic lighting. It was partially funded in previous fiscal years, but in order to begin the process of uh, implementing this work, we needed to be completely funded. And I know Borough President Richards, you've been there. And I know Councilwoman Palladino have been to the Institute at night. It is extremely dark down there at night in an industrial area. And to make people feel safe visiting there, we really needed to be illuminated. So I hope you will find our request worthy and I hope you continue to visit the Institute and everybody out there in virtual land will visit us as well. So thank you for this opportunity and thank you for your past support. Thank you so much. I look forward to our continued work together and thank you for all the work uh, you continue to do. Uh, we're now going to go to, we're going to try to Tamang Society again. Chimang Lama, Chimang Lama. Are you here? All right, we're going to move on to the Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong Museum. Excited about Louis Armstrong Museum. Hello to 
you, Borough President, to the members of the City Council, Community Board Chairs. I'm Regina Bain, Executive Director of the Louis Armstrong House Museum. The new Louis Armstrong Center across from the historic house in Corona will be completed this year. So building upon our decades of experience as a museum offering tours to the public, the new center will truly celebrate the legacy of the jazz trumpeter, American icon, and 30-year Queens resident, Louis Armstrong. It will also help us to live the Armstrong values of artistic excellence, education, and community. We thank the borough president and members of the city council for the awarded capital funds to realize this project. The center will host a state of the art exhibition space, which is being curated by award-winning jazz pianist, Jason Moran. It will have a 70 seat performance venue offering performances, lectures, films, and convenings on a year round base basis. You can see an artist's rendering of that space behind me. And I can attest with my own eyes that it is getting closer to realizing this goal. Alongside Selma's Place, the donated home of Selma Gerardo, the new three building Armstrong Corona campus will become a Queens based hub for inspiration and learning, economic development and tourism for the 15,000 local neighbors, students, city, national and international visitors we welcome in a typical year. With new space comes an expanded programmatic vision. This year, for the first time, we created an internationally award-winning children's film, free to the public, brought teaching artists to Queens classrooms and accomplished music education online, including social emotional learning using the musical form of the blues to discuss challenging times. This summer, we will welcome hundreds of students back to our garden for our Pops is Tarps Tops series of outdoor concerts in person. This year, we've worked with world-class artists, including Latin Grammy award-winning trumpeter, Linda Briseño, who led and recorded a Spanish language tour of the house, free to the public. Applications are now open for our program, Armstrong Now, $10,000 commissions for contemporary artists to create new works based on their research in our archives, the largest of any jazz musician and one of the largest of any black musician. We are so proud of what we've been able to accomplish, even with the uncertainties of these past years. We need your continued support to thrive. Thank you for all you have done, and we look forward to seeing you at the opening of the new Armstrong Center this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> all righty, we're now going to the sickle cell thalassemia patients network. Unmute. I'm going to trademark this this today. I'm going to become a billionaire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to you, Borough President Ledgers, and to the City Council members and the uh, district leaders there in Queens. The Sickle Cell Thalassemia Patients Network is a 35 year old organization which started as an adult support group for adults living with sickle cell disease and thalassemia and incorporated as a not-for-profit in 1992. Since then, we have been helping children and adults living with this disease and their families to reduce the negative impact that this genetic inherited disorder has on our families, which is social, economic, educational, political. It's, it's unbelievable the things um, that do happen within the community, particularly around access to care and access to quality care. We have, um, we have been awarded last August, a HRSA grant uh, called the Newborn Screening Follow-Up, which is going to allow us to expand care coordination throughout the five boroughs of New York City. We currently uh, have community health workers at Queens Hospital and would like to expand to other hospitals in Queens to do care coordination for adults also to provide transition programs for young adults aging out of pediatrics into adult care. In addition, uh, with our Queens, uh, excuse me, sickle cell organizations, we want to collaborate to create a free public education program for sickle cell trait awareness and testing. 
So we're working on, on building this amazing program. We haven't had anything like it since the 70s and the early 80s. So we want to bring back sickle cell trait education to New York. We want to be able to test all people with sickle cell disease. Unfortunately, it is characterized as a black disease and it is not as a human disease. And with Queens being the most diverse borough in the city, we want to be able to reach out to other ethnicities with this inherited disorder to provide genetic counseling if tested positive. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with all of you. We look forward to the opportunity to do more work in Queens and um, we're here to serve. Thank you and I appreciate the work you're doing around sickle cell, something that impacts uh, communities of color uh, disproportionately. And uh, one of my closest friends actually has sickle cell and it's always a struggle. So thank you for what you do. You're welcome. Thank you. Righty. I think, uh, Amanda, where am I going next? Positive Women United. Positive Women United. It's Positive Women United followed by Visiting Nurse Service of New York. Thank you so very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Uh, yes, my name is Sylvia Cote of Positive Women United. Um, obviously, most of you may know about the organization. It's locally based in Queens. It's a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization for young girls and women of all ages. Uh, we've been doing so much since we um, have pivoted COVID. Uh, we've obviously been getting a lot of local, national, statewide, and global outreach as far as especially for women's health and for mental services. So that's where we are allocating and that's where we're advocating as much um, that we need those services for women's health, um, especially during COVID that a lot of women and the youth, uh, female youth, young adolescents have not been having access to healthcare. Um, they have missed the appointments or um, they have been you know, negligent and they haven't had any uh, access to um, mental health, especially mental health services and um, really just keeping up with their health care needs. And also we've been dealing a lot with single moms um, and with their children that need um, additional services and support. So we've been working with that a lot um, along with um, a lot of STEM programs that we've been working on with uh, the female youth and the young ladies who need access and want um, technical support. Um, assistance as far as um, outreach with STEM related programs. We're actually going to have a STEM related workshop training next month. Um, a whole, I think it's either a whole week or two weeks um, intro introduction to science, technology, engineering, STEAM, um, arts as well in math. So it's either STEM or STEAM. So we've been doing that as well. We've been getting a lot of outreach um, for that uh, initiative. And also we are in, you know, we're also in the need of, you know, continuing asking for physical space so we can have these opportunities, we can have these programs, these workshops, um, webinars and seminars. Uh, we've been doing them virtually, but obviously none of the COVID-19 numbers have decreased. So we're looking to do more in-person, more human interaction, you want more human engagement with our members or supporters. And uh, we really wanted to do a lot more outreach. So we're definitely looking to uh, request and um, make more requests for physical space for our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Good to see you. Good to hear you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you for yeah. having right. a Thank you once again. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go to Visiting Nurse Service of New York. Okay, thank you, uh, Borough, Borough President and uh, City Council members and uh, Community Board Chairs. Um, I'm Dan Lowenstein, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. So we're uh, uh, one of the oldest and the largest not-for-profit home and community-based healthcare providers in New York. Um, last year, we provided care to over 20,000 Queens residents. And uh, I think we employ, let's see, about... Um, well, about 1,800 uh, Queens residents. That includes nurses, social workers, home, home health aides, and a variety of individuals who every day go into the homes of Queens residents and others, other New Yorkers to provide quality care. Um, we have uh, three um, uh, requests that we made, that all of which we submitted applications to council for discretionary funding for each of these requests. 
Um, the first is NORC Nursing, Nationally Occurring Retirement Community Nursing Services. We provide these services throughout uh, New York City in, in DIFTA funded NORCs. Um, we're looking to continue to do that. Um, those include uh, 10 NORCs in Queens, which are in my, in my testimony there. Um, and really these nurses are helping uh, NORC residents age in place. They're providing health advocacy, connections to care, special services that will essentially help them stay in, in the place that they, you know, that they want to stay in. Um, so that's a really, really important program that we want to see um, continue. Um, the second is the Gender Affirmation Program. Now, this is a program that we started about five years ago, the only one of its kind that exclusively helps individuals who have, who are, who have uh, gone through gender affirmation surgery um, and helps them with that recovery, right? Not just the physical recovery, though we do that also, but the social and emotional support that goes along with it. Um, most of the individuals that we care for are Medicaid or me Medicaid enrollees or Medicaid eligible, but Medicaid doesn't cover all of these services. So what we like, what we, what we are looking for funds for is uh, extra help with, so with the social worker who can help to identify needs. And then sometimes with support on rent, things that will help these individuals re enter into society the way that we know that they that they want to do. Um, and lastly is our veterans program. Um, we are the largest provider of hospice and home care services to veterans in New York City. All five boroughs, including Queens, great relationship with the St. Albans uh, uh, VA hospital system, and we want to continue that. And this what veterans need now is both you know, the care in the home that we can provide, but also the connection to the services that sometimes they don't really, you know, that, that they sometimes need to get gain access to. We have veterans on staff that help them every day, making sure that they are getting every benefit that is that is in, that they're entitled to from the city, state, and federal government. Um, so that is a you know, we want to we want to use these funds to expand uh, our role, expand our outreach in Queens, um, in Queens in particular, Queens and Brooklyn, where we really want to. Uh, expand. And that's my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Next, we're going to go to FMCP Conservancy, Hope Flushing Meadows, Corona Park. <laughs> that's what it's written out. Unmute. Unmute. Oh, yes. Go. <laughs> good afternoon or good evening. My goodness, you guys must be exhausted. No, um, we, we, we're just getting started. You're just getting started off. That's what I figured you would say. Um, I, I just want to say to, to all these, I, I really miss coming up there because I can't give you one of our, our maps of Flushing Meadow Corona Park and our, our usual pen. Uh, I want to thank you for having me here today. My name is Jean Silver. I am the president of Flushing Meadow Corona Park Conservancy. Just wanted to let you know all parks are open, not only Flushing Meadow, but since we're in Queens and this is the borough that is the Queens is the world's borough. I represent the world's park. And hopefully we'll get that tag name this year in. But I want to thank the former borough president and our new borough president on the wonderful jobs they have done with Queens. Never mind just with the park, but with Queens. And I give you so much hope and joy on the job that you've been doing so far because if you do what you're doing now, it's going to be a wonderful year for Queens. We have so many new uh, council members that I'm looking forward to working with and getting to know in the future. Um, once again, all the parks are open and I hope everybody comes out and enjoys the summer. I think we're going to have a beautiful one. We have a lot of programs that we're scheduling for. Please go to our website at fmcpc.org. You can download a map on the, on the website. And once again, I want to thank the Queen's delegation and the borough president for their support over the years. And you know, Flushing Meadow Park, the world's park is here for all the years. So please come out and join us this year. I'm going to keep it short. Have a wonderful night. Did you have an ask? <laughs> Oh, you have my ass in okay, writing, okay. so I'm not right. going to bore all right. you. All right, perfect. All right, great. A lot of work to do in the park. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for what you do. Beautiful park. All right, we're going to go to uh, Candace Prince, and then uh, Michael Mallon will take over. Uh, so she's going to be representing two groups, NAACP and South Queens Women's March. Oh, and then I'll hear from Class Size Matters. 
Uh, but let me just say this, Candace, you know how this works. So get directly to your ass because you got too much experience <laughs> to not just get directly to your ass. <laughs> got it. Oh, where's my timer? Are we, oh, we're still running down the previous person. Better not go over three minutes. <laughs> three minutes for both? Or just... <laughs> I'm messing with you. Go ahead. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Okay. First up, I am here on behalf of the New York State NAACP Conference. Um, okay. So nice. the vision of the National Association the advancement of colored people is to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights without discrimination based on race. So while we're best known as an advocacy organization, obviously these modern times require direct and modern solutions. We have what's called a Connect All Kids Equity Initiative that's now in its third year. It's a first of its kind program founded to bring the latest advanced learning technologies so we're talking about Dell computers, Chromebooks, specialized learning software from NeoWorld. All this is happening with the students, with the parents and with the teachers collaboratively. So for pre-K to grade two, um, they're getting the Chromebooks and the specialized learning. For grades three to 12, they're getting the STEM Happens Network. Um, so right now we're in districts three, four, six, seven, nine, 10 and 23. Uh, for Queens, we're in 27, 28, and 29. Obviously, we want to expand to uh, 24, 25, 26, and 30, but we need your help. We are requesting $100,000 from the borough president's office to expand the program's reach within the school districts that it's currently in, as well as be able to touch all of Queens. We definitely want to make sure that we're closing that digital divide, that everyone is getting the same services so that um, our students are ultimately college and career ready. That is my uh, presentation on behalf of the New York State NAACP Conference. Now you have Queens Woman March. Unmute. You're muted. Pulling that up, give me one second. Okay. So. Uh, inspired by global and national women's rights movements, the South Queens Women's March is a volunteer run organization that amplifies the voices of South Queens as diverse women. We're multi-generational, intersectional, working to foster women's empowerment through dismantling norms, practices, and institutions that support patriarchy and gender injustice, including gender-based violence. So due to the pan pandemic, obviously our goals changed. The original um, goal was to actually hold a march within South Queens that would bring all of our neighbors and supporters together. It's not yet um, safe to do that, but we've still been able to serve our community um, since then. So um, what our ask specifically today is, is $30,000 to hire a part-time administrator who will help us build on the progress we've made in the past two years. So everything from um, uh, civic engagement support, we've been helping with um, uh, COVID outreach, uh, all sorts of things, um, inti healthy, intimate and sexual relationships, um, workshops, uh, sorry, um, making sure that folks recognize the power of art to cope with trauma from gender-based violence, um, all sorts of programming that we've been able to introduce in lieu of having a physical march. And we wanna make sure that the borough president's office can help us um, to continue that programming while also working towards that march when it is safe to do so. That is my testimony for the South Queens Women's March. Okay. Thank you, Candace. good to see you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Okay. All right, we're gonna now go to class size matter. matters. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you, hello. Good, hello, good afternoon, Borough President Richards and council members, community board members and staff participating in this briefing. My name is Lani Hameson. I'm the executive director of Class Size Matters and we're applying for discretionary funding from Queen City Council members, primarily for operating expenses. We're a nonprofit focused on providing information about the importance of class size to student learning and providing the data showing that class sizes in New York City are far larger than they are in the rest of the state. 
This disparity in class size and inequity has led to New York State's highest court to conclude that our class sizes are too large to provide New York City students with their constitutional right to a sound basic education. To this day, this inequitable situation remains even though smaller classes have been shown to lead to better outcomes for all students, but especially those who need the help the most. We provide briefings to parents, community education councils, and other community group, groups on the specific class size and overcrowding data in their districts. And every spring we sponsor a parent action conference with workshops and sessions. On a Can you hear me? Yeah? Yes, I hear you. Uh, uh, if you're not talking, please make sure you mute. All right, but we hear you. Okay, I, I was, okay, so every spring we provide a parent action conference with workshops and sessions on a variety of education topics, including advocating for your special needs child, protecting student privacy, school integration efforts, class size and school overcrowding, high stakes testing, with experts uh, giving briefings and help to parents. One of the reasons I especially wanted to talk to you folks today is the opportunity to alert you to the fact that in the latest version of the capital plan released just a few days ago, the school construction authority proposes to cut the number of school seats planned for Queens by over 6,000 seats, the most of any borough compared to the adopted capital plan. This includes two, over 2,000 seats cut in Queens high schools, though your borough's high schools are the most overcrowded in the city. I'd be happy to share with you and your staff more data on this. We're also one of very few organizations dedicated to scrutinizing DOE spending and contracts for evidence of fraud and waste. In recent years, our oversight and advocacy in this area has led to hundreds of millions of dollars of savings in the areas of computer wiring and school busing. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today on our activities and plans for the future. If the borough president or any of the other elected officials or organizations here today would be interested in a briefing on these issues, please let us know by emailing us at info at classsizematters.org. Great. And I've been going through this book, which you see is on my desk <laughs> on the, the cuts. And uh, and I applaud, you know, the council. We're working with Adrian and obviously the new um, education chair. And we're going to be fighting to make sure that um, the budget um, uh, cuts that the mayor has proposed uh, are not disproportionately impacting Queens, but more so that money is put back, period. Uh, we should not be cutting schools during this during this period at all. Um, so I look forward to the continued work with you and thank you for uh, all of the work you've done over the years uh, and fighting for smaller class sizes. So thank thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you for you. the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. Michael. Thank you. We don't hear you, Mike. I, you might have to uh, sign in and out. I think his audio went. Uh, let's see. Uh, Christina Serrano is next. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Yeah, you. yeah we can hear you. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Borough President Donovan Richards. Good afternoon, City Council. Um, I'm here today to ask for capital funding for the Maurice Fitzgerald Playground located in um, the border of Ozone Park in Richmond Hill. This is actually my fourth time here. Um, thanks to City Council Speaker, we've allocated over 2 million, but we need about 5 million. Um, this park was last done in 1999 and um, it needs a facelift. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Already. One thing that I do want to point out, I know the time is limited. Um, there's a local boys and girls club that used to take their kids there. They're four blocks away. But the, the park has gone down so much that now they walk 15 blocks with their kids instead of going to that playground. So um, that's to just give you an idea of, of how urgent this park needs to be redone. And we did put money into the park, I believe, Amanda. City Council we? Speaker, yes. Adrian Adams, yes, yeah, she's put we in did, the past we did, last, years. we did last fiscal year, too. Yes. How much did we put in, Amanda? One million. We put in a million. So we're getting closer. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we remember your testimony from last year as well. Yeah. 
Oatmeal. So we did put it. one in. We still got yes. two. Going. God willing, we'll finish it up this year. This just yeah. Year. You know, I started when my son was 18 months. He's four years old now. So every year I just keep knocking, and I'm so grateful for every little thing that goes into it. So thanks again. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for your advocacy. And thank you're not you. a friend of the park. You're just a, a parent in the neighborhood. I'm a parent. And you signed um, up today. Yeah, and I'm a long-term that, resident of this neighborhood. That's great. Um, that's what we need more of. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you for showing up today. Thank See that, everybody. folks? Not even part of an organization concerned about Take the well-being of a park. Awesome. We're going to go to Michael. Amanda, who's next? I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties. Um, a Dromeda Community Thank Initiative so next. Sorry if I'm not saying that right. The Andromeda Community Initiative, is that what you said? Um, good. I tried. Right. Sure. My name is David Nidus, and uh, thank you uh, for hearing us, Bar President Richards. Uh, the Andromeda Community Initiative uh, is based out here in Long Island City, Queens, and our mission is to provide construction training for people in need. We work with people in reentry, people coming off of welfare, people overcoming barriers. We provide them with certification, hands-on training at our beautiful hands-on training space here in Long Island City. And then we go on to get uh, many of them jobs out of the people we, we train in construction, 85% uh, complete. Uh, and after that, 85% of those go on to get employment, often over $19 an hour. Our present salary is around $20 an hour. We're very proud uh, to be doing that. You know, I will point out uh, that we work predominantly with an African-American population, which is underrepresented in, in construction. Uh, they're 26 uh, roughly percent of, of uh, the population in our city, only 14% in construction and we do our level best to try to get people entry into construction. Um, work we do is impactful both as far as giving people who have never been in the field before entry and also providing safe, uh, for building safety. We work uh, to get people their OSHA, their SST, their suspended and their supported scaffolding uh, certifications which allow people to allow, uh, you know, when you're walking under your construction uh, in, in, your in your local neighborhoods, you'll be happy that we're, we're doing what, what, what we're doing. Um, we don't have a, a pending request in front of the borough president right now. We've, we've applied uh, uh, to uh, our local uh, council people, uh, as well as the delegation overall, and, and look forward in May to, to making a, a substantiated request. We would love to host any visitors out here at our Long Island City location so you can see the work we do. Uh, we greatly appreciate this opportunity to present. Thank you for your testimony. We're now going to go to Believe God's Love We Deliver. Yep, thank you so much. And thank you to the Queensboro delegation for your time. Um, in consideration um, of God's Love We Deliver's FY23 requests for funding. Um, God's Love is New York City's only uh, provider of medically tailored meals for people of all ages who are living with serious illness who cannot shop or cook for themselves. God's Love fills an important gap in the city's overall food response. If you're someone living with a serious illness with a specialized diet and are unable to shop or cook for yourself, God's Love is the only provider who can meet your nutritional needs in the New York City area. Our medically tailored meals are cooked in our own kitchen with no starters, fillers, or preservatives. The meals are then home delivered to our clients' homes in all five boroughs. Um, God's Love does not just put someone on a, on a diet. We have eight registered dietitian nutritionists um, who work with each of our clients to ensure the right meal for their diagnoses, comorbidities, allergies, medications, and also their preferences. In addition, God's Love can accommodate someone through the trajectory of their illness. So we can offer a soft, minced, or pureed option. Despite being the only provider of medically tailored meals, the only funding we receive from the city is through discretionary funding. Um, we serve these clients as, as it is core to our mission, but each year as we continue to grow, this dedication becomes more and more difficult fiscally. In calendar year 2021, we delivered a total of 2.5 million meals to 9,300 clients citywide. In Queens, we did 490,000 meals to 2,100 individuals and also their families um, in Queens. So 
At God's Love, we raised 65% of our funding from private philanthropic sources. Um, increased and sustained funding from the council is really critical to the support of our program. Um, and so God's Love is this year respectively requesting um, about $10,000 from each of the council members in Queens. Um, delegation funding in the amount of $20,000. And we also ask um, the Queensboro delegation to support our speaker request for $300,000. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. Thank you so much for your work and thank you for all the work you've done during the pandemic. All righty, next we're gonna go to Andromeda Community Initiative. I think I said that right. Sorry, they just went. No, that was God's love. We, oh, okay. oh, right, but yeah, right before that. Oh, I missed that. Around. Okay. Yeah, right. next is to, uh, oh, together and dance. dance. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, hello, everyone. You can hear me. Oh, I hope you can. You hear me? Okay, great. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, so hello, everyone. I know it's been a really, really long day. Thank you all so much for taking the time and for hearing all of us out. Um, my name is Katie Palmer. I'm the executive director of Together and Dance. Together and Dance provides creative movement and musical theater residencies uh, throughout the five boroughs, specifically in Queens. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Um, I just want to say this is my first time applying for discretionary funding um, from the uh, borough of Queens, as well as from individual uh, city council members. Um, and I'm just so honored to be here um, and to be hearing all of the incredible work that's happening in Queens. Um, it's just, it's really inspiring. I love Queens <laughs> and um, I'm so happy to hear all this. Um, so we are a very small uh, neighborhood based uh, program. I am based in Jackson Heights and we go all throughout Queens. We have six different partnerships in uh, yeah, in six different city council districts. So we're in PS12, which is in District 26. We're in PS21, which is in District 19. We're in PS144, which is in District 29. We're in uh, PS200, which is in District 24. We are in PS211, which is in District 21, and a District 242, which is in District 20. That is a lot of twos. It's all in my written um, proposal as well. Um, but what we do, is we provide uh, opportunities for students to experience the joy of connecting to each other in their school classrooms and in their school buildings during their school day. Um, we uh, focus a lot on self-expression and on collaboration. Um, we are very, very participant driven. So their choreography to go with all the words. They're writing their own scenes. They're also writing their own songs. We have a whole lyric and songwriting section of our musical theater program. Um, and uh, for creative movement, uh, all the uh, movement comes from the students. So it entirely is based and uh, developed from them. Um, we are also focusing on a trauma-informed lens, just considering what we all went through and what it means to come back into this space. And um, yeah, we're serving six, uh, six schools, uh, over 2,000 students, uh, with plus the teachers and the additional uh, professionals in those schools. Um, we are small and we are scrappy and we can do a lot with a little. So we are asking for $7,000 to continue these relationships with these schools, um, hopefully to be able to continue to build and build uh, and to continue to be more and more integrated. Uh, so the work that can really expand and deepen um, and we can make a lasting impact in these students' lives. Thank you all so much for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? All right, great. Next, we'll hear from friends of Maple, Maple Grove. Hey, I'm unmuting, starting. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dave, for this opportunity to speak. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, right, thank you for this opportunity to speak for the Friends of Maple Grove. I'm Carl Bellinas, president of the organization. The Friends of Maple Grove has a partnership with the historic Maple Grove Cemetery in Kew Gardens in the heart of Queens. It is one of the most unique cemeteries in the borough of Queens. We are extremely proud to be here for the Queens community. And we were one of the cemeteries in the area to keep our gates open during the pandemic, allowing people confined to their homes an opportunity to breathe and walk through the 65 acres of gardens and forests. The Friends era, uh, have been in existence for 17 years and over that time have made Maple Grove Cemetery an important cultural center for the borough of Queens and beyond. Maple Grove Cemetery was established in 1875. 
uh, this year we're marking 140, 147th year of existence and in three short years we'll be celebrating 150th anniversary. Every town, village and city in the world has a cemetery and the Friends has found a revolutionary new way to utilize a cemetery as an important teaching tool and we have frequently broken down the walls of the cemetery so that the public can benefit from the treasure trove of history and develop many family activities and educational events that have been used uh, for, for, the, uh, for the last 17 years. Now, the Friends has nurtured many partnerships uh, with the historical societies, other university schools, and non for profits. In 2005, we were created as a non for profit and to celebrate the legacy of th those who have passed and to pay tribute to life. Uh, Maple Grove built a state of the art center that we use, offering a host of opportunities for evolving community relationships. Maple Grove is the only cemetery in the world with a concert hall that offers and hosts a plethora of musical tributes and events. We also have an art gallery offering local artists and photographers in Queens opportunity to display their work monthly. We have created walking tours, art, uh, literary reading uh, series. We've also developed Victorian arts and crafts, various teas, concerts with various themes, Asian Pacific, Spanish heritage, Jewish classical uh, and jazz. We also have our trunk or treat, which is very successful, and also murder mystery dinner theater. Uh, it, uh, we also have 116,000 people buried in Maple Grove, including veterans as far back as the War of 1812. And we have encampments and Memorial Day services. And uh, recently we placed a, a, a tombstone and a mark of a Millie Tunnel, who was a former slave who had an unmarked grave for 100 and 25 years, and we used uh, the help of students from a local school. And uh, we, we hope to do more of those memorials in the future. And we are leaving a mark that we, we hope will make an impact uh, for the next generation. So thank you for your help in the past, and we look forward to your help in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I understand uh, that uh, Ms. Serrano's son uh, had a few words. Ms. Serrano. Thank you very much. This goes back to, to the playground of Maurice Fitzgerald. Go ahead, Jacob, you're on. What about the playground? I want, I want a swing. More, big kid swings, right? <laughs> big foot swings. And, and another, and a, um, a pole. A pole, right? A better jungle gym, right? Yeah, a better jungle gym. Okay, tell them thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great night. Have okay, a great night. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good night, folks. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, next, we'll hear from Art Transforms, although you have a tough act to follow there. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Wanda Best, and I am the founder and executive director for Art Transforms. Art Transforms Inc. is an organization established in 2016 that uses visual art to transform pain and trauma into art. Visual art is a creative process that communicates, educate, and express our feelings. We work with survivors of domestic violence and other women to empower them uh, with visual art. According to a survey by the Mayor's Office to End Domestic Violence and Gender-Based Violence and other studies released during the pandemic, abuse grew worse. The survey reported Queens has the highest rate of increase in abuse at 35%. Since 2019, Art Transform um, hosted a women's empowerment group at Cambria Heights Library, the Circle of Transformation. As a result of the pandemic, our monthly women's empowerment group was forced to go virtual, the powder room. We provide weekly visual sessions from April 2020 to present. To present. Uh, we hosted a recognition ceremony virtual where 13 women received plaques for their commitment to self-empowerment, self-determination, and perseverance. A, uh, our Transform will return to in-person group sessions called the Powder Room at Cambria Heights Library, effective uh, April 2nd. We will meet monthly at the library. 
The in-person group will consist of women's empowerment workshops and bi-monthly group art painting sessions. In December, 2022, we are hosting an award ceremony where the ladies will participate in the powder room will receive plaques. We are requesting $2,500 to cover the cost of the powder room for one year. The funding will be used to purchase supplies, art supplies, pay honorarians to professionals who facilitate workshops and the awards program, which includes the plaques. The feedback we receive from the ladies is amazing. Uh, they say change is always difficult and in a relationship or marriage is a loss of something that was and no longer exists. One of the ladies said the powder room is where she matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next we will hear from Visions. Hello everybody, I hope you can hear me. My name is Mark Boness. I am from Vision Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. We are a, I see I've spoken to a few people here already on the call, so, so I think that's good, but we are a 96 year old not-for-profit that provides completely free services for people who are blind and visually impaired to adjust to that blind and visual impairment and to integrate themselves back into New York City life. Um, our services are completely for free. The core of the service is in-home service where our trainers actually come to someone's home and actually help them adjust to that vision loss. Uh, we provide the service in any language, uh, including the 16 we have amongst the staff and hire interpreters as necessary. Uh, we also are the only in the state that provides the service on an equal basis to people who are legally uh, here as residents, as well as people who are undocumented. Um, in New York City, there are an estimated 90,000 blind seniors over the age of 65. Uh, in Queens, over 30,000. Uh, these are from uh, census figures, and we've partnered with a network of organizations, individuals, and community stakeholders um, to receive these referrals and to positively change the lives of older people who are blind and visually impaired. Um, over the years, we've strength, strengthened our relationship with the Department for the Aging and the city, and we've expanded uh, through a number of successful programs, including our Innovative Senior Center, uh, as well as our popular caregiver support program. Uh, we today are asking for consideration um, for three things. Uh, two are kind of overall city uh, budgets uh, issues. We want DIFTA to restore funding for intergenerational programs. It's been eliminated some years ago and it is important and it has worked. Um, the second one is we want DIFTA to expand a pilot microtransit program that allows accessor ride eligible people to hail a taxi or use Uber, Lyft, or Via at the same cost as subway or bus fare. Right now, there's a very successful program, uh, I guess, from Queens to Rivers over in Jersey City. Um, it's something that's worth looking at. Um, the final one, I know I see the clock moving down here pretty quickly, um, is that we are asking for support for a speaker's initiative that has been supported on a citywide basis since fiscal year 2015. It is called Blind Line. Um, we have asked for 75,000 and we've gotten 50,000 in the last few years. And basically it's an information and referral line specifically geared towards the needs of people who are blind and visually impaired. They can ask anything recently, of course, um, it has always been housing has been the number one thing. And of course, uh, recently, a lot of health issues. Um, how do I get the shot? Where do I get the shot? How do I, uh, uh, how do I safely social distance when I can't see somebody who's six feet away? So um, it is a very important program and deserves your consideration. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Senator Wire, thank you so much. Uh, next, we will hear from Samaritan Daytop Village. Good evening, distinguished members of the Queens Borough Delegation. My name is Michelle DeMott. I am the Chief of Staff to Mitchell Nedburn, who's the President and CEO of Samaritan Daytop Village. I first want to thank you for your continued support during these challenging times. Samaritan Daytop Village is a Queens-based, nationally recognized human services organization that provides comprehensive services to more than 33,000 people each year through a network of over 60 facilities, primarily located in the five boroughs of New York City, with its administrative headquarters in Briarwood. We offer mental health and substance use treatment, shelter and housing, as well as innovative services for veterans, women, youth, seniors, and families. 
The importance of mental health and substance use services has never been clearer than at this moment as New York City faces an unprecedented rise in the demand for these services as a direct result of the pandemic and the opioid epidemic. The clients we serve are among the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Most have low to no income coupled with complex needs. The physical and emotional isolation caused by the pandemic has manifested into increased anxiety and stress, all triggers for those we serve. Being mindful of the city's finances, we have restricted our 23 asks to programs of highest need due to the pandemic and the opioid epidemic. Specifically to meet the need, the increased need for services in Queens, we have submitted a request for 216,000 specifically for Queens as follows. 130,000 to fund an after school zone for school aged homeless children at two of our Queens based family shelters. 30,000 will be used to enhance our after school zone that was successfully piloted, piloted during the pandemic with city council funds at our Boulevard family shelter. We will also create an after school zone at our Belt Park family shelter and reconstruct a safe educational outdoor space. The initiative will break down educational barriers faced by the homeless children, which have shown to have an immense impact on breaking the cycle of poverty and homelessness. We are also requesting um, to $50,000 to expand our opioid and prevention treatment efforts in Queens. This funding will allow us to continue to educate the Queens community on the opioid epidemic, how to prevent overdoses, and the latest innovation in drug treatment and prevention. Most importantly, Queens residents will receive virtual harm reduction and Narcan training, as well as Narcan kits. Lastly, we are requesting $36,000 to fund wellness services and care packages for seniors at our Woodside Older Adult Senior Center, helping them to cogn cognitively engage um, as, ne as necessity as many seniors have experienced rapid decline during the pandemic. Virtual services will be expanded to keep seniors socially connected and the care packages will include books, educational materials, entertainment supplies, and everyday essentials. Samaritan Daytop Village is grateful for your consideration of our requests. I thank you on behalf of our agency and our Clean Queens clients. We look forward to continuing to be on the front lines in partnership with you and your communities to meet the needs of highly vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Sandra Ang. Council Member, would you like to say a few words? No, just um, thank you for having me on today. I look forward to hearing um, the rest of the testimony for everybody today. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Council Member, for joining us. Uh, next, we'll hear from Queen's Symphony Orchestra. Are you with us? Uh, Queen's Symphony, ah, here we go. You're on mute. You're on, okay. Here we go. Sorry about that. My name is Deborah Sturdy and I'm the executive director of the Queen's Symphony Orchestra. For the past 68 years, the Queen's Symphony has been presenting quality orchestral concerts to the vast diverse communities of the borough of Queens. We currently perform all concerts in a variety of formats free of charge to the public. The Queen's Symphony Orchestra provides an invaluable service to those who may never have the opportunity to otherwise experience the beauty of some of the finest classical music in the world, played by world-class professional musicians. It is also a unique opportunity to expose the next generation of Queen's residents to that, this magnificent art form. Also, it's been scientifically proven that children's exposure to music increases their learning capacity, self-esteem, and a greater appreciation of all arts and beauty throughout the world. The symphony underwent a complete reorganization a few seasons ago with my appointment as executive director and Martin Mykut as our music director. Since then, the Queen, Queen Symphony has remained in the black for the last few seasons and is completely debt-free. Maestro Martin Mykut brings vital energy to the organization, along with new innovative programming. Our president, Kenichi Wilson, is a grounding influence and along with our board of directors, is instrumental in finding new sources of funding for the organization. It's been successful. Um, our core programs include Mastor Concert Series, Family Concert Series, Concerts on the Green, Salon Concert Series through Cultural Immigrant Initiative, Symphony 101 in Schools and Libraries, and In-School Learning Programs through CASA. We are happy to report that these changes have been noticeable on a number of levels. On a musical level, the musicians have found the newfound pride and exuberance in their performances with Maestro Mike on the podium. Their enthusiasm from players is, is palpable and has reached across the footlights, resulting in larger and more enthusiastic audiences. 
Until this past season, we have increased our salon concerts and Symphony 101 program thanks to funding through the Cultural Initiative Agreement and thereby helping us to reach out to even more of the wonderfully diverse and underserved communities of Queens. We continue to expand our diverse, draw our diverse board and we look forward to welcoming new members. This season will mark 68 years of magnificent music making. There are not many performing arts organizations anywhere that can boast of such longevity. Therefore, we are asking for a total of $250,000 from the council members in order to continue to bring free quality concerts to the borough of Queens. We want to thank our civic leaders, council members, borough president, and all who have funded our programs over the years. We ask that you continue and hopefully increase your support. We are one of Queen's most valuable assets and we hope to continue and expand these programs in years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Ace. Good evening, Queensboro delegation members and New York City Council members. Founded in 1992, Ace Programs works with New Yorkers who have histories of homelessness, incarceration, and addiction. We provide job training, work experience, employment opportunities, and a lifetime support network to help participants achieve their goals of full-time employment and establishing economic independence. We also provide supplemental sanitation to 30 New York City Council districts and dozens of parks and plazas located throughout the city. All of our services and initiatives are based out of our headquarters, the A Center for Workforce Development, located in City of Queens. We enroll individuals into our free workforce development program via referral network that includes substance use treatment programs, shelters, and community organizations. Participants engage in a contextualized curriculum that includes soft and hard skills trainings, industry certifications, financial literacy training, computer proficiency training, therapeutic counseling, and more to help, to help them prepare for full-time employment. Once employed, ACE offers a, life, a lifelong aftercare program to help our graduates increase their earning power over time. ACE also offers full-time employment with benefits to over 100 individuals who have histories of homelessness, incarceration, and addiction. Thanks to many members on this call for their support. The ACE contract services team offers top-notch sanitation and street cleaning service, services on over 1,750 New York City block faces every single day. Our workers sweep sidewalks, change garbage cans, and, re and remove snow and graffiti throughout the four, uh, four seasons of the year. We are also providing rapid response to uh, council members throughout the city for uh, unique supplemental sanitation emergencies. ACE is now seeking $150,000 in capital support to purchase and outfit two vehicles that will transport ACE team members to cleaning hotspots where they will provide these crucial supplemental sanitation services. These vehicles, will be outfitted with watering, uh, watering tanks and maintenance equipment including a team of workers anywhere in New York City. These vehicles will also support ACE's ability to provide quality employment to New Yorkers who are overcoming histories of homelessness, incarceration and addiction. These full-time ACE team members are making their transition to independence and receive a suite of benefits and services from ACE. Employees are eligible for subsidized healthcare, 401k matching program, and have ACE's employment retention and support program uh, project stay at their fingertips. Thank you so much for your time, your support, and your consideration. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Pursuit. Hi, good evening, Queens delegation and city council members. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, for having us. I'm Ikech Namani, Senior Manager of Business Development and Head of External Affairs here at Pursuit formerly known as Coalition for Queens. We were founded in 2011 by two New Yorkers, originally from Queens, who devoted their lives to transforming Queens, America's most ethnically and linguistically diverse counties, into the new hub for technology and economic prosperity. Um, we have been around again since 2011, and we started our uh, software engineering fellowship in 2014. Through that, we've helped over 700 New Yorkers from low-income backgrounds uh, move from $18,000 to over $100,000 in annual earnings through careers in tech with partnerships with the Robin Hood Foundation, Siegel Family Foundation, New York City Council, Speakers Initiative, various council members throughout Queens, and we're hoping to see if we can get uh, $250,000 from not only just 
the council members, but the delegation to continue our mission, again, to reinvigorate Queens. Uh, seeing that the pandemic hit our constituents the hardest, again, we are looking to continue to, um, again, grow our, our, our initiatives. And again, this is specifically for software licenses, remote work accommodations while we're still hybrid, desktops, laptops, and education materials. Again, we've been in Queens for quite a bit of time, and we want to, again, have more success stories. We have partnerships with NYCHA. We've taken NYCHA constituents, Uber drivers, to become software engineers, again, at companies based here in New York City. We want to continue that. Um, again, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. We're going to send over another proposal. We've sent something over to the QBP's office already, and we're hoping to continue, continue our work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Saya. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sonia Sisodia. I'm the Executive Director of South Asian Youth Action. Um, so SIA has been supporting Queens youth for over 26 years through after school mentorship and college access. In 2021, we served about 1,700 young people throughout Queens um, in various neighborhoods, council districts um, throughout the borough through our programming at our community center in Elmhurst, as well as seven Queens-based um, after-school sites. We are specific, specifically requesting from the Queens uh, Borough President support for our programming at PS124, which is in South Ozone Park. We work with 150 elementary school students at this location. We are currently receiving $2,000 from the borough president's office to support um, literacy at the site. We are requesting an increase to $10,000 um, for the program. We do receive some, uh, we do receive uh, money from the Department of Youth and Community Development at this uh, after school program. The additional support allows us to enhance our literacy offerings at the location. Um, we, uh, SIA has been partnering with PS124 for 15 years, um, so it's a significant part of the organization's history. The demographic uh, demographics of the uh, school and of our program um, are, um, we work with students from all backgrounds. About 25% of the students at the school identify as South Asian, according to um, our um, enrollment records. Um, in the program. And so we think it's really important for an organization like SIA to have a significant presence um, in the neighborhood and at the school and the enhanced um, support through funding from the borough president's office would allow us to increase the quality of our programming and help cover funding gaps. Um, we, um, some of the activities that we um, offer are homework help, photography, um, I mentioned before, literacy, sports, uh, steam, yoga, Zumba, scrapbooking, 3D art projects, and, um, built, and um, an enhanced literacy project. Additionally, I know that there's some um, council members um, on, on as well. We are uh, requesting um, funding from um, the uh, Queen's uh, delegation as well to support um, our programming at um, many of our other locations. Some of our organizational achievements in the past year is 100% of our high school seniors were accepted to a range of colleges. 97% of our college students have been on track to graduate college, and we awarded $100,000 of direct assistance um, last year as well, uh, COVID-related direct assistance. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Street Soccer. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Vera Diana Vidalis Coit, current partnerships manager at Street Soccer USA. I've been working full time for three years, but started volunteering at the Times Square Cup in 2015. At the time, I was studying psychology and journalism and worked the cup as a social media coordinator with the purpose of sharing the stories of our players. It was then when I realized how impactful street soccer was. There was a team from Peru who had traveled to New York City just to be part of the cup. The players shared with me their struggles and how because of programs like street soccer, they were able to overcome adverse life situations. 
It was then that I also realized I wanted to be part of this organization and make a difference using my favorite sport as a tool. This interaction changed my entire life trajectory and introduced me to a movement of sports for social change. Street soccer programs offer more than meets the eye. Our commitment to holistic activities support the growth and development of participants no matter their age or background. Our programs <clears throat> encourage our participants' growth mentally, physically, and emotionally. We have served over 2,000 low-income and homeless youth and young adults to date. 92% of them improve social-emotional learning skills. We have also seen a two-thirds reduction in chronic absenteeism in school amongst our participants. Um, Street Soccer USA enables participants to learn outside of an original class classroom setting, tackling learning gaps that schools don't often teach. Studies show that those learning gaps increased during the remote learning due to COVID-19, impacting mostly schools who predominantly serve students of color. Street soccer is committed to continue bridging the, the learning gap through soccer to the extent that we have committed 300,000 to building a learning center that will serve as an educational and active outlet where participants can experience a safe and caring environment where their emotional and physical health positive identities and sense of belonging are nurtured and protected. Our programs are an effective solution to many targeted issues, including mental health and crime prevention. When communities have access to safe outlets like soccer, participants are less likely to be involved in criminal offenses. Participants are going from spending time on the streets where there is little to no guidance to a nurturing environment that shows them how to be the best versions of themselves for themselves and their communities. We employ local leaders to run our programs, which offer our participants the ability to see someone who looks like them in leadership roles. Studies show that playing soccer can improve both physical and mental health. People who play soccer see a significant improvement in self-esteem and confidence while also seeing a decrease in anxiety and depression. Soccer has the ability to break down barriers and unite people. By bringing people of all backgrounds and experiences together, we can create a better economic and social environment. It would be almost negligent not to offer access to a top quality level of the world's game in the world's borough. There's already a high demand for a programming for the district. Is that my time? Can't see. Okay. You could summarize, summarize the rest of your testimony. Okay, yeah. Um, so but I was just gonna end by saying that uh, there was a high demand from constituents from Queens. We had an event in November that um, in Sunset Park where we had a family from Queens, her name was Catherine. She came over to us and asked why we weren't offering our services in Queens. So um, I just wanted to say that we should be able to, to offer these resources within the district so that people from the district don't have to go outside of the district for these things. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you. And we've been joined uh, by Tamang Society. Tamang Society. Are you here? Ah, here, here we are. Yes. Please, please begin. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry, I'm like uh, lack of communication. I like, I got called twice, uh, board president. I'm so sorry about it. Uh, no, not a problem, please, please begin. Uh, this is Tamang Lama. I'm president of Tamang Society of America. Uh, this my organization is established on 2002. Until today, we like, you know, never like apply the grant, any grant industry. We are uh, engineers, people from Nepal. We have 18 different organizations working together that calls FITNA. Then uh, as a Tamang Society of America, we have a different in thick group. We have working in like, you know, different communities and as uh, a uh, city council member, borough president, uh, uh, this and that. So now we are like planning to introduce our small, like the tiny effort to the community. We are living like around the, uh, like Elmas, Jackson Heights, mostly Queens. We have 150,000 Nepalese people living, living around the Queens for right now. So we are different organizations, like, you know, we are applying the different help to the like city council member, then uh, all the board president, even mayor, like city council, all the members. So now we are planning to do uh, like, uh, like this 2019 uh, coronavirus, then we see uh, so many like different people has a very difficult, uh, very difficult situation. On the matter, then we are talking about the health concerns. Then our borough, we are like mainly focusing on the district 25, 26, 19, and 23. Most of the Nepalese people living around the block. We see the street, it is so dirty. You can see the, all the can, bottles, this and that on the street. We sometimes we believe we are not in the United States of America. It's, we feel so bad. 
That's why we are planning to make the our borough, our street, our neighborhood clean. That's why my Tamil South America would like to work all the cities, all the communities member to clean the out, keep the out city clean. That's why my Tamil South America is like briefly we like recommend a little grant for the city council. I like you know, expect I like you know submitted the document. So this is my kindly kindly like you know asking the all the committee members please help us to clean, keep our borough, keep our neighborhood clean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we'll hear from Global Kids. Global Kids? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Hi, my apologies. Um, I have submitted my testimony for the record, so you have that. I just want to summarize that, um, first of all, we wanna just thank um, the Queens delegation and, and members for their support of Global Kids, both financial and, um, and also just in your enthusiasm and support for the work that we do in the borough of Queens. You should know that we run programming across the city, um, serving 3,000 young people directly through after school and um, community school programs. Um, within Queens, we're servicing approximately 500 young people um, at John Adams High School, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Expeditionary Learning School, William, William Cullen Bryant High School, and the 30th Avenue School, or, we, or called Q300. And there we're providing comprehensive um, youth development programming that really promotes global citizenship. And, and really helping young people kind of be their best and do their best and, and particularly around academic achievement. Um, we've made a request this year um, for to the delegation, but also to council members um, to support um, our programs for a total of $150,000 um, this, this fiscal year. And it is our hope that those dollars can be provided to, to our organization to continue the great work that we're doing, but also to support our innovation um, as we're working with kids from Queens. Many of our, um, our work really are helping young people grapple with the issues of the day, um, but also build the resilience necessary to navigate the challenges for tomorrow. And so our hope is that we'll continue to be able to support them. We're currently supported by DYCD, where we have both um, Sonic and Compass um, uh, funding, as well as the Department of Education within their community schools. I'd like to just thank you all for your continued support, and thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Next, we'll hear from the Horticultural Society. Hello, um, my name is Nick Guntley. I'm the Senior Director of Horticulture at the Horticultural Society of New York, um, also known as the HORT. Um, the HORT's mission is to sustain the vital connection between plants and people. Um, our social service and public programs educate and inspire, growing a broad community that values horticulture for the many benefits it brings to our environment, our neighborhoods, and our lives. Our horticulture department's workforce training program is currently working on urban greening and plazas and streetscape uh, work across 12 council districts within Queens. We work to clean up tree pits by removing weeds and garbage and putting down fresh clean mulch to help beautify miles of streets and boulevards. We've worked to install tree guards on commercial corridors to help improve streetscapes in front of small businesses and residences. Uh, we've been planting and <clears throat> maintaining public plazas and open streets in Jackson Heights, Corona, Ridgewood, and Sunnyside. Our crews have helped to install school gardens across Historia, Long Island City, and Woodside. And we've coordinated a cleanup and garden renovation project within, <clears throat> um, within uh, Phil Rizzuto Park. The Horde has been growing its presence in Queens over the past decade, and I'm here today to ask for resources so that we can continue to offer these services and expand the work that we do. We can beautify every district in Queens. We work with neighborhood groups, local officials, 
government agencies such as DOT and parks to help tackle many of the greening needs that the local neighborhoods face. Your support would allow us to continue to work in these local communities and help to expand to new areas of Queens that might need a little extra care or revitalization. In addition to transforming the physical environment, this funding would go towards helping to build human capital through our workforce development program. This program provides short and long-term vocational training to at-risk youth, young adults, formerly incarcerated individuals, and homeless youth. Our team works year round to help keep your plazas green, streetscapes looking beautiful, as well as helping to revitalize green spaces throughout Queens. The HORT works collaboratively with 15 to 20 nonprofit organizations, including the Fortune Society in Long Island City, um, in order to fi find appropriate participants for the internship program. Under the supervision of professional horticulturists, up to 50 participants will receive transitional employment experience, job skills, horticultural training, and job placement support each year. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we very much hope we will have a chance to greater serve Queens. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, and next, we will hear from uh, Brooklyn USA Sports Association. Uh, sir? I'm sorry, you're, you're on mute. You're on mute. I have my daughter, I have my daughter's phone, I apologize. No, don't worry um, about it, it's fine. We can we've hear been, you. We've been, thank you, sir. We've been in existence for 32 years. In that time, I've been able to place 946 children in college on basketball scholarships. 18 of my players that started me before they were 12 have made the NBA. I was the former director of bed YMCA from 90 to 93, when bed was bed -Stuy. This past summer, we ran several events, one in which the borough president attended. It was Stop Asian Hate, three on three, hoop it up basketball tournament. And what we did was, and we've done this before, we took one Asian player, one black child, one white child, one Hispanic, one Muslim, one Jew, Jewish player, and we put them on the same team. It's one thing to have competition, but in competition, you kind of fight against your opponent, healthy fight. Here, we mixed everyone together to teach them, and naturally, teamwork comes into play. It's just a natural uh, uh, thing that happens. So we intend to do that again, but we're incorporating midnight basketball also. Midnight basketball was started in 1988 in Chicago. We're taking out, we're going to outreach to gang members, former incarcerated young men, and we're going to be playing basketball from 10 o'clock to 2 in the morning. Now, it's not all basketball. There's other services provided. And those services are going to be everything from job training to mental health issues to uh, 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 getting, getting our uh, young men uh, employed. And... Midnight basketball has been proven to stop crime. Those are the high crime areas, uh, high crime hours in the summertime. Now, myself personally, I've been to jail 62 times. I was never arrested, but I used to play basketball against inmates all over the state. So I have a lot of experience um, with uh, people that are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated and gang members. Unfortunately, some of my players have gone into gangs over the years and, you know, uh, they're troubled young men, but good young men. So with my, with our experience at Brooklyn USA, uh, we, we're working with uh, Councilwoman Sandra Ong, Linda Lee, and we'd like to work with Adrian Adams in those districts. We want to bring the Stop the Hate, Stop the Asian Hate, and then the Midnight Basketball. And those are the programs we would like to run in the Great Borough of Queens, which by the way, I live in Flushing, um, after living my whole life in Brooklyn, and I love it. So on that note, I will turn the floor over. I don't want to go over my time, but I thank you so much for listening. And if anybody has any questions in the future, please feel free to, to ask. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, and I would be remiss if I did not um, flag a resource within Borough Hall uh, for nonprofits. Uh, if, if you were not aware of the Queensboro Presence Nonprofit Network, uh, I would ask you to uh, send an email to our fiscal team. They'll help. They'll connect you with Susie Tannenbaum, 
my colleague who runs that. Uh, we will connect you with um, grant opportunities, um, educational educational seminars. It's really um, it's it's really a great one stop shop. Um, if you're, if, especially for smaller to medium sized nonprofits who are looking to grow. Uh, and again, my colleague, Susie Tannenbaum directs that and um, I'm sure she'd be happy to get you plugged in. Um, and again, oh, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you so much. Out my, my pleasure. And that's for everyone on this call, you know, but, but uh, absolutely, I hope you avail yourself of that service. Uh, so next we will hear from Woodside on the move. Thanks, Michael. Uh, th thank you, Borough President Richards. It's great staff, uh, the elected officials, uh, their great staff, uh, along with other community leaders and stakeholders. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity to speak tonight and address everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Raga. I'm the executive director for Woods on the Move. We're a grassroots community organization established 45 years ago, uh, dedicated to making Woodside, Western Queens, a better place to live, learn, and do business. D due to the pandemic, uh, our neighbors have faced tremendous housing insecurity, job insecurity, and food insecurity. And with the disproportionate negative impact in Woodside and the surrounding neighborhoods, our mission and work impact more lives than ever uh, in, in our history. The focus of our work is free social services, policy advocacy and organizing, and after school and summer program for our youth in the neighborhood. But just in the last six months, we've expanded our services to include community leadership training, youth development, civic engagement, small business services, and public health initiatives. Our vision is to build upon the pillars of our previous decades of work and continue servicing the most vulnerable communities in Western Queens. Just in the last year, uh, our social services has served over 3,000 individuals with over 8,000 cases through those programs, meaning people came in, one person came in on average, they had about uh, two or three cases they had to deal with as well. Um, and those were supported through programs like our housing counseling, a tenant organizing, legal clinics, and know your rights trainings. These people we serve hail also from a diverse range of backgrounds, uh, reflective of our community and our borough. Uh, that's uh, disproportionately our clients that we serve every day. And with our within the Latinx uh, community, we generally regularly serve uh, um, uh, the Mexican community, Dominican, Cuban, Puerto Rican, Ecuadorian, and Colombian. Uh, with a growing Asian community and in, in our neighborhoods, we've, we've been serving the Chinese, Tibetan, Nepalese, Filipino, uh, South Asians, and many more. Uh, in our previous year uh, for education, we've served over 1,000 uh, participants, and uh, what's on the move is provide free education to over 4,300 families, and just, and many of whom actually a quarter uh, we found are single parent households, most of whom have multiple ch children. Towards the end of last year, when the city was shutting down for multiple, uh, multiple COVID sites, uh, we stepped up, provided free COVID-19 testing across Queens on an annual average of 12,000 tests for our vulnerable uh, individuals. We've also started a Youth on the Move initiative for our, our over 100 youth leaders and, and have provided resources and drives across the city. So we just want to say that with more support, we can reinvest into our current programming, our expanded programming, that in the end of the day, we're just trying to do more and do right uh, by the vulnerable New Yorkers we have and our residents and neighbors. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time uh, to address you guys. And uh, thanks for moving me up. I was originally like 1045, so I appreciate this. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Stephen, and what's out on the move. Uh, I want to... Uh, I'll give a plug to our deputy chief of staff, uh, Brent Weitzberg, who was our COVID-19 uh, czar and has health and human services portfolio. Of course, Lisa Adkins, our director of housing, uh, you know, anything that has to do with, with COVID and housing um, advocacy, uh, with, you know, uh, and that's, this goes for everyone, just, just speaking broadly, please um, use us as a resource. We want to work with you. And of course, many people on the Zoom we've worked, you know, we worked with, you know, for many years, but uh, I, I, I definitely want to lift up their work and, and um, offer them as a resource to those who, who might be new uh, or in, might be a new organization. But thank you very much, Woodside on the Move. Uh, next, we will hear from Planned Parenthood. We have Planned Parenthood with us. Ah. Sorry, hi. Oh, no, not a problem. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, evening, everyone. My name is Elise Benusa. I'm the Government Relations Associate at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, or PPGNY. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Tonight, I testify before you on behalf of our staff and the thousands of patients we serve each year. Planned Parenthood of Greater New York is a trusted provider of sexual and reproductive health care and education programs for communities throughout New York State. Throughout the pandemic, our New York City health centers continued operating. We conducted over 68,000 patient visits in 2021, providing care to all. Also in 2021, our education and community engagement programs reached over 11,000 young people and over 11,500 adults through workshops and outreach. Project Street Beat, through their offices and mobile health centers, conducted over 981 additional encounters. In 2021, PBGNY enrolled over 5,600 people in health insurance programs. We are proud to be a part of a network of essential health care providers centering patients hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis. It is estimated that six in 10 New Yorkers are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. The cultural and language barriers among newly arrived immigrants and foreign born New Yorkers are often keep, keeps these populations out of more formalized healthcare systems. We ask for your support in our request for $50,000 from the Queens delegation to further our capacity to reach these populations with culturally resonant sexual and reproductive health care services. PBGNY works to reduce barriers to healthcare access for foreign born New Yorkers by providing culturally competent access to high quality medical services for patients in our health centers. We have addressed these barriers by expanding our health center hours, offering insurance enrollment, full sliding scale services for those who aren't eligible for insurance, and we offer access to additional translation services through a dedicated system that provides phone interpretation in over 200 languages, in addition to our own staff's language skills. We would use these funds to expand PBJ&Y's capacity to provide culturally and linguistically competent care to immigrants within our traditional and mobile health centers by training additional staff to provide high quality medical interpretation and increasing health navigation. We would appreciate your support for our citywide initiative funding requests, including the Access Health Initiative and Immigrant Health Initiative. The council, oh, I just have one more tiny thing to say. The council has generously provided support to ppg y in the past, recognizing the amount and recognizing that income and insurance status should not be barriers to competent, compassionate healthcare. ppg y has been a life, lifeline in New York City for over 100 years and we are proud to care for New Yorkers, regardless of ability to pay or immigration status, despite the federal landscape. We thank you for your support in this uh, critical effort. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear from Cienfuegos, sorry, Cienfuegos Foundation. Excuse me. That was well said. Hello, my name is, uh, can you see me? I'm sorry. Hi. Yes, we can see you in here. Welcome. Awesome, thank you. Uh, my name is Betania Perkins. I am the executive director of Cienfuegos Foundation. Uh, and we are a very small nonprofit, uh, educational nonprofit based in, in Astoria, Long Island City, where we run a food pantry and a mobile food pantry serving the community. It is our, um, it is our intention to uh, continue to fight hunger uh, and by providing our clients with their immediate needs, uh, such as emergency food, clothing, um, as well as other needs. Uh, but our primary goal is to help them by giving them the tools they need to provide for themselves and others. Uh, and we do that this through our financial empowerment workshops um, that we offer once a month uh, now since the pandemic started, as well as um, resume building workshops and uh, financial coaching courses, um, as well as uh, health fair and nutritional education to enable our clients to be able to um, come out of the, the place of uh, diabetes and uh, high blood pressure, which is uh, very much plaguing our communities. Um, it is, um, we are requesting $27,000 in order to continue our work um, and to expand uh, as the pandemic uh, hit, 
we have noticed uh, we we have been strained for resources as we have to turn away clients. We serve approximately 3,000 uh, families a month, and um, we always have to turn some clients away um, when we're unable to serve as many. <laughs> um, and we would like to, um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much for your time and your testimony. Um, next, we will hear from the ANSOB Center for Refugees. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to thank you all, and would like to thank the Queensborough President, Mr. Donovan Richards, the Queen's Delegation, uh, and the Council members in New York City, and all the staff members that worked to organize this great event. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you for your continued support for the ANSOP Center for Refugees and enabling us to help our refugees and immigrant communities uh, in New York City. My name is Iman Fauzi Mahalba. I'm the executive director at the ANSOP Center for Refugees. Our center is located in the district of Astoria, Queens, the borough with the largest number and highest percentage of foreign born individuals living anywhere in the state. Uh, for 22 years, the ANSOP Center has been working on behalf of the immigrant community, helping thousands of immigrants, refugees, and asylees from 104 different countries who reside in Astoria, Woodside, Sunnyside, and Long Island City, as well as New York City um, in general. So we provide immigration legal services, English classes, citizenship classes, job orientation classes, and case management services. Our services are very much needed in the refugee and immigrant community, and they are very critical to the long-term well-being and integration of refugees and immigrants in the city. Our community members really appreciated that during the toughest times during COVID-19, we were still in touch with them. We were one of the very few organizations that still offered in-person immigration legal services in Astoria. Um, which the community critically needed. Not everybody was tech savvy, not everybody was ready for the Zoom transition. We also offered, um, you know, we switched our classes to remote and we helped the clients get like, you know, used to the remote learning and like how to use Zoom and all of that. But we also had in-person for immigration legal services as well as um, remote immigration legal services also. Uh, we were hoping to get from the Queensborough president to support us with our funding request for $10,000 for fiscal year 23 um, due to the increased demand for immigration legal services. We would love to continue to work for our community. Uh, we had requested from city council for $90,000. We've been supported by our council members. We received funding from IOI discretionary funding through DYCD and HRA. Uh, we also receive funding from USCIS and CWE. Uh, we have multilingual sp staff that speaks English, Spanish, Arabic, French, Hindi, and Tibetan, and that enables us to reach a lot of diverse communities in New York City. Um, we help clients get like their language skills, their immigration legal status, and um, the job training that they need to have a successful life in the United States. Thank you very much for your support and your ongoing um, being in touch with us all. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Chess and Schools. Hi, my name is Debbie Eastburn. I'm the president of Chess in the Schools, a New York City institution that for over 35 years has taught chess to over half a million low-income New York City children. Our mission is to foster the intellectual and social development of low-income youth through chess education. And we believe that chess is more than a game. It's an intellectual sport and an educational tool that we use to teach children that the thinking skills of problem solving and strategy and focus and sportsmanship and patience. In Queens alone, we partner with seven public schools offering in-school classroom instruction to 591 children, after-school chess clubs to 83 kids, and remote chess learning opportunities to over 800 additional kids in Queens. We also run four free tournaments in Queens, reaching over 600 students. Um, 10 of our high school students are from Queens and they receive our college bound services. 
And 50, over 50 public school teachers have taken our teacher training. We have a wait list with over 29 or with 29 public schools in Queens. And you might ask why we have a wait list. And the reason is because we operated a deficit. We wish we could teach tests in, in all the, your schools, but we can't. So that's why I'm here to ask for your help with $10,000 in funding from the borough to help fund the work that we do in Queens. And the funding from the council members from Queens, uh, borough-wide, citywide, and in, in member item funding will provide the crucial support we need to continue to bring classroom chess education to hundreds of students in Queens and giving them this practice in essential thinking skills. So thank you so much. I'm going to check out before my one minute warning and thank you so much for listening to uh, the story of chess in the schools. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear from Boundless Theater Company Incorporated. Yes, good evening. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, my name is Maria Cristina Fuste, and I'm the Executive Artistic Director of Boundless Theater Company. We are a theater company based in Sunnyside, Queens, that produces theater in New York City, while also maintaining a close relationship with the artistic community in Puerto Rico. For the past 15 years, we have grown to become an important source of community service and engagement in the Latinx community. We run programs like Boundless de Oro that serves the older adult, adults community. For example, this year, we're doing a short film where everyone involved from actors to technicians are older adults from different parts of the city. And uh, the short film is called Cupido Trae Correspondencia and was just shot here this past weekend in Sunnyside. We also have a free summer program for um, children of the city of New York called El Barrio Raices. During this program, the children take acting, dance, singing lessons with professional artists um, from New York and Puerto Rico. And they learn also how to create their own costumes and sets. At the end of the program, there's a final presentation for friends and family and the community at large. And it always turns out to be incredibly inspiring and successful. This bilingual program takes place in Spanish Harlem and our vision is to have the opportunity of bringing the program back to Sunnyside um, in the near future. We also produce professional theater uh, with local international artists from different cultural backgrounds. Um, and all of our programming seeks to be inclusive, give a voice to those that typically don't have one and to be a cultural hub for those interested in the theater arts in our city. Uh, it's our interest to bring more of our programming to Sunnyside. Uh, and in order to do that, we are seeking support from city initiatives. This is the first time I have to say um, that this is the first time we've been approached and that we have give, be, been given the opportunity of presenting our work and who we are and the work we've been doing to, to all of you. So this is extremely exciting and, and, and it actually, it, it's inspiring. You know, it gives us more um, uh, power, yeah, to, to, to continue and to seek out uh, meeting all of you and uh, to seek more opportunities in Queens. Uh, so we are very, uh, how do you say again? Appreciative of, of this opportunity. Thank you for the consideration. Pleasure, thank you very much. Uh, and next we will hear from Chaya. Hi, thank you so much for giving me this time. I apologize I'm off camera today um, because I'm right now in the middle of dinner with my kid. But well, that's thank okay, you so please. much, Honorable Borough President um, uh, in your office. My name is Noor Shams and I am the Development Director at Chaya CDC. Um, thank you again for giving us this time. Chaya CDC works to build the power, housing stability, and well-being of South Asian and Indo-Caribbean communities in New York. And we've been doing this work in Queens for the last 20 years, uh, providing services in the areas of housing, economic justice, civic engagement, and immigration. Today, on behalf of our board and community members, uh, we're requesting capital funding for a multi-service 
community center in Jackson Heights that uh, would continue to provide free community programming dedicated to the needs of the South Asian and Indo-Caribbean communities, which is one of the fastest growing immigrant groups um, in New York. Chaya's request is for a total of 2.6 million in capital funding from the city, including a 1 million request from the Queensborough president um, to support the purchase of a community center in Jackson Heights, where we currently have our main office located. Um, this new location that we propose would become the permanent home for our Chaya, at which we would continue to provide free community programming to people of all, all ages. The direct program services that we currently offer and would continue to uh, serve at this location would include home buyer education and counseling, foreclosure prevention counseling, tenant counseling, financial empowerment programs, immigration services, ESOL classes, small business services, and more. Each year, Chaya reaches more than 14,000 people directly and indirectly through services provided in multiple South Asian languages, including Bengali, Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, Nepali, and Tibetan, among others. At present, South, uh, Asian Americans make up about 12% of the city's population and South Asian Indo-Caribbeans, which, which represents a very diverse community, is, one of, is the second largest segment of the Asian American community and one of the fastest growing, yet we continue to be underserved. Through the creation of this multi-service community center that's dedicated to our community, the fun, we will truly be able to create a gathering space that embraces the cultural, linguist, linguistic, and religious diversity of South Asian and Indo-Caribbean New, York, New Yorkers and will support Chaya to further scale our programs to um, meet the growing needs of our community. Um, you know, just again, I, I, I'm running out of time, but I just want to say we are an organization that is really working to fight gentrification and displacement in our neighborhoods. And we have been struggling to find a permanent home now for the last 20 years. And we're really hopeful that um, we can get community support from the city this year to uh, create a permanent home from Ch for Chaya. Thank you again uh, so much for your time today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from the Legal Aid Society. Good evening. Um, I'm also a board member of Chaya, so I fully support their request. My name is Satish Nori. I'm the attorney in charge of the Queens Neighborhood Office of the Legal Aid Society, the nation's oldest and largest not-for-profit legal services organization. LAS provides comprehensive legal services in all five boroughs of New York City for people who cannot afford to pay for private counsel. Since 1876, LAS has advocated for low-income individuals and families um, and has fought for legal reform in city, state, and federal courts across a variety of civil, criminal, and juvenile rights matters. LAS takes on 300,000 cases annually, including individual cases and legal matters, and thousands of cases in which we fight for the rights of tenants in regulated and unregulated apartments across the city. LAS also takes on law reform and appellate cases, the results of which benefit more than 1.7 million low-income families and individuals in New York City. The landmark rulings in many of these cases have a statewide and national impact. As attorney in charge of our Queens neighborhood office, I oversee a team of 71 staff members who provide legal services to low income residents across the borough every day. In fiscal year 2021, our office worked on more than 7,700 unique matters, providing full representation in more than 2,500 matters on more, uh, benefiting more than 7,000 Queens residents. Of the 2,500 full representation matters worked on in FY21, nearly half were eviction related matters. During the pandemic, which as we know, devastated Queens, our office assisted Queens residents on a variety of issues. We were instrumental in advocating for rent relief, eviction moratoriums, and reforms to housing court. We helped thousands of Queens residents access health and public assistance benefits. We helped hundreds of patients, hundreds of parents navigate the Department of Education's remote learning programs. We also helped coordinate the city's response to the pandemic, especially in the ways in which the pandemic affected vulnerable populations. But LAS was not eligible to receive a forgivable loan through the PPP, Payroll Protection Program, 
Please also note that the city has not provided cost of living adjustments as of 2021. Therefore, we respectfully seek $25,000 of funding from the Queens Borough President to support our work as an essential part of the economic recovery for our client community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, the, migra the Migrant Kitchen. Hi, how are you? This is Jacqueline Tanny. I am the president of the Migrant Kitchen Initiative, and we are a Queens-based organization dedicated to ending the hunger crisis by reducing food insecurity at a community level. We were founded as a group of restaurant industry friends who had thousands of meals in reserve when New York City shut down at the height of the pandemic and donated those meals to the hospital workers. Many of them were in um, our Queens community, sparking this worldwide movement to support healthcare workers. Um, but it became really clear to us quickly that the need for meals went well beyond the hospital walls. So we have since provided more than 800 83,000 meals within the Queens community through the Get Food NYC program and partnerships with local nonprofit organizations, um, including NICE, with food pantries like Love Wins, with the community refrigerator groups in Jackson Heights and the Queens Public Library, among others. Um, and through additional funding, we'd like to continue to provide meals on a regular basis through monthly distributions. All of our meals are culturally relevant and they're restaurant quality made from scratch. We use fresh seasonal ingredients, nothing frozen, um, and each menu is customized based on the community that we're serving. So when we go into a primarily Hispanic community, they might receive chimichurri roasted chicken with turmeric rice and black beans, fresh salsa. When we're in a Muslim community, we're sure that all of our meals are halal. They might receive um, a za'atar roasted carrot and hummus bowl. And in our Queens communities that are Caribbean, we've done distributions that include jerk chicken with a mango salsa um, with coconut rice and plantains and colored greens. So all of that is really meant to hit home for the folks who are receiving them. Um, and they're prepared in our kitchen, which is in Long Island City, by a team of immigrant chefs. And all of our our chefs cook food that they grew up eating, providing a taste of home for the residents that we're serving. Um, our team members have access to financial and legal counseling along with assimilation services. And it's really about providing hope through food. We believe that good food has the power to heal and provide stability, especially during times of crisis and hardship. And so together by tackling food insecurity and providing nutritious meals to our community, we could effectively reduce the number of health catastrophes um, and other systemic disadvantages that our community is facing. So thank you so much for hearing from us today. We really appreciate it. And we're hopeful that you might join us for a distribution and partner with us in the coming fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we will hear from the Ali Fournay Center. Welcome, Alexander Roque. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for your work for your time uh, as, as someone, as an immigrant who grew up in the city systems and know this work personally because of the impact it's, on me, it's had on me, I'm personally very grateful to all of you for your service to our great city and to the many communities that you serve. My name is Alex Froke, my, pro, my pronouns are he, him. I'm the president and executive director of the Ali Forney Center. The Ali Forney Center is the nation's largest and most comprehensive provider of services for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender young people who are kicked out of their homes, denied love by their families simply because of their identities. Each year we see over 2000 youths who've known the heartache and heartbreak of family rejection, who live on our streets, who live in our city systems and who are largely underrepresented and undercared for. Our work is centered around medical and mental health services, offering of over 300,000 meals a year. Uh, we also provide 31,000 direct services to this population and we provide a robust outreach and engagement effort uh, across all boroughs, specifically in Queens, we have a shelter uh, in Astoria where we house 20 young people and have housed 20 young people there for about 12 years. We also have a 21 bed program in development. Our request is around supporting our Astoria shelter. It's a significantly underfunded operation. Uh, in fact, the funding we receive from the city and state, actually we only receive city funding there, only covers about 70% of the expense. So we're offering for, we're, we're 
reaching out for funding in support of general needs, particularly in the areas of helping us with our um, recycling programs, uh, trash solutions, and helping our young people in our community itself to be better neighbors within the neighborhood, uh, as well as inviting uh, the borough president and your team to come visit us to meet the young people who are in our care. In addition to this direct ask of $19,000 for supplemental garbage and recycling pickup, we are also asking for support with the Speakers Initiative, the Trans Equity Initiative, and LGBT Community Services Initiative, as well as Food Pantry Initiatives. Uh, we are a, 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 a lean and mean organization uh, that has very limited resources, so your support in other areas of our work is greatly appreciated, uh, especially the last two points on our Food Pantries and the LGBTQ Services Commit Initiative. If you can support our applications and our work there, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm happy to pause for any questions or clarify any of the things that I shared. Otherwise, I'm also happy to hand the time over. Thank you, Alex. Uh, no, to to uh, respond to the invitation, I, I, we'd love to get him there, the borough president there. So please, my you know, my uh, our fiscal team will connect you with the appropriate folks on our end. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Of course, it's my pleasure. We'd love to have you all there. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Michael. Have a great day, everyone. You too. You as well. Um, and I just want to take one minute just to say that uh, one of the most uh, uplifting parts of our job here is to work with all our amazing nonprofits uh, across the borough and across the city. And it's and I'm inclined to wax poetic about each and every one of you. Um, and the only reason why we're not doing that is because of time constraints. So I just want to put that out there. I really appreciate everything everyone is doing here. Uh, such an amazing group of nonprofits. Uh, so thank you all. Um, next, we will hear from Project Hope. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Um, hi, my name is Elizabeth Ozonyali. I am the founder of Project Hope Charities, and we're located at 170-20 in uh, Queens, Jamaica, Queens. And uh, today, I'd just like to bring to your um, to your knowledge what we do. Uh, we're a food pantry, and we feed about 10 to 12,000 New Yorkers every month. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, we saw a spike in our numbers and we were able to reach out to families, homebound, and uh, even the elderly. Uh, it was quite a spike in the numbers for home delivery services. Um, we were able to help those who were not able to get food from other pantries because we were one of the few pantries that did not close at all. We remained open throughout uh, the, the peak of the pandemic and even till now. And what we're asking today is for your help in getting a mobile truck, a food truck, because we are limited in uh, capacity, what we can do. And for the amount of support that we get from Food Bank, we need to extend our services. Um, I heard um, a lady talking about uh, freshly prepared food. This was something that was unique that was added to our pantry. And I believe that we received, we benefited from that organization. We got a lot of freshly prepared food, restaurant style, very healthy food. And we were able to give out to the residents in our neighborhood, but we realized that we're limited. So we desire to go to neighborhoods, uh, surrounding neighborhoods around us. Um, to do the same thing, give out food, healthy food uh, to the population. And that's why we're requesting at this time for your support in getting a mobile food truck here, freshly uh, prepared food for um, the residents of New York. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, and Next, we will hear from uh, uh, Talia Spanish Theater. Good afternoon. I'm Angel Gilorrios, Artistic Executive Director of Talia Spanish Theater. For 45 years, the only bilingual Hispanic theater in Queens. First, I wish to applaud President uh, Donovan Richards for being a Queensboro president who supports the arts and the cultural tourism. And we decided to be working with him again. We respectfully request $20,000 from the Borough President's 23 spends budget for our 45th season. It's the same amount we received from the Queens Borough President's office back in 2008, 14 years ago. We will apply the funds towards uh, 
rent and utilities at our intimate home in Sunnyside, Queens, where all of our activities take place. Uh, these expenses in FY21 came to around 90,000. Every month is Hispanic Heritage Month at Talia Spanish Theater. We don't present festivals. We produce original programming by Hispanic artists, with Hispanic artists, for the Hispanic community of Queens and all of our neighbors year round. Uh, why do we need expense funding from the borough president? Stability, consistent public funding, especially for general operating support, creates a level playing field. Uh, nearly half of our income comes from city, state, and federal sources. Although we've worked hard to diversify our base of support, we rely on public funding. Over the past years before the pandemic, the nonprofit arts community in Queens has lost corporate supporters. Some corporations and foundations typically prefer to fund limited ethnic programming to celebrate a particular heritage month at mainstream institutions rather than support smaller organizations that are dedicated to these artists and audiences year round. Dalia is a jewel box, not an arena. We can't promise a corporate sponsor big numbers, but we can promise first class quality. We've lost corporate funding because of changes in priorities. And you know, um, our mission is create art. Our travel record speaks for itself. In 45 years, our more than 235 productions have received 237 awards for artistic excellence, not only locally, but also nationally and internationally including a Latin Grammy, the, the and New York State Governor's Arts Awards, and the Mayor's Award for Arts and Culture. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and for your testimony. Uh, well, everyone, we're running way ahead of schedule uh, due to everyone being very respectful of the timer. Uh, and I think this is a new record. Uh, we will actually be taking a 15 minute break as we reach out to all the organizations that are scheduled for later time slots to let them know that we expect to end early and we just want to give them a little bit of time to hop on early. Uh, we do expect this hearing to go on until 8 p.m. instead of midnight. It's a, quite a difference. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, thank you for, to our fiscal team for being so on point and to our nonprofit partners for being so respectful. Uh, we will see you, we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you very much.
And we're back. We will hear from the Richmond Hill Historical Society. Richmond Hill Historical Society, do we have you with us? Unmute, sorry about that. Yes, no, I'm here. Not a problem, good evening. Good evening, my name is Helen Day and I'm president of the Richmond Hill Historical Society. This year, we will celebrate our 25th anniversary. We are an independent, not-for-profit, community-based organization with a mission to preserve the history of our community by fostering a better appreciation, understanding, and enjoyment of our historic architectural heritage and contributions of past and present residents. We're home to many immigrant groups from the time the village was established 150 years ago. They are what make our community such a vibrant and culturally diverse neighborhood. The cultural and historical heritage of Richmond Hill is an important part of the development of the Great Borough of Queens. Our support comes from annual donations from our members, occasional fundraising events, and discretionary expense funding from the office of the Queens Borough President. Without this support, we would be unable to continue our mission to maintain and share the connection to our historic past. Our budget priorities for fiscal year 2023 include historic markers for the National Register Historic District, of which we're part of, markers for several historic buildings and homes, and continued work on updating and, and publishing an old history of Richmond Hill, as well as stipends for speakers at future open meetings and maintaining our historic archives. Your consideration for our modest request for $5,000 is greatly appreciated and will assist us in completing our upcoming projects. We are a unique community in Queens because we have a historic district on the state and national register of historic places with many Victorian homes that are in pristine condition. Our outreach both within and outside our neighborhood to other areas of Queens has provided opportunities for families, students and seniors to see our history come alive through our events and programs as well as historical and genealogical research. We have sponsored scholarships and hope to continue to do so through essay contests on historic preservation to graduating seniors at the High School for Construction Trades, Engineering and Architecture in Ozone Park. We've awarded a laptop to a graduating eighth grade student in Richmond Hill through an essay contest. Our educational outreaches included speaking about the Gilded Age to AP history students at Richmond Hill High School that occurred just recently and looking to partner with them on other historical projects and a visit to our archive museum. We have conducted walking tours and visits to the archive museum, not only for the general public, but also private tours with students from the Queens Metropolitan High School in Forest Hills over the past several years. We hold four open meetings that are free to the public each year that bring history alive with presentations by our historians and local authors that are popular with everyone from seniors to new residents who want to learn about the history of the area. We honor our veterans with ceremonies at the Buddy Monument in Forest Park on Memorial Day and Veterans Day with color guards from the local Civil Air Patrol, and we partnered with the Parks Department for an annual Flag Day ceremony also at Forest Park. This and more is included in the testimony letter that we filed with the Budget Office that provides more detail about our community and our involvement in historic preservation. Thank you again for your consideration. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next, we will hear from the African Poetry Theater. Yes, hello. My name is Sekou Branch. I'm the executive director of the African Poetry Theater. We're a 46 year old independent nonprofit, a cultural arts institution that serves the greater Jamaica, a story of Long Island City, and Far Rockaway. In 2018, unfortunately, we had a fire that devastated our building, and um, Borough President. Donovan Richards then was the uh, council of district 31 and he allotted some money towards uh, rebuilding as, as well as uh, Melinda Katz. But however, today I'm here to speak about 
um, our discretionary funding for our programming. And um, we have a, a program called the APT Community Theater Film Initiative. We offer opportunities to arts education to um, people in the community through theater. One is Theater Lingo, where we have youth learn ESL, Spanish, and Creole by learning um, um, theater and then doing a play in three languages. Another is our Educated Actors Series, where we teach the business of acting, how to break into the industry, and uh, techniques of acting. We have our stories, film education workshops, where we teach the business of making a film, how to budget a film, as well as how to use film equipment. We have Makeup Masterclass, where we teach the business of breaking into the makeup industry and doing film makeup. We have a crawl through history, which is a vignette, a video vignette of the history of historic communities in Queens, hosted by um, YouTuber Tom Delgado. Then we have a Black History Month film festival that takes place at Museum of Moving Image. And we have a paint poetry workshop that takes place at MoMA PS1. And we're asking for some support for these programs so that we can um, continue to serve the Queens community. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for all that you've done and for your, certainly for your resilience. And uh, I wanna thank you. Um, Amanda, call the next group. Oh, oh just uh, and uh, one before African Poetry Theater goes, I know you had the yes. fire, how are you doing? Just go through your ask again. Oh yeah, we, we um this was about discretionary. It wasn't a capital. So just discretionary, okay. So just right. capital. Okay. But I just wanted to mention that that you did support us um and we're 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 trying to uh to move forward with the with the capital funding with the money that's already allotted and we probably okay. should have a talk in the future. Yes, please. Would love to see I that place, it. Florida. Thank it's been you. there since I was a kid. <laughs> before, <laughs> Thank you. We, we want, you want to remain in the Yes. <laughs> All righty. Awesome. All righty. Next, we'll go to Film Fled. Oh, close. It was Film Flod. You were close. Flod. Oh, I done messed it up. I'm sorry. How are you? Flayed. All right. Did I get it right? Uh, you were close. Flod. You were right different okay. pews. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Um, hello, everyone. So for those who are not familiar, uh, the Film Flob Foundation has been um, since 1999. And we just wrapped our film festival in New York City. And we've been going 24 years on a film and music festival. So primarily what we do is we're, we're an arts and cultural organization. So the connection to Queens has been the last seven years. We run the Rockaway Oyster Fest, which is pretty much a Rockaway Irish Fest. So we bring over Irish arts and culture every September. And we did that seven years ago. And we had a lot of success. Um, based on that success, we were able to branch out into a crack LGBT CRAIC. That is the Irish word for a good time. So we did an Irish LGBT that was funded by uh, council member Danny Drum. So we got support for the last, I think, five years on that. That was held at the New York Irish Center. <laughs> Having said that, we do an event called Queer Ireland which is what we're also putting in for funding for, which is great. Went to, it was very successful last year. Um, our next event is June 11th with the Crew Island program. So we're looking for continued funding from that. And we sent in our supplemental form to uh, Council Member Juan. And um, those are the three programs that we're looking for support for. Three programs that bring the members of Queens out, not just the Irish and Irish American community. Um, as the New York Irish Center is in the heart of Long Island City in Astoria. And the Taste of Ireland event is gonna be at the Wolfhound, which is in the heart of Astoria, which draws people all over from Queens. And um, that's, where, uh, that's where the funds are gonna go for overhead with advertising and talent fees and flights and um, venue fees. So um, that's, that's it for our programs and um, anything else you need from us. Appreciate you taking the time and uh, that's about it for us. And uh, we appreciate any continued support for the programs. Alrighty, thank you for your testimony. I certainly send us an invitation. For I'm sure. eating my way around the borough. So, uh, so I would love to be there. 
That's great. Yeah, we sent uh, an invite out to Council Member Juan already, and uh, we'd love to have you come down. The Queer Island Night's going to be great. We're flying over some talent. I should tell you real quickly before we go up, uh, the one on June 11th deals with bullying and gay advocacy. So we're flying over two gay advocates from Ireland for this event on June 11th yeah. at the Irish Center. So hopefully you can make it. Great. And we had a great time at St. Pat's for All yesterday. It was really awesome. uh, a great that's, time. That's, <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that's, that's a great parade. Yeah, that's great All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to keep more of your time. Thanks for your consideration. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. We're now going to go to Churches United for Fair Housing, seeking asylum. Thank you, Borough President. If, if you allow me 10 seconds, I'm just dropping off with my son and my partner. He's in the midst I, of some I know that training. feeling. You want us to come back <laughs> or you're good? Yeah, if you can give me the next one up, I'll be great. I'll be stationed. All right, no I problem. appreciate that. So we'll, Thank you. So we'll, all right, Thank we'll you. go to Seeking Asylum. Hello, Borough President. Hello. Hey, Sebastian. Uh, hey, how are you? Great to see you. Good to see you. So we, we definitely thank you and your dedicated staff. It's really wonderful to work with an office um, that truly understands the concerns of both the LGBTQ plus and immigrant communities. Uh, you have some wonderful LGBTQ plus activists working actually in your office. I want to give a shout out to Michael. I don't know if Kat's here tonight. Um, and also someone I've worked with for a long time, uh, Amanda, it's great to, to see you as well. I uh, wanna say that um, today we are appearing before you to ask that you join us in focusing on those Queens residents that belong to both the LGBTQ plus and immigrant communities. LGBTQ plus immigrants are a dynamic part of the world's borough, but also face special challenges that non-LGBTQ plus immigrants face. Sadly, many LGBTQ plus immigrants cannot rely on the networks of family and community support available to others. With your, with your current support, SAFE is, has been launching a community needs assessment to gain a clearer picture of the enormous challenges facing LGBTQ plus immigrants. With the information we gather, analyze, and share, we and our partners in government and the nonprofit sector will be able to better serve this community. Continuing support is essential to addressing the significant gap in services, which is only going to grow as we anticipate a wave of LGBTQ plus refugees from Russia and Ukraine from Putin's war, along with increasing numbers from many other countries as post-pandemic travel becomes easier. Your direct investment in our work is much appreciated, but I also encourage you to make sure that all immigrant serving organizations that you fund know how to serve LGBTQ plus individuals directly, or at least guide them to culturally competent programs. Thank you. And we look forward to strengthening our partnership. Thank you so much. What was your, what was your ask? Uh, we're asking for $20,000 in discretionary and expense funding. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. All righty, we're now gonna go, we can go back to Churches United for Fair Housing. You're back, okay. I am back, thank you so all right, much. no problem, I understand that. <laughs> Balancing it all. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, um, good to see you again, Borough President. Uh, Rob Solano, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Churches United for Fair Housing. Just to set us a foundation, uh, we, we do a lot of work in organizing the past important legislation at the funding school to workers in, in New York State. We passed an, impor an important racial impact study in the city council, and we continue to fight for housing rights for the last 10 years. We also have a very important service department. Uh, we believe organizing goes equally with services. Our community, our people of faith, um, have long-term organizing needs, but also have immediate needs every single day. We want to make sure that our, our team is meeting those needs. The way we do it is pretty uh, sophisticated. We pick out specific church sites. We have two one in Jamaica called St. Pius, and we have one in Jackson Heights called Our Lady of Sorrows. With that type of structure, we don't have to pay for overhead, no lighting, no insurance, no uh, uh, retail space. What we're able to do is put all of the resources from the discretionary right into one of our team members to be there. So any advertisement, all of that stuff happens through the bulletins and through the important ambassadors that we call our abuelitas, 
who take this information and go out to the community and hand it out to the people that need it the most. And that exchange of hands of information as a 65 or 75 year old woman uh, of color who's handing in information out to the people that need it the most. So there's a trust connection from that church, from that ambassador to the community. So what we're able to use discretionary funding today, but go to those well-trained service department to do housing, immigrant rights, and racial justice every day in our offices. Uh, specifically, we would love to do more housing, affordable, uh, not only lottery, but more importantly, we believe the most important home that our membership have is the one they live in now. So if you have a good home and, and the hot water has to get fixed and the heating has to get fixed, or there's something that has to happen, we want to make sure that people are not self-evicting, trying to find a better situation somewhere else, but we can help them right now figure out their situation at home. And usually when we get involved, developers all of a sudden figure out a way to fix the heat and fix the hot water and fix the lighting. And, and that's a very important for us. The more we can get our information out there, the more we can help our people every day and we can get your support to fund that type of support will be incredibly helpful and have an incredible impact throughout the borough of Queens. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And that important is more, uh, that work is more important than ever. There's a city limits article out uh, this evening, I think, on hot water yep. heating issues citywide. And I uh, checked it out a little earlier and look forward to working with y'all. Thank you, BP. Appreciate it. Thank you. All righty. We're now going to Neighborhood Housing Services of Queens. Hello, everybody. Good evening, Honorable Borough President Donovan Richards, uh, Council members, staff members. Um, some of you know who we are, but for those who don't, um, for over 27 years, NHS of Queens has historically served low to moderate income residents um, of Queens, um, primarily, but not exclusive community boards one through four. Um, but obviously, I'm not sure if anybody has realized this week basically marks a two year mark where COVID-19 was uh, marked a global pandemic and we wanted to lock down and our whole lives went and uh, completely changed. Um, but ever since, you know, NHS of Queens has continued to work to continue to address the community needs and um, provide assistance to the various housing needs from, you know, the demand in um, purchasing a home for the first time, you know, assisting current homeowners. And if it's either from emergency home repairs, you know, um, uh, foreclosure prevention, um, assisting with uh, rental assistance and tenant rights and workforce development. Um, for, for basically 2020, obviously we focused on providing those emergency um, assistance. You know, there was dire insecurity in terms of job, house, food, housing. Um, last year, as we started to get back as a, uh, as a community as a whole on, you know, trying to get past the pandemic, we got hit hard, um, on, uh, obviously, by Hurricane Ida. And it further... Um, exemplified how our communities have been marginalized and underfunded for so long. Um, and then interest of Queens, as you know, Borough President, you know, we were on the ground since day one doing damage assessment, you know, providing, you know, small stipends to families who not only lost, you know, um, material possessions, you know, went through, you know, uh, property damage, but also lost their loved ones. Um, so NHS of Queens, you know, is proud of the work that's done. Last year, we touched the lives of 7,000 households throughout the whole uh, Queens County. Um, we like I mentioned our uh, home buyer program has counseled um, over 30 families who were able to achieve the family uh, American uh, dream. Um, we've continued. One of the things that I want to highlight was that we expanded our work workforce development program from our partnership with LaGuardia. And we partnered with Unidos uh, US, who is one of the largest uh, Latinx advocacy organizations in the country. And we are increasing the digital literacy. Um, and we actually got another uh, stream of funding uh, through DoorDash. Um, so we've done a lot of great things. And what we're asking is two things. Um, discretionary is 50,000. And you'll, as you'll see in the testimonies, break, um, breaking down to our core programs of housing. And then our um, capital request of 1.4 um, for our casita. So we received our um, space through Sterling Bank, well, Storia Bank, and then it became Sterling Bank. Um, and then it, the building got sold. So now our lease ends in two years. So to purchase our own casita to continue to deliver the services to our communities. Thank you. And thank you for your work. Look forward to continued partnership. Thank you. Have a good night. Great. Have a great night. Uh, now to the Queen's Jewish Community Council. Just unmuting, there we go, hello. 
All right. Hello. Hi, so I am uh, Mayor Waxman. I'm the Executive Director of the Queens Jewish Community Council. The Queens Jewish Community Council, QJCC, is a 54-year-old uh, Queens 501c3 organization committed to improving the economic, cultural, and social prosperity of its clientele. It's the lead agency representing some 150 Jewish synagogues, schools, and organizations in the borough of Queens. While initially established to serve the Jewish population, we're very proud of the fact that our clients now represent people from a wide range of ethnic groups in this diverse borough, including Hispanic residents, African-American residents, and residents from assorted regions and countries of Asia. Since QJCC is a borough-wide agency, our more than 15,000 clients live all over Queens and are constituents of most of the members of the Queens delegation. Um, anyone who comes to our doors is served. The financial repercussions of the uh, pandemic have left more people in need of QJCC services. Food insufficiency brings people to QJCC's food pantry. Job loss brings people to QJCC's insurance marketplace caseworker to seek affordable health insurance or to get help applying for Medicaid and or Medicare. And isolation leads some to require QJCC's delivery of kosher meals, a service we've provided for decades, the last seven of which has been done without a contract. We are tasked to testify today regarding proposals contained in the mayor's FY23 preliminary budget, with the understanding that what the borough president and the borough board here today will be used to develop the Queens Borough Board's budget priorities for the year. In that vein, allow me to focus on two of the mayor's proposals in particular. And my first is the mayor's first, public safety. As the mayor noted, every New Yorker is rightly concerned about rising crime and other threats to quality of life. So I wanna focus on a particular area of rising crime, which is hate crimes, in particular, the shocking rise in anti-Semitic attacks. I thank the borough president who has been sensitive to and vigilant in responding to hate crimes. I asked the borough president to budget focused on fighting crime, keeping in mind the need to particularly fight crimes of hate throughout Queens. Producing Jewish cultural events is a focus of QJCC. This is an area for which the borough president has long supported QJCC, and we thank you for bringing it up now because I believe that the appreciation and understanding of others, other communities, of other cultures, of other religions, et cetera, leads to better respect and relationship. QJCC intends to continue to run public events highlighting different Jewish groups and cultures to the public, which we, uh, which we hope will, uh, in turn, reduce anti-hate uh, action. We continue to look to the borough president's office to support and partner in these events. Um, second of all, of course, is uh, issues of support for uh, people who've lost income due to the pandemic. Um, QJC is committed to continuing to serve all people. So, uh, and basically we're asking, we're gonna ask for $100,000 in legislative funds and then another $100,000 um, to support the new building, which we uh, recently <laughs> Is the uh, second S capital? Yeah, the second S is okay. capital, correct. It's All the right. first time we've ever done that. Okay, great, okay. All thank right, you. thank you and thank you for the work you're doing. Give my regards to, uh, to everyone. Will do. All righty, we're now gonna go to uh, Turning Point for Women and Families. Good evening, Borough President. Good evening to council members and all my fellow CBOs. Uh, my name is Tasnia Ahmed, and I'm the Domestic Violence Program Director at Turning Point for Women and Families. Thank you guys so much for the opportunity to testify this evening. New York City's Muslim community is estimated over 1 million, with a majority residing in Queens. Despite this, Muslim women in Queens are underserved when it comes to domestic violence prevention and intervention. Their situation is further exacerbated by language or cultural barriers, poverty, immigration issues, and limited knowledge about their rights. Turning Point was founded 17 years ago and is the first nonprofit to address domestic violence in New York City's Muslim community. We help Muslim women and girls affected by domestic violence empower themselves and transform their own as well as their children's lives through a wide range of culturally competent services focused on safety and self-sufficiency. In fiscal year 2021 alone, we served over 900 women and girls and provided over 4,000 units of service through individual counseling, support groups, leadership workshops, ESL and citizenship classes, referrals to needed resources, advocacy, and so much more. We continue to provide the following services, both virtually and in person. Our domestic violence services provide survivors with crisis intervention, counseling, advocacy, and referrals in languages spoken by the Muslim community. 
Our senior support services provide senior Muslim women with ESOL classes geared towards the US citizenship exam and counseling to address elder abuse. Our youth program includes our weekly youth group for Muslim young women and girls ages 13 to 20, empowerment and leadership development, as well as a citywide interfaith anti-bullying campaign. Through our outreach program, we reach out to thousands of Muslims living in New York City to raise awareness and provide education around domestic violence. I cannot overemphasize the importance of funding from the Queensboro Board for a small grassroots CBO that has kept its doors open and provided all services virtually throughout the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the need for our services more than ever before, and we have learned how valuable our services have been to the most vulnerable in our community, survivors of domestic violence, senior women, and youth. Funding from the Queensboro Board will allow us to maintain the momentum and continue to provide these services um, in person as well as virtually in order to mitigate the deep impact of this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony and thank you for uh, your work. Um, we're gonna now go to uh, ASHO. ASHO, ASHO, unmute. Here, here. All right, we'll go to First Baptist Church. First Baptist, oh, oh there you go, just unmute, all right, did I hear you? Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Right. Good evening, right. everyone. Thank you guys for so much for allowing us this time. Thank you, Donovan Richards. Um, I'm representing Reverend Patrick Young and the First Baptist Church of East Elmhurst, Queens. On June the 18th and 19th, we'll be having our first annual Juneteenth Jubilee Intergenerational Family Day. This outdoor family street festival will be held at the Church of First Baptist, and we will be closing down the streets surrounding it. All Queens residents will be welcome, and we are requesting 85,000 to underwrite this event. There will be educational awareness programs health screenings, both mammogram and prostate. There'll be children's activities, games, music, and so much more. The closing uh, Juneteenth event will be honoring our COVID workers of our community. During this pandemic, uh, First Baptist Church has served by doing COVID vaccinations, COVID testing, and feeding over 30,000 families. And we felt that it was time that we take a moment to celebrate the resilience of Corona East Elmhurst, Queens, one of the hardest hit communities in New York City. And if you have any questions, uh, Eric? That's it. That's it. Thanks again, and that's that's our ask. So it's eighty-five thousand dollars, June eighteenth and nineteenth, at the First Baptist Church of East Helmers. Thank you so much for giving give us. Give my give my regards to Reverend Young. I will do. Great work, and uh, thank you for all that you've all done uh, during this pandemic. It's been, as we say, God's work. I know they like to say keep a separation of church and state, but I don't care. It's God's God's work. What y'all are doing there? Yes, uh, and I, I will and pass we've that had some hard tonight. hits, but we are, we're a resilient community. Yes, thank you. Thank you for all yep. that you've done. Thank you. All righty. We're now going to go to Greater Ridgewood Historical Society. Greater Ridgewood, here you go. Hello, good to see you again. <laughs> um, yeah, hi, my name is Linda Monte, and um, I want to thank uh, the borough president. Wow, it's great to see you, even if we're just in Zoom. Actually, those in-person uh, testimonies was lots of fun because you got to see everybody and chat everybody up. But anyhow, um, this is terrific too. And we're always so grateful to our New York City Council members, particularly District 34, District 30, and 26, and then the Queens delegation as well, and the Office of the Borough President, because believe it or not, uh, the office there has supported um, all of our um, capital requests that we have uh, in the past. And certainly we hope you can support uh, our funding for um, this next fiscal year uh, in the budget at a level of $60,000. Um, just for those who don't know, I think someone else used that term, the Greater Ridgewood Historical Society owns and maintains the Vander Ende Underdonk House located in Ridgewood. 
Our mission is to preserve and maintain the 1709 uh, Dutch house as a museum and provide cultural programming, including events, tours, exhibits that are available to the public. Like so many nonprofits and other small businesses, the COVID closures had a huge impact on our fundraising in particular because we use our property for fundraising and um, for program income because of the inability to really have large uh, gatherings and events. So we had to dip into our reserves and support staff salaries, maintenance and operation of the underdog house. But we're on the road to recovery, but that recovery really needs us to reimagine a little bit about how we provide cultural services uh, to the public. And this funding request is essential to do that. We need to, we had a huge um, education program, kids visiting us, over a thousand every year that went to zero. So we have to really start figuring out how, if we're not gonna have in-person, how we can do that virtually and have it meaningful, not just the droning um, like I'm doing right now on uh, about history. So that's really important for us. And this funding request will really satisfy that because we've already started our own fundraising campaign called uh, $13,000 to make a difference. That seems like not that much when I hear of all the needs that everybody else has, but it would really make a big difference to us, um, the, our, our request to get that program up and running again um, after it was so successful for the past 40 years. So um, that's the extent of my um, talking points. We did provide a testimony that anyone can um, review. And if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. And, Happy St. Patrick's Day to everyone in the future, um, and from my house uh, to all of yours too. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and good to see you again. All right, we're now gonna go back to ASHL. Ruby uh, Rahman? Yes. Rubaya? Did I say it Hi. right? Yes, Rubaya hey, Rahman. Good to see you. <laughs> Same here, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be present here. And um, uh, as you already know, I am Rubai Arman testifying on behalf of Autism Society Habilitation Organization, which is a Bengali acronym and it means come with us. We serve the marginalized population with autism and intellectual disability. Our show is dedicated to serve Bangladeshi Americans with intellectual or developmental disability and disorder people living in the New York City, especially in Queens. ASHU has applied for FY 2023 discretionary expense funding. The application ID connected to our request is 119279. We have requested a modest amount of 25,000 for autism initiative and we serve more than, we actually served more than 200 families in the last two years and helped them um, pass through the pandemic in our small ability. With the program funding, uh, uh, ASHU plans to create and continue the following, autism awareness by leveraging its existing connection with Bangladeshi American TV channels and hosting events to further create awareness we will bring subject matter experts and community leaders to break the denial and social stigma around autism and disability. To point out our cultural inappropriate services, which uh, leads to not getting any services to this community. To look into the challenges of COVID-19 vaccination for the IDD population. We also want to do or increase in-house services with the funding we will have to help the families in-house. And also we are doing uh, digital inclusion and literacy for our community who are immigrant mostly and uh, little literacy in English language. So we'll greatly appreciate your help in this community who are isolated and very shy to come out and get the services. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to present. We shall be obliged 
if the Queen's Borough Board considers our request. Thank you very much, Borough President. Thank you for your uh, work and thank you for your testimony, Ms. Fulman. All right, we're gonna now move on to Minority Empowerment Network. Uh, namaste. <laughs> namaste. <laughs> So uh, thank you for uh, giving the opportunity to speak. So um, I belong to Nepali communities, you know, very well, president also. So minority community network is a very small Nepalese organization. Its main focus is minority communities. And most of the Nepalese, they are residing queens. And but they don't know what is the resources for what, what resources we get from the government, uh, suppose federal, federal, national level, local level, they don't know information. So my, our main purpose is this. I, I, I submit this proposal for the awareness, our minority communities, what we get, what is available resources from the government side, what we can, how we can get the budget, how we can go to, how we know the access. Most of the Nepalese community and minority community, they don't know how, what is the district attorney, district council member duties, how we, con how we contact them, how we ask our problem, how we put our, uh, any query. So they don't know anything because most of, very few Nepalese people, they know, know what is the access. So, Main um, my, my our organization to our to our Nepali communities and minority also because we publish a newsletter booklet for the in Nepali and English English uh, language and just monthly one eight pages and Nepali and English language and we distribute the city five borough so they maybe they aware they maybe know the, oh okay now what does the Queensborough president of Queensborough can do for us, what district council member, what can they do for us, and assembly member, senator, everybody, everything. So main focus to our, our minority community through uh, media, through booklet, through newsletter. So I request 35,000 budget and others we we do, we are, we are volunteering, you know, uh, board president, you know, don't know, so you know everything that we are volunteering for the uh, Nepali communities, and I think uh, so. Just I request, please help us to part. This is our new organ, new organization, non profit organization, tax exempted. Please give us opportunity to serve our Nepali uh, and minority communities. Is our if you give a uh, chance, is very good, great opportunity for us. I think so. Thank you for your time and give me this time to speak. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night and thank you for your testimony. All right, we're now going to move to JMA uh, Families, JMAC, uh, and then the Bridge to Life. Good evening. Thank you, um, Borough President Richards, for having me today. My name is Joyce McMillan, and I am the Executive Director of JMAC for Families and Parent Legislative Action Network, better known as PLAN. And we work with families throughout New York City but we have about maybe 25% or a little more of our parents coming from Queens because we work to keep families intact and keep children out of foster care. We understand that education is the key to do that. And it's not just the education of families, it's the education of people who believe in a system that are turning children out of their system into homelessness. And so we're trying to prevent the separation through several different mechanisms. One, during COVID, we provided over 10,000 pampers to a domestic violence shelter in Queens um, in conjunction with a synagogue that was helping to donate these pampers as mutual aid. We also donated many other things that the families in the shelter needed. The unfortunate thing is many families come under the radar of the Administration for Children's Services for reasons related to poverty that are framed to be neglect. Mostly 80% of children who are in the foster care system are in the foster care system for neglect, not for abuse. 
Many people think they're there for abuse, but children who enter the system are more like less likely to graduate high school, more likely to be teenage parents, more likely to end up incarcerated, less likely to go to college, more likely to be homeless, more likely to be drug addicted. So what we do is we educate people on what it means to be a mandated supporter versus a mandated reporter, because these are families that should be supported instead of being separated. Separation is not support. And we're family together, keep children at home safe with the items that the family needs instead of separating. Separation causes a plethora of mental health issues and other issues that cannot be reversed. And we only want to use separation as a resort when there's a safety issue, not when there's a poverty issue. And we're asking for $75,000 to work with CUNY Law, who we already work with in training attorneys who are coming out of that school to um, understand what child welfare is and how it has worked for decades because throwing more money at the system has not corrected it. Our children are failing, the system is failing our children. We also work with Columbia University and we heal, educate, advocate and lead. And we have legislation right now, Miranda rights for families from the moment ACS knocks on their door so that they can have lawyers protect them and know their rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now go to the bridge to life. Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. This is an honor. Um, so my name is Francesca Yellico, and I'm the executive director at the Bridge to Life. The Bridge to Life is a women's support center located in College Point, Queens, but we serve women and families from all five boroughs. Um, we're a women's support center in the sense that um, we provide all kinds of material assistance to mothers, children, and their families. So um, we're kind of like the, the bridge between SNAP and um, WIC program, um, where we are able to provide all kinds of material help, meaning baby clothes, cribs, strollers, car seats, diapers, wipes, baby food, formula, everything a child needs right down to books and toys. All our services are free. Everything's confidential. Um, the moms can come to us every three months. So as their baby gets bigger, they can come in and get the next size diapers, more wipes, next size clothes, next season of clothes. Um, the only thing that we require is a referral from a social worker. So we work directly with the social workers, social workers from different hospitals, WIC programs, um, all different agencies send a referral to us. It gets put into our system. It's good for two years. After that two year mark, if the mom still needs assistance, she can continue coming. We never closed during COVID. And if I could tell you how many moms came to us because they didn't have diapers, because they didn't have a crib for their baby to sleep in, moms were coming straight from the hospital with newborn babies in their arms in the middle of a pandemic when we were afraid to go get our mail, like afraid to go to the supermarket. These moms were coming with newborn babies, taking, you know, taking their children out in the middle of COVID because they didn't have these basic necessities. So not only do we provide for all of the children in the family, but we have women's boutiques, two women's boutiques where the moms can come and they can get clothes for themselves, coats, shoes, pocketbooks, um, makeup, nail polish, jewelry, because we feel if the mom feels better about herself, she'll be better empowered and she'll be able to take care of her children better as well. So we serve approximately 4,000 women and children a year. And like I said, they come from all five boroughs. Um, everything is free, everything is confidential. And um, your, your assistance with this grant will help us to buy all new items for them, new, new cribs, new strollers, bassinets, more diapers, wipes, and all the basic necessities that sometimes are struggles for families to to provide for their families at, at times, especially now with economic, everything being so crazy and expensive. So I appreciate your time, your, your assistance and your belief in me. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Call the next group. Lost All right, following Bridge of Life, uh, we have uh, Anne Frank Center and then Qualities of Life Foundation. 
Yes, hello. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, provide testimony today. Um, I am Alexandra. I'm an educator at the Anne Frank Center USA. We work closely with the House in Amsterdam to uphold Anne's legacy here in the States. Uh, we're committed not only to bringing Holocaust and uh, human rights education to underserved schools, but also uh, committed to using arts-based residencies and theatrical performances as a tool to bring complex issues in the world today to the forefront. Uh, as we emerge from the pandemic, there is a growing concern of the lasting effects of the lockdown and isolation on students um, and the isolation on students' emotional awareness and intelligence. And with our residencies, students not only learn about um, an important time in our history, but absorb skills that give them an outlet for self-expression, help them process what is going on in the world, their lives, uh, what they're learning in, in school and um, as and as they reflect on the past and as well as what they're learning about themselves and um, how they can help build the kinder, fairer world that Anne Frank dreamed of. Uh, one testimony from a teacher that saw one of our popular performance programs, um, Letters from Anne and Martin, which presents the writings of Anne Frank, her diary, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, letter from Birmingham Jail. Uh, both of their writings side by side commented that um, in uh, light of recent events, it was amazing to witness a performance that connected two very different experiences with such similar worlds, and it showed the students the effects of hate and how important mutual respect is, which we endeavor to have come through through in, in our programs. In the uh, past year, the center has furthered the reach of its educational programs by going directly to schools, community centers, and other institutions. And we plan to continue to create new educational programs that focus on historical atrocities, contemporary issues, and as well as promoting self-esteem. And the growth allows for more in-depth and face-to-face -face interaction between um, our educators, school administrators and students. And with the help of your generous, generous funding, it would be used to pay for skilled teaching artists and performers to bring um, these much needed programs uh, to your local schools. And uh, once again, thank you so much and have an amazing um, evening, members of the board. Thank you for your work. Thank you so much. All righty, uh, Purple Health Foundation, followed by the Purple Health Foundation will be the Regional Planning Association, the new A3. Hi, my name is Dr. Anita Ravi. I'm a, a family medicine physician and I'm the CEO and the co-founder of our nonprofit Purple Health Foundation. Um, this is our first year applying for funding. Um, we were established in 2019 and we just started our um, direct services in November of last year. Um, we work to prevent gender-based violence in New York City by investing in the health care of GBV survivors, including survivors of human trafficking and domestic violence, through a novel model of healthcare. So, really reimagining what primary care is to include physical, mental, and financial health care. The survivors we serve live across all five boroughs, including Queens and shelters in Queens, and they have intersecting identities, including people who are LGBTQ, formerly incarcerated, people who are seeking asylum, and survivors who are experiencing homelessness. We've created a model of care so that survivors can rely on the, having us um, to provide care no matter where they are in their journey of survivorship, whether they're still in a trafficking or DV situation recently exited, or if it's been years since their trauma, but they still haven't felt comfortable connecting with care. Um, and to speak more to our care, um, someone from the Queens DA Special Victims Unit had reached out to us because they said, we often interact with youth who may be in need of medical treatment beyond acute care that they've received in the emergency room in relation to the crime that brought them their case to us. Or maybe they've never seen medical care at all and would benefit from a referral for services and relations to medical services in addition to therapeutic services. Often our survivors are uninsured or underinsured, although they are off, may be entitled to insurance and could benefit from a service provider who can provide culturally competent trauma-informed holistic services. So they basically beautifully summarize exactly what we can offer and what we're asking discretionary funding for. We have a program called um, Purple Ship. It's the Survivor Health Investment Program and it has three key components. It has care na navigation um, for medical services that's by a survivor leader. So it provides survivor leader employment and it helps people navigate the health system with a peer. Um, we also offer financial health uh, patient assistance programs so that if patients can't afford medication, labs, imaging, or specialist care, our program helps take care of that because everyone deserves access to care no matter what their insurance status is. Um, and so finally, I'll just leave you with a recent encounter of um, 
someone who's in a shelter in Queens that I recently took care of. Um, she was incarcerated and recently exited. Um, but when I was doing her medical history, um, she mentioned that one of her needs is contact lenses because she's had her contact lenses in her eyes for one year because she's been too afraid to take them out because she's worried that they'll get stolen from her shelter because other precious things like her laptop have been stolen. Through our Purple Ship program, we'll have a care nav navigator who can meet her, who can take her to a specialist to make sure she's comfortable and we can afford the contact lenses that she needs. So we really appreciate the opportunity to share our work with you and thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations on starting up uh, during the pandemic. Congratulations. All righty. Um, we will go now, I think I'm saying this right, Qualitas, Qualitas Foundation Center of Hi, Life Foundation. Thank you. It's, it's Qualitas of Life. Qualitas of Life. There you go. I was close. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Hi, I'm Aubrey Fennekin. Um, I'm here on behalf of Qualitas of Life Foundation this evening. Um, unfortunately, you don't get our amazing uh, Director of Education, Sandra Velez, so I will have to do. Um, but Qualitas has been around since 2007. Um, we work to improve the standard of living of um, new immigrant and low-income Hispanic individuals and their families, and to foster their financial health and security through both financial education and asset building programs. We work uh, with organizations, actually uh, some, some folks who've been on this call um, and many who are not this evening uh, across New York City to develop programs that are best suited for the various uh, Latinx communities in New York City. Um, these have included programs like New Horizon, which was a financial readiness program for very new immigrants, um, Family Treasure, which was an asset building program for families that engaged both parents and children, um, getting ready immigration processes and my money, which helps um, families organize their finances to navigate the immigration process in the midst of changing laws and policies, it's certainly been a whirlwind over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and we deliver comprehensive long term programs as well as short term interventions like financial access fairs because we found that Hispanic population um, in New York City, particularly new immigrants are quite, um, they're, they're really left out of the US financial system. Um, so we are seeking funding this year for our core program, uh, which is um, an eight session financial education program that's really designed to um, address the specific barriers faced by low income and immigrant Hispanic families and communities here in Queens um, and New York City more broadly. The curriculum employs a pedagogical model that's anchored on case studies and um, our entire staff, um, every full-time staff member and all of our facilitators that deliver this are um, fully bilingual. Many of them are from the community that we serve. Um, and we think that's really important because we are hyper-focused um, on bringing the low-income and immigrant Hispanic population into the financial mainstream, because that's really where you're able to build the, the American dream and kind of group, build wealth uh, long-term. So. Thank you so much. We would love to continue partnerships in Queens. We have uh, organizations in District 26, 21, um, 27, and 28 that we've partnered with and or are in conversations of uh, bringing this program to, um, and this support would, would make that possible. Thanks for Thank having you. me this evening. Thank you for your testimony of the good work. Uh, we now we're going to go to the Regional Planning Association, followed by Regional Planning Association. We're here from UA3 and then studio in the school. Good evening. Good to see you, Borough President. Uh, my name is Marlon Mehta. I'm New York Director at Regional Plan Association. We're a nonprofit civic organization that has worked for 100 years to improve mobility, access to opportunity, and the general quality of life for the New York City region's 23 million residents. We've done extensive work to support communities in Queens as well with planning and development, especially in neighborhoods as Flushing and Jamaica. We're applying for funding to provide community education and engagement to advance the Interborough Express, an innovative transportation project that would use underutilized rail lines to create new passenger transit service connecting Brooklyn and Queens. It's one of the most exciting transit projects New York City has seen in decades, and we're eager to continue working with communities along the line to ensure this project does the most it can to benefit residents. 
As you know, the IBX would turn 14 miles of existing underused freight rail lines into public transportation, connecting underserved communities from Jackson Heights, Queens to the Brooklyn Army, Army Terminal in Bay Ridge Sunset Park. The line would serve over 80,000 riders per day and connect to 17 subway lines and to two commuter rail lines. The IBX as proposed by the MTA is a truncated version of the triborough line that RPA has been advocating for since the mid 1990s. After several years of research, planning, outreach and education, we worked with community members and elected officials to build support for the triborough project and, and um, advocate with the MTA to conduct a feasibility study that was released earlier this year um, in January. The MTA study that was released built on our initial research, which, which examined compatibility with existing and future freight services, producing preliminary configuration with recommended station locations and first order estimates of ridership and costs. Governor Hochul now has put her full support behind this, the IBX proposal uh, and the MTA is beginning environmental review. The IBX will improve connectivity among neighborhoods throughout Queens and Brooklyn, including Jackson Heights, Middle Village, Woodside, Maspeth, and many others. And a trip from Jackson Heights to Brooklyn College, for example, would serve, um, served by the IBX would benefit by 42% reduction in travel time. The project area um, includes 10 council districts and over a dozen community boards. Our specific project work would increase, include outreach and discussion with community and regional stakeholders. We would continue to educate communities along the line uh, with a particular focus to representatives and residents of communities in transit deserts. And we would take this information from the community meetings to fuel our recommendations to the MTA uh, uh, to incorporate community feedback and to ensure um, that processes for station planning are uh, grounded in community planning. We would also provide more robust estimation of regional and community benefits, building on our previous work. This would include access to jobs and labor. Um, All right, what's your ask? Uh, so we're asking for 65,000 to continue this work for all the council districts and community boards along the line over the next year. Okay, great. We're big supporters of, of this project, obviously, and look forward to working with uh, folks on every level of government to see this through. It really is a game changer and has the, has the potential to really uh, deal with all of the things you, you talked about in a transit uh, equity fashion. So thank you so much and uh, look forward us. to the work ahead. All right, uh, we're now going to go to UA3, followed by UA3 Studio and a School, and then Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation. I don't know if you muted. UA3, I did see you. Don, okay, there you go. Okay, here we go. UA3, in April 2020, the city closed down. We've been able to deliver $20 million in food, fresh produce, and PPE, such as sanitizers, masks, and gloves, with zero government funding. We serve all boroughs, specifically 30 CBO organizations in Queens, Elmhurst, Ozone Park, Jamaica, and Flushing. Communities of color, groups from India, Bengali, Black, Hispanic, Chinese, etc. We have collaborated with Carnegie Hall for the Arts, Columbia University and St. John University. We have private food sources even before government food became available. We had a UA3 concert with CLO Green to help us. Speaker Adams, as well as Senator Schumer have also sung for us for our UA3 events. We hope you will too one day. Several corporate sponsors and even United Way have honored our work. Our CBO one network of over 130 community-based organizations with over 1,000 volunteers, we help feed over 7,000 families per week. We help keep New York City safe. UA3 is all about solidarity and empowerment. We share resources, job training, education, food, and experience. We need funding to ensure that our CBO operations can run effectively and that we can work in solidarity efficiently to combat food insecurity and beyond. Secu solidarity through collaboration, food, art, and music is the way to go. We need $100,000 to cover trucking and driving and to be able to continue networking our communities together. Thank you so much for hearing us. Thank you. And you said they sang for you. I don't know if I'll be invited back if I, if I sang at one of your events. <laughs> so I don't know if you really want that. 
<laughs> I think you'd be awesome. I'll try my best. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, thank you for the work that you've done during this pandemic and continue to do uh, and look forward to the continued work together. Thank you so much for the, all of the work you're doing. Thank you so much. All righty. Next, we have Studio in the School and then Brooklyn Legal Services, then Chinese Theater Works. Good evening. Thank you, Borough President Richards and the board for the opportunity to speak in support of arts education. My name is Allison Scott Williams, and I'm the president of Studio in a School in New York City. Studio in a School was founded in 1977 on the belief that all children, regardless of economic status, deserve to reap the benefits of a quality visual arts education. Our mission is twofold, to foster the creative and intellectual development of young people through quality visual arts education, and to collaborate with those who provide and support arts programming for children and youth, teachers, counselors, parents. All of this is directed by professional visual artists. We are seeking funding to enhance our programs for multilingual learners. Over the last five years, our multilingual learners visual arts education program has provided both instruction to students and intensive professional development to DOE teachers. The goal of this program are to improve the academic achievement of multilingual learners by practicing and developing arts appropriate advanced literacy instruction and to increase the school and teacher capacities through a collaborative model of professional learning. Recently, we have successfully implemented this program across 25 schools citywide, reaching over 2,500 students, including two schools in Queens, PS 148 in East Helmhurst and PS 383 in Sunnyside. Funding would enable us to continue this program and to ensure that multilingual learners are given the tools to express themselves through art while also promoting language acquisition. Finally, we have a long history in working with Queens Public Schools through our partnerships. Our long-term partnerships at PS45Q and PS96Q have been funded actually by a Queens Public School graduate. We've also piloted our early childhood education programs at many Queens early childhood centers and have given our little learners age appropriate foundations in the arts. We look forward to our continued work in Queens and I thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you, thank you for your work. Next we'll go to Brooklyn Legal Services followed by Brooklyn Legal Services Chinese Data Works. Thank you, Queensboro President and Board. My name is Tamara Del Carmen, and I am the Director of the Consumer Economic Advocacy Program with Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A. The mission of Brooklyn Legal Services Corporation A, Brooklyn A, is to advance social and economic justice in community empowerment through innovative, collaborative, neighborhood-based legal representation and advocacy. For over half a century, we have represented low and moderate income individuals and families throughout New York City. Our clients live in rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods where many residents and small business owners have been displaced or are facing displacement and harassment. Brooklyn A has three core programs, preserving affordable housing, consumer economic advocacy program, and community economic development program each of which has unique initiatives and plays an important community role to ensure basic needs are met and fundamental rights affirmed. Together, these programs will continue to help New York City recover from the devastating effects of the pandemic. Our work in Queens is focused on foreclosure prevention and supporting small business. Brooklyn A's foreclosure prevention program provides vulnerable homeowners with legal services that prevent foreclosure and defend against predatory lending. BKA is the only legal service organization in New York City whose foreclosure prevention practice includes complex bankruptcy cases as a viable alternative to foreclosure proceedings for resolving foreclosure matters. To combat discriminatory practices, BKA utilizes complex litigation in federal district court and New York State Supreme Court against subprime lenders financial institutions, mortgage brokers, loan servicers, and foreclosure rescue scam artists. 
Doing so allows us to hold bad actors accountable and attempt to prevent them from harming others in the future. Last year, we worked with over 70 homeowners in Queens. Half of the homeowners we work with are seniors and over 90% are BIPOC. To address the emerging needs of homeowners during the pandemic and with the lift of the moratorium on foreclosures, BKA is representing homeowners in legal proceedings to prevent foreclosure, educating homeowners on their rights and responsibilities concerning moratoriums and relief available for financial hardship, and assisting homeowners to apply for bankruptcy as a tool to stop the foreclosure process. We help families in Queens to regain long-term financial stability and build intergenerational wealth. Thank you. Thank you. And what are you seeing now? Are you seeing huge increases in cases? Can you just speak about that a little bit? More? We are seeing a huge number of increases. We've assisted tons of homeowners with applying for half, and we do anticipate an uptick in the number of foreclosures and the number of homeowners that will also apply for bankruptcy. All right. In addition. Okay. In addition to that, we also see an increase in deed theft, and Queens is unfortunately a target area. Okay, very important work. Okay, we look forward to working with you, and uh, we should connect on a different day. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chinese Data Works, and then Commune, commune Life. And then Common Life. Wait, Chinese data works. All right, we'll go to Common Life. Uh, Hi. Oh, sorry, there you go. Okay. Right. Sorry, um, I'm not with the Chinese Theater Works, but I was told to unmute. I'm with the New York Chinese Cultural Center. Should I go now or is, am I later on? Sure, you, you can go. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Queensborough President and Board. Um, as I said, I'm Yang Yen with the executive director of the New York Chinese Cultural Center. The New York Chinese Cultural Center is a nonprofit arts organization dedicated to deepening the appreciation of Chinese culture through the arts in New York City and across the United States for almost five decades. Founded in 1974, we also offer programs in Chinese performing and visual arts. We nurture and showcase creative new works by our professional artists while preserving traditional Chinese arts for current and future generations to enjoy. Pre-pandemic, we served over 700,000 people and more than 15,000 students with our various programs. In Queens alone, we served over 66,000 people with 95 engagements uh, in 2019. To support public cultural and arts events in Queens, as well as programs in schools, we kindly request $25,000 to celebrate Asian holidays like Lunar New Year, Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and Immigrant Heritage Month, we would produce free public events in Queens to share Chinese culture and arts with performances and workshops, uh, partnering with local community organizations. We will collaborate with other Asian artists to showcase different Asian cultures, including but not limited to Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Filipino cultures. While we are based in Manhattan Chinatown, our mission is to go out to different communities throughout New York City to share Chinese arts in an effort to support Chinese and Asian communities across New York City and build cross-cultural appreciation across different communities. The request of funds would help us support these uh, public and free performances to celebrate the different holidays and occasions throughout the year. Um, also, we have an arts and education program, and we would want to partner with um, different schools in Queens, particularly our world neighborhood charter school in Astoria, which is uh, has a diverse student population of 39% Hispanic, 33% white, 18% Asian, and Pacific Islander, 6% black, and then 73% of them are from low income families. Uh, we have worked with the school for several years. And in the interest of time, um, I won't go into the details, but please do refer to our written testimonial. And I will end here ahead of schedule. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. And thank you for your work. All righty, we'll now go to Common Life.
Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Rosa Gill. Uh, thank you, Queensborough President Donovan Richards and members of the Queen's delegation for allowing me to speak tonight on the impact of COVID uh, on the mental health crisis plaguing the Latino community, and in particular, the Latino teens at risk of suicide who participate in our Life is Precious program, LIP, and to ask you for su your support for the program in fiscal year 2023. The center LIP, we opened it in 2015 in Long Island City. And today we have over 30 Latina adolescents uh, from Queens and over uh, 30 parents who are actively participating in our Life is Precious program. Latina teens had already reached epidemic proportions prior to the start of the pandemic. For example, in August 2020, the CDC released its youth risk behavior survey that shows that 41% um, and 48% of Latina in Queens felt sad and hopeless. 14%, actually 15%, seriously considered suicide and 8.3% attempted suicide. Um, after COVID um, or during COVID, we have seen an exacerbation of uh, depression, suicide ideation, uh, anxiety. And um, part of the challenge is that um, they experience social isolation, overcrowding, parents unemployment, inability to access financial relief due to immigration status, uh, housing uh, challenges and food insecurity, and of course, inade inadequate remote learning opportunity. Uh, and high rate of COVID related illnesses and activities um, have really impacted this uh, program. We have 28 uh, psychiatric admissions due to COVID, uh, and eight of them are from the Queen's participant. Um, and we continue to get uh, many, many referrals from the schools and from uh, nonprofit organizations because we are the only program in the city of New York that is providing suicide prevention program for Latina adolescents. Uh, I wanna um, thank you for again for uh, allowing us to present testimony and requesting your support to continue to save lives, the lives of Latina adolescents at risk of suicide. And thank you so much to the Queen's delegation for your support in 2023. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. Next, we're going to David Jones. Good afternoon, good evening, I'm sorry. How are you? My name is David Jones, uh, founder and executive director of iCODI. And I am in front of you in reference to the NYC Computer Lab Initiative, where we are currently in the process of opening a computer lab in every underprivileged and underserved community in New York City. We've opened two um, in 2021. Um, the ribbon cutting ceremony at the Flatbush Gardens uh, Community Center was attended by Senator Parker, uh, Farrah Lewis, um, Nick Perry, um, and others. Uh, government officials. And so our premise is to assist with conquering the digital divide. Uh, the digital divide has been in existence um, way before COVID, but COVID shed an even bigger light on uh, the digital divide. A, for example, would be when the DOE transitioned to remote learning. We got a chance to see how many families didn't have uh, devices, let alone even Wi-Fi in the home. Some things that uh, probably you and I most on this, um, or this panel here or here would take for granted. And so with that, um, again, we're opening computer labs in every underprivileged and underserved community in New York City. Um, our markers will be NYCHA buildings because a NYCHA building kind of serves as a marker of an underprivileged or underserved um, community. And uh, upon opening the labs, we will have uh, we'll impl implement uh, programming such as Microsoft Office uh, training, uh, STEM learning, um, and also not just for quote unquote, the younger generation, but very important to ingratiate um, our seniors or our elders into uh, the 21st century in that um, everything is online now as far as paying bills, um, just getting information in general. And so doing simple things with them as far as setting them up with email addresses, um, teaching them how to use their phones for more than just a phone call, 
some of the other things that they may need to use or that's at their access, um, we can teach them. So I say, for example, uh, many of the elderly who passed during COVID maybe would have gotten a chance to see some of their family members if they knew how to use Zoom via their phone. And so um, I want to be as brief as possible. My time is running out, but I um, hope that um, you deem it feasible to help to assist us in conquering the digital divide via the New York City Computer Lab Initiative. Thank you, and thank you for your work. And you should definitely uh, connect with Deputy Borough President uh, Ebony Young, who's doing a lot of work around this as well, just offline. So Absolutely. Thank you, for the work you're doing. thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, great. Thank you. All righty, we're now going to go to the Transportation Diversity Council. Good, e good evening. My name is Samson, President and CEO and Founder of Transportation Diversity Council. I would like to thank uh, the Queensboro President, City Council Member Presidents today, in particular, Council Member Julie uh, Wong who invited us to be present. TDC is a 501c3 uh, organization in operation for over 10 years with a mission to level the playing field and prepare the next generation of transportation leaders. As such, our organization is composed of transit executives from across the country, and we are based in Brooklyn, New York. We work very closely with the New York MTA, Los Angeles Metropolitan Transportation Authority, Jacksonville Transit Authority, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and New Jersey Transit, to name a few. We have recruited candidates from our partnership and founding school, Bronx Design and Construction Academy. The CT graduates have been onboarded at New York City Transit, and we have been successful in doing the same in California and Alabama. The problem statement, the needs of New York City transportation infrastructure have been publicly known and discussed for years. The recent COVID pandemic has greatly impacted loss of experienced skilled talent. There are currently hundreds of open jobs with the MTA agency, especially New York City Transit. Plans are underway to endorse TDC's work with student talent to recruit, train, retain, and educate a high quality transportation workforce to meet the current and future industry needs. A sense of urgency is at hand, and the needs have been intensified, bringing key stakeholders such as yourselves and the Council's Transportation Committee together to ensure that the transportation workforce of the New York City uh, metro area is ready to meet current and next generation challenges. In the essence of time, uh, please, you know, see our full statement, but I'll say we are requesting uh, funding to really transform the uh, opportunities for young people within the New York City community with good paying jobs, quality jobs, and skill sets that will be uh, lifelong uh, for, for them and their families. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your work. All right, next we'll hear from Tech Row. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> good evening, uh, Queensborough President Richards, uh, council members and distinguished members of the board. Um, my name is Travis Feldler and I'm the CEO of Tech Row. Tech Row is an educational organization that leverages virtual reality technology, like what you see here, uh, to reimagine you know, high school, college, and career readiness. Um, we partner with scores of organizations reaching thousands of students throughout the country. Uh, the team is a group of technology, education, and media veterans that have launched education programs, media networks like MTV, and technology initiatives through NYC and the world. Our support comes from several technology, media, and telecommunications companies, including foundations. Our journey um, started from a place where we were disturbed by the enrollment declines in higher education across our colleges and universities due to the number of uh, students that are rethinking the value of a college degree, um, including the growing sentiment among parents, losing confidence in public education, opting to send their children elsewhere, brought with it a charged desire for us to strategically leverage 
leverage virtual reality technology to shift these paradigms. So just to kind of help frame this conversation, I'd like to put forward a few scenarios. Imagine you are a student in Far Rockaway, Flushing, Corona, and you can, and you can now experience what college is like from your classroom. Or you're a parent trying to navigate where you send your child to high school and you do not have an opportunity to do a school visit because you work double shifts to provide for your family. Or you're in a school where the student to counselor ratio is 401 and your guidance counselor can only spend 38 minutes of, of, of time a year on post-secondary planning. Um, this is the reality of our students and families and they face this. So we're democratizing the power of experience through immersive technology. So today, I'd like to bring to the attention of the board our goal of realizing this technology in every middle and high school in Queens. We want to reimagine how our communities explore their educational opportunities, and this is an excellent way to do so. Um, our projected budget uh, request to ensure that this technology is in every school will come out to about one and a half million dollars. And with this, we want to create a mobile and web application that houses a library of immersive learning experiences, providing parents with accessible VR tours on high schools and higher education options so that we can bring trust and confidence back in public education and college degrees. We also want to enable middle and high schools with VR headsets so that students can explore campus experiences of Queens universities and colleges in an immersive way and to have better aid in navigating post-secondary planning. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for uh, your work. And uh, you should also connect with the deputy borough president as well offline. Thank you. Doing a lot of work in this space. Thank All you, right, sir. we're gonna now go to Arab American Family Support Center and then International Studio and cor Coratorial Program. Great, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Carrie Cecil. Um, I'm here with the Arab American Family Support Center and really grateful for your time. I, I recognize that you all had a really long day, so I won't read from my testimony. I've submitted it. I'll just share briefly um, about the work that we do at the Arab American Family Support Center. We've been open throughout the pandemic. We provide intensive culturally and linguistically accessible services to immigrants and refugees throughout Queens. Our staff speak 36 languages, so this enables us to provide specific services that mainstream agencies struggle to offer. And we have seen incredible increase in need across the communities, particularly as it relates to food insecurity, housing insecurity, and the rise in domestic violence. And so we're, we're seeking your support in making sure that community centers like ours can continue to be a, a critical resource and a safe space for people to access the support that they need. Um, and in particular, as it relates to increased funding for, for the Dove Initiative and making sure that agencies like the Arab American Family Support Center have the, the resources that we need to continue to respond at the level we're responding to the rise in domestic violence. We've seen 40% increase in demand since the pandemic started for our case management support. We've also seen doubling in proportion of risk, meaning that more people have, are experiencing homicidal or, or suicidal risk than ever before. And that meant, means our staff need to work longer hours, our staff need to have uh, be equipped with the right tools to respond to those needs. And so we're, we're seeking additional support from, from you all to make that happen in addition uh, we're seeking support, increased support for adult literacy initiatives this year to make sure that we have safe spaces for both young adults and adults to learn and grow and also have a, a really safe space where they can access additional resources that they need. Um, so I I'll stop there, but I just want to say thank you. Thank you to you all for your ongoing support over the past couple of years, and we hope that we can count on the continued support this year. Thank you. Thank you for the work you continue to do. All right, we're now going to go to International Studio and Coratorial Program. Thank you so much. I'm Susan. Um, I cannot believe you've been, have you been here since 10 a.m.? You know it. That's insane. Anyway. I got a, I got a break, though. At least, I got at least an hour or two or something like that. So oh thank you to the staff. All right, it's all a team effort, but I'm still here. Still Incredible. going. Incredible. So my, my comments start with good morning, 
But anyway, good evening, and I am delighted to be testifying. Thank you very much. Um, the organization that I am director of, I'm Susan Hapgood, is called the International Studio and Curatorial Program. And our mission is to support artists and curators from around the world to introduce New York audiences to exceptional international art practices and enrich the appreciation and understanding of contemporary art. Um, so we are in an old printing factory, 17,500 square feet of light filled high ceiling space in the highly industrial area of North Williamsburg. We are two blocks from Queens um, and we serve a multitude of visitors from Ridgewood, Linden Hill, Massbeth throughout the year. And we have about 10,000 audience members predominantly from Queens, Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, we sustained the arts community through COVID with a lot of digital visual arts programming, even during the lockdown. We're requesting cultural immigrant initiative funding because we have artists from all over the world. Um, and so we bring in immigrant communities to access the programming from their home, home countries. And we're also asking for discretionary funding um, for additional free public visual arts programs. Um, our best loved events are open studios, which take place three times a year. And I invite you all to come see. The next one comes up April 22nd. Um, and I said, we organize talks. Everything is free, open to all. Um, we're also a New York Public Library Culture Pass member. And um, we also collaborate. So, so therefore we collaborate with Queens Public Library also Brooklyn Public Library and New York Public Library. And we collaborate with 15 other New York-based visual arts residency programs and we cross promote events. Um, I guess that's about it. We serve Queens, we serve the entire city. I just wanna say um, once more that everything we do is free and there's always an exhibition on view or a public talk coming up. Um, and as one person once put it, we are like the United Nations of contemporary art. And it's true. And we are really right on the edge of Queens. And we are uh, one of the largest cultural organizations of our kind in our sort of immediate neighborhood. So I thank you very much for your time and attention. And I thank you for the incredible work that you all do for our city, because I believe it takes a lot of teamwork and a lot of respect for one another. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you for your testimony. And now we're going to go to the Chinese Theater. Chinese Theater Works. Hi. Sorry, I messed that up. Chinese Theater Works. Yes. I am Guang Yufeng, director of um, the company we founded in 1995. Um, our mission is to preserve and promote the traditional Chinese performing art to create new performances that bridges East and the Western aesthetics and the forms. Our project will be uh, interview uh, Chinese opera performers who uh, immigrant from China in late 1980s. And um, um, they have incredible uh, immigrant story actually just like any other immigrant from all over the world and the Queens is you know the the biggest uh, community to include everybody so we would like to uh, use um, this opportunity to, to interview some of them and uh, transcribe it and translate it into English and present their stories and their performances in libraries like at uh, Flushing Town Hall um, and um, uh, in other community centers. So for more neighbors to get to know Chinese people. And uh, we, uh, um, we are um, uh, not only based in, in Queens and also our pro programs uh, was covered uh, in entire um, uh, New York state and across country and uh, globally. We go to uh, different countries and uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong and China to bring back the story. And we are very, very proud to be uh, presented by New York State Council on Art and the Department of Cultural Affairs for uh, since 1995, since we 
funded. So we hope we got this opportunity to uh, document uh, these wonderful uh, stories from Chinese opera performers who represent Chinese immigrant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. All right, we're now gonna move to the Caribbean American Repertory Theater. We're letting them in right now, BP. Can, okay. um, can Robert's iPad please Oh, Robert's iPad, yourself? sorry. Who's Robert's iPad? How are you doing, uh, poor person? This is uh, Robert McDonough from Shannon Gales. Can you hear me? Oh, hey, Robert. Okay. <laughs> How are you? Good. <laughs> I, I, I'm surprised you're awesome. I'm delighted to see your, your hands on. Huh? So uh, do you want me to do my presentation? Yes. My name is Donovan. I got a little Irish in me. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was good to see your team out there yesterday so, marching uh, in Sunnyside. Yeah. Yeah, we had a good crowd, and thank God. I wasn't near myself, I was upstate, but yeah, no, we had a great crowd, so good, good to see you there. Um, so let me start. I wrote this, not knowing to you be <laughs> looking at me, but um, I'll read it out anyway. So my name is Robert McDonough. I'm, uh, I was chairman of Shani Gill's GA Club for the past five years until my term expired in December 2021, and I'm currently field maintenance and development chairman. The Shannon Gills Club is a non-profit Irish youth sports and cultural organisation based in Frank Golden Park in College Point. <clears throat> I would like to thank Queensborough, uh, the Queensborough Board, Queensborough President's Office, New York City Council and Queensborough President Richards for all, and all your staff for the opportunity to speak. Uh, in 2014, we signed a maintenance agreement with New York City Parks Department to maintain Frank Golden Park at the Shannon Gills Club's cost and expense. Uh, for the permitted use of the park. Over the last seven years, we developed two grass fields, bleachers and atrium at Frank Cohen Park, and, and you were there for the grand opening, uh, and a very, uh, in a very successful public-private partnership with New York City and New York City and Queen's Parks Department. This was achieved by our club members, local businesses, uh, the Queen's community, the Irish government, as well as our local representatives, and this project would not have happened without the help of your office. Uh, Queensborough President. Uh, they, uh, this accumulated in the grand opening of the field last October, and we were delighted to have you there while we opened the field. It was um, huge. It was huge for the club and huge, huge for the community. Uh, the the Shannon Gales Club has over 300 boys and girls under the age of 18 as members and participants and use this field daily. These kids come from all over Queens as, as well as other areas. <clears throat> we also run programs in local schools that no charge to schools or the pupils. We run free programs at Frank Golden for the local and new families, uh, Bellrose, Sunnyside, Middle Village, and other neighborhoods throughout New York City. We are also looking to run programs in public schools and more communities, and I'd like to speak to your uh, department about that, uh, uh, Mr. President. Um, the field is also used by other local groups, and we share time in the field. We currently maintain Frank Golden Park with labor by club volunteers only. Uh, but this still costs the club between fifty and sixty thousand annually, as we fund, uh, which we fundraise for. We um, during the development of two, the two uh, fields of Frank Golden Pass, a, a cost of over seven million. Field lighting was included in the parks department plan and approved uh, at community board level. The infrastructure was put in place. The lighting, including all conduits necessary, the footings for each light was prepped and put in place, as well as electricity was brought on site to power the lights. At this point, the uh, funding is allowed for the completion of lightings. We are budgeting 1.5 million to complete the lighting. Uh, and therefore we are asking the Queensborough, uh, Queensborough Board for uh, your support again to complete the Frank Golden Park project and the cost of lighting so we can be utilized to the project's full potential, especially for the fall season and when it gets dark. Um, from 5.30 days uh, is normally when we use the field. Uh, we are really on, on, unable to use it uh, at that time of the, uh, during the winter months, uh, uh, fall months and spring, early spring. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, thank you for the work you do. Yeah, thank you. Righty, we're now gonna go uh, to the Caribbean American Repertory, Repertory uh, Theater. You're muted. Thank you very, very much. And um, on behalf of Caribbean American Reptory Theater, um, I would like to offer my congratulations to our 
friend and president, um, Donovan Richards, for assuming his new role as Greensboro president and for his staff for this opportunity to request financial support for our work in the Borough of Queens. We've been around for a long time and we partner with the Theater for the Living Word um, for a lot of our shows in the area of St. Albans and the greater Jamaica, and of course, throughout the Borough of Queens. Um, we have collaborated with Black Spectrum, African Poetry Theater, Theater and Park. We, we are known throughout the borough, but we focus a lot on Caribbean, African-American, and African theater. In, I'm sorry. In the borough, I've got my dog here that's distracting. Um, the company challenges itself to present works that foster a climate of cross-cultural communication beyond what is known by this media stereotypes. Um, we're specifically asking, uh, I think we have re sent in a, a written request for about 60,000 to aid primarily with our audience development, student outreach program and marketing programs. Um, what we've been doing before the pandemic is we've been collaborating or with about four or to six schools in the borough of Queens and we want to expand it, whereby we have the students bust in on a school day for a morning performance of our shows. As you know, our show, our plays are very professional. Um, we've done plays like Raisin in the Sun and uh, Fences. And we have the students bust in uh, on a school day and they fill the Jamaica Performing Arts Center, which holds 400 students and teachers. And we want to expand that program to include more schools, as many as eight or 10 schools in the community. We offer heavily discounted, only about a half of the students pay admission costs. So we need uh, funding to offset the cost of the productions so that the students could come and be educated and entertained at the same time in their borough of Queens on a school day. And I tell you, Mr. Bar President, it's been the highlight of our work in Queens to look in the audience and see 400 students really, really into a that's uplifting for them. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and good to see you and keep up the good work. Thank you. All right, we're now gonna to go to Dream NYC Hoops and then hear say. Dream NYC Hoops. See you on. All righty, I see Airsay is on. We'll come back to them if they connect. Judith Sloan. We'll give them a minute, I guess. Uh, Y'all wanna ping them? Dream NYC Hoops, Judith Sloan, here say. Yes, I'm There you here. go, Judith is on, there you go. Yeah, I gotta go. Hi. Hi, sorry, Hi. this is Dream NYC All right, hold up. All right, so we gotta have one of y'all. All right, I'm gonna let the lady go, ladies go first. So well, no, you Judith can let Sloan. the other person go first because I was supposed to be at 11, so I was just zooming in, but let oh, them okay. go first and I'll get myself prepared. All right, no problem. All right, we'll go to Dream Wait. NYC Hoops. And then okay, I'll go after great. that. No problem. Thank you everyone for your time today. Um, my name is Leslie Hernandez and I am the founder, co-founder of Dream NYC Hoops. Uh, Dream NYC Hoops is an organization created to help children, uh, particularly from low income families, uh, to have a productive outlet through youth sports in New York City. <clears throat> Our goal is to continue to help our 80 student athletes from ages 8 to 15 experienced the joy and positive benefits of playing basketball. These past two years have been really tough on youth programs 
as city budgets have been slashed due to COVID-19. Cost is the number one barrier keeping kids from income-restricted families out of youth sports. By receiving city funding, you'll empower our youth to make a change and equip them with the tools they need to address unmet needs that exist in their communities. By uplifting and teaching the value of generosity, we'll increase our pro-social behavior, creating the just and generous world we all seek to live in. There are various costs associated with running a youth sports organization, including gym time, uniforms, and tournament fees. Our players require gym time in order to run practices and have a safe location for the players and families to meet and socialize. Tournaments are a fantastic way to get players noticed by high schools and and college scouts who run, in turn, provide athletic scholarships. Our players and their families are unable to come up with the capital required to run our program. If we're unable to continue our services, there will be 80 children without a productive outlet in our district. We hope to call on council members to help us get established. With your help, we can subsidize gym fees and tournament fees for our players who desperately need gym time and tournament opportunities. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank testimony. You very much. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do. All right, Judith, you're back. I'm back. Is it oh. possible to share my screen or is that is that okay? You got three, you got three, what is it? Three minutes, sure. Okay, we'll Start the time I when will, you share it, but you can. I will I, definitely just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we are a nonprofit that works with multi-generational children, um, older people, uh, new immigrants, refugees. We've been running projects with youth and immigrant youth in a partnership with the International High School at LaGuardia Community College. And we work on all kinds of things. The pandemic meant that we had to start doing things that we weren't used to doing, like video, uh, vi video creation of what does it mean to be back in school, whereas we used to do lots of large performances. Um, we also do a lot of big projects with multiple generational uh, you know, groups and organizations. And we did this project called 1001 Voices with the Queen Symphony Orchestra with 190 singers and with uh, 55 musicians. And we, this year, want to work on a new project on climate issues, which we think are really important for Queens in general, and certainly for New York. And um, we're working on a project where we're gonna interview people and talk about the ways that impacts their lives and write a new piece that's called, This Is Not a Drill. And looking at like, what can we do? We're gonna interview uh, city agencies and also just looking at how we as a community can think through some of these things that we're gonna be facing in the future. And we plan to do that both with our school projects and our arts and education programs and funding from the borough president's office would be tremendously helpful. And am I on my three minutes? No, I have more time, huh? It's a uh, minute, oh, you're on a roll. I'm on a roll. And so I <laughs> so um, I can put our, our website in the chat and the videos in the chat. And one of the things that's really been great for us over the past, I would say, 20 years is that we've been in the same area and we've been in Queens for over uh, for 30 years now and worked on many, many different projects. And I guess our most seminal project was this, Crossing the Boulevard, which won the Brendan Gill Prize. And it's about new immigrants and refugees. And we all know that Queens is the most diverse place in the United States. And these projects are a way of people telling their stories. Um, and this guy is from Ukraine, which is very topical right now. Um, and so we're, we're really interested in continuing those programs and creating these cross-generational, interracial collaborations. Thank you so much. <laughs> There's my three minutes. Thank you. All righty. All righty. I'm going back to Amanda. Is this it? That's it. That's a wrap.
Whoa. All righty. All righty. Wow. What wow. a day. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thank you all for coming out. I really do want to thank uh, all of the organizations and uh, the general public who testified today, our community boards, uh, to all the council members who showed up. Uh, thank you um, to the staff members who stayed on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We could do nothing without our staff members. Uh, this concludes our fiscal year 2023 Queensborough Board preliminary budget hearing. Woo. I want to thank the individuals and organizations once again that testified. We value all the points made and will consider them when responding to the mayor's fiscal year 2023 preliminary budget. I am happy we were able to allow individuals and community-based organizations to share their voice and give them the audience they deserve. So I really wanna thank the panelists who joined us throughout the day and night. Um, this includes the community board chairs, the New York City Council, once again, Queens delegation and their staff. That's why it's good to read the notes because I just went off the cuff, but they had all of this in, in the notes. <laughs> um, thank you for taking the time to be here. I know it's been a long day. Also, I have to give a very special shout out to the staff members who made this possible today. Um, I want to start with my budget director, Amanda Minichini. Thank you so much. Whoa, hats off to you. I hope you get like a day off or something. <laughs> <laughs> you need a few days <laughs> whenever that's feasible. But thank you so much for all your work. Uh, to Carolina Gill, thank you so much. She's held it down uh, for a long time. And thank you so much. And to our newest addition, Daniel Lewis, thank you so much. Whoa, it's your first one. All right, great job. To uh, Avi, thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, I have to give a, a big shout out to both our Deputy Borough President, Evan Young. Thank you so much. You are a trooper. Uh, and of course, to the, the impeccable uh, Chief of Staff, we have Michael Mallon. Thank you so much. Uh, none of this is possible without a great team, uh, and you all stuck through the day, and it shows your commitment to Queens, so I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, and this concludes the 2023 fiscal preliminary budget hearing.